The shadow shall rise across the world, and darken every land, even to the smallest corner, and there shall be neither light nor safety. And he who shall be born of the dawn, born of the maiden, according to prophecy, he shall stretch forth his hands to catch the shadow, and the world shall scream in the pain of salvation. All glory be to the Creator and to the light, and to he who shall be born again. May the light save us from him. From Commentaries on the Koreathan Cycle Serene Darshamel Motara, Council Sister to Komael, High Queen of Jeremide, Circa 325 A.B., the Third Age. Chapter 1 Seeds of Shadow The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the Third Age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose on the great plain called the Caroline Grass. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time. But it was a beginning. North and west the wind blew beneath early morning sun, over endless miles of rolling grass and far-scattered thickets, across the swift-flowing river Luan, past the broken-topped fang of Dragon Mount, mountain of legend towering above the slow swells of the rolling plain, looming so high that clouds wreathed it less than halfway to the smoking peak. Dragon Mount, where the dragon had died, and with him, some said, the age of legends, where prophecy said he would be born again, or had been, north and west, across the villages of Jualde and Darien and Alindia, where bridges like stone lacework arched out to the shining walls, the great white walls of what many called the greatest city in the world, Tarvalen, a city just touched by the reaching shadow of Dragon Mount each evening. Within those walls, Ogre made buildings well over two thousand years old seemed to grow out of the ground rather than having been built, or to be the work of wind and water rather than that of even the fabled hands of Ogre stonemasons. Some suggested birds taking flight, or huge shells from distant seas. Soaring towers, flared or fluted or spiraled, stood connected by bridges hundreds of feet in the air, often without rails. Only those long in Tarvalen could avoid gaping like country folk who had never been off the farm. Greatest of those towers, the White Tower dominated the city, gleaming like polished bone in the sun. The wheel of time turns around Tarvalen, so people said in the city, and Tarvalen turns around the tower. The first sight travelers had of Tarvalen before their horses came in view of the bridges, before their riverboat captains sighted the island, was the tower, reflecting the sun like a beacon. Small wonder, then, that the great square surrounding the walled tower grounds seemed smaller than it was under the massive tower's gaze, the people in it dwindling to insects. Yet the white tower could have been the smallest in Tarvalen. The fact that it was the heart of Ais Sedai power, would still have overawed the island city. Despite their numbers, the crowd did not come close to filling the square. Along the edges, people jostled each other in a milling mass, all going about their day's business. But closer to the tower grounds, there were ever fewer people, until a band of bare paving stones at least fifty paces wide bordered the tall white walls. Eyes, said I, were respected, and more in Tarvalen, of course, and the Amerlin seat ruled the city as she ruled the Eyes, said I. But few wanted to be closer to Eyes, said I, power than they had to. There was a difference between being proud of a grand fireplace in your hall and walking into the flames. A very few did go closer, to the broad stairs that led up to the tower itself, to the intricately carved doors wide enough for a dozen people abreast. Those doors stood open, welcoming. There were always some people in need of aid or an answer they thought only eyes said I could give, and they came from far as often as near, 
from Arafel and Gaeldan, from Saldea and Ilion. Many would find help or guidance inside, though often not what they had expected or hoped for. Min kept the wide hood of her cloak pulled up, shadowing her face in its depths. In spite of the warmth of the day, the garment was light enough not to attract comment, not on a woman so obviously shy. And a good many people were shy when they went to the tower. There was nothing about her to attract notice. Her dark hair was longer than when she was last in the tower, though still not quite to her shoulders, and her dress, plain blue except for narrow bands of white Jericho's lace at neck and wrists, would have suited the daughter of a well-to-do farmer, wearing her feast-day best to the tower, just like the other women approaching the wide stairs. Min hoped she looked the same, at least. She had to stop herself from staring at them to see if they walked or held themselves differently. I can do it, she told herself. She had certainly not come all this way to turn back now. The dress was a good disguise. Those who remembered her in the tower remembered a young woman with close-cropped hair, always in a boy's coat and breeches, never in a dress. It had to be a good disguise. She had no choice about what she was doing, not really. Her stomach fluttered the closer she came to the tower, and she tightened her grip on the bundle clutched to her breast. Her usual clothes were in there, and her good boots, and all her possessions, except the horse she had left at an inn not far from the square. With luck she would be back on the gelding in a few hours, riding for the Austrian bridge and the road south. She was not really looking forward to climbing onto a horse again so soon, not after weeks in the saddle with never a day's pause, but she longed to leave this place. She had never seen the White Tower as hospitable, and right now it seemed nearly as awful as the Dark One's prison at Sheol Ghul. Shivering, she wished she had not thought of the Dark One. I wonder if Moraine thinks I came just because she asked me? The light helped me, acting like a fool girl, doing fool things because of a fool man. She mounted the stairs uneasily. Each was deep enough to take two strides for her to reach the next, and unlike most of the others, she did not pause for an awed stare up the pale height of the tower. She wanted this over. Inside, archways almost surrounded the large round entry hall, but the petitioners huddled in the middle of the chamber, shuffling together beneath a flat-domed ceiling. The pale stone floor had been worn and polished by countless nervous feet over the centuries. No one thought of anything except where they were and why. A farmer and his wife in rough woolens, clutching each other's calloused hands, rubbed shoulders with a merchant in velvet-slashed silks, a maid at her heels clutching a small worked silver casket, no doubt her mistress's gift for the tower. Elsewhere the merchant would have stared down her nose at farm folk who brushed so close, and they might well have knuckled their foreheads and backed away apologizing. Not now. Not here. There were few men among the petitioners, which was no surprise to Min. Most men were nervous around eyes, said I. Everyone knew it had been male eyes, said I, when there still had been male eyes, said I, who were responsible for the breaking of the world. Three thousand years had not dimmed that memory, even if time had altered many of the details. Children were still frightened by tales of men who could channel the one power, men doomed to go mad from the Dark One's taint on Sidene, the male half of the true source. Worst was the story of Luz Theron Telamon, the dragon, Luz Theron Kinslayer, who had begun the breaking. For that matter, the stories frightened adults, too. Prophecy said the dragon would be born again in mankind's greatest hour of need to fight the Dark One in Tarmon Gaedon, the last battle. But that made little difference in how most people looked at any connection between men and the power. Any eyes, said I, would hunt down a man who could channel. Now, of the seven Ajahs, the Red did little else. Of course, none of that had anything to do with seeking help from Eyes, said I, yet few men felt easy about being linked in any way to Eyes, said I, and the power. 
Few, that is, except warders. But each warder was bonded to an eyes, said I. Warders could hardly be taken for the general run of men. There was a saying, A man will cut off his own hand to get rid of a splinter, before asking help from eyes, said I. Women meant it as a comment on men's stubborn foolishness, but men had heard some men say the loss of a hand might be the better decision. She wondered what these people would do if they knew what she knew. Run screaming, perhaps. And if they knew her reason for being here, she might not survive to be taken up by the tower guards and thrown into a cell. She did have friends in the tower, but none with power or influence. If her purpose was discovered, it was much less likely that they could help her than that she would pull them to the gallows or the headsman behind her. That was saying she lived to be tried, of course. More likely her mouth would be stopped permanently long before a trial. She told herself to stop thinking like that. I'll make it in, and I'll make it out. The light burn Rand Althor for getting me into this. Three or four accepted, women men's age, or perhaps a little older, were circulating through the round room, speaking softly to the petitioners. Their white dresses had no decoration except for seven bands of color at the hem, one band for each aja. Now and again a novice, a still younger woman, or girl, all in white, came to lead someone deeper into the tower. The petitioners always followed the novices with an odd mix of excited eagerness and foot-dragging reluctance. Min's grip tightened on her bundle as one of the accepted stopped in front of her. The light illumine you, the curly-haired woman said perfunctorily. I am called Theolaine. How may the tower help you? Theolaine's dark round face held the patience of someone doing a tedious job when she would rather be doing something else. Studying, probably, from what Min knew of the accepted. Learning to be eyes Sedai. Most important, however, was the lack of recognition in the accepted's eyes. The two of them had met when Min was in the tower before, though only briefly. Just the same, Min lowered her face in assumed diffidence. It was not unnatural. A good many country folk did not really understand the great step up from accepted to full eyes Sedai. Shielding her features behind the edge of her cloak, she looked away from Feolaine. "'I have a question I must ask the Amerlin seat,' she began, then caught off abruptly as three eyes said I stopped to look into the entry hall, two from one archway and one from another. Accepted and novices curtsied when their rounds took them close to one of the eyes said I, but otherwise went on about their tasks, perhaps a trifle more briskly. That was all. Not so for the petitioners. They seemed to catch their breaths altogether. Away from the White Tower, away from Tarvalon, they might simply have thought the eyes said I, three women whose ages they could not guess, three women in the flush of their prime, yet with more maturity than their smooth cheeks suggested. In the Tower, though, there was no question. A woman who had worked very long with a one power was not touched by time in the same way as other women. In the tower, no one needed to see a golden great serpent ring to know an eyes said I. A ripple of curtsy spread through the huddle and jerky bows from the few men. Two or three people even fell to their knees. The rich merchant looked frightened. The farm couple at her side stared at legends come to life. How to deal with eyes said I was a matter of hearsay for most. It was unlikely that any here, except those who actually lived in Tarvalon, had seen an eyes said I before, and probably not even the Tarvaloners had been this close. But it was not the eyes said I themselves that halted Min's tongue. Sometimes, not often, she saw things when she looked at people images and auras that usually flared and were gone in moments. Occasionally she knew what they meant. It happened rarely, the knowing, much more rarely than the seeing, even. But when she knew, she was always right. Unlike most others, I said I, and their warders, always had images and auras, 
sometimes so many dancing and shifting that they made men dizzy. The numbers made no difference in interpreting them, though. She knew what they meant for eyes, said I, as seldom as for anyone else. But this time she knew more than she wanted to, and it made her shiver. A slender woman with black hair falling to her waist, the only one of the three she recognized, her name was Ananda, she was yellow, Aja, wore a sickly brown halo, shriveled and split by rotting fissures that fell in and widened as they decayed. The small, fair-haired eyes Sadai beside Ananda was green, Aja, by her green-fringed shawl. The white flame of Tarvalan on it showed for a moment when she turned her back, and on her shoulder, as if nestled among the grapevines and flowering apple branches worked on her shawl, sat a human skull, a small woman's skull, picked clean and sun-bleached. The third, a plumply pretty woman, halfway around the room, wore no shawl. Most eyes, said I, did not, except for ceremony. The lift of her chin and the set of her shoulders spoke of strength and pride. She seemed to be casting cool blue eyes on the petitioners through a tattered curtain of blood, crimson streamers running down her face. Blood and skull and halo faded away in the dance of images around the three, came and faded again. The petitioners stared in awe, seeing only three women who could touch the true source and channel the one power. No one but men saw the rest. No one but men knew those three women were going to die, all on the same day. The Armalin cannot see everyone, Feolaine said with poorly hidden impatience. Her next public audience is not for ten days. Tell me what you want, and I will arrange for you to see the sister who can best help you. Min's eye flew to the bundle in her arms and stayed there, partly so she would not have to see again what she had already seen. All three of them! Light! What chance was there that three eyes said I would die on the same day? But she knew. She knew. I have the right to speak to the Armalin seat in person? It was a right seldom demanded. Who would dare? but it existed. Any woman has that right, and I ask it. Do you think the Armalin seat herself can see everyone who comes to the White Tower? Surely another eyes said I can help you. Feolaine gave heavy weight to the titles as if to overpower Min. Now tell me what your question is about, and give me your name so the novice will know who to come for. My name is Elmindreda. Min winced in spite of herself. She had always hated the name, but the Armalin was one of the few people living who had ever heard it. If only she remembered. I have the right to speak to the Armalin, and my question is for her alone. I have the right. The accepted arched an eyebrow. Elmindreda? Her mouth twitched toward an amused smile. And you claim your rights. Very well. I will send word to the Keeper of the Chronicles that you wish to see the Amarlin seat personally, Elmindreda. Min wanted to slap the woman for the way she emphasized Elmindreda, but instead she forced out a murmured, Thank you. Do not thank me yet. No doubt it will be hours before the Keeper finds time to reply, and it will certainly be that you can ask your question at the Mother's next public audience. Wait with patience, Elmindreda. She gave Min a tight smile, almost a smirk, as she turned away. Grinding her teeth, Min took her bundle to stand against the wall between two of the archways, where she tried to blend into the pale stonework. Trust no one, and avoid notice until you reach the Amarlin, Moiraine had told her. Moiraine was one eye, said I, she did trust most of the time. It was good advice in any case. All she had to do was reach the Armalin, and it would be over. She could don her own clothes again, see her friends, and leave. No more need for hiding. She was relieved to see that the eyes Sadai had gone. Three eyes Sadai dying on one day. 
It was impossible. That was the only word. Yet it was going to happen. Nothing she said or did could change it. When she knew what an image meant, it happened. But she had to tell the Amarlin about this. It might even be as important as the news she brought from Warain, though that was hard to believe. Another accepted came to replace one already there, and to Min's eyes bars floated in front of her apple-cheeked face like a cage. Shiriam, the mistress of novices, looked into the hall. After one glance, Min kept her gaze on the stone under her feet. Shiriam knew her all too well, and the red-haired eyes Sadai's face seemed battered and bruised. It was only the viewing, of course, but Min still had to bite her lip to stifle a gasp. Shiriam, with her calm authority and sureness, was as indestructible as the tower. Surely nothing could harm Shiriam. But something was going to. An eyes Sadai unknown to Min, wearing the shawl of the brown Aja, accompanied a stout woman in finely woven red wool to the doors. The stout woman walked as lightly as a girl, face shining, almost laughing with pleasure. The brown sister was smiling, too, but her aura faded like a guttering candle flame. Death, wounds, captivity, and death. To Min it might as well have been printed on a page. She set her eyes on her feet. She did not want to see any more. Let her remember, she thought. She had not felt desperation at any time on her long ride from the mountains of mist, not even on the two occasions when someone tried to steal her horse. But she felt it now. Light, let her remember that bloody name. Mistress Elmindrida? Min gave a start. The black-haired novice who stood before her was barely old enough to be away from home, perhaps fifteen or sixteen, though she made a great effort at dignity. Yes, I am. That is my name. I am Sarah. If you will come with me— Sarah's piping voice took on a note of wonder. The Amerlin seat will see you in her study now. Min gave a sigh of relief and followed eagerly. Her cloak's deep hood still hid her face. But it did not stop her seeing, and the more she saw, the more she grew eager to reach the Amarlin. Few people walked the broad corridors that spiraled upward with their brightly colored floor tiles and their wall hangings and golden lampstands. The tower had been built to hold far greater numbers than it did now, but nearly everyone she saw as she climbed higher wore an image or aura that spoke to her of violence and danger. Warders hurried by with barely a glance for the two women, men who moved like hunting wolves, their swords only an afterthought to their deadliness, but they seemed to have bloody faces or gaping wounds. Swords and spears danced about their heads, threatening. Their auras flashed wildly, flickered on the knife edge of death. She saw dead men walking, knew they would die on the same day as the eyes set eye in the entry hall, or at most a day later. Even some of the servants, men and women with the flame of Tarvalon on their breasts, hurrying about their work, bore signs of violence. An eyes said I, glimpsed down a side hallway, appeared to have chains in the air around her, and another, crossing the corridor ahead of Min and her guide, seemed for most of those few strides to wear a silver collar around her neck. Min's breath caught at that. She wanted to scream. It can all be overwhelming to someone who's never seen it before, Sarah said, trying and failing to sound as if the tower were as ordinary to her now as her home village. But you are safe here. The Amarlin seat will make things right. Her voice squeaked when she mentioned the Amarlin. Light let her do just that, Min muttered. The novice gave her a smile that was meant to be soothing. By the time they reached the hall outside the Armelin study, Min's stomach was churning and she was treading almost on Sarah's heels. Only the need to pretend that she was a stranger had kept her from running ahead long since. One of the doors to the Armelin's chambers opened, and a young man with red-gold hair came stalking out, nearly striding into Min and her escort. 
tall and straight and strong in his blue coat, thickly embroidered with gold on sleeves and collar, Gawain of House Trocand, eldest son of Queen Morgays of Andor, looked every inch the proud young lord. A furious young lord. There was no time to drop her head. He was staring down into her hood, right into her face. His eyes widened in surprise, then narrowed to slits of blue ice. So you are back. Do you know where my sister and Egwene have gone? They are not here. Min forgot everything in a rising flood of panic. Before she knew what she was doing, she had seized his sleeves, peering up at him urgently, and forced him back a step. Gawain, they started for the tower months ago. Elaine and Egwene and Nynaeve, too, with Varen Sedai and— Gawain, I—I— I... Calm yourself, he said, gently undoing her grip on his coat. Light, I didn't mean to frighten you so. They arrived safely, and would not say a word of where they had been or why. Not to me. I suppose there's scant hope you will. She thought she kept her face straight, but he took one look and said, I thought not. This place has more secrets than— They've vanished again, and Nynaeve too. Nynaeve was almost an offhand addition. She might be one of Min's friends, but she meant nothing to him. His voice began to roughen once more, growing tighter by the second. Again, without a word. Not a word. Supposedly they're on a farm somewhere as penance for running away, but I cannot find out where. The Armorlin won't give me a straight answer. Min flinched. For a moment streaks of dried blood had made his face a grim mask. It was like a double hammer blow. Her friends were gone. It had eased her coming to the tower, knowing they were here, and Gawain was going to be wounded on the day the eyes said I died. Despite all she had seen since entering the tower, despite her fear, none of it had really touched her personally until now. Disaster striking the tower would spread far from Tarvalin, yet she was not of the tower and never could be. But Gawain was someone she knew, someone she liked, and he was going to be hurt more than the blood told, hurt somehow deeper than wounds to his flesh. It hit her that if catastrophe seized the tower, not only distant eyes Sedai would be harmed, women she could never feel close to, but her friends as well. They were of the tower. In a way she was glad Egwene and the others were not there, glad she could not look at them and perhaps see signs of death. Yet she wanted to look, to be sure, to look at her friends and see nothing, or see that they would live. Where in the light were they? Why had they gone? Knowing those three, she thought it possible that if Gawain did not know where they were, it was because they did not want him to know. It could be that. Suddenly she remembered where she was and why, and that she was not alone with Gawain. Sarah seemed to have forgotten she was taking men to the Amarlin. She seemed to have forgotten everything but the young lord, making calf eyes that he was not noticing. Even so, there was no use pretending any longer to be a stranger to the tower. She was at the Amarlin's door. Nothing could stop her now. Gawain, I don't know where they are. But if they are doing penance on a farm, they're probably all sweat and mud to their hips, and you are the last one they will want to see them. She was not much easier about their absence than Gawain was, in truth. Too much had happened, too much was happening, too much with ties to them and to her. But it was not impossible they had been sent off for punishment. You won't help them by making the Amarlin angry. I don't know that they are on a farm, or even alive. Why all this hiding and sidestepping if they're just pulling weeds? If anything happens to my sister, or to Egwene, he frowned at the toes of his boots. I am supposed to look after Elaine. How can I protect her when I don't know where she is? Min sighed. Do you think she needs looking after, either of them? But if the Amarlin had sent them somewhere, maybe they did. The Amarlin was capable of sending a woman into a bear's den with nothing but a switch, if it suited her purposes. And she would expect the woman to come back with a bearskin, or the bear on a leash, as instructed. But telling Gawain that would only inflame his temper and his worries. 
Gawain, they have pledged to the tower. They won't thank you for meddling. I know Elaine isn't a child, he said patiently, even if she does bounce back and forth between running off like one and playing at being eyes, said I. But she is my sister, and beyond that she is daughter-heir of Andor. She'll be queen after mother. Andor needs her whole and safe to take the throne, not another succession. Playing at being eyes, said I. Apparently he did not realize the extent of his sister's talent. The daughter heirs of Andor had been sent to the tower to train for as long as there had been an Andor, but Elaine was the first to have enough talent to be raised to eyes, said I, and a powerful eyes, said I, at that. Very likely he also did not know Egwene was just as strong. So he will protect her whether she wants it or not. She said it in a flat voice, meant to let him know he was making a mistake. But he missed the warning and nodded agreement. That has been my duty since the day she was born. My blood shed before hers, my life given before hers. I took that oath when I could barely see over the side of her cradle. Gareth Bryn had to explain to me what it meant. I won't break it now. Andor needs her more than it needs me. He spoke with a calm certainty, an acceptance of something natural and right that sent chills through her. She had always thought of him as boyish, laughing and teasing, but now he was something alien. She thought the Creator must have been tired when it came time to make men. Sometimes they hardly seemed human. And Egwene? What oath did you take about her? His face did not change, but he shifted his feet warily. I am concerned about Egwene, of course, and Nynaeve. What happens to Elaine's companions might happen to Elaine. I assume they're still together. When they were here, I seldom saw one without the others. My mother always told me to marry a poor liar, and you qualify, except that I think someone else has first claim. Some things are meant to be, he said quietly, and some never can. Galad is heartsick because Egwene is gone. Galad was his half-brother, the pair of them sent to Tarvalon to train under the warders. That was another Andoran tradition. Galad de Drid Damadred was a man who took doing the right thing to the point of a fault, as men saw it. But Gawain could see no wrong in him, and he would not speak his feelings for a woman Galad had set his heart on. She wanted to shake him shake some sense into him, but there was no time now. Not with the Amarlin waiting, not with what she had to tell the Amarlin waiting. Certainly not with Sarah standing there, calf-eyes or no calf-eyes. Gawain, I am summoned to the Amarlin. Where can I find you when she is done with me? I will be in the practice yard. The only time I can stop worrying is when I am working the sword with Hamar. Hamar was a blade master, and the warder who taught the sword. Most days I am there until the sun sets. Good, then. I will come as soon as I can, and try to watch what you say. If you make the Armelin angry with you, Elaine and Egwene might share in it. That I cannot promise, he said firmly. Something is wrong in the world. Civil war in the Cairienne. The same and worse in Taraban and Aradaman. False dragons. Troubles and rumors of troubles everywhere. I don't say the tower is behind it, but even here things are not what they should be, or what they seem. Elaine and Egwene vanishing isn't the whole of it. Still, they are the part that concerns me. I will find out where they are. And if they have been hurt, if they are dead. He scowled, and for an instant his face was that bloody mask again. More. A sword floated above his head, and a banner waved behind it. The long, hilted sword, like those most warders used, had a heron engraved on its slightly curved blade, symbol of a blademaster, and men could not say whether it belonged to Gawain or threatened him. The banner bore Gawain's sigil of the charging white boar, but on a field of green rather than the red of Andor. Both sword and banner faded with the blood. Be careful, Gawain. She meant it two ways careful of what he said, and careful in a way she could not explain even to herself. You must be very careful. 
His eyes searched her face as if he had heard some of her deeper meaning. I will try, he said finally. He put on a grin, almost the grin she remembered, but the effort was plain. I suppose I had better get myself back to the practice yard if I expect to keep up with Galad. I managed two out of five against Hamar this morning, but Galad actually won three. The last time he bothered to come to the yard. Suddenly he appeared to really see her for the first time, and his grin became genuine. You want to wear dresses more often. It's pretty on you. Remember, I will be there till sunset. As he strode away with something very close to the dangerous grace of a warder, Min realized she was smoothing the dress over her hip and stopped immediately. The light burn all men. Sarah exhaled as if she had been holding her breath. He is very good looking, isn't he? she said dreamily. Not as good looking as Lord Galad, of course. And you really know him? It was half a question, but only half. Min echoed the novice's sigh. The girl would talk with her friends in the novice's quarters. The son of a queen was a natural topic, especially when he was handsome and had an air about him like the hero in a gleeman's tale. A strange woman only made for more interesting speculation. Still, there was nothing to be done about it. At any rate, it could hardly cause any harm now. The Armelin seat must be wondering why we haven't come, she said. Sarah came to herself with a wide-eyed start and a loud gulp. Seizing Min's sleeve with one hand, she jumped to open one of the doors, pulling Min behind her. The moment they were inside, the novice curtsied hastily and burst out in panic. I have brought her, Liana said I, Mistress Elmindreda. The Armelin seat wants to see her. The tall, coppery-skinned woman in the anteroom wore the hand-wide stole of the Keeper of the Chronicles, blue to show she had been raised from the blue Aja. Fists on hips, she waited for the girl to finish, then dismissed her with a clipped, "'Took you long enough, child. Back to your chores now.' Sarah bobbed another curtsy and scurried out as quickly as she had entered. Min stood with her eyes on the floor, her hood still pulled up around her face. Blundering in front of Sarah had been bad enough though at least the novice did not know her name. But Liana knew her better than anyone in the tower, except the Amerlin. Min was sure it could make no difference now, but after what had happened in the hallway, she meant to hold to Moiraine's instructions until she was alone with the Amerlin. This time her precautions did no good. Liana took two steps, pushed back the hood, and grunted as if she had been poked in the stomach. Min raised her head and stared back defiantly, trying to pretend she had not been attempting to sneak past. Straight, dark hair, only a little longer than her own, framed the keeper's face. The eyes, said I's expression, was a blend of surprise and displeasure at being surprised. So you are Elmindreda, are you? Liana said briskly. She was always brisk. I must say you look at more in that dress than in your usual... garb. Just Min, Liana said I, if you please. Min managed to keep her face straight, but it was difficult not to glare. The keeper's voice had held too much amusement. If her mother had had to name her after someone in a story, why did it have to be a woman who seemed to spend most of her time sighing at men, when she was not inspiring them to compose songs about her eyes or her smile? Very well, Min. I'll not ask where you've been, nor why you've come back in a dress, apparently wanting to ask a question of the Amerlin. Not now, at least. Her face said she meant to ask later, though, and get answers. I suppose the mother knows who El Mindreda is? Of course. I should have known that when she said to send you straight in and alone. The light alone knows why she puts up with you. She broke off with a concerned frown. What is the matter, girl? Are you ill? Min carefully blanked her face. No. No, I am all right. For a moment the keeper had been looking through a transparent mask of her own face, a screaming mask. "'May I go in now?' Liana said I. Liana studied her a moment longer, then jerked her head toward the inner chamber. "'In with you.' Min's leap to obey would have satisfied the hardest taskmistress. The Armelin seat's study had been occupied by many grand and powerful women over the centuries, and reminders of the fact filled the room from the tall fireplace, all of golden marble from Candor, 
cold now, to the panelled walls of pale, oddly striped wood, iron-hard yet carved in wondrous beasts and wildly feathered birds. Those panels had been brought from the mysterious lands beyond the Aeel Waste well over a thousand years ago, and the fireplace was more than twice as old. The polished redstone of the floor had come from the mountains of mist. High arched windows led onto a balcony. The iridescent stone framing the windows shone like pearls, and had been salvaged from the remains of a city sunk into the sea of storms by the breaking of the world. No one had ever seen its like. The current occupant, Swan Sanche, had been born a fisherman's daughter in Tyr, though, and the furnishings she had chosen were simple, if well made and well polished. She sat in a stout chair behind a large table plain enough to have served a farmhouse. The only other chair in the room, just as plain and usually set off to one side, now stood in front of the table atop a small Tyrian rug, simple in blue and brown and gold. Half a dozen books rested open on tall reading stands about the floor. That was all of it. A drawing hung above the fireplace, tiny fishing boats working among reeds in the fingers of the dragon, just as her father's boat had. At first glance, despite her smooth eyes set eye features, Swan Sanche herself looked as simple as her furnishings. She herself was sturdy, and handsome rather than beautiful, and the only bit of ostentation in her clothing was the broad stole of the armelin seat she wore, with one coloured stripe for each of the seven ajas. Her age was indeterminate, as with any eyes, said I. Not even a hint of grey showed in her dark hair. But her sharp blue eyes brooked no nonsense, and her firm jaw spoke of the determination of the youngest woman ever to be chosen, armelin seat. For over ten years Swan Sanche had been able to summon rulers and the powerful, and they had come, even if they hated the White Tower and feared Eyes Sedai. As the Armelin strode around in front of the table, Min set down her bundle and began an awkward curtsy, muttering irritably under her breath at having to do so. Not that she wanted to be disrespectful. That did not even occur to one facing a woman like Swan Sanche but the bow she usually would have made seemed foolish in a dress, and she had only a rough idea of how to curtsy. Halfway down, with her skirts already spread, she froze like a crouching toad. Swan Sanche was standing there as regal as any queen, and for a moment she was also lying on the floor naked. Aside from her being in only her skin, there was something odd about the image, but it vanished before Min could say what. It was as strong a viewing as she had ever seen, and she had no idea what it meant. "'Seeing things again, are you?' the Armelin said. "'Well, I can certainly make use of that ability of yours. I could have used it all the months you were gone, but we'll not talk of that. What's done is done. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills.' She smiled a tight smile. But if you do it again, I'll have your hide for gloves. Stand up, girl. Liana forces enough ceremony on me in a month to last any sensible woman a year. I don't have time for it, not these days. Now, what did you just see? Min straightened slowly. It was a relief to be back with someone who knew of her talent, even if it was the Amarlin seat herself. She did not have to hide what she saw from the Amarlin. Far from it. You are... You aren't wearing any clothes. I... I don't know what it means, Mother. Swan barked a short, mirthless laugh. No doubt that'll take a lover. But I have no time for that either. There's no time for winking at the men when you're busy bailing the boat. Maybe, Min said slowly. It could have meant that, though she doubted it. I just do not know. But, Mother, I've been seeing things ever since I walked into the tower. Something bad is going to happen, something terrible. She started with the eyes said I in the entry hall, and told everything she had seen, as well as what everything meant, when she was sure. She held back what Gawain had said, though, or most of it. It was no use telling him not to anger the Armelin if she did it for him. The rest she laid out as starkly as she had seen it. Some of her fear came out as she dredged it all up, seeing it all again. Her voice shook before she was done. The Armelin's expression never changed. So you spoke with young Garwin, she said when Min finished. 
Well, I think I can convince him to keep quiet. And if I remember Sarah correctly, the girl could do with some time working in the country. She'll spread no gossip hoeing a vegetable patch. I don't understand, Min said. Why should Garwin keep quiet? About what? I told him nothing. And Sarah? Mother, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. Eyes, Sedai, and Waters are going to die. It has to mean a battle. And unless you send a lot of eyes, Sedai, and Waters off somewhere, and servants too, I saw servants dead and injured too, unless you do that, the battle will be here, in Tarvalin. Did you see that? the Amalin demanded. A battle? Do you know with your... your talent, or are you guessing? What else could it be? At least four eyes, Sedai, are as good as dead. Mother, I've only laid eyes on nine of you since coming back, and four are going to die. And the waters... What else could it be? More things than I like to think of, Swan said grimly. When? How long before this thing occurs. Min shook her head. I do not know. Most of it will happen in the space of a day, maybe two, but that could be tomorrow or a year from now, or ten. Let us pray for ten. If it comes tomorrow, there isn't much I can do to stop it. Min grimaced. Only two, I said I, besides Swan Sanche, knew of what she could do, Moiraine and Verin Mothwin, who had tried to study her talent. None of them knew how it worked any more than she did, except that it had nothing to do with the power. Perhaps that was why only Moiraine seemed able to accept the fact that when she knew what a viewing meant, it happened. Maybe it's the White Cloaks, Mother. They were everywhere in Alindir when I crossed the bridge. She did not believe that Children of the Light had anything to do with what was coming, but she was reluctant to say what she believed. Believed, not knew. Yet that was bad enough. But the Armalin had begun shaking her head before she finished. They would try something if they could, I've no doubt. They would love to strike at the tower, but Eamon Valda won't move openly without orders from the Lord Captain Commander. And Pedron Nile will not strike unless he thinks we're injured. He knows our strength too well to be foolish. For a thousand years the White Cloaks have been like that. Silver pike in the reeds, waiting for a hint of eyes, said I, blood in the water. But we've showed them none yet, nor will we if I can help it. Yet if Valda did try something on his own, Swan cut her off. He has no more than five hundred men close to Tarval and girl. He sent the rest away weeks ago to cause trouble elsewhere. The shining walls held off the Aiel, and Arthur Hawkwing too. Valda will never break into Tarvalan unless the city is already falling apart from the inside. Her voice did not change as she went on. You very much want me to believe the trouble will come from the White Cloaks. Why? There was no gentleness in her eyes. Because I want to believe it, Min muttered. She licked her lips and spoke the words she did not want to say. The silver collar I saw on that one eyes, said I. Mother, it looked, it looked like one of the collars that the Sean Chan used to to control women who can channel. Her voice dwindled as Swan's mouth twisted with distaste. Filthy things, the Armalin growled. As well, most people don't believe a quarter of what they hear about the Shan Chan. But there's more chance of it being the White Cloaks. If the Shan Chan land again anywhere, I will know it in days by pigeon, and it is a long way from the sea to Tarvalin. If they do reappear, I will have plenty of warning. No, I fear what you see is something far worse than the Shan Chan. I fear it can only be the Black Aja. Only a handful of us know about them, and I don't relish what will happen when the knowledge becomes common, but they are the greatest immediate threat to the tower. Min realized she was clutching her skirt so hard that her hands hurt. Her mouth was dry as dust. The White Tower had always coldly denied the existence of a hidden Aja, dedicated to the Dark One. The surest way to anger an eyes, said I, was merely to mention such a thing. For the Armorlin seat herself, to give the Black Aja reality so casually, made Min's spine turn to ice. 
As if she had said nothing out of the ordinary, the Armalin went on. But you didn't come all this way just to do your viewings. What word from Moiraine? I know everything from Arad Doman to Tarabin is in chaos, to say the least. That was saying the least indeed. Men supporting the dragon reborn were fighting those opposing him, and had turned both countries to civil war while they still fought each other for control of Almuth Plain. Swan's tone dismissed all that as a detail. But I've heard nothing of Randolph Orr for months. He is the focus of everything. Where is he? What does Moiraine have him doing? Sit, girl, sit. She gestured to the chair in front of the table. Min approached the chair on wobbly legs and half fell into it. The black archer! Oh, light! I said I was supposed to stand for the light. Even if she did not really trust them, there was always that. Eyes, said I, and all the power of the eyes, said I, stood for the light and against the shadow. Only now it was not true any longer. She hardly heard herself say, He's on his way to Tyr. Tyr? It's Colondor, then. Moiraine means him to take the sword that cannot be touched out of the stone of Tyr. I swear I'll hang her in the sun to dry. I will make her wish she were a novice again. He cannot be ready for that yet. It was not— Min stopped to clear her throat. It was not Moiraine's doing. Rand left in the middle of the night by himself. The others followed, and Moiraine sent me to tell you. They could be in Tyr by now. For all I know, he could have Colondor by now. Burn him, Swan barked. By now he could be dead. I wish he had never heard a word of the prophecies of the dragon. If I could keep him from hearing another, I would. But doesn't he have to fulfill the prophecies? I don't understand. The Armalan leaned back against her table wearily. As though anyone even understands most of them. The prophecies aren't what makes him the dragon reborn. All that takes is for him to admit it and he must have if he is going for Colondor. The prophecies are meant to announce to the world who he is, to prepare him for what is coming, to prepare the world for it. If Moiraine can keep some control over him, she will guide him to the prophecies we can be sure of, when he is ready to face them. And for the rest we trust that what he does is enough. We hope. For all I know, he has already fulfilled prophecies none of us understands. The light send, it's enough. So you do mean to control him? He said you'd try to use him, but this is the first I've heard you admit it. Min felt cold inside. Angry, she added, You haven't done such a good job of it so far, you and Moiraine. Swan's tiredness seemed to slide from her shoulders. She straightened and stood looking down at Min. You had best hope we can. Did you think we could just let him run about loose, headstrong and stubborn, untrained, unprepared, maybe going mad already? Do you think we could trust to the pattern, to his destiny, to keep him alive like some story? This isn't a story. He isn't some invincible hero, and if his thread is snipped out of the pattern, the wheel of time won't notice his going, and the Creator will produce no miracles to save us. If Moiraine cannot reef his sails, he very well may get himself killed, and where are we then? Where is the world? The Dark One's prison is failing. He will touch the world again. It is only a matter of time. If Randolph Orr is not there to face him in the last battle, if the headstrong young fool gets himself killed first, the world is doomed. The war of the power all over again, with no Luz Theron and his hundred companions. Then fire and shadow forever. She stopped suddenly, peering at Min's face. So that's the way the wind sets, is it? You and Rand. I did not expect this. Min shook her head vigorously, felt her cheeks coloring. Of course not. I was... It's the last battle, and the dark one... Light, just thinking about the dark one loose ought to be enough to freeze a warder's marrow. And the black Aja. Don't try to dissemble, the Amalin said sharply. Do you think this is the first time I ever saw a woman afraid for her man's life? You might as well admit it. 
Nin squirmed on her chair. Swan's eyes dug at her, knowing and impatient. All right, she muttered finally. I'll tell you all of it, and much good it does either of us. The first time I ever saw Rand, I saw three women's faces, and one of them was mine. I've never seen anything about myself before or since, but I knew what it meant. I was going to fall in love with him. All three of us were. Three. The other two, who are they? Min gave her a bitter smile. The faces were blurred. I don't know who they are. Nothing to say that he would love you in return? Nothing. He has never looked at me twice. I think he sees me as... as a sister. So don't think you can use me as a leash on him, because it will not work. Yet you do love him. I don't have any choice. Min tried to make her voice less sullen. I tried treating it as a joke, but I can't laugh any more. You may not believe me, but when I know what it means, it happens. The Armalin tapped a finger against her lips and looked at Min consideringly. That look worried Min. She had not meant to make such a show of herself, nor to tell as much as she had. She had not told everything, but she knew she should have learned by now not to give an eyes sedai a lever, even if she did not see how it could be used. Eyes sedai were skilled at finding ways. Mother, I've delivered Moraine's message, and I've told everything I know of what my viewings meant. There's no reason now I can't put on my own clothes and go. Go where? Here, after talking with Gawain, trying to make sure he did not do something foolish. She wished she dared ask where Egwain and the other two were, but if the Armalin would not tell Elaine's brother, there was small chance she would tell Min. And Swan Sanche still had that weighing look in her eyes. Oh, wherever Rand is, I may be a fool, but I'm not the first woman to be a fool over a man. The first to be a fool over the dragon reborn. It will be dangerous being close to Randall Thor once the world finds out who he is, what he is. And if he now wields Colindor, the world will learn soon enough. Half will want to kill him anyway, as if by killing him they can stop the last battle, stop the Dark One from breaking prey. A good many will die close to him. It might be better for you to stay here. The Amelin sounded sympathetic. But Min did not believe it. She did not believe Swan Sanche was capable of sympathy. I'll take the risk. Maybe I can help him. With what I see. It isn't even as if the tower would be that much safer, not so long as there is one red sister here. They'll see a man who can channel and forget the last battle and the prophecies of the dragon. So will many others, Swan broke in calmly. Old ways of thinking are hard to shed. For eyes, said I, as for anyone else. Min gave her a puzzled look. She seemed to be taking Min's side of the thing now. It is no secret I am friends with Egwene and Nynaeve, and no secret they are from the same village as Rand. For the Red Aja, that will be connection enough. When the Tower finds out what he is, I would probably be arrested before the day is out. So will Egwene and Nynaeve, if you don't have them hidden away somewhere. Then you mustn't be recognized. You catch no fish if they see the net. I suggest you forget your coat and breeches for a time. The Armalin smiled like a cat smiling at a mouse. What fish do you expect to catch with me? Min asked in a faint voice. She thought she knew and hoped desperately she was wrong. Her hope did not stop the Armalin from saying, The Black Odger. Thirteen of them fled, but I fear some remain. I cannot be sure who I can trust. For a while I was afraid to trust anyone. You are no dark friend, I know, and your particular talent may just be some help. At the very least, you'll be another trustworthy pair of eyes. You've been planning this since I walked in, haven't you? That's why you want to keep Gawain and Sarah quiet. Anger built up inside men like steam in a kettle. The woman said frog and expected people to jump. That they usually did just made it worse. She was no frog, no dancing puppet. Is this what you did to Egwene and Elaine and Nynaeve? 
send them off after the black archer? I wouldn't put it past you. You tend your own nets, child, and let those girls tend theirs. As far as you are concerned, they are working penance on a farm. Do I make myself plain? That unwavering stare made Min shift on her chair. It was easy to defy the Armalin until she started staring at you with those sharp, cold blue eyes. Yes, mother. The meekness of her reply rankled, but a glance at the Armalin convinced her to let it lie. She plucked at the fine wool of her dress. I suppose it won't kill me to wear this a little longer. Suddenly Swan looked amused. Min felt her hackles rising. I fear that won't be enough. Min in a dress is still Min in a dress to anyone who looks close. You cannot always wear a cloak with a hood up. No, you must change everything that can be changed. For one thing, you will continue to go by Elmindreda. It is your name, after all. Min winced. Your hair is almost as long as Liana's, long enough to put in curls. For the rest... I never had any use for rouge and powder and paints, but Liana remembers the use of them. Min's eyes had grown wider by the word since the mention of curls. Oh, no, she gasped. No one will take you for Min who wears breeches once Liana makes you into a perfect Elmindreda. Oh, no. As to why you are staying in the tower... A reason suitable for a fluttery young woman who looks and acts nothing at all like Min? The Armalin frowned thoughtfully, ignoring Min's efforts to break in. Yes, I will let it be put about that Mistress Elmindreda managed to encourage two suitors to the point that she has to take shelter from them in the tower until she can decide between them. A few women still claim sanctuary each year, and sometimes for reasons as silly. Her face hardened and her eyes sharpened. If you're still thinking of Tyr, think again. Consider whether you can be of more help to Rand there or here. If the Black Arja brings the tower down, or worse, gains control, he loses even the little help I can give. So, are you a woman or a lovesick girl? Trapped. Men could see it as plainly as a shackle on her leg. Do you always get your way with people, mother? The Armalin's smile was even colder this time. Usually, child. Usually. Shifting her red-fringed shawl, Elida stared thoughtfully at the door to the Armalin study, through which the two young women had just vanished. The novice came back out almost immediately, took one look at Elida's face, and bleated like a frightened sheep. Elida thought she recognized her, though she could not bring the girl's name to mind. She had more important uses for her time than teaching wretched children. Your name? Sarah, Elida, said I. The girl's reply was a breathless squeak. Elida might have no interest in novices, but the novices knew her and her reputation. She remembered the girl now, a daydreamer with moderate ability who would never be of any real power. It was doubtful she knew anything more than Elida had already seen and heard, or remembered much more than Garwin's smile, for that matter. A fool. Elida flicked a dismissive hand. The girl dropped a curtsy so deep her face almost touched the floor tiles, then fled at a dead run. Elida did not see her go. The red sister had turned away, already forgetting the novice. As she swept down the corridor, not a line marred her smooth features, but her thoughts boiled furiously. She did not even notice the servants, the novices and accepted, who scrambled out of her way, curtsying as she passed. Once she almost walked over a brown sister with her nose in a sheaf of notes. The plump brown jumped back with a startled squawk that Elida did not hear. Dress or no dress? She knew the young woman who had gone in to see the Armalin. Min, who had spent so much time with the Armalin on her first visit to the tower, though for no reason anyone knew. Min, who were such close friends with Elaine, Egwene, and Nynaeve. The Armalin was hiding the whereabouts of those three. Elida was sure of it. 
All reports that they were serving penance on a farm had come at third or fourth hand from Swan Sanche, more than enough distance to hide any twisting of words to avoid an outright lie. Not to mention the fact that all Elida's considerable efforts to find this farm had yielded nothing. The light burn her! For a moment open anger painted her face. She was not sure whether she meant Swan Sanche or the daughter heir. Either would serve. A slender accepted heard her, glanced at her face, and went as white as her own dress. Elida strode by without seeing her. Apart from everything else, it infuriated her that she could not find Elaine. Elida had the foretelling, sometimes, the ability to foresee future events. If it came seldom and faintly, that was still more than any eyes Sadai had had since Guitara Moroso, dead now twenty years. The very first thing Elida had ever foretold, while still an accepted, and had known enough even then to keep to herself, was that the royal line of Andor would be the key to defeating the Dark One in the last battle. She had attached herself to Morgaze as soon as it was clear Morgaze would succeed to the throne, had built her influence year by patient year. And now, all her effort, all her sacrifice, she might have been Amarlin herself had she not concentrated all her energies on Andor, might be for naught because Elaine had disappeared. With an effort she forced her thoughts back to what was important now. Egwene and Nynaeve came from the same village as that strange young man, Randolph Thor, and men knew him as well, however much she had tried to hide the fact. Randolph Thor lay at the heart of it. Elida had only seen him once, supposedly a shepherd from the two rivers in Andor, but looking every inch the Aeelman. The foretelling had come to her at the sight of him. He was Tavirian, one of those rare individuals who, instead of being woven into the pattern as the wheel of time chose, forced the pattern to shape itself around them, for a time at least. And Elida had seen chaos swirling around him, division and strife for Andor, perhaps for even more of the world. But Andor must be kept whole, whatever else happened. That first foretelling had convinced her of that. There were more threads, enough to snare Swan in her own web. If the rumors were to be believed, there were three Tavirin, not just one. All three from the same village, this Eamon's field, and all three near the same age, odd enough to occasion a good deal of talk in the tower. And on Swan's journey to Shinar, near a year ago now, she had seen them, even talked with them. Randolph Orr, Perrin Abara, Matrim Corthon. It was said to be mere happenstance, just fortuitous chance. So it was said. Those who said it did not know what Elida knew. When Elida saw the young Althor man, it had been Moiraine who spirited him away, Moiraine who had accompanied him, and the other two Tavirin in Shinar. Moiraine Domadred who had been Swan Sanche's closest friend when they were novices together. Had Elida been one to make wagers, she would have wagered that no one else in the tower remembered that friendship. On the day they were raised Aes Sedai, at the end of the Aeel War, Swan and Moiraine had walked away from one another and afterward behaved almost like strangers. But Elida had been one of the accepted over those two novices, had taught their lessons and chastised them for slacking at chores, and she remembered. She could hardly believe that their plot could stretch back so far. All four could not have been born much before that. Yet it was the last link to tie them all together. For her it was enough. Whatever Swan was up to, she had to be stopped. Turmoil and chaos multiplied on every side. The Dark One was sure to break free. The very thought made Elida shiver and wrap her shawl around her more tightly, and the Tower had to be aloof from mundane struggles to face that. The Tower had to be free to pull the strings to make the nation stand together, free of the troubles Randolph Four would bring. Somehow he had to be stopped. 
from destroying Andor. She had told no one what she knew of Althor. She meant to deal with him quietly, if possible. The hall of the tower already spoke of watching, even guiding, these Tavirin. They would never agree to dispose of them, of the one in particular, as he must be disposed of, for the good of the tower, for the good of the world. She made a sound in her throat close to a growl. Swan had always been headstrong, even as a novice, had always thought much of herself for a poor fisherman's daughter. But how could she be fool enough to mix the tower in this without telling the hall? She knew what was coming as well as anyone. The only way it could be worse was if— Abruptly Elida stopped, staring at nothing. Could it be that this Althor could channel— or one of the others. Most likely it would be Althor. No, surely not. Not even Swan would touch one of those. She could not. Who knows what that woman could do, she muttered. She was never fit to be the Omerlin seat. The talking to yourself, Elida? I know you Reds never have friends outside your own Aja, but surely you have friends to talk to inside it. Elida turned her head to regard all the Arin. The swan-necked eyes and eyes stared back with the insufferable coolness that was a hallmark of the white Aja. There was no love lost between a Red and White. They had stood on opposite sides in the hall of a tower for a thousand years. White stood with blue, and Swan had been a blue. But whites prided themselves on dispassionate logic. Walk with me, Elida said. Alviarin hesitated before falling in beside her. At first the white sister arched a disparaging eyebrow at what Elida had to say concerning Swan. But before the end she was frowning in concentration. You have no proof of anything improper, she said when Elida finally fell silent. Not yet. Elida said firmly. She permitted herself a tight smile when Alviarin nodded. It was a beginning. One way or another, Swan would be stopped before she could destroy the tower. Well hidden in a stand of tall leather leaf above the north bank of the river Tarin, Dayan Bornhald tossed back his white cloak with its flaring golden sun on the breast, and raised the stiff leather tube of a looking-glass to his eye. A cloud of tiny bite-mees buzzed around his face, but he ignored them. In the village of Torren Ferry, across the river, tall stone houses stood on high foundations against the floods that came every spring. Villagers hung out of windows or waited on stoops to stare at the thirty white-cloaked riders sitting their horses in burnished plate and mail. A delegation of village men and women were meeting with a horseman. Rather, they were listening to Jarrett Byar, from what Bornhald could see, which was much the best. Bornhald could almost hear his father's voice. Let them think there is a chance, and some fool will try to take it. Then there's killing to do, and another fool will try to avenge the first, so there's more killing. Put the fear of the light into them from the first. Let them know no one will be harmed if they do as they're told, and you'll have no trouble. His jaw tightened at the thought of his father, dead now. He was going to do something about that, and soon. He was sure only Bayar knew why he had leaped to accept this command, aimed at an all-but-forgotten district in the hinterlands of Andor, and Bayar would hold his tongue. Bayar had been as dedicated to Dayan's father as a hound, and he had transferred all that loyalty to Dayan. Bornhald had had no hesitation in naming Bayar second under him when Eamon Valda gave him the command. Bayar turned his horse and rode back onto the ferry. Immediately the ferryman cast off and began hauling the barge across by means of a heavy rope slung over the swiftly flowing water. Bayar glanced at the men at the rope. They eyed him nervously as they tramped the length of the barge, then trotted back to take up the cable again. It all looked good. Lord Bornhold. Bornhold lowered the looking-glass and turned his head. The hard-faced man who had appeared at his shoulder stood rigid, 
staring straight ahead from under a conical helmet. Even after the hard journey from Tarvalin, and Bornhald had pressed every mile, his armor shone as brightly as his snowy cloak with its golden sunburst. Yes, child, even. Hundredman Faran sent me, my lord. It's the Tinkers. Ordeeth was talking to three of them, my lord, and now none of the three can be found. Blood and ashes! Bornhalt spun on his boot heel and strode back into the trees, even at his heels. Out of sight of the river, white-cloaked horsemen clogged the spaces between leather leaves and pines, lances held with casual familiarity, or bows laid across their pommels. The horses stamped their hooves impatiently and flicked their tails. The riders waited more stolidly. This would not be their first river crossing into strange territory, and this time no one would be trying to stop them. In a large clearing beyond the mounted men stood a caravan of the Tuatha'an, the traveling people, tinkers. Nearly a hundred horse-drawn wagons, like small boxy houses on wheels, made an eye-jarring blend of colors, red and green and yellow, and every hue imaginable in combinations only a tinker's eye could like. The people themselves wore clothes that made their wagons look dull. They sat on the ground in a large cluster, eyeing the mounted men with an oddly calm unease. The thin crying of a child was swiftly comforted by its mother. Nearby, dead mastiffs made a mound already buzzing with flies. Tinkers would not raise a hand even to defend themselves, and the dogs had been mostly show, but Bornhald had not been willing to take a chance. Six men were all he had thought necessary to watch Tinkers. Even with stiff faces they looked embarrassed. None glanced at the seventh man, sitting a horse near the wagons, a bony little man with a big nose, and a dark gray coat that looked too big for him, despite the fineness of its cut. Farron, a bearded boulder of a man, yet light on his feet for all his height and width, stood glaring at all seven equally. The hundred men pressed a gauntleted hand to his heart in salute, but left all talking to Bornhald. A word with you, Master Ordeeth, Bornhald said quietly. The bony man cocked his head, looking at Bornhald for a long moment before dismounting. Farron growled, but Bornhald kept his voice low. Three of the tinkers cannot be found, Master Ordeeth. Did you perhaps put your own suggestion into practice? The first words out of Ordeeth's mouth when he saw the tinkers had been, Kill them. They're of no use. Bornhald had killed his share of men, but he had never matched the casualness with which the little man had spoken. Ordeeth rubbed a finger along the side of his large nose. Now why would I be killing them? And after you ripped me so, for just suggesting it? His Lugarder accent was heavy today. It came and went without him seeming to notice another thing about the man that disturbed Bornhold. Then you allowed them to escape, yes? Well, as to that, I did take a few of them off where I could see what they knew. Undisturbed, you see. What they knew? What under the light could tinkers know of use to us? There's no way of telling until you ask now, is there? Ordeeth said. I didn't hurt any of them much, and I told them to get themselves back to the wagons. Who would be thinking they'd have the nerve to run away with so many of your men about? Bornhald realized he was grinding his teeth. His orders had been to make the best time possible to meet this odd fellow who would have more orders for him. Bornhard liked none of it, though both sets of orders bore the seal and signature of Pedro Nile, Lord Captain Commander of the Children of the Light. Too much had been left unsaid, including Ordeeth's exact status. The little man was there to advise Bornhald, and Bornhald was to cooperate with Ordeeth. Whether Ordeeth was under his command had been left vague, and he did not like the strong implication that he should heed the fellow's advice. Even the reason for sending so many of the children into this backwater had been vague. To root out dark friends, of course, and spread the light, that went without saying. But close to half a legion on Andoran soil without permission, the order risked much if word of it reached the Queen in Camelin. Too much to be balanced by the few answers Bornhald had been given. It all came back to Ordeeth. Bornhald did not understand how the Lord Captain Commander could trust this man, with his sly grins and his black moods and his haughty stares, so you could never be sure what kind of man you were talking to, not to mention his accent changing in the middle of a sentence. The fifty children who had accompanied Ordeeth were as sullen and frowning a lot as Bornhald had ever seen. 
He thought Ordeef must have picked them himself to have so many sour scowls, and it said something of the man that he would choose that sort. Even his name, Ordeef, meant wormwood in the old tongue. Still, Bornhold had his own reasons for wanting to be where he was. He would cooperate with a man since he had to, but only as much as he had to. Master Ordeeth, he said in a carefully level tone, this ferry is the only way in or out of the Two Rivers district. That was not quite the truth. According to the map he had, there was no way across the Tarin except here, and the upper reaches of the Manetherindrel, bordering the region on the south, had no fords. To the east lay bogs and swamps. Even so, there must be a way out westward across the mountains of mist, though his map stopped at the edge of the range. At best, however, it would be a hard crossing that many of his men might not survive, and he did not intend to let Ordeeth know of even that small chance. When it is time to leave, if I find Andoran soldiers holding this bank, you will ride with the first to cross. You will find it interesting to see at close hand the difficulty of forcing a way across a river this wide, yes? This is your first command, is it not? Ordeeth's voice held a hint of mockery. This may be part of Andor on the map, but Camelin has not sent a tax collector this far west in generations. Even if those three talk, who will believe three tinkers? If you think the danger is too great, remember whose seal is on your orders. Ferran glanced at Bornhold, half reached for his sword. Bornhold shook his head slightly, and Ferran let his hand fall. I mean to cross the river, Master Ordeeth. I will cross if the next word I hear is that Garth Bryn and the Queen's guards will be here by sundown. Of course, Ordeeth said, suddenly soothing. There will be as much glory here as at Tarvalon, I assure you. His deep, dark eyes took a glazed look, stared at something in the distance. There are things in Tarvalon I want, too. Bornhold shook his head, and I must cooperate with him. Jarrett Bayar drew up and swung down from his saddle beside Faran. As tall as the hundred men, Bayar was a long-faced man with dark, deep-set eyes. He looked as if every ounce of fat had been boiled off of him. The village is secured, my lord. Lucellan is making certain no one slips off. They nearly soiled themselves when I mentioned dark friends. Not in their village, they say. The folk further south are the dark friend kind, though, they say. Further south is it, Bornhold said briskly. We shall see. Put three hundreds across the river, Bayar. Perron's first. The rest to follow after the tinkers cross, and make sure no more of them get away, yes? We will scour the two rivers, Wadith broke in. His narrow face was twisted. Saliva bubbled at his lips. We will flog them and flay them and sear their souls. I promised him. He'll come to me now. He will come. Bornhold nodded for Bayar and Ferran to carry out his commands. A madman, he thought. The Lord Captain Commander has tied me to a madman. But at least I will find my path to Perrin of the Two Rivers. Whatever it takes, I will avenge my father. From a colonnaded terrace on a hilltop, the High Lady Suroth looked across the wide, lopsided bowl of Cantoran Harbor. The shaven sides of her scalp left a wide crest of black hair that fell down her back. Her hands rested lightly on a smooth stone balustrade as white as her pristine gown, with its hundreds of pleats. There was a faint rhythmic clicking as she unconsciously drummed her fingers with her inch-long nails, the first two on each hand lacquered blue. A slight breeze blew off of the Arith Ocean, carrying more than a hint of salt in its coolness. Two young women, kneeling against the wall behind the High Lady, held white-plumed fans ready if the breeze should fail. Two more women and four young men completed the line of crouching figures waiting to serve. Barefoot, all eight wore sheer robes to please the High Lady's aesthetic senses with the clean lines of their limbs and the grace of their motions. At the moment, Suroth truly did not see the servants, no more than one saw furniture. 
She saw the six death watch guards at either end of the colonnade, though, stiff as statues with their black tasseled spears and black laggard shields. They symbolized her triumph and her danger. The death watch guard served only the empress and her chosen representatives, and they would kill or die with equal fervor, whichever was necessary. There was a saying, on the heights, the paths are paved with daggers. Her fingernails clicked on the stone balustrade. How thin was the razor's edge she walked? Vessels of the Atha'an Mier, the sea folk, filled the inner harbor behind the sea wall, even the largest looking too narrow for their length. Cut rigging made their yards and booms slant at crazy angles. Their decks were empty, their crews ashore and under guard, as were any in these islands who had the skill to sail the open sea. Great bluff-bowed Shan Chan ships by the score lay in the outer harbor and anchored off the harbor mouth. One, its ribbed sails bellied with wind, escorted a swarm of small fishing boats back toward the island port. If the smaller craft scattered, some of them might escape, but the Shan Chan ship carried a Damani, and one demonstration of a Damani's power had quelled any such thoughts. The charred, shattered hulk of the Sea Folk ship still lay on a mud flat near the harbor mouth. How long she would manage to keep the Sea Folk elsewhere, and the accursed mainlanders, from learning that she held these islands, Suroth did not know. It will be long enough, she told herself. It must be long enough. She had worked something of a miracle in rallying most of the Shan Chan forces after the debacle the High Lord Turok had led them to. All but a handful of the vessels that had escaped from Faume lay under her control, and no one questioned her right to command the Hylina, the forerunners. If her miracle held, no one on the mainland suspected they were here. Waiting to take back the lands the Empress had sent them to reclaim, waiting to achieve the Corina, the return. Her agents already scouted the way. There would be no need to return to the court of the Nine Moons and apologize to the Empress for a failure not even hers. The thought of having to apologize to the Empress sent a tremor through her. Such an apology was always humiliating and usually painful, but what made her shiver was the chance of being denied death at the end, of being forced to continue as if nothing had occurred, while everyone, common as well as the blood, knew her degradation. A handsome young serving man sprang to her side, bearing a pale green robe worked in brilliantly plumaged birds of delight. She held her arms out for the garment and noticed him no more than a clod of dirt beside her velvet slipper. To escape that apology, she must retake what had been lost a thousand years ago, and to do that she must deal with this man who, her mainland agents told her, claimed to be the Dragon Reborn. If I cannot find a way to deal with him, the displeasure of the Empress will be the least of my worries. Turning smoothly, she entered the long room fronting the terrace, its outer wall, all doors and tall windows to catch the breezes. The pale wood of the walls, smooth and glistening like satin, pleased Soroth, but she had removed the furnishings of the old owner, the former Atha'an Mier, governor of Cantorin, and replaced them with a few tall screens, most painted with birds or flowers. Two were different. One showed a great spotted cat of the Senchore, as large as a pony. The other a black mountain eagle, crest erect like a pale crown and snowy-tipped wings spread to their full seven feet. Such screens were considered vulgar, but Suroth liked animals. Unable to bring her menagerie with her across the Arith Ocean, she had had the screens made to depict her two favorites. She had never taken kindly to being balked in anything. Three women awaited her as she had left them, two kneeling, one lying prostrate on the bare, polished floor, patterned in inlays of light and dark wood. The kneeling women wore the dark blue dresses of Soldam, red panels embroidered with forked silver lightning on the breast and on the sides of their skirts. One of the two... Alwyn, a sharp-faced, blue-eyed woman with a perpetual glower, had the left side of her head shaved. The rest of her hair hung to her shoulder in a light brown braid. Suroth's mouth tightened momentarily at the sight of Alwyn. No Soldam had ever before been raised to the Sojin, the hereditary upper servants of the blood, much less to a voice of the blood. 
Yet there have been reasons in Alwyn's case. Alwyn knew too much. Still, it was to the woman lying face down, all in plain dark grey, that Suroth directed her attention. A wide collar of silvery metal encircled the woman's neck, connected by a shining leash to a bracelet of the same material on the wrist of the second soul dime, Taisa. By means of leash and collar, the Adam, Taisa could control the great clad woman. And she had to be controlled. She was Damani, a woman who could channel and thus too dangerous to be allowed to run loose. Memories of the armies of the night were still strong in Shan Chan a thousand years after their destruction. Sir Roth's eyes flickered uneasily to the two Soldam. She no longer trusted any Soldam, and yet she had no choice but to trust them. No one else could control the Damani, and without the Damani, the very concept was unthinkable. The power of Shan Chan, the very power of the Crystal Throne, was built on controlled Damani. There were too many things about which Suroth had no choice to suit her, such as Alwyn, who watched as if she had been so Jin all of her life. No, as if she were of the blood itself and knelt because she chose to. Pura. The Damani had another name when she was one of the hated Ais Sedai before falling into Shan Chan hands, but Suroth neither knew what it had been, nor cared. The grey-clad woman tensed, but did not raise her head. Her training had been particularly harsh. I will ask again, Pura, how does the White Tower control this man who calls himself the Dragon Reborn? The Damani moved her head a fraction, enough to shoot a frightened look at Taisa. If her answer was displeasing, the Soldam could make her feel pain without raising a finger by means of the Adam. The Tower would not try to control a false dragon, High Lady, Pura said breathily. They would capture him and gentle him. Taisa looked an indignant question at the High Lady. The answer had avoided Suroth's query, and perhaps even implied that one of the blood had spoken untruth. Suroth gave a slight shake of her head, the merest sideways motion. She had no wish to wait while the Damani recovered from punishment, and Taisa bowed her head in acquiescence. Once again, Puram, what do you know of Eyes Sedai? Suroth's mouth twisted at being defiled with that name. Alwyn gave a grunt of distaste. Eyes Sedai, aiding this man? I warn you, our soldiers fought women of the tower, women channeling the power, at Falme. So do not attempt to deny it. Pura, Pura does not know, my lady. There was urgency in the Damani's voice and uncertainty. She darted another wide-eyed glance at Taisa. It was clear that she wanted desperately to be believed. Perhaps, perhaps the Amerlin or the Hall of the Tower. No, they would not. Pura does not know, my lady. The man can channel, Sir Roth said curtly. The woman on the floor moaned, though she had heard the same words from Suroth before. Saying it again made Suroth's stomach knot, but she allowed nothing to show in her face. Little of what had happened at Falme had been the work of women channeling. Damani could sense that, and the Soldam wearing the bracelet always knew what her Damani felt. That meant it had to have been the work of the man. It also meant he was incredibly powerful. So powerful that Suroth had once or twice found herself wondering, growing queasy, whether he might really be the dragon reborn. That cannot be, she told herself firmly. In any case, it made no difference to her plans. It is impossible to believe that even the White Tower would allow such a man to walk free. How do they control him? The Damani lay there silently, face to the floor, shoulders shaking, weeping. Answer the High Lady, Thaisa said sharply. Taisa did not move, but Pura gasped, flinching as if struck across the hips, a blow delivered through the Adam. But Pura does not know. The Damani stretched out a hesitant hand, as though to touch Suroth's foot. Please, Pura has learned to obey. Pura speaks only the truth. Please do not punish Pura. Suroth stepped back smoothly, letting none of her irritation show. That she should be forced to move by a Damani that she could almost be touched by one who could channel. 
She felt a need to bathe, as if the touch had actually landed. Thaisa's dark eyes bulged in outrage at the Damani's effrontery. Her cheeks were scarlet with shame that this should happen while she wore the woman's bracelet. She seemed torn between prostrating herself beside the Damani to beg forgiveness and punishing the woman then and there. Alwyn stared a thin-lipped contempt, every line of her face saying that such things did not happen when she wore a bracelet. Suroth raised one finger a fraction, making a small gesture every Sojin knew from childhood, a simple dismissal. Alwyn hesitated before interpreting it, then tried to cover her slip by rounding harshly on Thaisa. Take this creature from the presence of the High Lady Suroth, and when you have punished her, go to Sorella and tell her that you control your charges as if you had never worn the bracelet before. Tell her that you are to be... Surath shut Alwyn's voice from her mind. None of that had been her command except the dismissal, but quarrels between Soldam were beneath her notice. She wished she knew whether Pura was managing to hide something. Her agents reported claims that the women of the White Tower could not lie. It had not been possible to force Pura to tell even a simple lie, to say that a white scarf was black, yet that was not enough to be conclusive. Some might accept the tears of the Damani, her protests of inability, whatever the soul dam did, but none who did would have risen to lead the return. Pura might have some reservoir of will left, might be clever enough to try using the belief that she was incapable of lying. None of the women collared on the mainland were fully obedient, trustworthy, not like the Damani brought from Shan Chan. None of them truly accepted what they were, as Sean Chan Damani did. Who could say what secrets might hide in one who had called herself Eyes Sedai? Not for the first time Suroth wished she had the other Eyes Sedai who had been captured on Toman Head. With two to question, there would have been a better chance to catch lies and evasions. It was a useless wish. The other could be dead, drowned at sea, or on display at the court of the Nine Moons. Some of the ships Suroth had failed to gather in must have managed the journey back across the ocean, and one might well have carried the woman. She herself had sent a ship carrying carefully crafted reports nearly half a year ago now, as soon as she had solidified her control of the forerunners, with a captain and crew from families that had served hers since Luther Pandrag had proclaimed himself emperor nearly a thousand years ago. Dispatching the ship had been a gamble, for the Empress might send back someone to take Sir Roth's place. Not sending the vessel would have been a greater, though. Only utter and crushing victory could have saved her then. Perhaps not even that. So the Empress knew of Falme, knew of Turok's disaster and Sir Roth's intention to go on. But what did she think of that knowledge? And what was she doing about it? That was a greater concern than any Damani, whatever she had been before collaring. Yet the Empress did not know everything. The worst could not be entrusted to any messenger, no matter how loyal. It would only be passed from Suroth's lips directly to the ear of the Empress, and Suroth had taken pains to keep it so. Only four still lived who knew the secret, and two of those would never speak of it to anyone, not of their own volition. Only three deaths can hold it more tightly. Sir Roth did not realize she had murmured the last aloud until Alwyn said, And yet the High Lady needs all three alive. The woman had a properly humble suppleness to her stance, even to the trick of downcast eyes that still managed to watch for any sign from Sir Roth. Her voice was humble, too. Who can say, High Lady, what the Empress, may she live forever, might do if she learned of an attempt to keep such knowledge from her. Instead of answering, Suroth made the tiny dismissing gesture once more. Again Alwyn hesitated. This time it had to be simple reluctance to leave. The woman rose above herself before bowing deeply and backing out of Suroth's presence. With an effort, Suroth found a calmness. The Soldam and the other two were a problem she could not solve now, but patience was a necessity for the blood. Those who lacked it were likely to end in the Tower of Ravens. On the terrace, kneeling servants leaned forward a hair in readiness as she appeared again. The soldiers maintained their watch to see she was undisturbed. 
Sir Roth took up her place before the balustrade, this time staring out to sea, toward the mainland hundreds of miles to the east. To be the one who successfully led the forerunners, who began the return, would bring much honor. Perhaps even adoption into the family of the Empress, though that was an honor not without complications. To also be the one who captured this dragon, whether false or real, along with the means of controlling his incredible power. But if, when I take him, do I give him to the Empress? That is the question. Her long nails began to click again on the wide stone rail. Chapter 2 Whirlpools in the Pattern Inland the hot night wind blew, north across the vast delta called the Fingers of the Dragon, a winding maze of waterways, broad and narrow, some choked with knife grass. Vast plains of reeds separated clusters of low islands, forested with spider-rooted trees, seen nowhere else. Eventually the delta gave way to its source, the river Arenine, the river's great width spotted with the lights of small boats lantern-fishing. Boats and lights bobbed wildly, sudden and unexpected, and some older men muttered of evil things passing in the night. Young men laughed, but they hauled the nets more vigorously, too, eager to be home and out of the dark. The story said evil could not cross your threshold unless you invited it in. That was what the story said. But out in the darkness... The last tang of salt had vanished by the time the wind reached the great city of Tyr, hard by the river, where tile-roofed inns and shops shouldered against tall, towered palaces gleaming in the moonlight. Yet no palace was half so tall as the massive bulk, almost a mountain, that stretched from city's heart to water's edge. The Stone of Tyr, fortress of legend, the oldest stronghold of mankind, erected in the last days of the breaking of the world. While nations and empires rose and fell, were replaced and fell anew, the stone stood. It was the rock on which armies had broken spears and swords and hearts for three thousand years, and in all that time it had never fallen to invading arms, until now. The streets of the city, the taverns and inns, were all but empty in the muggy darkness, people keeping cautiously within their own walls. Who held the stone was Lord of Tyr, city and nation. That was the way it had always been, and the people of the Tyr accepted it always. By daylight they would cheer their new lord with enthusiasm, as they had cheered the old. By night they huddled together, shivering despite the heat, when the wind howled across their rooftops like a thousand keening mourners. Strange new hopes danced in their heads, hopes none in Tyr had dared for a hundred generations hopes mixed with fears as old as the breaking. The wind lashed the long white banner catching the moon above the stone as if trying to rip it away. Along its length marched a sinuous figure like a legged serpent, golden-maned like a lion, scaled in scarlet and gold, seeming to ride the wind. Banner of prophecy hoped for and dreaded. Banner of the dragon. The dragon reborn harbinger of the world's salvation, and herald of a new breaking to come. As if outraged at such defiance, the wind dashed itself against the hard walls of the stone. The dragon banner floated, unheeding in the night, awaiting greater storms. In a room more than halfway up the stone's southern face, Perrin sat on the chest at the foot of his canopied bed and watched the dark-haired young woman pacing up and down. There was a trace of wariness in his golden eyes. Usually Fa'il bantered with him, maybe poked a little gentle fun at his deliberate ways. Tonight she had not said ten words since coming through the door. He could smell the rose petals that had been folded into her clothes after cleaning, and the scent that was just her. And in the hint of clean perspiration he smelled nervousness. Fa'il almost never showed nerves. Wondering why she did now, set an itch between his shoulders that had nothing to do with the night's heat. Her narrow, divided skirts made a soft whisk, whisk, whisk with her strides. He scratched his two-week growth of beard irritably. It was even curlier than the hair on his head. It was also hot. For the hundredth time he thought of shaving. 
"'It suits you,' Fahil said suddenly, stopping in her tracks. Uncomfortably, he shrugged shoulders heavy from long hours working at a forge. She did that sometimes, seemed to know what he was thinking. "'It itches,' he muttered, and wished he had spoken more forcefully. It was his beard. He could shave it off any time he wanted. She studied him, her head tilted to one side. Her bold nose and high cheekbones made it seem a fierce study, a contrast to the soft voice in which she said, It looks right on you. Perrin sighed and shrugged again. She had not asked him to keep the beard, and she would not, yet he knew he was going to put off shaving again. He wondered how his friend Matt would handle this situation, probably with a pinch and a kiss and some remark that made her laugh, until he brought her around to his way of thinking. But Perrin knew he did not have Matt's way with the girls. Matt would never find himself sweating behind a beard just because a woman thought he should have hair on his face. Unless, maybe, the woman was Fahil. Perrin suspected that her father must deeply regret her leaving home, and not just because she was his daughter. He was the biggest fur trader in Saldeia, so she claimed, and Perrin could see her getting the price she wanted every time. Something is troubling you, Fahil, and it isn't my beard. What is it? Her expression became guarded. She looked everywhere but at him, making a contemptuous survey of the room's furnishings. Carvings of leopards and lions, stooping hawks and hunting scenes, decorated everything from the tall wardrobe and bedposts as thick as his leg to the padded bench in front of the cold marble fireplace. Some of the animals had garnet eyes. He had tried to convince the Magir that he wanted a simple room, but she did not seem to understand. Not that she was stupid or slow. The Magir commanded an army of servants greater in numbers than the defenders of the stone. Whoever commanded the stone, whoever held its walls, she saw to the day-to-day -day matters that let everything function. But she looked at the world through Teheran eyes. Despite his clothes, he must be more than the young countryman he seemed, because commoners were never housed in the stone, save for defenders and servants, of course. Beyond that, he was one of Rand's party, a friend or a follower, or in any case, close to the dragon reborn in some way. To the Magir, that set him on a level with a lord of the land at the very least, if not a high lord. She had been scandalized enough at putting him in here without even a sitting room. He thought she might have fainted if he had insisted on an even plainer chamber. If there were such things, short of the servants' quarters or the defenders, at least nothing here was gilded except the candlesticks. Fahil's opinions, though, were not his. You should have better than this. You deserve it. You can wager your last copper that Matt has better. Matt likes quarty things, he said simply. You do not stand up for yourself. He did not comment. It was not his rooms that made her smell of unease, any more than his beard. After a moment, she said, The Lord Dragon seems to have lost interest in you. All his time is taken by the High Lords now. The itch between his shoulders worsened. He knew what was troubling her now. He tried to make his voice light. The Lord Dragon? You sound like a Tyrion. His name's Rand. He's your friend, Perrin Abara, not mine. If a man like that has friends... She drew a deep breath and went on in a more moderate tone. I have been thinking about leaving the stone, leaving Tyr. I don't think Moiraine would try to stop me. News of... of Rand has been leaving the city for two weeks now. She can't think to keep him secret any longer. He only just stopped another sigh. I don't think she will either. If anything, I think she considers you a complication. She will probably give you money to see you on your way. Planting fists on hips, she moved to stare down at him. Is that all you have to say? What do you want me to say? That I want you to stay? The anger in his own voice startled him. He was angry with himself, not her. Angry because he had not seen this coming. Angry because he could not see how to deal with it. He liked being able to think things through. It was easy to hurt people without meaning to when you were hasty. He'd done that now. Her dark eyes were large with shock. He tried to smooth his words. I do want you to stay, Fahil. But maybe you should leave. 
I know you're no coward, but the dragon reborn, the forsaken... Not that anywhere was really safe. Not for long, not now. Yet there were safer places than the stone. For a while, anyway. Not that he was stupid enough to put it to her that way. But she did not appear to care how he put it. Stay. The light illumined me. Anything is better than sitting here like a boulder, but... She knelt gracefully in front of him, resting her hands on his knees. Taryn, I do not like wondering when one of the forsaken is going to walk around the corner in front of me, and I do not like wondering when the dragon reborn is going to kill us all. He did it back in the breaking, after all. Killed everyone close to him. Rand doesn't lose Theron Kinslayer, Perrin protested. I mean, he is the dragon reborn, but he isn't... he wouldn't... He trailed off, not knowing how to finish. Rand was Luz Theron Telamon reborn. That was what being the dragon reborn meant. But did it mean Rand was doomed to lose Theron's fate? Not just going mad. Any man who channeled had that fate in front of him, and then a rotting death. But killing everyone who cared for him? I have been talking to Bane and Chiad Perrin. That was no surprise. She spent considerable time with the Aiel women. The friendship made some trouble for her, but she seemed to like the Aiel women as much as she despised the Stone's Tearin noblewomen. But he saw no connection to what they were talking about, and he said so. They say Moiraine sometimes asks where you are, or Matt. Don't you see? She would not have to do that if she could watch you with a power. Watch me with a power? he said faintly. He had never even considered that. She cannot. Come with me, Perrin. We can be twenty miles across the river before she misses us. I can't, he said miserably. He tried diverting her with a kiss, but she leaped to her feet and backed away so fast he nearly fell on his face. There was no point going after her. She had her arms crossed beneath her breasts like a barrier. Don't tell me you are that afraid of her. I know she is eyes, said I, and she has all of you dancing when she twitches the strings. Perhaps she has the... Rand, so tied, he cannot get loose. And the light knows Egwene and Elaine and even Nynaeve don't want to. But you can break her cords if you try. It has nothing to do with Moiraine. It's what I have to do. I... She cut him short. Don't you dare hand me any of that hairy-chested drivel about a man having to do his duty. I know duty as well as you, and you have no duty here. You may be Tavirin, even if I don't see it. But he is the dragon reborn, not you. Will you listen? he shouted, glaring, and she jumped. He had never shouted at her before, not like that. She raised her chin and shifted her shoulders, but she did not say anything. He went on. I think I am part of Rand's destiny somehow. Matt, too. I think he can't do what he has to unless we do our part as well. That is the duty. How can I walk away if it might mean Rand will fail? Might? There was a hint of demand in her voice, but only a hint. He wondered if he could make himself shout at her more often. Did Moiraine tell you this, Perrin? You should know by now to listen closely to what an eyes Sedai says. I worked it out for myself. I think Tavir and are pulled toward each other. Or maybe Rand pulls us, Matt and me both. He's supposed to be the strongest Taviran since Arthur Hawkwing. Maybe since the breaking. Matt won't even admit he's Taviran. But however he tries to get away, he always ends up drawn back to Rand. Loyal says he has never heard of three Taviran, all the same age and all from the same place. Fa'il sniffed loudly. Loyal does not know everything. He isn't very old for an ogre. He's past ninety. Perrin said defensively, and she gave him a tight smile. For an ogre, ninety years was not much older than Perrin, or maybe younger. He did not know much about ogre. In any case, Loyal had read more books than Perrin had ever seen or even heard of. Sometimes he thought Loyal had read every book ever printed. And he knows more than you or I do. He believes maybe I have the right of it. And so does Moiraine. No, I haven't asked her, but why else does she keep a watch on me? Did you think she wanted me to make her a kitchen knife? She was silent for a moment, and when she spoke it was in sympathetic tones. Poor Perrin. I left Saldeia to find adventure. And now that I am in the heart of one, the greatest since the breaking, 
All I want is to go somewhere else. You just want to be a blacksmith, and you're going to end up in the stories whether you want it or not. He looked away, though the scent of her still filled his head. He did not think he was likely to have any stories told about him, not unless his secret spread a long way beyond the few who knew already. Fa'il thought she knew everything about him, but she was wrong. An axe and a hammer leaned against the wall opposite him, each plain and functional, with a haft as long as his forearm. The axe was a wicked half-moon blade balanced by a thick spike, meant for violence. With the hammer, he could make things, had made things, at a forge. The hammerhead weighed more than twice as much as the axe blade, but it was the axe that felt heavier by far every time he picked it up. With the axe, he had... He scowled, not wanting to think about that. She was right. All he wanted was to be a blacksmith, to go home and see his family again and work at the smithy. But it was not to be. He knew that. He got to his feet long enough to pick up the hammer, then sat back down. There was something comforting in holding it. Master Luhan always says you can't walk away from what has to be done. He hurried on, realizing that was a little too close to what she had called hairy-chested drivel. He's the blacksmith back home, the man I was apprenticed to. I've told you about him. To his surprise, she did not take the opportunity to point out his near echo. In fact, she said nothing, only looked at him, waiting for something. After a moment, it came to him. Are you leaving, then? he asked. She stood up, brushing her skirt. For a long moment, she kept silent, as if deciding on her answer. I do not know, she said finally. This is a fine mess you've put me in. Me? What did I do? Well, if you don't know, I am certainly not going to tell you. Scratching his beard again, he stared at the hammer in his other hand. Matt would probably know exactly what she meant. Or even old Tom Marilyn. The white-haired gleeman claimed no one understood women, but when he came out of his tiny room in the belly of the stone, he soon had half a dozen girls young enough to be his granddaughters, sighing and listening to him play the harp, and tell of grand adventure and romance. Fa'il was the only woman Perrin wanted, but sometimes he felt like a fish trying to understand a bird. He knew she wanted him to ask. He knew that much. She might or might not tell him, but he was supposed to ask. Stubbornly, he kept his mouth shut. This time he meant to wait her out. Outside in the darkness, a cock crowed. Fa'il shivered and hugged herself. My nurse used to say that meant a death coming. Not that I believe it, of course. He opened his mouth to agree it was foolishness, though he shivered too. But his head whipped around at a grating sound and a thump. The axe had toppled to the floor. He had only time to frown, wondering what could have made it fall, when it shifted again, untouched, then leaped straight for him. He swung the hammer without thought. Metal ringing on metal drowned Fa'il's scream. The axe flew across the room, bounced off the far wall, and darted back at him, blade first. He thought every hair on his body was trying to stand on end. As the axe sped by her, Fa'il lunged forward and grabbed the haft with both hands. It twisted into grip, slashing toward her wide-eyed face. Barely in time, Perrin leaped up, dropping the hammer to seize the axe, just keeping the half-moon blade from her flesh. He thought he would die if the axe, his axe, harmed her. He jerked it away from her so hard that the heavy spike nearly stabbed him in the chest. It would have been a fair trade to stop the axe from hurting her, but with a sinking feeling he began to think it might not be possible. The weapon thrashed like a thing alive, a thing with a malevolent will. It wanted Perrin. He knew that as if it had shouted at him, but it fought with cunning. When he pulled the axe away from Fa'il, it used his own movement to hack at him. When he forced it from himself, it tried to reach her, as if it knew that would make him stop pushing. No matter how hard he held the haft, it spun in his hands, threatened with spike or curved blade. Already his hands ached from the effort, and his thick arms strained, muscles tight. Sweat rolled down his face. He was not sure how much longer it would be before the axe fought free of his grip. 
This was all madness, pure madness, with no time to think. Get out, he muttered through gritted teeth. Get out of the room, Fayil. Her face was bloodless pale, but she shook her head and wrestled with the axe. No, I will not leave you. It will kill both of us. She shook her head again. Growling in his throat, he let go of the axe with one hand. His arm quivered with holding the thing one-handed. The twisting haft burned his palm and thrust Fayil away. She yelped as he wrestled her to the door. Ignoring her shouts and her fists pounding at him, he held her against the wall with a shoulder until he could pull the door open and shove her into the hallway. Slamming the door behind her, he put his back against it, sliding the latch home with his hip as he seized the axe with both hands again. The heavy blade, gleaming and sharp, trembled within inches of his face. Laboriously, he pushed it out to arm's length. Fahil's muted shouts penetrated the thick door, and he could feel her beating on it, but he was barely conscious of her. His yellow eyes seemed to shine as if they reflected every scrap of light in the room. Just you and me now, he snarled to the axe. Blood and ashes, how I hate you! Inside, a part of him came close to hysterical laughter. Rand is the one who's supposed to go mad, and here I am talking to an axe. Rand, burn him! Teeth bared with effort, he forced the axe back a full step from the door. The weapon vibrated, fighting to reach flesh. He could almost taste its thirst for his blood. With a roar, he suddenly pulled the curved blade toward him, threw himself back. Had the axe truly been alive, he was sure he would have heard a cry of triumph as it flashed toward his head. At the last instant, he twisted, driving the axe past himself. With a heavy thunk, the blade buried itself in the door. He felt the life, he could not think what else to call it, go out of the imprisoned weapon. Slowly he took his hands away. The axe stayed where it was, only steel and wood again. The door seemed a good place to leave it for now, though. He wiped sweat from his face with a shaking hand. Madness. Madness walks wherever Rand is. Abruptly he realized he could no longer hear Fahil's shouts or her pounding. Throwing back the latch, he hastily pulled the door open. A gleaming arc of steel stuck through the thick wood on the outside, shining in the light of wide-spaced lamps along the tapestry-hung hallway. Fahil stood there, hands raised, frozen in the act of beating on the door. Eyes wide and wondering, she touched the tip of her nose. Another inch, she said faintly, and... With a sudden start, she flung herself on him, hugging him fiercely, raining kisses on his neck and beard between incoherent murmurs. Just as quickly, she pushed back, running anxious hands over his chest and arms. Are you hurt? Are you injured? Did it? I'm all right, he told her. But are you? I did not mean to frighten you. She peered up at him. Truly? You are not hurt in any way? Completely unhurt. I... Her full-armed slap made his head ring like hammer on anvil. You great hairy lummox, I thought you were dead. I was afraid it had killed you. I thought— She cut off as he caught her second slap in mid-swing. Please don't do that again, he said quietly. The smarting imprint of her hand burned on his cheek, and he thought his jaw would ache the rest of the night. He gripped her wrist as gently as he would have a bird, but though she struggled to pull free— his hand did not budge an inch. Compared to swinging a hammer all day at the forge, holding her was no effort at all, even after his fight against the axe. Abruptly she seemed to decide to ignore his grip, and stared him in the eye. Neither dark nor golden eyes blinked. I could have helped you. You had no right— I had every right, he said firmly. You could not have helped. If you had stayed, we'd both be dead. I couldn't have fought— not the way I had to, and kept you safe, too. She opened her mouth, but he raised his voice and went on. I know you hate the word. I'll try my best not to treat you like porcelain, but if you ask me to watch you die, I will tie you like a lamb for market and send you off to Mistress Luhan. She won't stand for any such nonsense. Tonguing a tooth and wondering if it was loose, he almost wished he could see Fayil trying to ride roughshod over Alsbet Luhan. The blacksmith's wife kept her husband in line with scarcely more effort than she needed for her house. Even Nynaeve had been careful of her sharp tongue around Mistress Luhan. The tooth still held tight, he decided. 
Fahil laughed suddenly, a low, throaty laugh. You would, too, wouldn't you? Don't think you would not dance with the dark one if you tried, though. Perrin was so startled he let go of her. He could not see any real difference between what he had just said and what he had said before. But the one had made her blaze up, while well, this she took fondly. Not that he was certain the threat to kill him was entirely a joke. Fahil carried knives hidden about her person, and she knew how to use them. She rubbed her wrist ostentatiously and muttered something under her breath. He caught the words, Hairy Ox, and promised himself he would shave every last whisker of that fool beard. He would. Aloud, she said, The axe. That was him, wasn't it? The dragon reborn trying to kill us. It must have been Rand. He emphasized the name. He did not like thinking of Rand the other way. He preferred remembering the Rand he had grown up with in Eamon's Field. Not trying to kill us, though. Not him. She gave him a wry smile, more a grimace. If he was not trying, I hope he never does. I don't know what he was doing, but I mean to tell him to stop it, and right now. I don't know why I care for a man who worries so about his own safety, she murmured. He frowned at her quizzically, wondering what she meant, but she only tucked her arm through his. He was still wondering, as they started off through the stone, the axe he left where it was, stuck in the door. It would not harm anyone. Teeth clamped on a long-stemmed pipe, Matt opened his coat a bit more and tried to concentrate on the cards lying face down in front of him and on the coins spilled in the middle of the table. He had had the bright red coat made to an Andoran pattern of the best wool, with golden embroideries scrolling around the cuffs and long collar, but day by day he was reminded how much farther south Tyr lay than Andor. A sweat ran down his face and plastered the shirt to his back. None of his companions around the table appeared to notice the heat at all, despite coats that looked even heavier than his, with fat, swollen sleeves, all padded silks and brocades and satin stripes. Two men in red and gold livery kept the gambler's silver cups full of wine and proffered shining silver trays of olives and cheeses and nuts. The heat did not seem to affect the servants either though now and again one of them yawned behind his hand when he thought no one was looking. The night was not young. Matt refrained from lifting his cards to check them again. They would not have changed. Three rulers, the highest cards in three of the five suits, were already good enough to win most hands. He would have been more comfortable dicing. There was seldom a deck of cards to be found in the places he usually gambled, where silver changed hands in fifty different dice games, but these young Tayerin lordlings would rather wear rags than play at dice. Peasants tossed a dice, though they were careful not to say so in his hearing. It was not his temper they feared, but who they thought his friends were. This game called Chop was what they played, hour after hour, night after night, using cards hand-painted and lacquered by a man in the city who had been made well-to-do by these fellows and others like them. Only women or horses could draw them away, but neither for long. Still, he had picked up the game quickly enough, and if his luck was not as good as it was with dice, it would do. A fat purse lay beside his cards, and another, even fatter, rested in his pocket. A fortune, he would have thought once, back in Eamon's field, enough to live the rest of his life in luxury. His ideas of luxury had changed since leaving the two rivers. The young lords kept their coin in careless shining piles, but some old habits he had no intention of changing. In the taverns and inns it was sometimes necessary to depart quickly, especially if his luck was really with him. When he had enough to keep himself as he wanted, he would leave the stone just as quickly. Before Moiraine knew what he was thinking, he would have been days gone by now if he had had his way. It was just that there was gold to be had here. One night at this table could earn him more than a week of dicing in taverns. If only his luck would catch. 
He put on a small frown and puffed worriedly at his pipe, to look unsure whether his cards were good enough to go on with. Two of the young lords had pipes in their teeth, too, but silver worked, with amber bits. In the hot, still air, their perfumed tobacco smelled like a fire in a lady's dressing chamber. Not that Matt had ever been in a lady's dressing chamber. An illness that nearly killed him had left his memory as full of holes as the best lace, yet he was sure he would have remembered that. Not even the dark one would be mean enough to make me forget that. Sea folk, ship docked today, Ryman muttered around his pipe. The broad-shouldered young lord's beard was oiled and trimmed to a neat point. That was the latest fashion among the younger lords, and Ryman chased the latest fashions as assiduously as he chased women, which was only a little less diligently than he gambled. He tossed a silver crown onto the pile in the middle of the table for another card. A raker, fastest ships there are, rakers, so they say. Outrun the wind, they say. I would like to see that. Burn my soul, but I would. He did not bother to look at the card he was dealt. He never did until he had a full five. The plump, pink-cheeked man between Ryman and Matt gave an amused chuckle. You want to see the ship, Ryman? You mean the girls, do you not? The women, exotic sea-folk beauties with their rings and baubles and swaying walks, eh? He put in a crown and took his card, grimacing when he peeked at it. That meant nothing. Going by his face, a Dorian's cards were always low and mismatched. He won more than he lost, though. Well, perhaps my luck will be better with the sea-folk girls. The dealer, tall and slender on Matt's other side, with a pointed beard even more darkly luxuriant than Ryman's, laid a finger alongside his nose. You think to be lucky with those, eh, Dorian? The way they keep to themselves, you'll be lucky to catch a whiff of their perfume. He made a wafting gesture, inhaling deeply with a sigh, and the other lordlings laughed, even a Dorian. A plain-faced youth named Estean laughed loudest of all, scrubbing a hand through lank hair that kept falling over his forehead. Replace his fine yellow coat with drab wool, and he could have passed for a farmer instead of the son of a high lord with the richest estates in Tyr, and in his own right the wealthiest man at the table. He had also drunk much more wine than any of the others. Swaying across the man next to him, a foppish fellow named Baran, who always seemed to be looking down his sharp nose, Estean poked the dealer with a none-too-steady finger. Baran leaned back, twisting his mouth around his pipe stem as if he feared Estean might throw up. It's good, Carloman, Estean gurgled. You think so too, don't you, Baran? A Dorian won't get a sniff. If he wants to try his luck, take a gamble, he ought to go after the Aeel wenches, like Matt here. All those spears and knives burn my soul, like asking a lion to dance. Dead silence stopped around the table. Estean laughed on alone, then blinked and scrubbed fingers through his hair again. What's the matter? Do I say something? Oh. Oh, yes, them. Matt barely stopped a scowl. The fool had to bring up the Aeel. The only worse subject would have been Aes Sedai. They would almost rather have Aeel walking the corridors, staring down any Tayarin who got in their way, than even one Aes Sedai. And these men thought they had four at least. He fingered an Andoran silver crown from his purse on the table and pushed it into the pot. Carloman dealt out the card slowly. Matt lifted it carefully with a thumbnail, and did not let himself so much as blink. The ruler of cups, a high lord of tear. The rulers in a deck varied according to the land where the cards were made, with the nation's own ruler always as ruler of cups, the highest suit. These cards were old. He had already seen new decks with Rand's face, or something like it, on the Ruler of Cups, complete with the dragon banner. Rand, the Ruler of Tear. That still seemed ludicrous enough to make him want to pinch himself. Rand was a shepherd, a good fellow to have fun with when he was not going all over serious and responsible. Rand, the Dragon Reborn, now. That told him he was a stone fool to be sitting there, where Moiraine could put her hand on him whenever she wanted, 
waiting to see what Rand would do next. Maybe Tom Marilyn would go with him, or Perrin. Only Tom seemed to be settling into the stone as if he never meant to leave, and Perrin was not going anywhere unless Fael crooked a finger. Well, Matt was ready to travel alone, if need be. Yet there was silver in the middle of the table, and gold in front of the lordlings, and if he was dealt the fifth ruler, there was no hand in chop could beat him. Not that he really needed it. Suddenly he could feel luck tickling his mind. Not tingling, as it did with the dice, of course, but he was already certain no one was going to beat four rulers. The Tehrans had been betting wildly all night, the price of ten farms crossing the table on the quickest hands. But Carloman was staring at the deck of cards in his hand instead of buying his fourth, and Baran was puffing his pipe furiously and stacking the coins in front of him as if ready to stuff them into his pockets. Ryman wore a scowl behind his beard, and a Dorian was frowning at his nails. Only Estean appeared unaffected. He grinned uncertainly around the table, perhaps already forgetting what he had said. They usually managed to put some sort of good face on the situation if the Aiel came up, but the hour was late, and the wine had flowed freely. Matt scoured his mind for a way to keep them and their gold from walking away from his cards, one glance at their faces was enough to tell him that simply changing the subject would not be enough. But there was another way. If he made them laugh at the Aiel. Is it worth making them laugh at me, too? Chewing his pipe stem, he tried to think of something else. Baran picked up a stack of gold in each hand and moved to stick them in his pockets. I might just try these sea folk women, Matt said quickly, taking his pipe to gesture with. Odd things happen when you chase Aiel girls. Very odd. Like the game they call Maiden's Kiss. He had their attention, but Baran had not put down the coins, and Carloman still showed no sign of buying a card. Estean gave a drunken guffaw. Kiss you with steel in your ribs, I suppose. Maidens of the spear, you see. Steel. Spear in your ribs. Burn my soul. No one else laughed, but they were listening. Not quite. Matt managed to grin. Burn me, I've told this much. I might as well tell the rest. Rourke said if I wanted to get along with the maidens, I should ask them how to play Maiden's Kiss. He said that was the best way to get to know them. It still sounded like one of the kissing games back home, like Kiss the Daisies. He had never considered the Aiel clan chief a man to play tricks. He would be warier the next time. He made an effort to improve the grin. So I went along to Bane, and... Raymond frowned impatiently. None of them knew any Aiel's name but Rourke, and none of them wanted to. Matt dropped the names and hurried on. Went along dumb as a bull-goose fool and asked them to show me. He should have suspected something from the wide smiles that had bloomed on their faces, like cats who had been asked to dance by a mouse. Before I knew what was happening, I had a fistful of spears around my neck like a collar. I could have shaved myself with one sneeze. The others around the table exploded in laughter, from Ryman's wheezing to Estean's wine-soaked bray. Matt left them to it. He could almost feel the spear points again, pricking if he so much as twitched a finger. Bane, laughing all the while, had told him she had never heard of a man actually asking to play Maiden's Kiss. Carloman stroked his beard and spoke into Matt's hesitation. You cannot stop there. Go on. When was this? Two nights ago, I'll wager, when you didn't come for the game and no one knew where you were. I was playing stones with Tom Marilyn that night, Matt said quickly. This was days ago. He was glad he could lie with a straight face. They each took a kiss, that's all. If she thought it was a good kiss, they eased up with the spears. If not, they pushed a little harder, to encourage, you might say. That was all. I'll tell you this. I got nicked less than I do shaving. He stuck his pipe back between his teeth. If they wanted to know more, they could go ask to play the game themselves. He almost hoped some of them were fool enough. Bloody Aiel women and their bloody spears. He had not made it to his own bed until daybreak. It would be more than enough for me, Carloman said dryly. The light burned my soul if it would not. He tossed a silver crown into the center of the table and dealt himself another card. Maiden's kiss. He shook with mirth, and another ripple of laughter ran around the table. 
Laurent bought his fifth card, and Estéan fumbled a coin from the heap scattered in front of him, peering at it to see what it was. They would not stop now. Savages, Laurent muttered around his pipe. Ignorant savages. That is all they are, burn my soul. Live in caves out in the waste. In caves. No one but a savage could live in the waste. Ryman nodded. At least they serve the Lord Dragon. I would take a hundred defenders and clean them out of the stone if not for that. Baran and Carloman growled fierce agreement. It was no effort for Matt to keep his face straight. He had heard much the same before. Boasting was easy when no one expected you to carry through. A hundred defenders? Even if Rand stood aside for some reason, the few hundred Aiel holding the stone could probably keep it against any army Tyr could raise. Not that they seemed to want the stone, really. Matt suspected they were only there because Rand was. He did not think any of these lordlings had figured that out. They tried to ignore the Aiel as much as possible, but he doubted it would make them feel any better. Matt. Estayan fanned his cards out in one hand, rearranging them as if he could not decide what order they were meant to go in. Matt. You will speak to the Lord Dragon, won't you? About what? Matt asked cautiously. Too many of these Tairins knew he and Rand had grown up together to suit him, and they seemed to think he was arm in arm with Rand whenever he was out of their sight. None of them would have gone near his own brother if he could channel. He did not know why they thought him a bigger fool. Didn't I say? The plain-faced man squinted at his cards and scratched his head, then brightened. Oh, yes, his proclamation, Matt, the Lord Dragons, his last one, where he said commoners had the right to call lords before a magistrate. Who ever heard of a lord being summoned to a magistrate? And for peasants? Matt's hand tightened on his purse until the coins inside grated together. It would be a shame he said quietly, if you were tried and judged just for having your way with a fisherman's daughter, whatever she wanted, or for having some farmer beaten for splashing mud on your cloak. The others shifted uneasily, catching his mood, but Estean nodded, head bobbing so it seemed about to fall off. Exactly. Though it wouldn't come to that, of course. A lord being tried before a magistrate? Of course not, not really. He laughed drunkenly at his cards. No fisherman's daughters. Smell of fish, you see, however you have them washed. A plump farm girl is best. Matt told himself he was there to gamble. He told himself to ignore the fool's blather, reminded himself of how much gold he could take out of Estean's purse. His tongue did not listen, though. Who knows what it might come to? Hangings, maybe. A Dorian gave him a sidelong look, guarded and uneasy. Do we have to talk about... about commoners, Estean? What about old Asteril's daughters? Have you decided which you'll marry yet? What? Oh. Oh. I'll flip a coin, I suppose. Estean frowned at his cards, shifted one, and frowned again. Medore has two or three pretty maids. Perhaps Medore. Matt took a long drink from his silver wine cup to keep from hitting the man in his farmer's face. He was still on his first cup. The two servants had given up trying to add more. If he hit Estean, none of them would lift a hand to stop him, not even Estean, because he was the Lord Dragon's friend. He wished he was in a tavern somewhere out in the city, where some dockman might question his luck and only a quick tongue or quick feet or quick hands would see him leave with a whole skin. Now that was a fool thought. A Dorian glanced at Matt again, measuring his mood. I heard a rumor today. I hear the Lord Dragon is taking us to war with Ilion. Matt gagged on his wine. War? he spluttered. War, Ryman agreed happily around his pipe stem. Are you certain? Carloman said, and Baron added, I've heard no rumors. I heard it just today from three or four tongues. A Dorian seemed to be absorbed in his cards. Who can say how true it is? It must be true, Ryman said. With the Lord Dragon to lead us, holding Colindor, we'll not even have to fight. He will scatter their armies, and we will march straight into Ilion. Too bad, in a way. 
Burn my soul if it isn't. I would like a chance to match swords with the Ilianers. You'll get no chance with the Lord Dragon leading, Perron said. They will fall on their knees as soon as they see the dragon banner. And if they do not, Carloman added with a laugh, the Lord Dragon will blast them with lightning where they stand. Ilion first, Ryman said, and then... Then we'll conquer the world for the Lord Dragon. You tell him I said so, Matt. The whole world. Matt shook his head. A month gone they would have been horrified by even the idea of a man who could channel, a man doomed to go mad and die horribly. Now they were ready to follow Rand into battle, and trust his power to win for them. Trust the power, though it was not likely they would put it that way. Yet he supposed they had to find something to hang on to. The invincible stone was in the hands of the Aeol. The dragon reborn was in his chambers a hundred feet above their heads, and Colindor was with him. Three thousand years of tear in belief and history lay in ruins, and the world had been turned on its head. He wondered whether he had handled it any better. His own world had gone all askew in little more than a year. He rolled a gold tear in crown across the backs of his fingers. However well he had done, he would not go back. When will we march, Matt? Baron asked. I don't know, he said slowly. I don't think Rand would start a war. Unless he had gone mad already. That hardly bore thinking about. The others looked as if he had assured them the sun would not come up tomorrow. We are all loyal to the Lord Dragon, of course, a Dorian frowned at his cards. Out in the countryside, though, I hear that some of the High Lords, a few, have been trying to raise an army to take back the stone. Suddenly no one was looking at Matt, though Esteon still seemed to be trying to make out his cards. When the Lord Dragon takes us to war, of course, it will all melt away. In any case, we are loyal here in the stone. The High Lords, too, I am certain. It is only the few out on the countryside. Their loyalty would not outlast their fear of the Dragon Reborn. For a moment Matt felt as though he were planning to abandon Rand in a pit of vipers. Then he remembered what Rand was. It was more like abandoning a weasel in a henyard. Rand had been a friend. The Dragon Reborn, though. Who could be a friend to the Dragon Reborn? I'm not abandoning anybody. He could probably pull the stone down on their heads if he wanted to. On my head, too. He told himself again that it was time to be gone. No fisherman's daughters, Esteon mumbled. You will speak to the Lord Dragon? It's your turn, Matt, Colomin said anxiously. He looked half afraid, though what he feared, that Esteon would anger Matt again, or that the talk might go back to loyalty, was impossible to say. Will you buy the fifth card or stack? Matt realized he had not been paying attention. Everyone but himself and Carloman had five cards, though Ryman had neatly stacked his face down beside the pot to show that he was out. Matt hesitated, pretending to think, then sighed and tossed another coin toward the pile. As the silver crown bounced end over end, he suddenly felt luck grow from trickles to a flood. Every ping of silver against wooden tabletop rang clear in his head. He could have called face or sigil and known how the coin would land on any bounce, just as he knew what his next card would be before Carloman laid it in front of him. Sliding his cards together on the table, he fanned them in one hand. The ruler of flames stared at him alongside the other four, the Armorlin seat, balancing a flame on her palm, though she looked nothing like Swan Sanche. However the Teherans felt about eyes, said I, they acknowledged the power of Tarvalin, even if Flames was the lowest suit. What were the odds of being dealt all five? His luck was best with random things, like dice, but perhaps a little more was beginning to rub off on cards. The light burned my bones to ash if it is not so, he muttered. Or that was what he meant to say. There! Estean all but shouted. You cannot deny it this time. That was the old tongue. Something about burning and bones, he grinned around the table. My tutor would be proud. 
I ought to send him a gift, if I can find out where he went. Nobles were supposed to be able to speak the old tongue, though in reality few knew more than Esteon seemed to. The young lords set to arguing over exactly what Matt had said. They seemed to think it had been a comment on the heat. Goosebumps pebbled Matt's skin as he tried to recall the words that had just come out of his mouth. A string of gibberish, yet it almost seemed he should understand. Burn, Warren, if she'd left me alone, I wouldn't have holes in my memory big enough for a wagon and team, and I wouldn't be spouting whatever it bloody is. He would also be milking his father's cows instead of walking the world with a pocket full of gold. But he managed to ignore that part of it. Are you here to gamble, he said harshly, or babble like old women over their knitting? To gamble, Baran said curtly. Three crowns, gold. He tossed the coins onto the pot. And three more besides, Esteon hiccuped, and added six golden crowns to the pile. Suppressing a grin, Matt forgot about the old tongue. It was easy enough. He did not want to think about it. Besides, if they were starting this strongly, he might win enough on this hand to leave in the morning. And if he's crazy enough to start a war, I'll leave if I have to walk. Outside in the darkness, a cock crowed. Matt shifted uneasily and told himself not to be foolish. No one was going to die. His eyes dropped to his cards and blinked. The armorlin's flame had been replaced by a knife. While he was telling himself he was tired and seeing things, she plunged the tiny blade into the back of his hand. With a hoarse yell, he flung the cards away and hurled himself backward, overturning his chair, kicking the table with both feet as he fell. The air seemed to thicken like honey. Everything moved as if time had slowed, but at the same time everything seemed to happen at once. Other cries echoed his, hollow shouts reverberating inside a cavern. He and the chair drifted back and down. The table floated upward. The ruler of flames hung in the air, growing larger, staring at him with a cruel smile. Now close to life-size, she started to step out of the card. She was still a painted shape with no depth, but she reached for him with her blade, red with his blood as if it had already been driven into his heart. Beside her, the ruler of cups began to grow, the tear in High Lord drawing his sword. Matt floated, yet somehow he managed to reach the dagger in his left sleeve and hurl it in the same motion straight for the Amarlin's heart. If this thing had a heart... The second knife came into his left hand, smoothly, and left more smoothly. The two blades drifted through the air like thistle-down. He wanted to scream, but that first yell of shock and outrage still filled his mouth. The ruler of rods was expanding beside the first two cards, the queen of Andor gripping the rod like a bludgeon, her red-gold hair framing a madwoman's snarl. He was still falling, still yelling that drawn-out yell. The Amarlin was free of her card, the High Lord starting out with his sword. The flat shapes moved almost as slowly as he, almost. He had proof the steel in their hands could cut, and no doubt the rod could crack a skull. His skull. His thrown daggers moved as if sinking in jelly. He was sure the cock had crowed for him. Whatever his father said, the omen had been real. But he would not give up and die. Somehow he had two more daggers out from under his coat, one in either hand. Struggling to twist in midair to get his feet under him, he threw one knife at the golden-haired figure with a bludgeon. The other he held on to as he tried to turn himself to land ready to face— The world lurched back into normal motion, and he landed awkwardly on his side, hot enough to drive the wind out of him. Desperately he struggled to his feet, drawing another knife from under his coat. You could not carry too many, Tom claimed. Neither was needed. For a moment he thought cards and figures had vanished. Or maybe he had imagined it all. Maybe he was the one going mad. Then he saw the cards, back to ordinary size, pinned to one of the dark wood panels by his still quivering knives. He took a deep, ragged breath. The table lay on its side, coins still spinning across the floor where lordlings and servants crouched among scattered cards, they gaped at Matt and his knives, those in his hands and those in the wall, with equally wide eyes. Esteon snatched a silver pitcher that had somehow escaped being overturned, and began pouring wine down his throat, the excess spilling over his chin and down his chest. "'Just because you do not have the cards to win,' a Dorian said hoarsely, "'there is no need to—' 
He cut off with a shudder. You saw it, too? Matt slipped the knives back into their sheaths. A thin trickle of blood ran down the back of his hand from the tiny wound. Don't pretend you were blind. I saw nothing, Ryman said woodenly. Nothing! He began crawling across the floor, gathering up gold and silver, concentrating on the coins as if they were the most important thing in the world. The others were doing the same, except Esteon, who scrambled about checking the fallen pitchers for any that still held wine. One of the servants had his face hidden in his hands. The other, eyes closed, was apparently praying in a low, breathless whine. With a muttered oath, Matt strode to where his knives pinned the three cards to the panel. They were only playing cards again, just stiff paper with a clear lacquer cracked. But the figure of the armalin still held a dagger instead of a flame. He tasted blood and realized he was sucking the cut in the back of his hand. Hastily he wrenched his knives free, tearing each card in half before tucking the blade away. After a moment he hunted through the cards, littering the floor, until he found the rulers of coins and winds, and tore them across too. He felt a little foolish. It was over and done with. The cards were just cards again, but he could not help it. None of the young lords crawling about on hands and knees tried to stop him. They scrambled out of his way, not even glancing at him. There would be no more gambling tonight, and maybe not for some nights to come. At least, not with him. Whatever had happened, it had been aimed at him clearly. Even more clearly, it had to have been done with the one power. They wanted no part of that. Burn you, Rand, he muttered under his breath. If you have to go mad, leave me out of it. His pipe lay in two pieces, the stem bitten through cleanly. Angrily, he grabbed his purse from the floor and stalked out of the room. In his darkened bedchamber, Rand tossed uneasily on a bed wide enough for five people. He was dreaming. Through a shadowy forest, Moiraine was prodding him with a sharp stick toward where the Amerlin seat waited, sitting on a stump with a rope halter for his neck in her hands. Dim shapes moved half-seen through the trees, stalking, hunting him. Here a dagger blade flashed in the failing light. Over there he caught a glimpse of ropes ready for binding. Slender and not as tall as his shoulder, Moiraine wore an expression he had never seen on her face. Fear. Sweating, she prodded harder, trying to hurry him to the Armorlin's halter. Dark friends and the forsaken in the shadows, the white tower's leash ahead and Moiraine behind. Dodging Moiraine's stick, he fled. It is too late for that, she called after him, but he had to get back. Back. Muttering, he thrashed on the bed, then was still, breathing more easily for a moment. He was in the waterwood back home, sunlight slanting through the trees to sparkle on the pond in front of him. There was green moss on the rocks at this end of the pond, and thirty paces away at the other end a small arc of wildflowers. This was where, as a child, he had learned to swim. You should have a swim now. He spun around with a start. Min stood there, grinning at him in her boy's coat and breeches, and next to her, Elaine, with her red golden curls and a green silk gown fit for her mother's palace. It was Min who had spoken, but Elaine added, The water looks inviting, Rand. No one will bother us here. I don't know, he began slowly. Min cut him off by twining her fingers behind his neck and pulling herself up on tiptoe to kiss him. She repeated Elaine's words in a soft murmur. No one will bother us here. She stepped back and doffed her coat, then attacked the laces of her shirt. Rand stared, the more so when he realized Elaine's gown was lying on the mossy ground. The daughter heir was bending, arms crossed, gathering up the hem of her shift. What are you doing? he demanded in a strangled voice. Getting ready to go swimming with you? Min replied. Elaine flashed him a smile and hoisted the shift over her head. He turned his back hastily, though half wanting not to, and found himself staring at Egwene, her big dark eyes looking back at him sadly. 
Without a word, she turned and vanished into the trees. Wait, he shouted after her. I can explain. He began to run. He had to find her. But as he reached the edge of trees, Min's voice stopped him. Don't go, Rand. She and Elaine were in the water already, only their heads showing as they swam lazily in the middle of the pond. Come back, Elaine called, lifting a slim arm to beckon. Do you not deserve what you want for a change? He shifted his feet, wanting to move, but unable to decide which way. What he wanted. The words sounded strange. What did he want? He raised a hand to his face to wipe away what felt like sweat. Festering flesh almost obliterated the heron branded on his palm. White bone showed through red-edged gaps. With a jerk he came awake, lying there shivering in the dark heat. Sweat soaked his small clothes and the linen sheets beneath his back. His side burned where an old wound had never healed properly. He traced the rough scar, a circle nearly an inch across, still tender after all this time. Even Moiraine's eyes Sedai healing could not mend it completely. But I'm not rotting yet, and I'm not mad either, not yet. Not yet. That said it all. He wanted to laugh and wondered if that meant he was a little mad already. Dreaming about Min and Elaine, dreaming of them like that, well, it was not madness, but it was surely foolishness. Neither one of them had ever looked at him in that way when he was awake. Egwene he had been all but promised to, since they were both children. The betrothal words had never been spoken in front of the women's circle, but everyone in and around Eamon's field knew they would marry one day. That one day would never come, of course. Not now. Not with a fate that lay ahead of a man who channeled. Egwene must have realized that, too. She must have. She was all wrapped up in becoming Eyes Sedai. Still, women were odd. She might think she could be an Eyes Sedai and marry him anyway, channeling or no channeling. How could he tell her that he did not want to marry her any more, that he loved her like a sister? But there would not be any need to tell her, he was sure. He could hide behind what he was. She had to understand that. What man could ask a woman to marry him when he knew he had only a few years, if he was lucky, before he went insane, before he began to rot alive? He shivered despite the heat. I need sleep. The High Lords would be back in the morning, maneuvering for his favor, for the Dragon Reborn's favor. Maybe I won't dream this time. He started to roll over, searching for a dry place in the sheets, and froze, listening to small rustlings in the darkness. He was not alone. The sword that is not a sword lay across the room, beyond his reach, on a throne-like stand the High Lords had given him, no doubt in the hopes he would keep Colindor out of their sight. Someone wanting to steal Colindor. A second thought came. Or to kill the Dragon Reborn? He did not need Tom's whispered warnings to know that the High Lord's professions of undying loyalty were only words of necessity. He emptied himself of thought and emotions, assuming the void. That much came without effort. Floating in the cold emptiness within himself, thought and emotion outside, he reached for the true source. This time he touched it easily, which was not always the case. Sidene filled him like a torrent of white heat and light, exalting him with life, sickening him with the foulness of the dark one's taint, like a skim of sewage floating on pure sweet water. The torrent threatened to wash him away, burn him up, engulf him. Fighting the flood, he mastered it by bare effort of will, and rolled from the bed, channeling the power as he landed on his feet in the stance to begin the sword form called Apple Blossoms in the Wind. His enemies could not be many, or they would have made more noise. The gently named form was meant for use against more than one opponent. As his feet hit the carpet, a sword was in his hands, with a long hilt and a slightly curved blade sharp on only one edge. It looked to have been wrought from flame, yet it did not even feel warm. The figure of a heron stood black against the yellow-red of the blade. 
In the same instant, every candle and gilded lamp burst alight, small mirrors behind them swelling the illumination. Larger mirrors on the walls and two stand mirrors reflected it further, until he could have read comfortably anywhere in the large room. Colindor sat undisturbed. A sword, seemingly of glass, hilt and blade, on a stand as tall as a man and just as wide, the wood ornately carved and gilded and set with precious stones. The furnishings, too, were all gilded and begemmed, bed and chairs and benches, wardrobes and chests and washstand. The pitcher and bowl were golden sea-folk porcelain, as thin as leaves. The broad taraban carpet and scrolls of scarlet and golden blue could have fed an entire village for months. Almost every flat surface held more delicate sea-folk porcelain, or else goblets and bowls and ornaments of gold worked with silver, and silver chased with gold. On the broad marble mantel over the fireplace, two silver wolves with ruby eyes tried to pull down a golden stag a good three feet tall. Draperies of scarlet silk embroidered with eagles in thread of gold hung at the narrow windows, stirring slightly in a failing wind. Books lay wherever there was room, leather-bound, wood-bound, some tattered and still dusty from the deepest shelves of the stone's library. Now, where he had thought to see assassins or thieves, one beautiful young woman stood hesitant and surprised in the middle of the carpet, black hair falling in shining waves to her shoulders. Her thin, white silk robe emphasized more than it hid. Berylaine, ruler of the city-state of Mayenne, was the last person he had expected. After one wide-eyed start, she made a deep, graceful curtsy that drew her garments tight. I am unarmed, my lord dragon. I submit myself to your search if you doubt me. Her smile suddenly made him uncomfortably aware that he wore nothing but his small clothes. I'll be burned if she makes me scramble around trying to cover myself. The thought floated beyond the void. I didn't ask her to walk in on me. To sneak in. Anger and embarrassment drifted along the borders of emptiness, too, but his face reddened all the same. Dimly he was aware of it, aware of the knowledge deepening the flush in his cheeks. So coldly calm within the void, outside he could feel each individual droplet of sweat sliding down his chest and back. It took a real effort of stubborn will to stand there under her eyes. Search her. The oh, light help me. Relaxing his stance, he let the sword vanish, but held the narrow flow connecting him to Saidin. It was like drinking from a hole in a dike when the whole long mound of earth wanted to give way, the water sweet as honeyed wine and sickening as a rivulet through a midden. He did not know much of this woman, except that she walked through the stone as if it were her palace in Mayenne. Tom said the first of Mayenne asked questions constantly of everyone questions about Rand, which might have been natural given what he was, but they made him no easier in his mind. And she had not returned to Mayenne. That was not natural. She had been held captive in all but name for months until his arrival, cut off from her throne and the ruling of her small nation. Most people would have taken the first opportunity to get away from a man who could channel. What are you doing here? He knew he sounded harsh and did not care. There were Aiel guarding that door when I went to sleep. How did you come past them? Berylaine's lips curved up a trifle more. To Rand it seemed the room had gotten suddenly even hotter. They passed me through immediately, when I said I had been summoned by the Lord Dragon. Summoned? I didn't summon anybody. Stop this, he told himself. She's a queen or the next thing to it. You know as much about the ways of queens as you do about flying. He tried to make himself be civil, only he did not know what to call the first of Mayenne. My lady, that would have to do. Why would I summon you at this time of night? She gave a low, rich laugh, deep in her throat. Even wrapped in emotionless emptiness, it seemed to tickle his skin, make the hairs stir on his arms and legs. Suddenly he took in her clinging garb as if for the first time, and felt himself go red all over again. She can't mean, can she? 
Light, I've never said two words to her before. Perhaps I wish to talk, my lord dragon. She let the pale robe fall to the floor, revealing an even thinner white silk garment he could only call a nightgown. It left her smooth shoulders completely bare, and exposed a considerable expanse of pale bosom. He found himself wondering distantly what held it up. It was difficult not to stare. You are a long way from your home, like me. The nights especially seem lonely. Tomorrow I will be happy to talk with you. But during the day people surround you, petitioners, high lords, Aiel. She gave a shiver. He told himself he really ought to look away, but he could as easily have stopped breathing. He had never before been so aware of his own reactions when wrapped in the void. The Aiel frightened me, and I do not like Teoran lords of any sort. About the Teorans he could believe her, but he did not think anything frightened this woman. Burn me, she's in a strange man's bedchamber in the middle of the night, only half-dressed, and I'm the one who's jumpy as a cat in a dog run. Void or no, it was time to put an end to things before they went too far. It would be better if you returned to your own bedchamber, my lady. Part of him wanted to tell her to put on a cloak, too, a thick cloak. Part of him did. It, it is really too late for talking. Tomorrow, in daylight. She gave him a slanted, quizzical look. Have you absorbed stuffy, tear in ways already, my lord dragon? Or is this reticence something from your two rivers? We are not so formal in Mayenne. My lady, he tried to sound formal. If she did not like formality, that was what he wanted. I am promised to Egwene Alvere, my lady. You mean the eyes said I, my lord dragon? If she really is eyes said I. She is quite young, perhaps too young, to wear the ring and the shawl. Berylaine spoke as if Egwene were a child, though she herself could not be more than a year older than Rand, if that, and he had only a little over two years on Egwene. My lord dragon, I do not mean to come between you. Marry her, if she is green, Arja. I would never aspire to wed the dragon reborn himself. Forgive me if I overstep myself, but I told you we are not so formal in Mayenne. May I call you Rand? Rand surprised himself by sighing regretfully. There had been a glint in her eye, a slight shift of expression, gone quickly, when she mentioned marrying the dragon reborn. If she had not considered it before, she had now. The dragon reborn, not Randall Thor, the man of prophecy, not the shepherd from the two rivers. He was not shocked exactly. Some girls back home mooned over whoever proved himself fastest or strongest in the games at Bell Tyne and Sunday, and now and again a woman set her eyes on the man with the richest fields or the largest flocks. It would have been good to think she wanted Randall Thor. It is time for you to go, my lady, he said quietly. She stepped closer. I can feel your eyes on me, Rand. Her voice was smoky heat. I am no village girl tied to her mother's apron, and I know you want— Do you think I'm made of stone, woman? She jumped at his roar, but the next instant she was crossing the carpet, reaching for him, her eyes dark pools that could pull a man into their depths. Your arms look as strong as stone. If you think you must be harsh with me, then be harsh so long as you hold me. Her hands touched his face. Sparks seemed to leap from her fingers. Without thinking, he channeled the flows still linked to him, and suddenly she was staggering back, eyes wide with startlement, as if a wall of air pushed her. It was air, he realized. He did things without knowing what he was doing more often than he did know. At least once done, he could usually remember how to do them again. The unseen, moving wall scraped ripples along the carpet, sweeping along Barrelane's discarded robe, a boot he had tossed aside undressing, and a red leather footstool, supporting an open volume of Eben Van Dees's The History of the Stone of Tear, pushing them along as it forced her almost to the wall, fenced her in, safely away from him. He tied off the flow. That was all he could think to call what he did, and no longer needed to maintain the shield himself. 
For a moment he studied what he had done until he was sure he could repeat it. It looked useful, especially the tying off. Dark eyes still wide, Barrelane felt along the confines of her invisible prison with trembling hands. Her face was almost as white as her skimpy silk shift. Footstool, boot, and book lay at her feet, jumbled with the robe. Much as I regret it, he told her, we will not speak again except in public, my lady. He really did regret it. Whatever her motives, she was beautiful. Burn me, I am a fool. He was not sure how he meant that, for thinking of her beauty or for sending her away. In fact, it is best you arrange your journey back to Mayenne as soon as possible. I promise you that Tyr will not trouble Mayenne again. You have my word. It was a promise good only for his lifetime, perhaps only as long as he stood in the stone, but he had to offer her something. A bandage for wounded pride, a gift to take her mind off being afraid. But her fear was already under control, on the outside at least. Honesty and openness filled her face, all efforts at allure gone. Forgive me. I have handled this badly. I did not mean to offend. In my country, a woman may speak her mind to a man freely, or he to her. Rand, you must know that you are a handsome man, tall and strong. I would be the one made of stone if I did not see it and admire. Please do not send me away from you. I will bake it if you wish. She knelt smoothly and like a dance. Her expression still said she was being open, confessing everything, but on the other hand, in kneeling she had managed to tug her already precarious gown down until it looked in real danger of falling off. Please, Rand. Even sheltered in emptiness as he was, he gaped at her, and it had nothing to do with her beauty or her near undress, well, only partly. If the defenders of the stone had been half as determined as this woman, half as steadfast in purpose, ten thousand Aiel could never have taken the stone. I am flattered, my lady, he said diplomatically. Believe me, I am, but it would not be fair to you. I cannot give you what you deserve. And let her make of that what she will? Outside in the darkness, a cock crowed. To Rand's surprise, Barrelane suddenly stared past him, eyes as big as teacups. Her mouth dropped open, and her slim throat corded with a scream that would not come. He spun, the yellow-red sword flashing back into his hands. Across the room, one of the stand mirrors threw his reflection back at him, a tall young man with reddish hair and gray eyes, wearing only white linen small clothes and holding a sword carved from fire. The reflection stepped out onto the carpet, raising its sword. I have gone mad. Thought drifted on the borders of the void. No, she saw it. It's real. Movement to his left caught the corner of his eye. He twisted before he could think, sword sweeping up and the moon rises over water. The blade slashed through the shape, his shape, climbing out of a mirror on the wall. The form wavered, broke up like dust motes floating on air, vanished. Rand's reflection appeared in the mirror again, but even as it did, it put hands on the mirror frame. He was aware of movement in mirrors all around the room. Desperately he stabbed at the mirror. Silvered glass shattered, yet it seemed that the image shattered first. He thought he heard a distant scream inside his head, his own voice screaming, fading. Even as shards of mirror fell, he lashed out with a one power. Every mirror in the room exploded suddenly, fountaining glass across the carpet. The dying scream in his head echoed again and again, sending shivers down his back. It was his voice. He could hardly believe it was not himself who made the sounds. He spun back to face the one that had gotten out, just in time to meet its attack, unfolding the fan to counter stones falling down the mountain. The figure leaped back, and suddenly Rand realized it was not alone. As quickly as he had smashed the mirrors, two more reflections had escaped. Now they stood facing him, three duplicates of himself, down to the puckered round scar on his side, all staring at him, faces twisted with hatred and contempt, with a strange hunger. Only their eyes seemed empty, lifeless. Before he could take a breath, they rushed at him. Rand stepped sideways, pieces of broken mirror slicing his feet, ever sideways from stance to stance and form to form, trying to face only one at a time. He used everything Lan, Moiraine's water, had taught him of the sword in their daily practice. Had the three fought together, had they supported one another, 
He would have died in the first minute, but each fought him alone, as if the others did not exist. Even so, he could not stop their blades entirely. In minutes, blood ran down the side of his face, his chest, his arms. The old wound tore open, adding its flow to stain his small clothes with red. They had his skill as well as his face, and they were three to his one. Chairs and tables toppled, priceless sea-folk porcelain shattered on the carpet. He felt his strength ebbing. None of his cuts was major by itself, except the old wound, but altogether. He never thought of calling for help from the Aiel outside his door. The thick walls would stifle even a death scream. Whatever was done, he must do alone. He fought wrapped in the cold emotionlessness of the void, but fear scraped at its boundaries like wind-lashed branches scratching a window in the night. His blade slipped past its opponent to slash across a face just below the eyes. He could not help wincing. It was his face, its owner sliding back just far enough to avoid a killing cut. Blood welled from the gash, veiling mouth and chin in dark crimson, but the ruined face did not change expression, and its empty eyes never flickered. It wanted him dead, the way a starving man wanted food. Can anything kill them? All three bled from the wounds he had managed to inflict, but bleeding did not seem to slow them as he knew it was slowing him. They tried to avoid his sword, but did not appear to realize they had been hurt. If they had been, he thought grimly. Light! If they bleed, they can be hurt! They must! He needed a respite, a moment to catch his breath, to gather himself. Suddenly he leaped away from them, onto the bed, rolling across its width. He sensed, rather than saw, blades slashing the sheets, barely missing his flesh. Staggering, he landed on his feet, caught at a small table to steady himself. The shining, gold-worked silver bowl on the table wobbled. One of his doubles had climbed onto the torn bed, kicking goose feathers as it padded across warily, sword at the ready. The other two came slowly around, still ignoring each other, intent only on him. Their eyes glistened like glass. Rand shuddered as pain stabbed his hand on the table. An image of himself, no more than six inches tall, drew back its small sword. Instinctively, he grabbed the figure before it could stab again. It writhed in his grip, baring teeth at him. He became aware of small movements all around the room, of small reflections by the score stepping out of polished silver. His hand began to numb, to grow cold, as if the thing was sucking the warmth out of his flesh. The heat of Sa'idin swelled inside him, a rushing filled his head, and the heat flowed into his icy hand. Suddenly the small figure burst like a bubble, and he felt something flow into him, from the bursting, some little portion of his lost strength. He jerked as tiny jolts of vitality seemed to pelt him. When he raised his head, wondering why he was not dead, the small reflections he had half-glimpsed were gone. The three larger stood wavering as if his gain and strength had been their loss. Yet as he looked up, they steadied on their feet and came on, if more cautiously. He backed away, thinking furiously, sword threatening first one and then another. If he continued to fight them as he had been, they would kill him sooner or later. He knew that as surely as he knew he was bleeding. But something linked the reflections. Absorbing the small one, the far-off thought made him queasy, but that was what it had been— had not only brought the others with it, it had also affected the bigger, for a moment at least. If he could do the same to one of them, it might destroy all three. Even thinking of absorbing them made him vaguely aware of warning to empty his stomach, but he did not know another way. I don't know this way. How did I do it? Light, what did I do? He had to grapple with one of them, to touch it at least. He was somehow sure of that. But if he tried to get that close, he would have three blades through him in as many heartbeats. Reflections. How much are they still reflections? Hoping he was not being a fool, if he was, he might well be a dead one. He let his sword vanish. He was ready to bring it back on the instant, but when his carved fire blade winked out of existence, the others did too. For a moment, confusion painted three copies of his face, one a bloody ruin. But before he could seize one of them, they leaped for him, all four crashing to the floor in a tangle of grappling limbs, rolling across the glass-littered carpet. Cold soaked into Rand. Numbness crept along his limbs, through his bones, until he barely felt the shards of mirror, the slivers of porcelain grinding into his flesh. Something close to panic flickered across the emptiness surrounding him. He might have made a fatal mistake. They were larger than the one he had absorbed, and they were drawing more heat from him. And not only heat. As he grew colder, the glassy gray eyes staring into his took on life. With chill certainty, he knew that if he died, that would not end the struggle. The three would turn on one another until only one remained, and that one would have his life, his memories, would be him. 
Stubbornly he fought, struggling harder the weaker he became. He pulled on Sa'idin, trying to fill himself with its heat. Even the stomach turning taint was welcome, for the more of it he felt, the more Sa'idin suffused him. If his stomach could rebel, then he was still alive, and if he lived, he could fight. But how? How? What did I do before? Sa'idin raged through him till it seemed that if he survived his attackers, he would only be consumed by the power. How did I do it? All he could do was pull at Sa'idin and try, reach, strain. One of the three vanished. Rand felt it slide into him. It was as if he had fallen from a height, flat onto stony ground. And then the other two together. The impact flung him onto his back, where he lay staring up at the worked plaster ceiling with its gilded bosses, lay luxuriating in the fact that he was still breathing. The power still swelled in every crevice of his being. He wanted to spew up every meal he had ever eaten. He felt so alive that, by comparison, life not soaked in Sa'idin was living a shadow. He could smell the beeswax of the candles and the oil in the lamps. He could feel every fiber of the carpet against his back. He could feel every gash in his flesh, every cut, every nick, every bruise. But he held on to Sa'idin. One of the Forsaken had tried to kill him, or all of them had. It must have been that, unless the Dark One was free already, in which case he did not think he would have faced anything as easy or as simple as this. So he held his link to the true source. Unless I did it myself. Can I hate what I am enough to try to kill myself, without even knowing it? Light, I have to learn to control it. I have to. Painfully he pushed himself up. Leaving bloody footprints on the carpet, he limped to the stand where Colindor rested. Blood from hundreds of cuts covered him. He lifted the sword, and its glassy length glowed with a power flowing into it. The sword that is not a sword. That blade, apparently glass, would cut as well as the finest steel, yet Colindor truly was not a sword, but instead a remnant of the Age of Legends, a Sa'angriol. With the aid of one of the relatively few Angriol known to have survived the War of the Shadow and Breaking of the World, it was possible to channel flows of the one power that would have burned the channeler to ash without it. With one of the even rarer Sa'angriol, the flows could be increased as much over those possible with an angrial as an angrial increased them over channeling naked. And Colindor, usable only by a man, linked to the dragon reborn through three thousand years of legend and prophecy, was one of the most powerful Sa'angrial ever made. Holding Colindor in his hands, he could level a city's walls at a blow. Holding Colindor in his hands, he could face even one of the Forsaken. It was them. It must have been. Abruptly he realized he had not heard a sound from Barrelane. Half fearing to see her dead, he turned. Still kneeling, she flinched. She had donned her robe again and hugged it around her like steel armor or stone walls. Face as white as snow, she licked her lips. Which one are... She swallowed and began again. Which one? She could not finish it. I am the only one there is, he said gently. The one you were treating as if we were betrothed. He meant it to soothe her, perhaps make her smile. Surely a woman as strong as she had shown herself to be could smile, even facing a blood-drenched man. But she bent forward, pressing her face to the floor. I apologize humbly for having most grievously offended you, Lord Dragon. Her breathy voice did sound humble and frightened, completely unlike herself. I beg you to forget my offense and forgive. I will not bother you again, I swear it, my Lord Dragon. On my mother's name and under the light, I swear it. He loosed the knotted flow. The invisible wall confining her became a momentary stir that ruffled her robe. There is nothing to forgive, he said wearily. He felt very tired. Go as you wish, 
She straightened hesitantly, stretched out a hand, and gave a relieved gasp when it encountered nothing. Gathering the skirts of a robe, she began to pick her way across the glass-littered carpet, shards grating under her velvet slippers. Short of the door, she stopped, facing him with an obvious effort. Her eyes could not quite meet his. I will send the Aiel in to you if you wish. I could send for one of the ice Sedai to tend your wounds. She would as soon be in a room with a Murdral now, or the Dark One himself. But she's no milksop. Thank you, he said quietly. But no, I would appreciate it if you told no one what happened here. Not yet. I will do what needs to be done. It had to be the Forsaken. As my Lord Dragon commands. She gave him a tight curtsy and hurried out, perhaps afraid he might change his mind about letting her go. I assume the Dark One himself, he murmured as the door closed behind her. Limping to the foot of the bed, he lowered himself into the chest there and laid Colindor across his knees, bloody hands resting on the glowing blade. With that in his hands, even one of the Forsaken would fear him. In a moment he would send for Moiraine to heal his wounds. In a moment he would speak to the Aiel outside and become the dragon reborn again. But for now, he only wanted to sit and remember a shepherd named Randall Thor. Chapter 3 Reflection Despite the hour, a good many people were hurrying through the stone's wide corridors, a steady trickle of men and women in the black and gold of stone servants, or the livery of one high lord or another. Now and again a defender or two appeared, bareheaded and unarmed, some with their coats undone. The servants bowed or curtsied to Perrin and Fayil if they came close, then hurried on with hardly a pause. Most of the soldiers gave a start on seeing them. Some bowed stiffly hand to heart, but one and all quickened their steps as if eager to be away. Only one lamp in three or four was lit. In the dim stretches between their tall stands, shadows blurred the hanging tapestries and obscured the occasional chest against the wall. For any eyes but Perrin's they did. His eyes glowed like burnished gold in those murky lengths of hall. He walked quickly from lamp to lamp and kept his gaze down unless he was in full light. Most people in the stone knew about his strangely colored eyes one way or another. None of them mentioned it, of course. Even Fayil seemed to assume the color was part of his association with an ice sedai, something that simply was, to be accepted but never explained. Even so, a prickling always ran across his back whenever he realized the stranger had seen his eyes shining in the dark. When they held their tongues, the silence only emphasized his apartness. I wish they wouldn't look at me like that, he muttered as a grizzled defender twice his age came close to running once he had passed, as though they are afraid of me. They haven't before, not this way. Why aren't all these people in bed? A woman carrying a mop in a bucket bobbed a curtsy and scurried by with her head down. Her arm twined through his. Fa'il glanced at him. I would say the gods are not supposed to be in this part of the stone unless they are on duty. A good time to cuddle a maid on a lord's chair and maybe pretend they are the lord and lady, while lord and lady are asleep. They are probably worried that you might report them. And servants do most of their work at night. Who would want them underfoot, sweeping and dusting and polishing in daylight? Perrin nodded doubtfully. He supposed she would know about such things from her father's house. A successful merchant likely had servants and guards for his wagons. At least these folk were not out of their beds because what had happened to him had happened to them, too. If that were the case, they would be out of the stone altogether and likely still running. But why had he been a target, singled out as it seemed? He was not looking forward to confronting Rand, but he had to know. Fa'il had to stretch her stride to keep up with him. For all its splendor, all the gold and fine carving and inlays, the interior of the stone had been designed for war as much as its exterior had been. 
Murder holes dotted the ceiling wherever corridors crossed. Never used arrow slits peeked into the halls at places where they might cover an entire hallway. He and Fael climbed narrow, curving staircase after narrow, curving staircase, all built into the walls or else enclosed, with more arrow slits looking down on the corridor below. None of this design had hampered the Aiel, of course, the first enemy ever to get beyond the outer wall. As they trotted up one of the winding stairs, Perrin did not realize they were trotting, though he would have been moving faster if not for Fael on his arm. He caught a whiff of old sweat and a hint of sickly sweet perfume, but they registered only in the back of his brain. He was caught up in what he was going to say to Rand. Why did you try to kill me? Are you going mad already? There was no easy way to ask, and he did not expect easy answers. Stepping out into a shadowed corridor, nearly at the top of the stone, he found himself staring at the backs of a high lord and two of the noblemen's personal guards. Only the defenders were allowed to wear armor inside the stone, but these three had swords at their hips. That was not unusual, of course, but their presence here, on this floor, in the shadows, staring intently at the bright light at the far end of the hall, that was not usual at all. That light came from the anteroom in front of the chambers Rand had been given, or taken, or maybe been pushed into by Moiraine. Perrin and Fael had made no effort to be quiet in climbing the stairs, but the three men were so intent in their watching that none of them noticed the new arrivals at first. Then one of the blue-coated bodyguards twisted his head as if working a cramp in his neck. His mouth dropped open when he saw them. Biting off an oath, the fellow whirled to face Perrin, bearing a good hand of his sword blade. The other was only a heartbeat slower. Both stood tensed, ready, but their eyes shifted uneasily, sliding off Perrin's. They gave off a sour smell of fear. So did the High Lord, though he had his fear tightly reined. The High Lord Torayan, white streaking his dark pointed beard, moved languidly, as if at a ball. Pulling a too sweetly scented handkerchief from his sleeve, he dabbed at a knobby nose that appeared not at all large when compared with his ears. A fine silk coat with red satin cuffs only exaggerated the plainness of his face. He eyed Perrin's shirt sleeves and dabbed his nose again before inclining his head slightly. The light of Lubinio, he said politely. His glance touched Perrin's yellow stare and flinched away, though his expression did not change. You are well, I trust? Perhaps too politely. Perrin did not really care for the man's tone, but the way Torian looked Fael up and down with a sort of casual interest clenched his fists. He managed to keep his voice level, though. The light illumine you, my lord Torian. I am glad to see you helping keep watch over the lord dragon. Some men in your place might resent him being here. Torian's thin eyebrows twitched. Prophecy has been fulfilled, and Tyr has fulfilled its place in that prophecy. Perhaps the dragon reborn will lead Tyr to a still greater destiny. What man could resent that? But it is late. A good night to you. He eyed Fael again, pursing his lips, and walked off down the hall just a bit too briskly, away from the anteroom's light. His bodyguards healed him like well-trained dogs. There was no need for you to be uncivil, Fael said in a tight voice when the High Lord was out of hearing. You sounded as if your tongue were frozen iron. If you do intend to remain here, you had better learn to get on with the lords. He was looking at you as if he wanted to dandle you on his knee, and I do not mean like a father. She sniffed dismissively. He is not the first man ever to look at me. If he found the nerve to try more, I could put him in his place with a frown and a glance. I do not need you to speak for me, Perrin Ibarra. Still, she did not sound entirely displeased. Scratching his beard, he peered after Torian, watching the High Lord and his guards vanish around a distant corner. He wondered how the Teirin lords managed without sweating to death. Did you notice? Fael. His heel-hounds did not take their hands off their swords until he was ten paces clear of us. 
She frowned at him, then down the hall after the three, and nodded slowly. You're right, but I do not understand. They do not bow and scrape the way they do for him, but everyone walks as warily around you and Matt as they do around the ice Sedai. Maybe being a friend of the Dragon Reborn isn't as much protection as it used to be. She did not suggest leaving again, not in words, but her eyes were full of it. He was more successful in ignoring the unspoken suggestion that he had been with the spoken. Before they reached the end of the hallway, Berylane came hurrying out of the bright lights of the anteroom, clutching a thin white robe tightly around her with both arms. If the first of Mayenne had been walking any faster, she would have been running. To show Fayil he could be as civil as she could possibly wish, Perrin swept a bow that he wagered even Matt could not have bettered. By contrast, Fayil's curtsy was the barest nod of her head, the merest bending of a knee. He hardly noticed. As Berylane rushed past them without a glance, the smell of fear, rank and raw as a festering wound, made his nostrils twitch. Beside this, Torian's fear was nothing. This was mad panic tied with a frayed rope. He straightened slowly, staring after her. Filling your eyes? Fa'il asked softly. Intent on Berylane, wondering what had driven her so near the brink, he spoke without thinking. She smelled of... Far down the corridor, Torian suddenly stepped out of a side hallway to seize Berylane's arm. He was talking a torrent, but Perrin could not make out more than a handful of scattered words, something about her overstepping herself in her pride, and something else that seemed to be Torian offering her his protection. Her reply was short, sharp, and even more inaudible, delivered with lifted chin. Pulling herself free, roughly, the first of Mayenne walked away, back straight and seemingly more in command of herself. On the point of following, Torian saw Perrin watching. Dabbing at his nose with his handkerchief, the High Lord vanished back into the crossing corridor. "'I do not care if she smelled of the essence of dawn,' Fa'il said darkly. "'That one is not interested in hunting a bear, however fine his hide would look stretched on a wall. She hunts the sun.' He frowned at her. "'The sun? A bear? What are you talking about?' "'You go on by yourself.' I think I will go to my bed after all. If that's what you want, he said slowly, but I thought you were as eager to find out what happened as I am. I think not. I'll not pretend I am eager to meet the... Rand, not after avoiding it until now. And now I am especially not eager. No doubt the two of you will have a fine talk without me, especially if there's wine. You don't make any sense he muttered, scrubbing a hand through his hair. If you want to go to bed, then fine, but I wish you would say something I understand. For a long moment she studied his face, then suddenly bit her lip. He thought she was trying not to laugh. Oh, Perrin, sometimes I believe it is your innocence I enjoy most of all. Sure enough, traces of laughter silvered her voice. You go on to, to your friend and tell me of it in the morning, as much as you want to. She pulled his head down to brush his lips with a kiss, and as quick as the kiss, ran back down the hallway. Shaking his head, he watched until she turned into the stairs with no sign of Torian. Sometimes it was as if she spoke another language. He headed toward the lights. The anteroom was a round chamber, fifty paces or more across. A hundred gilded lamps hung on golden chains from its high ceiling. Polished redstone columns made an inner ring, and the floor appeared to be one huge slab of black marble, streaked with gold. It had been the anteroom of the king's chambers, in the days when Tyr had kings, before Arthur Hawkwing put everything from the spine of the world to the Arith Ocean under one king. The Tyrian kings had not returned when Hawkwing's empire collapsed, and for a thousand years the only inhabitants of these apartments had been mice tracking through dust. No high lord had ever had enough power to dare claim them for his own. A ring of fifty defenders stood rigidly in the middle of the room, breastplates and rimmed helmets gleaming, spears all slanted at exactly the same angle. 
Facing every direction as they did, they were supposed to keep all intruders from the current Lord of the Stone. Their commander, a captain distinguished by two short white plumes on his helmet, held himself only a trifle less stiffly. He posed with one hand on his sword hilt and the other on his hip, self-important with his duty. They all smelled of fear and uncertainty, like men who lived under a crumbling cliff and had almost managed to convince themselves it would never fall. Or at least not tonight. Not in the next hour. Perrin walked on by them, his boot heels making echoes. The officer started toward him, then hesitated when Perrin did not stop to be challenged. He knew who Perrin was, of course. At least he knew as much as any Tayarin knew. Traveling companion of Ice Sedai, friend of the Lord Dragon. Not a man to be interfered with by a mere officer of the Defenders of the Stone. There was his apparent task of guarding the Lord Dragon's rest, of course, but though he probably did not admit it even to himself, the officer had to know that he and his brave show of polished armor were simply that. The real guards were those Perrin met when he strode beyond the columns and approached the doors to Rand's chambers. They had been sitting so still behind the columns that they seemed to fade into the stone, though their coats and breeches, in shades of gray and brown made to hide them in the waist, stood out here as soon as they moved. Six maidens of the spear, Aeel women who had chosen a warrior's life over the hearth, flowed between him and the doors on soft laced boots that reached their knees. They were tall for women, the tallest barely a hand shorter than he, sun-darkened with short-cropped hair, yellow or red or something in between. Two held curved horn bows with arrows knocked, if not drawn. The others carried small hide bucklers and three or four short spears, each, short but with spearheads long enough to stick through a man's body with inches to spare. I do not think I can let you go in, a woman with flame-colored hair said, smiling slightly to take the sting out of the words. Aiel did not go about grinning as much as other folk, or show a great deal of any outward emotion, for that matter. I think he does not want to see anyone tonight. I am going in, Bane. Ignoring her spears, he took her by the upper arms. That was when it became impossible to ignore the spears, since she had managed to get a spear point hard against the side of his throat. For that matter, a somewhat blonder woman named Chiad suddenly had one of her spears at the other side, as if the two were intended to meet somewhere in the middle of his neck. The other women only watched, confident that Bane and Chiad could handle whatever had to be done. Still, he did his best. I don't have time to argue with you. Not that you listen to people who argue with you, as I remember. I am going in. As gently as he could, he picked Bane up and set her out of his way. Chiad's spear only needed her to breathe on it to draw blood, but after one startled widening of dark blue eyes, Bane abruptly took hers away and grinned. Would you like to learn a game called Maiden's Kiss, Perrin? You might play well, I think. At the very least, you would learn something. One of the others laughed aloud. Chiad's spear point left his neck. He took a deep breath, hoping they would not notice it was his first since the spears touched him. They had not veiled their faces. Their shufa lay coiled around their necks like dark scarves, but he did not know if Aiel had to do so before they killed, only that veiling meant they were ready to. Another time, perhaps, he said politely. They were all grinning as if Bane had said something amusing, and his not understanding was part of the humor. Tom was right. A man could go crazy trying to understand women of any nation and any station in life. That was what Tom said. As he reached for a door handle in the shape of a rearing golden lion, Bane added, On your head be it. He has already chased out what most men would consider better company by far than you. Of course, he thought, pulling open the door. Barrelane, she was coming from here. Tonight everything is revolving around... The first of Mayan vanished from his thoughts as he got a look into the room. Broken mirrors hung on the walls, and broken glass covered the floor, along with shards of shattered porcelain and feathers from the slashed mattress. Open books lay tumbled among overturned chairs and benches. 
and Rand was sitting at the foot of his bed, slumped against one of the bedposts with eyes closed and hands limp atop Colindor, which lay across his knees. He looked as if he had taken a bath in blood. Get Moiraine, Perrin snapped at the Aiel women. Was Rand still alive? If he was, he needed ice Sedai healing to stay that way. Tell her to hurry. He heard a gasp behind him, then soft boots running. Rand lifted his head. His face was a smeared mask. Shut the door. Moiraine will be here soon, Rand. Rest easy. She will shut the door, Perrin. Murmuring among themselves, the Aiel women frowned but moved back. Perrin pulled the door to, cutting off a questioning shout from the white-plumed officer. Glass crunched under his boots as he crossed the carpet to Rand. Tearing a strip from a wildly sliced linen sheet, he watered it against the wound in Rand's side. Rand's hands tightened on the transparent sword at the pressure, then relaxed. Blood soaked through almost immediately. Cuts and gashes covered him from the soles of his feet to his head. Slivers of glass glittered in many of them. Perrin rolled his shoulders helplessly. He did not know what more to do other than wait for Moiraine. What under the light did you try to do, Rand? You look as though you tried to skin yourself. And you nearly killed me as well. For a moment he thought Rand was not going to answer. Not me, Rand said finally in a near whisper. One of the forsaken. Perrin tried to relax muscles he did not remember tensing. The effort was only partly successful. He had mentioned the forsaken to Fa'il, not exactly casually, but by and large he had been trying not to think of what the forsaken might do when they found out where Rand was. If one of them could bring down the dragon reborn, he or she would stand high above the others when the Dark One broke free. The Dark One free, and the last battle lost before it was fought. Are you sure? he said just as quietly. It had to be, Perrin. It had to be. If one of them came after me as well as you. Where's Matt, Rand? If he was alive and went through what I did, he'd be thinking what I did. That it was you. He'd be here by now to bless you out. Or on a horse and halfway to the city gates, Rand struggled to sit erect. Drying blood smears cracked and fresh trickles started on his chest and shoulders. If he is dead, Perrin, you had best get as far from me as you can. I think you and Loyal are right about that. He paused, studying Perrin. You and Matt must wish I had never been born, or at least that you'd never seen me. There was no point in going to check. If anything had happened to Matt, it was over and done now. And he had a feeling that his makeshift bandage pressed against Rand's side might be what would keep him alive long enough for Moiraine to get there. He don't seem to care if he has gone off. Burn me, he's important, too. What are you going to do if he's gone? Or dead, the light send it not so. What they least expect. Rand's eyes looked like morning mist covering the dawn, blue-gray with a feverish glow seeping through. His voice had a knife edge. That is what I have to do in any case. What everyone least expects. Perrin took a slow breath. Rand had a right to taut nerves. It was not a sign of incipient madness. He had to stop watching for signs of madness. Those signs would come soon enough, and watching would do nothing but keep his stomach tied in knots. What's that? he asked quietly. Rand closed his eyes. I only know I have to catch them by surprise. Catch everyone by surprise, he muttered fiercely. One of the doors opened to admit a tall Aielman, his dark red hair touched with grey. Behind him the Tayarin officer's plumes bobbed as he argued with the maidens. He was still arguing when Bane pushed the door shut. Rourke surveyed the room with sharp blue eyes, as if he suspected enemies hiding behind a drape or an overturned chair. The clan chief of the Ta'ardid Aiel had no visible weapon except the heavy-bladed knife at his waist, but he carried authority and confidence like weapons, quietly yet as surely as if they were sheathed alongside the knife, and his shufa hung about his shoulders. No one who knew the slightest about Aiel took one for less than dangerous when he wore the means to veil his face. The tear and fool outside sent word to his commander that something had happened in here. Rourke said, and rumors are already sprouting like corpse moss in a deep cave. 
Everything from the White Tower trying to kill you to the last battle fought here in this room. Perrin opened his mouth. Rourke raised a forestalling hand. I happened to meet Baralane, looking as if she had been told the day she would die, and she told me the truth of it. And it does look to be the truth, though I doubted her. I sent for Moiraine, Perrin said. Rourke nodded. Of course the maidens would have told him everything they knew. Rand gave a painful bark of a laugh. I told her to keep quiet. It seems the Lord Dragon doesn't rule Mayen. He sounded more wryly amused than anything else. I have daughters older than that young woman, Rourke said. I do not believe she will tell anyone else. I think she would like to forget everything that happened tonight. And I would like to know what happened, Moiraine said, gliding into the room. Slight and slender as she was, Rourke towered over her as much as the man who followed her in, Lan, her warder. But it was the ice Sedai who dominated the room. She must have run to come so fast, but she was calm as a frozen lake now. It took a great deal to ruffle Moiraine's serenity. Her blue silk gown had a high lace neck and sleeves slashed with darker velvet, but the heat and humidity did not appear to touch her. A small blue stone, suspended on her forehead from a fine golden chain in her dark hair, flashed in the light, emphasizing the absence of the slightest sheen of sweat. As always when they met, Lands and Rourke's icy blue stares nearly struck sparks. A braided leather cord held Land's dark hair, gray streaked at the temples. His face looked to have been carved from rock, all hard planes and angles, and his sword rode his hip like part of his body. Perrin was not sure which of the two men was more deadly, but he thought a mouse could starve on the difference. The warder's eyes swung to Rand. I thought you were old enough to shave without someone to guide your hand. Rourke smiled, a slight smile, but the first Perrin had ever seen from him in Land's presence. He is young yet. He will learn. Land glanced back at the Aielman, then returned the smile, just as slightly. Moiraine gave the two men a brief withering look. She did not seem to pick her way as she crossed the carpet, but she stepped so lightly, holding her skirts up, that not one shard of glass crunched under her slippers. Her eyes swept around the room. Taking in the smallest details, Perrin was sure. For a moment she studied him. He did not meet her gaze. She knew too much about him for comfort. But she bore down on Rand like a silent silken avalanche, icy and inexorable. Perrin dropped his hand and moved out of her way. The wadded cloth stayed against Rand's side, held by congealing blood. From head to foot the blood was beginning to dry in black streaks and smears. The slivers of glass in his skin glittered in the lamplight. Moraine touched the blood-caked cloth with her fingertips, then took her hand back as though changing her mind about looking underneath. Perrin wondered how the ice Sedai could look at Rand without wincing, but her smooth face did not change. She smelled faintly of rose-scented soap. At least you are alive. Her voice was musical, a chill, angry music at the moment. What happened can wait. Try to touch the true source. Why? Rand asked in a wary voice. I cannot heal myself, even if I knew how to heal. No one can. I know that much. For the space of a breath, Moiraine seemed on the point of an outburst, strange as that would have been, but in another breath she was once again layered in calm so deep that surely nothing could crack it. Only some of the strength for healing comes from the healer, the power can replace what comes from the healed. Without it, you will spend tomorrow flat on your back, and perhaps the next day as well. Now, draw on the power if you can, but do nothing with it. Simply hold it. Use this if you must. She did not have to bend far to touch Colindor. Rand moved the sword from under her hand. Simply hold it, you say. He sounded about to laugh out loud. Very well. Nothing happened that Perrin could see, not that he expected to. Rand sat there like the survivor of a lost battle, looking at Moiraine. She hardly blinked. Twice she scrubbed her fingers against her palms, as if unaware. After a time, Rand sighed. 
I cannot even reach the void. I can't seem to concentrate. A quick grin cracked the blood drying on his face. I do not understand why. A thick red thread snaked its way down past his left eye. Then I will do it, as I always have, Moiraine said, and took Rand's head in her hands, careless of the blood that ran over her fingers. Rand lurched to his feet with a roaring gasp, as if all the breath were being squeezed from his lungs, back arching so his head nearly tore free of her grasp. One arm flung wide, the fingers spread and bending back so far it seemed they must break. The other hand clamped down on Colindor's hilt, the muscles of that arm knotting visibly into cramps. He shook like cloth caught in a windstorm. Dark flakes of dried blood fell, and bits of glass tinkled onto the chest and floor, forced out of cuts, closing up and knitting themselves together. Perrin shivered as if that windstorm roared around him. He had seen healing done before, that and more, greater and worse, but he could never be complacent about seeing the power used, about knowing it was being used, not even for this. Tales of ice, said I, told by merchants, guards, and drivers, had embedded themselves in his mind long years before he met Moiraine. Rourke smelled sharply uneasy. Only Lan took it as a matter of course. Lan and Moiraine. Almost as soon as it began, it was done. Moiraine took her hands away, and Rand slumped, catching the bedpost to hold himself on his feet. It was difficult to say whether he clutched the bedpost or Colindor more tenaciously. When Moiraine tried to take the sword to replace it on the ornate stand against the wall, he drew it away from her firmly, even roughly. Her mouth tightened momentarily, but she contented herself with pulling the wad of cloth from his side, using it to scrub away some of the surrounding smears. The old wound was a tender scar again. The other injuries were simply gone. The mostly dried blood that still covered him could have come from someone else. Moiraine frowned. It still does not respond, she murmured half to herself. It will not heal completely. That is the one that will cure me, isn't it? He asked her softly, then quoted. His blood on the rocks of Sheol Ghul, washing away the shadow, sacrifice for man's salvation. You read too much, she said sharply, and understand too little. Do you understand more? If you do, then tell me. He is only trying to find his way, Lan said suddenly. No man likes to run forward blindly when he knows there is a cliff somewhere ahead. Perrin gave a twitch of surprise. Lan almost never disagreed with Moiraine, or at least not where anyone could overhear. He and Rand had been spending a good deal of time together, though, practicing the sword. Moiraine's dark eyes flashed, but what she said was, He needs to be in bed. Will you ask that wash water be brought and another bedchamber prepared? This one needs a thorough cleaning and a new mattress. Lan nodded and put his head into the anteroom for a moment, speaking quietly. I will sleep here, Moiraine. Letting go of the bedpost, Rand pushed himself erect, grounding Colindor's point on the littered carpet and resting both hands on the hilt. If he leaned a little on the sword, it did not show much. I won't be chased any more, not even out of a bed. Taishamanetherin, Lan murmured. This time even Rourke looked startled, but if Moiraine heard the water compliment Rand, she gave no sign of it. She was staring at Rand, her face smooth, but thunderheads in her eyes. Rand wore a quizzical little smile, as if wondering what she would try next. Perrin edged toward the doors. If Rand and the ice Sedai were going to match wills, he would just as soon be elsewhere. Land did not appear to care. It was hard to tell with that stance of his, somehow standing with his back straight and slouching at the same time. He could have been bored enough to sleep where he stood, or ready to draw his sword. His manner suggested either, or both. Rourke stood much the same, but he was eyeing the doors, too. "'Stay where you are.' Moraine did not look away from Rand, and her outflung finger pointed halfway between Perrin and Rourke. But Perrin's feet stopped just the same. Rourke shrugged and folded his arms. "'Stubborn,' Moraine muttered. This time the word was for Rand. "'Very well. If you mean to stand there until you drop, you can use the time before you fall on your face to tell me what occurred here.' 
I cannot teach you, but if you tell me, perhaps I can see what you did wrong. A small chance, but perhaps I can. Her voice sharpened. You must learn to control it, and I do not mean just because of things like this. If you do not learn to control the power, it will kill you. You know that. I have told you often enough. You must teach yourself. You must find it within yourself. I did nothing except survive, he said in a dry voice. She opened her mouth, but he went on. Do you think I could channel and not know it? I didn't do it in my sleep. This happened awake. He wavered and caught himself on the sword. Even you could not channel anything but spirit asleep, Moraine said coolly, and this was never done with spirit. I was about to ask what did happen. Perrin felt his hackles rising as Rand told his story. The axe had been bad enough, but at least the axe was something solid, something real. To have your own reflection jump out of mirrors at you? Unconsciously he shifted his feet, trying not to stand on any fragments of glass. Soon after he began speaking, Rand glanced behind him at the chest, a quick look, as if he did not want it observed. After a moment the slivers of silvered glass that were scattered across the lid of the chest stirred and slid off onto the carpet as though pushed by an unseen broom. Rand exchanged looks with Moiraine, then sat down slowly and went on. Perrin was not sure which of them had cleared the chest top. There was no mention of Barrelane in the tale. It must have been one of the Forsaken, Rand finished at last. Maybe Samael. You said he's an alien. Unless one of them is here and here. Could Samael reach the stone from Ilion? Not even if he held Colindor, Moraine told him. There are limits. Samael is only a man, not the Dark One. Only a man? Not a very good description, Perrin thought. A man who could channel, but who somehow had not gone mad. At least not yet, not that anyone knew. A man perhaps as strong as Rand. But where Rand was trying to learn... Samael knew every trick of his talents already. A man who had spent three thousand years trapped in the Dark One's prison, a man who had gone over to the shadow of his own choice. No, only a man did not begin to describe Samael, or any of the Forsaken, male or female. Then one of them is here, in the city. Rand put his head down on his wrists, but jerked himself erect immediately, glaring at those in the room. I'll not be chased again. I'll be the hound first. I will find him, or her, and I will— Not one of the Forsaken? Moiraine cut in. I think not. This was too simple, and too complex. Rand spoke calmly. No riddles, Moiraine. If not the Forsaken, who? Or what? The ice Sedai's face could have done for an anvil, yet she hesitated, feeling her way. There was no telling whether she was unsure of the answer, or deciding how much to reveal. As the seals holding the Dark One's prison weaken, she said after a time, it may be inevitable that a miasma will escape even while he is still held like bubbles rising from the things rotting on the bottom of a pond. But these bubbles will drift through the pattern until they attach to a thread and burst. Light! It slipped out before Perrin could stop it. Moiraine's eyes turned to him. You mean what happened to, to Rand is going to start happening to everybody? Not to everyone. Not yet, at least. In the beginning, I think there will only be a few bubbles slipping through cracks the Dark One can reach through. Later, who can say? And just as Tavirin bend the other threads in the pattern around them, I think perhaps Tavirin will tend to attract these bubbles more powerfully than others do. Her eyes said she knew Rand was not the only one to have had a waking nightmare. A brief touch of a smile, there and gone almost before he saw it, said he could keep silent if he wished to hold it secret from others, but she knew. Yet in the months to come, the years, should we be lucky enough to have that long, I fear a good many people will see things to give them white hairs, if they survive. 
Matt, Rand said, do you know if he... is he... I will know soon enough, Warren replied calmly. What is done cannot be undone, but we can hope. Whatever her tone, though, she smelled ill at ease until Rourke spoke. He is well, or was. I saw him on my way here. Going where? Warren said with an edge in her voice. He looked to be heading for the servants' quarters, the Aielman told him. He knew that the three were Tavirin, if not as much else as he thought he did, and he knew Matt well enough to add, Not the stables, I said I. The other way, toward the river. And there are no boats at the stone's docks. He did not stumble over words like boat and dock the way most of the Aiel did, although in the waste such things existed only in stories. She nodded as if she had expected nothing else. Perrin shook his head. She was so used to hiding her real thoughts, she seemed to veil them out of habit. Suddenly one of the doors opened, and Bane and Chiad slipped in, without their spears. Bane was carrying a large white bowl and a fat pitcher with steam rising from the top. Chiad had towels folded under her arm. "'Why are you bringing this?' Moiraine demanded. Chiad shrugged. "'She will not come in.' Rand barked a laugh. Even the servants know enough to stay clear of me. Put it anywhere. Your time is running out, Rand, Moiraine said. The Tehrans are becoming used to you after a fashion, and no one fears what is familiar as much as what is strange. How many weeks or days before someone tries to put an arrow in your back or poison in your food? How long before one of the forsaken strikes or another bubble comes sliding along the pattern? Don't try to harry me, Moiraine. He was blood-filthy, half-naked, more than half leaning on Colindor to stay sitting up, but he managed to fill those words with quiet command. I will not run for you either. Choose your way soon, she said, and this time inform me what you mean to do. My knowledge cannot aid you if you refuse to accept my help. Your help, Rand said wearily. I'll take your help, but I will decide, not you. He looked at Perrin as if trying to tell him something without words, something he did not want the others to hear. Perrin had not a clue what it was. After a moment, Rand sighed. His head sank a little. I want to sleep. All of you, go away, please. We will talk tomorrow. His eyes flickered to Perrin again, underscoring the words for him. Moiraine crossed the room to Bane and Chiad, and the two Aiel women leaned close so she could speak for their ears alone. Perrin heard only a buzz and wondered if she was using the power to stop him eavesdropping. She knew the keenness of his hearing. He was sure of it when Bane whispered back, and he still could not make out anything. The ice Sedai had done nothing about his sense of smell, though. The Aiel women looked at Rand as they listened, and they smelled wary. Not afraid but as if Rand were a large animal, that would be dangerous if they misstepped. The ice Sedai turned back to Rand. We will talk tomorrow. You cannot sit like a partridge waiting for a hunter's net. She was moving for the door before Rand could reply. Lan looked at Rand as if about to say something, but followed her without speaking. Rand? Perrin said. We do what we have to. Rand did not look up from the clear hilt between his hands. We all do what we have to. He smelled afraid. Perrin nodded and followed Rourke out of the room. Moiraine and Lan were nowhere in sight. The Tehran officer was staring at the doors from ten paces off, trying to pretend the distance was his choice and had nothing to do with the four Aiel women watching him. The other two maidens were still in the bedchamber, Perrin realized. He heard voices from the room. Go away, Rand said tiredly. Just put that down and go away. If you can stand up, Chiad said cheerfully, we will. Only stand. There was the sound of water splashing into a bowl. We have tended to wounded before, Bane said in soothing tones, and I used to wash my brothers when they were little. Rourke pushed the door shut, cutting off the rest. You do not treat him the way the Tehrans do, Perrin said quietly. No bowing and scraping. I don't think I have heard one of you call him Lord Dragon. 
The dragon reborn is a wetlander prophecy, Rourke said. Ours is he who comes with the dawn. I thought they were the same. Else why did you come to the stone? Burn me, Rourke. You, Aiel, are the people of the dragon, just as the prophecies say. You've as good as admitted it, even if you won't say it out loud. Rourke ignored the last part. In your prophecies of the dragon, the fall of the stone, and the taking of Colindor proclaim that the dragon has been reborn. Our prophecy says only that the stone must fall before he who comes with the dawn appears to take us back to what was ours. They may be one man, but I doubt even the wise ones could say for sure. If Rand is the one, there are things he must do yet to prove it. What? Perrin demanded. If he is the one, he will know, and do them. If he does not, then our search still goes on. Something unreadable in the Aielman's voice pricked Perrin's ears. And if he isn't the one you search for? What then, Rourke? Sleep well and safely, Perrin. Rourke's soft boots made no sound on the black marble as he walked away. The Tehran officer was still staring past the maidens, smelling of fear, failing to mask the anger and hatred on his face. If the Aiel decided Rand was not he who comes with the dawn, Perrin studied the Tehran officer's face and thought of the maidens not being there, of the stone empty of Aiel, and he shivered. He had to make sure Fa'il decided to leave. That was all there was for it. She had to decide to go, and without him. Chapter 4 Strings Tom Marilyn sprinkled sand across what he had written to blot the ink, then carefully poured the sand back into its jar and flipped the lid shut. Riffling through the papers scattered in rough piles across the table, six tallow candles made fire a real danger, but he needed the light. He selected a crumpled sheet marred by an ink blot. Carefully he compared it with what he had written, then stroked a long white moustache with a thumb in satisfaction, and permitted himself a leathery-faced smile. The High Lord Carleon himself would have thought it was his own hand. Be wary. Your husband suspects. Only those words, and no signature. Now, if he could arrange for the High Lord Tedosian to find it, where his wife, the Lady Altima, might carelessly have left it. A knock sounded at the door, and he jumped. No one came to see him at this time of the night. A moment, he called, hastily stuffing pens and ink pots and selected papers into a battered writing chest. A moment, while I put on a shirt. Locking the chest, he shoved it under the table where it might escape casual notice, and ran an eye over his small, windowless room to see if he had left anything out that should not be seen. Hoops and balls for juggling littered his narrow, unmade bed, and lay among his shaving things on a single shelf with fire wands and small items for sleight of hand. His gleeman's cloak, covered with loose patches in a hundred colors, hung from a peg on the wall along with his spare clothes and the hard leather cases holding his harp and flute. A woman's diaphanous red silk scarf was tied around the strap of the harp case, but it could have belonged to anyone. He was not sure he remembered who had tied it there. He tried to pay no more attention to one woman than any other, and all of it light-hearted and laughing. Make them laugh, even make them sigh, but avoid entanglements. That was his motto. He had no time for those. That was what he told himself. I'm coming, he limped to the door irritably. Once he had drawn oohs and ahs from people who could hardly believe, even while they watched, that a raw-boned, white-haired old man could do back springs and handstands and flips, limber and quick as a boy. The limp had put an end to that, and he hated it. The leg ached worse when he was tired. He jerked open the door and blinked in surprise. Well, come in, Matt. I thought you would be hard at work, lightening Lordling's purses. They didn't want to gamble any more tonight, Matt said sourly, dropping onto the three-legged stool that served as a second chair. His coat was undone and his hair disheveled. His brown eyes dotted around, never resting on one spot long, but their usual twinkle, suggesting that the lad saw something funny where no one else did, was missing tonight. 
Tom frowned at him, considering. Matt never stepped across this threshold without a quip about the shabby room. He accepted Tom's explanation that his sleeping beside the servants' quarters would help people forget that he had arrived in the shadow of Ice Sedai, but Matt seldom let a chance for a joke pass. If he realized that the room also assured that no one could think of Tom having any connection to the Dragon Reborn, Matt, being Matt, probably thought that a reasonable wish. It had taken Tom all of two sentences, delivered in haste during a rare moment when no one was looking, to make Rand see the real point. Everyone listened to a gleeman, everyone watched him, but no one really saw him or remembered who he talked to, as long as he was only a gleeman, with his hedgerow entertainments fit for country folk and servants, and perhaps to amuse the ladies. That was how Teherins saw it. It was not as if he were a bard, after all. What was bothering the boy to bring him down here at this hour? Probably one or another of the young women, and some old enough to know better, who had let themselves be caught by Matt's mischievous grin. Still, he would pretend it was one of Matt's usual visits until the lad said otherwise. I'll get the stones board. It is late, but we have time for one game. He could not resist adding, Would you care for a wager on it? He would not have tossed a dice with Matt for a copper, but Stones was another matter. He thought there was too much order and pattern in Stones for Matt's strange luck. What? Oh, no, it's too late for games. Tom, did... did anything happen down here? Leaning the stone's board against a table leg, Tom dug his tobacco pouch and long-stemmed pipe out of the litter remaining on the table. Such as what? he asked, thumbing the bowl full. He had time to stick a twist of paper in the flame of one of the candles, puff the pipe alight, and blow out the spill before Matt answered. Such as Rand going insane, that's what. No, you'd not have to ask if it had. A prickling made Tom shift his shoulders, but he blew a blue-gray streamer of smoke as calmly as he could, and took his chair, stretching his gimpy leg out in front of him. What happened? Matt drew a deep breath, then let everything out in a rush. The playing cards tried to kill me. The Armorlin and the High Lord and— I didn't dream it, Tom. That's why those puffed-up jackdaws don't want to gamble any more. They're afraid it will happen again. Tom, I'm thinking of leaving Tyr. The prickling felt as if he had black wasp nettles stuffed down his back. Why had he not left Tyr himself long since? Much the wisest thing. Hundreds of villages lay out there waiting for a gleeman to entertain and amaze them, and each with an inn or two full of wine to drown memories. But if he did, Rand would have no one except Moiraine to keep the High Lords from maneuvering him into corners and maybe cutting his throat. She could do it, of course, using different methods than his. He thought she could. She was Kyrienin, which meant she had probably taken in the game of houses with her mother's milk. And she would tie another string to Rand for the White Tower while she was about it. Mesh him in an ice sedai net so strong he would never escape. But if the boy was going mad already— Fool! Tom called himself. A pure fool to stay mixed in this because of something fifteen years in the past. Staying would not change that. What was done was done. He had to see Rand face to face, no matter what he had told him about keeping clear. Perhaps no one would think it too odd if a gleeman asked to perform a song for the Lord Dragon, a song especially composed. He knew a deservedly obscure Kandori tune, praising some unnamed lord for his greatness and courage in grandiose terms that never quite managed to name deeds or places. It had probably been bought by some lord who had no deeds worth naming. Well, it would serve him now, unless Moiraine decided it was strange. That would be as bad as the high lords taking notice. I am a fool. I should be out of here tonight. He was roiling inside, his stomach churning acid, but he had spent long years learning to keep his face straight before ever he put on a gleeman's cloak. He puffed three smoke rings, one inside the other, and said, 
You have been thinking of leaving Tyr since the day you walked into the stone. Perched on the edge of the stool, Matt shot him an angry look. And I mean to. I do. Why not come with me, Tom? There are towns where they think the dragon reborn hasn't drawn a breath yet, where nobody's given a thought to the bloody prophecies of the bloody dragon in years, if ever. Places where they think the Dark One is a grandmother's tale, and Trollocs are traveller's wild stories, and Murdral ride shadows to scare children. You could play your harp and tell your stories, and I could find a game of dice. We could live like lords, traveling as we want, staying where we want, with no one trying to kill us. That hit too close for comfort. Well, he was a fool, and there it was. He just had to make the best of it. If you really mean to go, why haven't you? Moiraine watches me, Matt said bitterly. And when she isn't, she has somebody else doing it. I know. I said I don't like to let someone go once they lay hands on them. It was more than that, he was sure, more than what was openly known, certainly. But Matt denied any such thing, and no one else who knew was talking either. If anyone besides Moiraine did know, it hardly mattered. He liked Matt. He even owed him, in a fashion. But Matt and his troubles were a street-corner rare compared to Rand. But I cannot believe she really has someone watching you all the time. As good as. She's always asking people where I am, what I'm doing. It gets back to me. Do you know anybody who won't tell a nice Sedai what she wants to know? I don't. As good as being watched. You could avoid eyes if you put your mind to it. I have never seen anyone as good as sneaking about as you. I mean that as a compliment. Something always comes up, Matt muttered. There's so much gold to be had here, and there's a big-eyed girl in the kitchen who likes a little kiss and tickle, and one of the maids has hair like silk to her waist, and the roundest... He trailed off, as if he had suddenly realized how foolish he sounded. Have you considered that maybe it's because if you mention Tavir and Tom, I'm leaving? Tom changed what he had been going to say. That maybe it's because Rand is your friend and you don't want to desert him? Desert him? The boy jumped up, kicking over the stool. Tom, he is the bloody dragon reborn. At least that's what he and Warren say. Maybe he is. He can channel, and he has that bloody sword that looks like glass. Prophecies, I don't know, but I know I would have to be as crazy as these Terrans to stay. He paused. You don't think... You don't think Moiraine is keeping me here, do you? With the power? I do not believe she can, Tom said slowly. He knew a good bit about ice, said I, enough to have some idea how much he did not know, and he thought he was right on this. Matt raked his fingers through his hair. Tom, I think about leaving all the time, but I get these strange feelings, almost as if something was going to happen, something momentous, that's the word. It's like knowing there'll be fireworks for Sunday, only I don't know what it is I'm expecting. Whenever I think too much about leaving, it happens, and suddenly I've found some reason to stay another day. Always just one more bloody day. Doesn't that sound like ice, said I, work to you? Tom swallowed the word Tavir in and took his pipe from between his teeth to peer into the smoldering tobacco. He did not know much about Tavir in, but then no one did, except the ice, said I, or maybe some of the ogre. I was never much good at helping people with their problems, and worse with my own, he thought. With an ice, said I, close to hand, I'd advise most people to ask her for help. Advice I'd not take myself. Ask Warren? I suppose that is out of the question in this case. But Nynaeve was your wisdom back in Eamon's field. Village wisdoms are used to answering people's questions, helping with their problems. Matt gave a raucous snort of laughter. And put up with one of her lectures about drinking and gambling, and... Tom, she acts like I'm ten years old. Sometimes I think she believes I'll marry a nice girl and settle down on my father's farm. Some men would not find it an objectionable life, Tom said quietly. Well, I would. I want more than cows and sheep and tobacco for the rest of my life. I want... Matt shook his head. 
All these holes in memory. Sometimes I think if I could just fill them in, I'd know. Burn me, I don't know what I'd know. But I know I want to know it. That's a twisty riddle, isn't it? I'm not certain even an ice said I can help with that. A gleeman surely can't. I said no ice said I. Tom sighed. Calm yourself, boy. I was not suggesting it. I am leaving. As soon as I can fetch my things and find a horse. Not a minute longer. In the middle of the night? The morning will do. He refrained from adding, If you really do leave. Sit down, relax. We'll play a game of stones. I have a jar of wine here somewhere. Matt hesitated, glancing at the door. Finally, he jerked his coat straight. The morning will do. He sounded uncertain, but he picked up the overturned stool and set it beside the table. But no wine for me, he added as he sat down. Strange enough things happen when my head is clear. I want to know the difference. Tom was thoughtful as he put the board and the bags of stones on the table. Just that easily the lad was diverted, pulled along by an even stronger Tavirin named Rand Althor, was how Tom saw it. It occurred to him to wonder if he was caught in the same way. His life had certainly not been headed toward the Stone of Tear in this room when he first met Rand, but since then it had been twitched about like a kite string. If he decided to leave, say, if Rand really had gone mad, would he find reasons to keep putting it off? What is this, Tom? Matt's boot had encountered the writing case under the table. Is it all right if I move it out of my way? Well, of course. Go right ahead. He winced inside as Matt shoved the case aside roughly with his foot. He hoped he had corked all the ink bottles tightly. Joe's, he said, holding out his fists. Matt tapped the left, and Tom opened it to reveal a smooth black stone, flat and round. The boy chortled at having the first go and placed the stone on the cross-hatched board. No one seeing the eagerness in his eyes would have suspected that only moments before he had been twice as eager to go. A greatness he refused to recognize, clinging to his back, and an ice sedai intent on keeping him for one of her pets. The lad was well and truly caught. If he was caught too, Tom decided, it would be worth it to help one man, at least, keep free of ice, said I. Worth it to make a payment on that fifteen-year-old debt. Suddenly and strangely content, he set a white stone. Did I ever tell you, he said around his pipe stem, about the wager I once made with a Domani woman? She had eyes that could drink a man's soul and an odd-looking red bird she had bought off a sea-folk ship. She claimed it could tell the future. This bird had a fat yellow beak, nearly as long as its body, and it... Chapter 5 Questioners They should be back by now. Egwene fluttered the painted silk fan vigorously, glad the nights were at least a little cooler than the days. Tyrian women carried the fans all the time, the nobles at least, and the wealthy, but as far as she could see they did no good at all except when the sun was down, and not much then. Even the lamps, great golden mirrored things on silvered wall brackets, seemed to add to the heat. What can be keeping them? An hour, Moiraine had promised them, for the first time in days, and then she had left without explanation after bare five minutes. Did she give any hint of why they wanted her? Avienda? Or who wanted her, for that matter? Seated cross-legged on the floor beside the door, large green eyes startling in her dark tanned face, the Aiel woman shrugged. In coat and breeches and soft boots, Shufa looped about her neck, she appeared unarmed. Karine whispered her message to Moiraine, said I. I would not have been proper to listen. I am sorry, I said I. Guiltily, Egwene fingered the great serpent ring on her right hand, the golden serpent biting its own tail. As an accepted, she should have been wearing it on the third finger of her left hand. But letting the high lords believe that they had four full ice sedai inside the stone kept them on their best manners, or what passed for manners among Tairin nobles. Moiraine did not lie, of course. 
She never said they were more than accepted, but she never said they were accepted either and let everyone think what they wanted to think, believe what they thought they saw. Moraine could not lie, but she could make truth dance a fine jig. It was not the first time Egwene and the others had pretended to full sisterhood since leaving the tower, but more and more she felt uncomfortable deceiving Avienda. She liked the Aiel woman, thought they could be friends if they could ever come to know one another, but that hardly seemed possible as long as Avienda thought Egwene was Aes Sedai. The Aiel woman was there only at Moiraine's order, issued for unspoken purposes of her own. Egwene suspected it was to give them an Aiel bodyguard, as if they had not learned to protect themselves. Still, even if she and Avienda did become friends, she could not tell her the truth. The best way to keep a secret was to make sure no one knew who did not absolutely have to know. Another point Moiraine had made. Sometimes Egwene found herself wishing the ice Sedai could be wrong, glaringly wrong, just once, in a way that would not mean disaster, of course. That was the rub. Tanchiko, Nynaeve muttered. Her dark, wrist-thick braid hung down her back to her waist as she stared out of one of the narrow windows, casements swung out in the hope of catching a night breeze. On the broad river Aranine, below, bobbed the lanterns of a few fishing boats that had not ventured downriver, but Egwene doubted she saw them. There is nothing for it but to go to Tanchico, it seems. Nynaeve gave an unconscious hitch to her green dress with its wide neck that bared her shoulders. She did that a good deal. She would have denied wearing the dress for Lan, Moiraine's water. She would have if Egwene had dared make the suggestion. But green, blue, and white seemed to be Land's favorite colors on women, and every dress that was not green, blue, or white had vanished from Nynaeve's wardrobe. Nothing for it. She did not sound happy. Egwene caught herself giving an upward tug to her own dress. They felt odd, these dresses that just clung to the shoulders. On the other hand, she did not believe she could bear to be more covered— Light as it was, the pale red linen felt like wool. She wished she could bring herself to wear the filmy gowns Barrelane wore. Not that they were suitable for public eyes, but they certainly did appear to be cool. Stop fretting over comfort, she told herself sternly. Keep your mind on the business at hand. Perhaps, she said aloud, myself I am not convinced. A long, narrow table, polished till it glistened, ran down the middle of the room. A tall chair stood at the end near Egwene, lightly carved and touched here and there with gilt, quite plain for tear, while the side chairs had progressively lower backs until those at the far end seemed little more than benches. Egwene had no idea what purpose the Teherins had put the room to. She and the others used it for questioning two prisoners taken when the stone fell. She could not force herself to go into the dungeons, though Rand had ordered all of the implements that had decorated the guardroom walls melted or burned. Neither Nynaeve nor Elaine had been eager to return either. Besides, this brightly lit room, with its clean-swept green tile floor and its wall panels carved with the three crescents of tear, was a sharp contrast to the grim gray stone of the cells, all dim and dank and dirty. That had to have some softening effect on the two women in prisoners' rough woven woolens. Only that drab brown dress, however, would have told most people that Joia Bayer, standing beyond the table with her back turned, was a prisoner at all. She had been white Aja, and had lost none of the white's cool arrogance on shifting her allegiance to the black. Every line of her proclaimed that she stared rigidly at the far wall of her own choice and for no other reason. Only a woman who could channel would have seen the thumb-thick flows of air that held Joia's arms to her sides and lashed her ankles together. A cage woven of air kept her eyes straight ahead. Even her ears were stopped up, so she could not hear what anyone said until they wanted her to. Once again Egwene checked the shield woven from spirit that blocked Joia from touching the true source. It held, as she knew it must. 
She herself had woven all the flows around Joia, and tied them to maintain themselves, but she could not be easy in the same room with a dark friend who had the ability to channel, even if it was blocked. Worse than just a dark friend. Black Acha. Murder was the least of Joia's crimes. She should have been bowed down under her weight of broken oaths, blasted lives, and blighted souls. Joia's fellow prisoner, her sister in the Black Aja, lacked her strength. Standing stoop-shouldered at the far end of the table, head down, Amiko Nagoyan seemed to sink in on herself under Egwene's gaze. There was no need to shield her. Amiko had been stilled during her capture. Still able to sense the true source, she would never again touch it, never again channel. The desire to, the need to, would remain, as sharp as the need to breathe, and her loss would be there for as long as she lived, Sa'idar, forever out of reach. Egwene wished she could find in herself even a shred of pity, but she did not wish for it very hard. Amiko murmured something at the tabletop. What? Nynaeve demanded. Speak up. Amiko raised her face humbly on its slender neck. She was still a beautiful woman, with large dark eyes, but there was something different about her that Egwene could not quite put her finger on. Not the fear that made her clutch her coarse prisoner's dress with both hands. Something else. Swallowing, Amiko said, You should go to Tanchiko. You've told us that twenty times, Nynaeve said roughly. Fifty times. Tell us something new. Name names we do not already know. Who, still in the White Tower, is Black Aja? I do not know. You must believe me. Amiko sounded tired, utterly beaten. Not at all the way she had sounded when they were the prisoners, and she the jailer. Before we left the tower, I knew only Leandrin, Chesmal, and Rihanna. No one knew more than two or three others, I think, except Leandrin. I have told you everything I know. Then you are remarkably ignorant for a woman who expected to rule part of the world when the Dark One breaks free, Egwene said dryly, snapping her fan shut for emphasis. It still stunned her, how easily she could say that now. Her stomach still clenched and icy fingers still crawled her spine, but she no longer wanted to scream or run weeping. It was possible to become used to anything. I overheard Leandrin that once talking to Tamail, Amiko said wearily, starting a tale she had told them many times. In the first days of her captivity she had tried to improve her story, but the more she elaborated, the more she had tangled herself in her own lies. Now she almost always told it the same way, word for word. If you could have seen Leandrin's face when she saw me— she would have murdered me on the spot had she thought I had heard anything. And Tamail likes to hurt people. She enjoys it. I only heard a little before they saw me. Leandrin said there was something in Tanchico, something dangerous to... to him. She meant Rand. She could not say his name, and a mention of the dragon reborn was enough to send her into tears. Leandrin said it was dangerous to whoever used it, too. Almost as dangerous as to him. That is why she had not already gone after it, and she said being able to channel would not protect him. She said, when we find it, his filthy ability will bind him for us. Sweat ran down her face, but she shivered almost uncontrollably. Not a word had changed. Egwene opened her mouth, but Nynaeve spoke first. I've heard enough of this. Let us see if the other has anything new to say. Egwene glared at her, and Nynaeve stared back just as hard, neither blinking. Sometimes she thinks she's still the wisdom, Egwene thought grimly, and I am still the village girl to teach about herbs. She had better realize things are different now. Nynaeve was strong in the power, stronger than Egwene, but only when she could actually manage to channel. Unless angry, Nynaeve could not channel at all. Elaine usually smoothed things over when it came to this, as it did more often than it should. By the time Egwene thought of smoothing matters herself, she had almost always dug in her heels and flared back, and trying to be soothing then would only be backing down. That was how Nynaeve would see it, she was sure. She could not remember Nynaeve ever making any move to back down, so why should she? 
This time Elaine was not there. Moiraine had summoned the daughter heir with a word and a gesture to follow the maiden who had come for the eyes Sedai. Without her, the tension stretched, each of the accepted waiting for the other to blink first. At the end I barely breathed. She kept herself strictly out of their confrontations. No doubt she considered it simple wisdom to stand clear. Strangely, it was Amiko who broke the impasse this time, though likely all she meant to do was demonstrate her cooperation. She turned to face the far wall, waiting patiently to be bound. The foolishness of it struck Egwene suddenly. She was the only woman in the room who could channel, unless Nynaeve grew angry, or Joia's shield failed. She tested the weave of spirit again without thinking, and she indulged in a staring match while Amiko waited to accept her bonds. At another time she might have laughed at herself aloud. Instead she opened herself to Sa'idar, that never-seen, ever-felt, glowing warmth that seemed always to be just beyond the corner of her eye. The one power filled her, like joyous life itself redoubled, and she wove the flows around Amiko. Nynaeve merely grunted. It was doubtful she was mad enough to sense what Egwene was doing. She could not, without her temper up. Yet she could see Amiko stiffen as the flows of air touched her, then slump, half supported by the flows, as if to show how little she was resisting. Avienda shuddered, the way she had taken to doing whenever she knew the power was being channeled near her. Egwene wove blocks for Amiko's ears. Questioning them, one at a time, did little good if they could hear each other's stories, and turned to Joia. She shifted her fan from hand to hand so she could wipe them on her dress, and stopped with a grimace of distaste. Her sweaty palms had nothing to do with the temperature. Her face, Avienda said abruptly, and surprisingly, she almost never spoke unless addressed by Moiraine or one of the others. Amiko's face! She does not have the look she did, as if the years had passed her by. Not as much as she did. Is that because she was... because she was stilled? She finished in a breathless rush. She had picked up a few habits being so much around them. No woman of the tower could speak of stilling without a chill. Egwene moved down the table to where she could see Amiko's face from the side and yet stay out of Joia's vision. Joia's eyes always turned her stomach to a lump of ice. Avienda was right. That was the difference she herself had noticed and not understood. Amiko looked young, perhaps younger than her years, but it was not quite the agelessness of Eyes Sedai, who had worked years with the One Power. You have sharp eyes, Avienda, but I don't know if this has anything to do with stilling. It must, though, I suppose. I don't know what else could cause it. She realized that did not sound very much like an eyes Sedai, who generally spoke as if they knew everything. When an eyes Sedai said she did not know, she usually managed to make her denial appear to cloak volumes of knowledge. While she was racking her brain for something properly portentous, Nynaeve came to her rescue. Relatively few eyes Sedai have ever been burned out, Avienda, and far fewer stilled. Burned out was what it was called when it happened by accident. Officially, stilling resulted from trial and sentence. Egwene could not see the point of it, really. It was like having two words for falling down the stairs, depending on whether you tripped or were pushed. For that, most eyes Sedai seemed to see it the same, except when teaching novices or accepted. Three words, actually. Men were gentled, must be gentled, before they went mad. Only now there was Rand, and the tower did not dare gentle him. Nynaeve had put on a lecturing tone, no doubt trying to sound eyes Sedai. She was doing an imitation of Sheriam before a class, Egwene realized, hands clasped at her waist, smiling slightly as if it were all so simple when you applied yourself. Stilling is not a thing anyone would choose to study, you understand, Nynaeve continued. It is generally accepted to be irreversible. What makes a woman able to channel cannot be replaced once it is removed, any more than a hand that has been cut off can be healed back into existence. 
At least no one had ever been able to heal Stilling. There had been attempts. What Nynaeve said was generally true, yet some sisters of the brown Aja would study almost anything if given the chance, and some yellow sisters, the best healers, would try to learn to heal anything. But even a hint of success at healing a woman who had been stilled was non-existent. Aside from that one hard fact, little is known. Women who are stilled seldom live more than a few years. They seem to stop wanting to live. They give up. As I said, it is an unpleasant subject. Avienda shifted uncomfortably. I only thought that might be it, she said in a low voice. Egwene thought it might be too. She resolved to ask Moiraine if she ever saw her without Avienda there as well. It seemed to her that their deceit got in the way almost as much as it helped. Let us see if Joia still tells the same tale, too. Even so, she had to take herself in hand before she could unravel the flows of air woven around the dark friend. Joia must have been stiff from standing so still for so long, but she turned smoothly to face them. The sweat beating her forehead could not diminish her dignity and presence, any more than her drab, rough dress lessened the sense of her being there by choice. She was a handsome woman, with something motherly about her face, despite its ageless smoothness, something comforting. But the dark eyes set in that face made a hawk's look kind. She smiled at them, a smile that never reached those eyes. The light illumined you. May the hand of the Creator shelter you. I will not hear that out of you. Nynaeve's voice was quiet and calm, but she tossed her braid over her shoulder and gripped the end in her fist the way she did when angry or uneasy. Egwene did not think she was uneasy. Joia did not seem to make Nynaeve's skin crawl as she did Egwene's. I have repented my sins, Joia said smoothly. The dragon is reborn, and he holds Colindor. The prophecies are fulfilled. The Dark One must fail. I can see that now. My repentance is real. No one can walk so long in the shadow that she cannot come again to the light. Nynaeve's face had grown darker by the word. Egwene was sure she was furious enough to channel now, but if she did, it would probably be to strangle Joia. Egwene did not believe Joia's repentance any more than Nynaeve, of course, but the woman's information might be real. Joia was quite capable of a cold decision to go over to what she believed would be the winning side. Or she might only be buying time, lying, in hope of rescue. Lies should not have been possible for an eyes Sadai, even one who had lost all right to the name, not outright lies. The very first of the three oaths, taken with the oath rod in hand, should have seen to that. But whatever oaths to the Dark One were sworn on joining the Black Aja, they seemed to sever all three oaths. Well, the Amerlin had sent them out to hunt the Black Aja, to hunt Leandrin and the other twelve who had done murder and fled the tower, and all they had to go on now was what these two could or would tell them. Give us your tale again, Egwene commanded. Use different words this time. I am tired of listening to memorized stories. If she was lying, there was more chance she would trip herself up telling it differently. We will hear you out. That was for Nynaeve's benefit. She gave a loud sniff, then a curt nod. Joia shrugged. As you wish. Let me see. Different words. The false dragon... Mazrim Taim, who was captured in Saldeia, can channel with incredible strength. Perhaps as much as Randall Thor, or nearly so, if the reports can be believed. Before he can be brought to Tarvalan and gentled, Leandrin means to break him free. He will be proclaimed as the Dragon Reborn, his name given as Randall Thor, and then he will be set to destruction on such a scale as the world has not seen since the War of the Hundred Years. That is impossible, Nynaeve broke in. The pattern will not accept a false dragon. Not now that Rand has proclaimed himself. Egwene sighed. They had had this out before, but Nynaeve always argued the point. 
she was not sure Nynaeve really believed that Rand was the dragon reborn, no matter what she said, no matter the prophecies and Colindor and the fall of the stone. Nynaeve was just enough older than he to have looked after him when he was a child, just as she had after Egwene. He was an Eamon's fielder, and Nynaeve still saw her first duty as protecting the people of Eamon's field. Is that what Moiraine told you? Joia asked with a touch of contempt. Moiraine has spent little time in the tower since she was raised, and not much more with the sisters anywhere. I suppose she knows the workings of village life, perhaps even something of the politics between nations, but she does claim certainty about matters learned only through study and discussion with those who know. Still, she might be correct. Mazarin Taim might well find it impossible to proclaim himself. But if others do it for him, is there a difference that matters? Egwene wished Moiraine would come back. The woman would not speak so confidently if Moiraine were there. Joia knew very well that she and Nynaeve were only accepted. It made a difference. Go on, Egwene said, almost as harshly as Nynaeve. And remember, different words... Of course, Joia replied, as though responding to a gracious invitation, but her eyes glittered like chips of black glass. You can see the obvious result. Randall Thor will be blamed for the depredations of Randall Thor. Even proof that they are not the same man may well be dismissed. After all, who can say what tricks the dragon reborn can play? Perhaps put himself in two places at once— even the sort who have always rallied to a false dragon will hesitate in the face of the indiscriminate slaughter and worse laid at his feet. Those who do not shrink at such butchery will seek out the Randall Thor who seems to revel in blood. The nations will unite as they did in the Aiel War. She gave Avienda an apologetic smile, incongruous beneath those merciless eyes. But no doubt much more quickly— even the dragon reborn cannot stand against that, not forever. He will be crushed before the last battle even begins, by the very ones he was meant to save. The Dark One will break free. The day of Tormon Gedon will come, and the shadow will cover the earth and remake the pattern for all time. That is Leandrin's plan. There was not a hint of satisfaction in her voice, but no horror either. It was a plausible story, more plausible than Amico's tale of a few eavesdropped sentences, but Egwene believed Amico and not Joia. Perhaps because she wanted to. A vague threat in Tanchico was easier to face than this fully fleshed plan to turn every hand against Rand. No, she thought. Joia is lying, I am sure she is. Yet they could not afford to ignore either story. But they could not chase after both, not with any hope of success. The door banged open, and Moiraine strode in, with Elaine following. The daughter heir was frowning at the floor in front of her toes, lost in dark thoughts. But Moiraine... For once the eyes, said eyes, serenity had vanished. Fury painted her face. Chapter 6 Doorways Rand Althor, Moiraine told the heir in a low, tight voice, is a mule-headed, stone-willed fool of a, a... a man. Elaine lifted her chin angrily. Her childhood nurse, Linny, used to say you could weave silk from pig bristles before you could make a man anything but a man. But that was no excuse for Rand. We breed them that way in the two rivers. Nynaeve was suddenly all half-suppressed smiles and satisfaction. She seldom hid her dislike of the eyes Sedai half as well as she thought she did. Two rivers women never have any trouble with them. From the startled look Egwene gave her, that was a lie big enough to warrant having her mouth washed out. Moiraine's brows drew down as if she were about to reply to Nynaeve in harder kind. Elaine stirred, but she could not find anything to say that would head off argument. Rand kept dancing through her head. He had no right. But... What right did she have? Egwene spoke instead. What did he do, Moiraine? The eyes, Sedai's eyes, swung to Egwene, a stare so hard that the younger woman stepped back and snapped her fan open, nervously fluttering it at her face. 
but Moiraine's gaze settled on Joia and Amico, the one watching her warily, the other bound and unaware of anything but the far wall. Elaine gave a small start at realizing Joia was not bound. Hastily she checked the shield blocking the woman from the true source. She hoped none of the others had noticed her jump. Joia frightened her nearly to death, but Egwene and Nynaeve were no more scared of the woman than Moiraine was. Sometimes it was difficult being as brave as the daughter heir of Andor should be. She often found herself wishing she could manage as well as those two. The gods, Moiraine muttered as if to herself, I saw them in the corridor still, and never thought. She smoothed her dress, composing herself with an obvious effort. Elaine did not believe she had ever seen Moiraine so out of herself as tonight. But then the eyes, said I, had cause. No more than I do. Well, do I? She found herself trying not to meet Egwene's eyes. Had it been Egwene or Nynaeve or Elaine who was off balance, Joia would surely have said something, subtle and of two meanings, calculated to upset them a little more. If they had been alone, at least. With Moiraine, she only watched uneasily, silently. Moiraine walked the length of the table, her calm restored. Joia was nearly ahead the taller, but had she also been dressed in silks, there would have been no doubt which was in command of the situation. Joia did not quite draw back, but her hands tightened on her skirts for a moment before she could master them. "'I have made arrangements,' Moiraine said quietly. "'In four days you will be taken upriver by ship, to Tarvalin and the Tower. There they are not so gentle as we have been.' If you have not found the truth so far, find it before you reach South Harbor, or you will assuredly go to the gallows in the traitor's court. I will not speak to you again unless you send word that you have something new to tell. And I do not want to hear a word from you, not one word, unless it is new. Believe me, it will save you pain in Tarvalin. Avienda, will you tell the captain to bring in two of his men? Elaine blinked as the Aiel woman unfolded herself and vanished through the doorway. Sometimes Avienda could be so still she seemed not to be there. Joia's face worked as if she wanted to speak, but Moiraine stared up at her, and finally the dark friend turned her eyes away. They glittered like a raven's, full of black murder, but she held her tongue. To Elaine's eyes, a golden-white glow suddenly surrounded Moiraine, the glow of a woman embracing Sa'idar. Only another woman trained to channel could have seen it. The flows holding Amiko unraveled more quickly than Elaine could have managed. She was stronger than Moiraine, potentially at least. In the tower, the women teaching her had been almost unbelieving at her potential, and at Egwene's and Nynaeve's. Nynaeve was the strongest of them all when she could manage to channel. But Moiraine had the experience. What they were still learning to do, Moiraine could do half asleep. Yet there were some things Elaine could do, and the other two, that the eyes Sedai could not. It was a small satisfaction in the face of how easily Moiraine cowed Joia. Freed, able to hear, Amiko turned and became aware of Moiraine for the first time, with a squeak, she dropped a curtsy as deep as any new novice. Joia was glaring at the door, avoiding anyone's gaze. Nynaeve, arms crossed and knuckles white from gripping her braid, was giving Moiraine a stare almost as murderous as Joia's. Egwene fingered her skirt and glowered at Joia. Elaine frowned, wishing she were as brave as Egwene, wishing she did not feel she was betraying her friend. Into that walked the captain, with two more defenders in black and gold on his heels. Avienda was not with them. It seemed she had taken her opportunity to escape Eyes Sedai. The grizzled officer, two short white plumes on his rimmed helmet, shied as his eyes met Joia's, though she did not even seem to see him. His gaze skittered from woman to woman uncertainly. The mood of the room was trouble, and a wise man did not want any part of trouble among this sort of women. The two soldiers clutched their tall spears to their sides, almost as if they feared they might have to defend themselves. Perhaps they did fear it. "'You will take these two back to their cells,' Moiraine told the officer curtly. 
Repeat your instructions. I want no mistakes. Yes, I— The captain's throat seemed to seize. He gulped a breath. Yes, my lady, he said, watching her anxiously to see if that would do. When she only continued to look at him, waiting, he gave an audible sigh of relief. The prisoners are to talk to no one except myself, not even each other. Twenty men in the guardroom and two outside each cell at all times. Four if a cell door has to be opened for any reason. I myself will watch their food prepared and take it to them. All as you have commanded, my lady. A hint of question tinged his voice. A hundred rumors floated through the stone concerning the prisoners and why two women needed to be guarded so heavily. And there were whispered stories about the eyes Sadai, each darker than the last. Very good, Moiraine said. Take them. It was not clear who was more eager to leave the room, the prisoners or the guards. Even Joia stepped quickly, as if she could not bear keeping silent near Moiraine for another moment. Elaine was certain she had kept her face calm since entering the room, but Egwene came to her, put an arm around her. What is the matter, Elaine? You look about to cry. The concern in her voice made Elaine feel like bursting into tears. Light, she thought, I will not be that silly, I will not. A weeping woman is a bucket with no bottom. Linny had been full of sayings like that. Three times. Nynaeve burst out at Moiraine. Only three. You have consented to help us question them. This time you vanish before we begin, and now you calmly announce you are sending them off to Tarvalin. If you will not help, at least do not interfere. Do not presume on the Amerlin's authority too far, Moiraine said coolly. She may have set you to chase Leandrin, but you are still only accepted and woefully ignorant, whatever letters you carry. Or did you mean to keep questioning them forever before reaching a decision? You Two Rivers people seem to work at avoiding decisions that must be made. Nynaeve opened and closed her mouth, eyes bulging, as if wondering which accusation to answer first. But Moiraine turned to Egwene and Elaine. Pull yourself together, Elaine. How you can carry out the Armelin's orders if you think every land has the customs you were born to, I do not know. And I do not know why you are so upset. Do not let your feelings hurt others. What do you mean? Egwene said. What customs? What are you talking about? Berylaine was in Rand's chambers, Elaine said in a small voice before she could stop herself. Her eyes flickered guiltily toward Egwene. Surely she had kept her own feelings hidden. Moiraine gave her a reproachful look and sighed. I would have spared you this if I could, Egwene. If Elaine had not let her disgust with Berylaine overcome her sense, the customs of Mayenne are not those either of you were born to. Egwene, I know what you feel for Rand, but you must realize by now that nothing can come of it. He belongs to the pattern, and to history. Seemingly ignoring the eyes Sadai, Egwene peered into Elaine's eyes. Elaine wanted to look away, and could not. Suddenly Egwene leaned closer, whispering behind a cupped hand, I love him, like a brother, and you like a sister. I wish you well of him. Elaine's eyes widened, a smile spreading slowly across her face. She answered Egwene's hug with a fierce hug of her own. Thank you, she murmured softly. I love you too, sister. Oh, thank you. She got it wrong. Egwene said half to herself, a delighted grin blooming on her face. Have you ever been in love, Moiraine? What a startling question. Elaine could not imagine the eyes Sedai in love. Moiraine was blue, Aja, and it was said blue sisters gave all their passions to causes. The slender woman was not at all taken aback. For a long moment she looked levelly at the pair of them, each with an arm around the other. Finally, she said, I could wager I know the face of the man I will marry better than either of you knows that of your future husband. Egwene gaped in surprise. Who? Elaine gasped. The eyes Sadai appeared regretful of having spoken. Perhaps I only meant we share an ignorance. Do not read too much into a few words. She looked at Nynaeve consideringly. Should I ever choose a man? Should I say? It will not be Lan. That much I will say.
That was a sop to Nynaeve, but Nynaeve did not seem to like hearing it. Nynaeve had what Linny would have called a hard patch to hoe, loving not just a warder, but a man who tried to deny returning her love. Fool man that he was, he talked of the war against the shadow he could not stop fighting and could never win, of refusing to dress Nynaeve in widow's clothes for her wedding feast. Silly things of that sort. Elaine did not see how Nynaeve put up with it. She was not a very patient woman. "'If you are finished chatting about men,' Nynaeve said acidly, as though to prove just that, "'perhaps we can go back to what is important.' Gripping her braid hard, she picked up speed and force as she went along, like a water-wheel with the gears disengaged. "'How are we to decide whether Joia is lying or Amiko, if you send them away, or whether they both are, or neither?' I don't relish dithering here, Moiré, no matter what you think, but I have walked into too many traps to want to walk into another. And I don't want to run after Jack-o'-the-Wisps, either. I—we are the ones the Amarlin sent after Leandrin and her cronies. Since you don't seem to think they are important enough to spare more than a moment to help us, the least you can do is not crack our ankles with a broom. She seemed about to rip that braid free and try to strangle the eyes Sedai with it, and Moiraine wore a dangerously cool crystalline calm that suggested she might be ready to teach again the lesson on holding her tongue that she had taught Joia. It was, Elaine decided, time for her to stop moping. She did not know how she had fallen into the role of peacemaker among these women. Sometimes she wanted to take them all by the scruff of the neck and shake them, but her mother always said no good decision was ever made in anger. "'You might add to your list of what you want to know,' she said. "'Why were we summoned to Rand? "'That is where Corrine took us. "'He is all right now, of course. "'Moraine healed him.' "'She could not repress a shudder, "'thinking of her brief glimpse inside his chamber, "'but the diversion worked a charm. "'Healed?' Nynaeve gasped. "'What happened to him?' "'He almost died.' The eyes, Sedai said, as calmly as if she were saying he had a pot of tea. Elaine felt Egwene tremble as they listened to Moiraine's dispassionate report, but perhaps some of the trembling was her own. Bubbles of evil drifting through the pattern, reflections leaping out of mirrors, Rand a mass of blood and wounds. Almost as an afterthought, Moiraine added that she was sure Perrin and Matt had experienced something of the same but escaped unharmed. The woman must have ice instead of blood. No, she was heated enough about Rand's stubbornness, and she wasn't cold when she spoke of marrying, however much she pretended to be. But now she could have been discussing whether a bolt of silk was the right color for a dress. And these... these things will keep on, Egwene said when Moiraine finished. Is there nothing you can do to stop it, or that Rand can do? The small blue stone dangling from Moiraine's hair swung as she shook her head. Not until he learns to control his abilities. Perhaps not then. I do not know if even he will be strong enough to push the miasma away from himself. At the least, though, he will be better able to defend himself. Can't you do something to help him? Nynaeve demanded. You are the one of us who is supposed to know everything, or pretends to. Can't you teach him? Some part of it, anyway? And don't quote proverbs about birds teaching fish to fly. You would know better, Moiraine replied, if you had taken the advantage of your studies that you should have. You should know better. You want to know how to use the power, Nynaeve, but you do not care to learn about the power. Sa'idin is not Sa'idar. The flows are different, the ways of weaving are different. The bird has a better chance. This time Egwene took a turn at diffusing tension. What is Rand being stubborn about now? Nynaeve opened her mouth, and she added, He can be stubborn as a stone sometimes. Nynaeve shut her mouth with a snap. They all knew how true that was. Moiraine eyed them, considering. At times Elaine was not sure how much the eyes Sedai trusted them, or anyone. He must move, the eyes Sedai said at last. Instead he sits here, and the Teherans already begin to lose their fear of him. He sits here, and the longer he sits, doing nothing, the more the Forsaken will see his inaction as a sign of weakness. 
The pattern moves and flows, only the dead are still. He must act or he will die. From a crossbow bolt in his back, or poison in his food, or the forsaken banding together to rip his soul from his body, he must act or die. Elaine winced at each danger on her list. That they were real only made it worse. And you know what he must do, don't you? Nynaeve said tightly. You have this action planned. Moiré nodded. Would you rather he go herring off alone once more? I dare not risk it. This time he might be dead, or worse, before I find him. That was true enough. Rand hardly knew what he was doing, and Elaine was sure Moiraine had no wish to lose the little guidance she still gave him, the little he allowed her to give. Will you share your plan for him with us? Egwene demanded. She was certainly not helping soothe the air now. Yes, do, Elaine said, surprising herself with a cool echo of Egwene's tone. Confrontation was not her way when it could be avoided. Her mother always said it was better to guide people than try to hammer them into line. If their manner irritated Moiraine, she gave no sign of it. As long as you understand that you must keep it to yourselves, a plan revealed is a plan doomed to fail. Yes, I see you do understand. Elaine certainly did. The plan was dangerous, and Moiraine was not sure it would work. Samael is an Ilian. The eyes said I went on. The Teherans are always as ripe for war with Ilian as the other way round. They have been killing each other off and on for a thousand years, and they speak of their chance for it as other men speak of the next feast day. I doubt even knowing of Samael's presence would change that, not with a dragon reborn to lead them. Tyr will follow Rand eagerly enough in that enterprise, and if he brings Samael down, he— Light! Nynaeve exclaimed. You not only want him to start a war, you want him to seek out one of the Forsaken. No wonder he is being stubborn. He is not a fool for a man. He must face the Dark One in the end, Moiraine said calmly. Do you truly think he can avoid the Forsaken now? As for war, there are wars enough without him, and every one worse than useless. Any war is useless, Elaine began, then faltered as comprehension suddenly filled her. Sadness and regret had to show on her face, too, but certainly comprehension. Her mother had lectured her often on how a nation was led as well as how it was governed, two very different things, but both necessary. And sometimes things had to be done for both that were worse than unpleasant, although the price of not doing them was worse still. Moiraine gave her a sympathetic look. It is not always pleasant, is it? Your mother began when you were just old enough to understand, I suppose, teaching you what you will need to rule after her. Moiraine had grown up in the royal palace in Carienne, not destined to reign, but related to the ruling family, and no doubt overhearing the same lectures. Yet sometimes it seems ignorance would be better to be a farm woman knowing nothing beyond the boundaries of her fields. More riddles, Nynaeve said contemptuously. War used to be something I heard about from peddlers, something far away that I didn't really understand. I know what it is now, men killing men, men behaving like animals, reduced to animals, villages burned, farms and fields burned, hunger, disease, and death, for the innocent as the guilty. What makes this war of yours better, Moiraine? What makes it cleaner? Elaine, Moiraine said quietly. She shook her head. She did not want to be the one to explain this, but she was not sure even her mother sitting on the lion throne could have kept silent under Moiraine's compelling dark-eyed stare. War will come whether Rand begins it or not, she said reluctantly. Egwene stepped back a pace, staring at her in disbelief, no sharper than that on Nynaeve's face. The incredulity faded from both women as she continued. The Forsaken will not stand idly and wait. Samael cannot be the only one to have seized a nation's reins, just the lone one we know. They will come after Rand eventually, in their own persons perhaps, but certainly with whatever armies they command, and the nations that are free of the Forsaken? How many will cry glory to the dragon banner, and follow him to Tarmon Gedon? And how many will convince themselves the fall of the stone is a lie, and Rand only another false dragon who must be put down, a false dragon perhaps strong enough to threaten them if they do not move against him first?
One way or another, war will come. She cut off sharply. There was more to it, but she could not, would not, tell them that part. Moiraine was not so reticent. Very good, she said, nodding, yet incomplete. The look she gave Elaine said she knew Elaine had left out what she had on purpose. Hands folded calmly at her waist, she addressed Nynaeve and Egwene. Nothing makes this war better or cleaner, except that it will cement the Tearins to him, and the Ilioners will end up following him just as the Tearins do now. How could they not, once the dragon banner flies over Ilion? Just the news of his victory might decide the wars in Tarabon and Arad Daman in his favor. There are wars ended for you. In one stroke he will make himself so strong in terms of men and swords that only a coalition of every remaining nation from here to the Blight can defeat him, and with the same blow he shows the Forsaken that he is not a plump partridge on a limb for the netting. That will make them wary, and buy him time to learn to use his strength. He must move first. Be the hammer, not the nail. The eye Sedai grimaced slightly, a hint of her earlier anger marring her calm. He must move first. And what does he do? He reads. Reads himself into deeper trouble. Nynaeve looked shaken, as if she could see all the battles and death. Egwene's dark eyes were large with horrified understanding. Their faces made Elaine shiver. One had watched Rand grow up, the other had grown up with him. And now they saw him starting wars. Not the dragon reborn, but Randall Thor. Egwene struggled visibly, latching on to the smallest part, the most inconsequential of what Moiraine had said. How can reading put him in trouble? He has decided to find out for himself what the prophecies of the dragon say. Moiraine's face remained cool and smooth, but suddenly she sounded almost as tired as Elaine felt. They may have been proscribed in tear, but the chief librarian had nine different translations in a locked chest. Rand has them all now. I pointed out the verse that applies here, and he quoted it to me from an old Condori translation. Power of the shadow made human flesh, wakened to turmoil, strife, and ruin. The reborn one, marked and bleeding, dances the sword in dreams and mist, changed the shadow sworn to his will. From the city, lost and forsaken, leads the spears to war once more, breaks the spears and makes them see truth, long hidden in the ancient dream. She grimaced. It applies to this as well as it does to anything. Ilion under Samael is surely a forsaken city. Lead the tear in spears to war, chain Samael, and he has fulfilled the verse. The ancient dream of the dragon reborn, but he will not see it. He even has a copy in the old tongue, as if he understood two words. He runs after shadows, and Samael or Ravin or Lanfear may have him by the throat before I can convince him of his mistake. He is desperate. Nynaeve's gentle tone was not for Moiraine, Elaine was sure, but for Rand. Desperate and trying to find his way. So am I desperate, Moiraine said firmly. I have dedicated my life to finding him, and I will not let him fail if I can prevent it. I am almost desperate enough to— She broke off, pursing her lips. Let it be enough that I will do what I must. But it isn't enough, Egwene said sharply. What is it you'll do? You have other matters to concern you, the eyes, Sedai said. The black Aja— No! Elaine's voice was knife-edged and commanding. Her knuckles are hard white where she gripped her soft blue skirts. You keep many secrets, Moiraine, but tell us this. What do you mean to do to him? An image flashed in her mind of seizing Moiraine and shaking the truth out of her, if need be. Do to him nothing. Oh, very well. There is no reason you should not know. You have seen what the Taerians call the Great Holding. Oddly, for a people that feared the power so, the Taerians held in the stone a collection of objects connected to the power, second only to that in the White Tower. 
Elaine, for one, thought it was because they had been forced to guard Colindor so long, whether they wanted or not. Even the sword that is not a sword might seem less than what it was when it was one among many. But the Taerins had never been able to make themselves display their prizes. The great holding was kept in a filthy series of crowded rooms buried even deeper than the dungeons. When Elaine had first seen them, the locks and the doors had long since rusted shut, where the doors had not simply collapsed from dry rot. We spent an entire day down there, Nynaeve said, to see if Leandrin and her friends took anything. I don't think they did. Everything was buried in dust and mold. It will take ten riverboats to transport all of it to the tower. Perhaps they can make some sense of it there. I surely could not. The temptation to prod Moiraine was apparently too great to avoid, for she added, You would know all this if you had given us a little more of your time. Moiraine took no notice. She seemed to be looking inward, examining her own thoughts, and she spoke almost to herself. There is one particular tear on griot in the holding, a thing like a red stone door frame, subtly twisted to the eye. If I cannot make him reach some decision, I may have to step through. The small blue stone on her forehead trembled, sparkling. Apparently she was not eager to take that step. At the mention of Tyr on Griot, Egwene instinctively touched the bodice of her dress. She had sewn a small pocket there herself to hide the stone ring it now held. That ring was a Tyr on Griot, powerful in its way, if small, and Elaine was one of only three women who knew she had it. Moiraine was not one of the three. They were strange things, Tiran Griel, fragments of the age of legends like Angreal and Sa Angreal, if more numerous. Tiran Griel used the one power instead of magnifying it. Each had apparently been made to do one thing and one thing alone. But though some were used now, no one was sure if those uses were anything like what they had been made for. The oath rod, on which a woman took the three oaths on being raised, eyes sedai, was a tear on griot that made those oaths a part of her flesh and bone. The last test a novice took on being raised to accept it was inside another tear on griot that ferreted out her most heartfelt fears and made them seem real, or perhaps took her to a place where they were real. Odd things could happen with tear on griot. I said I had been burned out or killed, or had simply vanished in studying them, and in using them. I saw that doorway, Elaine said, in the last room at the end of the hall. My lamp went out, and I fell three times before I made it to the door. A slight flush of embarrassment reddened her cheeks. I was afraid to channel in there, even to relight the lamp. Much of it looks rubbish to me. I think the Taerins simply grabbed anything that anyone hinted might be connected to the power, but I thought if I channeled I might accidentally empower something that wasn't rubbish, and who knows what it might do. And if you had stumbled in the dark and fallen through the twisted doorway? Moiraine said wryly. That needs no channeling, only to step through. To what purpose? Nynaeve asked. To gain answers. Three answers, each true, about past, present, or future. Elaine's first thought was for the children's tale, Billy Under the Hill, but only because of the three answers. A second thought came on its heels, and not to her alone. She spoke while Nynaeve and Egwene were still opening their mouths. Moiraine, this solves our problem. We can ask whether Joia or Amiko is telling the truth. We can ask where Leandrin and the others are, the names of the Black Aja still in the tower. We can ask what this thing is that is dangerous to Rand, Egwene put in, and Nynaeve added. Why haven't you told us of this before? Why have you let us go on listening to the same tales day after day, when we could have settled it all by now? The eyes said I winced and threw up her hands. You three rush in blindly where Lan and a hundred waters would tread warily. Why do you think I have not stepped through? Days ago I could have asked what Rand must do to survive and triumph how he can defeat the Forsaken and the Dark One, how he can learn to control the power and hold off madness long enough to do what he must. She waited, hands on hips, while it sank in. None of them spoke. There are rules, she went on, and dangers. No one may step through more than once, only once. 
You may ask three questions, but you must ask all three and hear the answers before you may leave. Frivolous questions are punished, it seems, but it also seems what may be serious for one can be frivolous coming from another. Most importantly, questions touching the shadow have dire consequences. If you asked about the black archer, you might be returned dead, or come out a gibbering madwoman, if you came out at all. As for Rand, I am not certain it is possible to ask a question about the dragon reborn that does not touch the shadow in some way. You see, sometimes there are reasons for caution. How do you know all this? Nynaeve demanded. Planting fists on hips, she confronted the eyes Sedai. The High Lords surely never let eyes Sedai study anything in the holding. From the filth down there, none of it has seen sunlight in a hundred years or more. More, I should think, Moraine told her calmly. They ceased their collecting nearly three hundred years gone. It was just before they stopped completely that they acquired this Tirangrio. Up until then it was the possession of the Firsts of Mayenne, who used its answers to help keep Mayan out of Tyr's grasp, and they allowed Aes Sedai to study it, in secret, of course. Mayan has never dared anger Tyr too openly. If it was so important to Mayen, Nynaeve said suspiciously, why is it here in the stone? Because firsts have made bad decisions as well as good in trying to keep Mayen free of Tyr. Three hundred years ago the High Lords were planning to build a fleet to follow Mayenner ships and find the oilfish shoals. Halvar, the then first, raised the price of Mayenner lamp oil well above that of oil from Tyr's olives, and to further convince the High Lords that Mayen would always put its own interests behind those of Tyr, made them a gift of the Tyr Angrio. He had already used it, so it was no further good to him and he was almost as young as Berylane is now, apparently with a long reign ahead of him, and many years of needing Tear in goodwill. He was a fool, Elaine muttered. My mother would never make such a mistake. Perhaps not, Moraine said, but then Andor is not a small nation cornered by a much larger and stronger. Halvar was a fool, as it turned out. The High Lords had him assassinated the very next year, but his foolishness does present me with an opportunity if I need it. A dangerous one, yet better than none. Nynaeve muttered to herself, perhaps disappointed that the eyes Sedai had not tripped herself up. It leaves the rest of us right where we were, Egwene sighed, not knowing who is lying or whether they both are. Question them again, if you wish, Warrain said. You have until they are put on the ship, though I very much doubt either will change her tale now. My advice is to concentrate on Tanchico. If Joia speaks truly, it will take I, Sedai, and warders to guard Mazrim Taim, not just the three of you. I sent a warning to the Amerlin by pigeon when I first heard Joia's story. In fact, I sent three pigeons to make sure one reaches the tower. So kind of you to keep us informed. Elaine murmured coolly. The woman did go her own way. Just because they were only pretending to be full eyes, said I, was no reason for Moiraine to keep them in the dark. The Armelin had sent them out to hunt the Black Archer. Moiraine inclined her head briefly, as if accepting the thanks for real. You're welcome. Remember that you are the hounds the Armelin set after the Black Archer. Her slight smile at Elaine's start said she knew exactly what Elaine had been thinking. The decision on where to course must be yours. You have pointed that out to me as well, she added dryly. I trust it will prove an easier decision than mine, and I trust you will sleep well, what sleep is left before daybreak. A good night to you. That woman... Elaine muttered when the door had closed behind the eyes, said I. Sometimes I could almost strangle her. She dropped into one of the chairs at the table and sat frowning at her hands in her lap. Nynaeve gave a grunt that might have been agreement as she went to a narrow table against the wall where silver goblets and spice jars stood next to two pitchers. One pitcher, full of wine, rested in a gleaming bowl of now mostly melted ice, 
brought all the way from the spine of the world, packed in chests of sawdust. Ice in the summer to chill a high lord's drink. Elaine could barely imagine such a thing. A cool drink before bed will do us all good, Nynaeve said, busying herself with wine and water and spices. Elaine lifted her head as Egwene took a seat next to her. Did you mean what you said, Egwene, about Rand? Egwene nodded, and Elaine sighed. Do you remember what Min used to say, all her jokes about sharing him? I sometimes wondered if that was a viewing she did not tell us about. I thought she meant we both loved him, and she knew it. But you had the right to him, and I didn't know what to do. I still don't. Egwene, he loves you. He will just have to be put straight, Egwene said firmly. When I marry, it will be because I want to, not just because a man expects me to love him. I will be gentle with him, Elaine, but before I am done, he will know he is free, whether he wants to be or not. My mother says men are different from us. She says we want to be in love, but only with the one we want. A man needs to be in love, but he will love the first woman to tie a string to his heart. That is all very well. Elaine said in a tight voice, but Berylaine was in his chambers. Egwene sniffed. Whatever she intends, Berylaine won't keep her mind on one man long enough to make him love her. Two days ago she was casting eyes at Rourke. In two more she'll be smiling at someone else. She is like Els Grinwell. You remember her, the novice who spent all her time out at the practice yards, fluttering her eyelashes at the warders? She was not just fluttering her eyelashes in his bedchamber at this hour. She was wearing even less than usual, if that is possible. Do you mean to let her have him, then? No, Elaine said it very fiercely, and she meant it. But in the next breath she was full of despair. Oh, Egwene, I do not know what to do. I love him. I want to marry him. Light, what will Mother say? I would rather spend a night in Joia's cell than listen to the lectures Mother will give me. Andoran nobles, even in royal families, married commoners often enough that it hardly occasioned comment, in Andor at least, but Rand was not exactly the usual run of commoner. Her mother was quite capable of actually sending Linny to drag her home by her ear. More gays can hardly say much if Matt is to be believed, Egwene said comfortingly, or even half believed. This Lord Gabriel your mother is mooning after hardly sounds the choice of a woman thinking with her head. I am sure Matt exaggerated, Elaine replied primly. Her mother was too shrewd to make herself a fool over any man. If Lord Gabriel, she had never even heard of him before Matt spoke his name, if this fellow dreamed he could gain power through more gaze, she would give him a rude awakening. Nynaeve brought three goblets of spiced wine to the table, beads of condensation running down their shining sides, and small green and gold woven straw mats to put them on so the damp would not mar the table's polish. So, she said, taking a chair, you've discovered you are in love with Rand, Elaine, and Egwene has discovered she isn't. The two younger women gaped at her, one dark, the other fair, yet a near mirror image of astonishment. I have eyes. Nynaeve said complacently, and ears, when you don't take the trouble to whisper. She sipped at her wine, and her voice grew cold when she continued. What do you mean to do about it? If that chit Berylaine has her claws into him, it will not be easy to pry them loose. Are you sure you want to go to the effort? You know what he is. You know what lies ahead of him, even setting the prophecies aside. Madness, death. How long does he have? A year? Two? Or would it begin before summer's end? He is a man who can channel. She bit off each word in tones of iron. Remember what you were taught. Remember what he is. Elaine held her head high and met Nynaeve stare for stare. It does not matter. Perhaps it should, but it doesn't. Perhaps I am being foolish. I do not care. I cannot change my heart to order, Nynaeve. Suddenly Nynaeve smiled. I had to be sure, she said warmly. You must be sure. It isn't easy loving any man, but loving this man will be harder yet. Her smile faded as she went on. 
My first question still has to be answered. What do you mean to do about it? Berylaine may look soft. She certainly makes men see her so, but I do not think she is. She will fight for what she wants, and she's the kind to hold hard to something she doesn't particularly want, just because someone else does want it. I would like to stuff her in a barrel, Egwene said, gripping her goblet as if it were the first's throat, and ship her back to Mayenne in the bottom of the hold. Nynaeve's braid swung as she shook her head. All very well, but try to offer advice that helps. If you cannot, keep silent and let her decide what she must do. Egwene stared at her, and she added, Rand is Elaine's to deal with now, not yours. You have stepped aside, remember? The remark should have made Elaine smile, but it did not. This was all supposed to be different, she sighed. I thought I would meet a man, learn to know him over months or years, and slowly I would come to realize I loved him. That is the way I always thought it would be. I hardly know Rand. I've talked with him no more than half a dozen times in the space of a year. But I knew I loved him five minutes after I first set eyes on him. Now that was foolish. Only it was true, and she did not care if it was foolish. She would tell her mother the same to her face and Linny. Well, perhaps not Linny. Linny had drastic ways of dealing with foolishness, and she seemed to think Elaine had not aged beyond ten. As matters stand, though, I don't even have the right to be angry with him or Berylaine. But she was. I would like to slap his face till his ears ring for a year. I'd like to switch her all the way to the ship that takes her back to Mayenne. Only she did not have the right, and that made it all the worse. Infuriatingly, a plaintive tone touched her voice. What can I do? He has never looked at me twice. In the two rivers, Egwene said slowly, if a woman wants a man to know she is interested in him, she puts flowers in his hair at bell time or Sunday. Or she might embroider a feast day shirt for him any time. Or make a point of asking him to dance and no one else. Elaine gave her an incredulous look, and she hastened to add, I am not suggesting you embroider a shirt, but there are ways to let him know how you feel. Mayenners believe in speaking out. Elaine's voice held a brittle edge. Perhaps that is the best way. Just tell him right out. At least he'll know how I feel then. At least I'll have some right to— She snatched her spiced wine and tilted her head back, drinking. Speak out? Like some Mayenner hussy. Setting the empty goblet back on the small mat, she drew a deep breath and murmured, What will Mother say? What's more important, Nynaeve said gently, is what you will do when we have to leave here. Whether it's Tanchico, or the Tower, or somewhere else, we will have to go. What will you do when you've just told him you love him and you must leave him behind? If he asks you to stay with him? If you want to? I will go. There was no hesitation in Elaine's reply, but a touch of asperity. The other woman should not have had to ask. If I must accept him being the dragon reborn, he must accept that I am what I am, that I have duties. I want to be Eyes Sedai, Nynaeve. It isn't some idle amusement. Neither is the work we three have to do. Could you really think I would abandon you and Egwene? Egwene hurried to assure her that the thought had never crossed her mind. Nynaeve did the same, but slowly enough to give herself the lie. Elaine looked from one to the other of them. In truth, I feared you might tell me I was foolish, fretting over a thing like this, when we have the black Aja to worry about. A slight flicker of Egwene's eyes said the thought had occurred to her, but Nynaeve said, Rand is not the only one who might die next year or next month. We might, too. Times are not what they were and we cannot be either. If you sit and wish for what you want, you may not see it this side of the grave. It was a chilling sort of reassurance, but Elaine nodded. She was not being silly. If only the black Aja could be settled so easily. She pressed her empty silver goblet to her forehead for the coolness. What were they to do? Chapter 7 Playing with Fire with the sun barely above the horizon the next morning, Egwene presented herself at the doors to Rand's chambers, followed by a foot-dragging Elaine. 
The daughter heir wore a long-sleeved dress of pale blue silk, cut in the tear in fashion, and pulled low after some little discussion. A necklace of sapphires like a deep morning sky and another strand woven into her red-gold curls showed up the blue of her eyes. Despite the damp warmth, Egwene wore a plain, deep red scarf, as large as a shawl, around her shoulders. Avienda had supplied the scarf and the sapphires, too. Surprisingly, the Aiel woman had a tidy store of such things, somehow. For all she had known they were there, Egwene gave a start when the Aiel guards glided to their feet with startling suddenness. Elaine let out a small gasp, but quickly eyed them with that regal bearing she managed so well. It seemed to have no effect on these sun-dark men. The six were Cheyenne Mata'al, stone dogs, and appeared relaxed for Aiel, meaning they seemed to be looking everywhere, seemed ready to move in any direction. Egwene drew herself up in imitation of Elaine. She did wish she could do that as well as the daughter heir, and announced, I, we, want to see how the Lord Dragon's wounds are. Her remark was plainly foolish, if they knew much about healing, but that likelihood was small. Few people did, and Aiel probably less than most. She had not intended to give any reason for being there. It was enough that they thought her eyes sedai, but when the Aiel appeared almost to spring out of the black marble floor, it suddenly seemed a good idea. Not that they were making any move to stop Elaine and her, of course, but these men were all so tall, so stone-faced, and they carried those short spears and horn bows as if using them would be as natural as breathing and as easy. With those light-colored eyes regarding her so intently, it was all too easy to remember stories of black-veiled Aiel, without mercy or pity, of the Aiel war and the men like these who had destroyed every army sent against them until the last, who had only turned back to the waste after fighting the allied nations to a standstill during three blood-soaked days and nights before Tarvalin itself. She very nearly embraced Sahidar. Gaul, the stone dog's leader, nodded, looking down at Elaine and her with a touch of respect. He was a handsome man, in a rugged way, a little older than Nynaeve, with eyes as green and clear as polished gems, and long eyelashes so dark they seemed to outline his eyes in black. They may be troubling him. He is in a foul mood this morning. Gaul grinned, just a quick flash of white teeth in understanding of a temper when wounded. He has chased off a group of these high lords already, and threw one of them out himself. What was his name? Torian, another even taller man replied. He had an arrow knocked, the short curved bow held almost casually. His grey eyes rested on the two women for an instant, then went back to searching among the anteroom's columns. Torian, Gaul agreed. I thought he would slide as far as those pretty carvings. He pointed his spear to the ring of stiff-standing defenders. But he came short by three paces. I lost a good tear in hanging, all hawks and gold thread, to Mangan. The taller man gave a brief contented smile. Egwene blinked at the image of Rand physically pitching a high lord across the floor. He had never been violent, far from it. How much had he changed? She had been too busy with Joia and Amico and he too busy with Moiraine or Lan or the High Lords to do more than speak in passing a few words about home here and there, about how the Beltine Festival might have gone this year and what Sunday would be like. It had all been so brief. How much had he changed? We have to see him, Elaine said, a slight tremor in her voice. Gaul made a bow, grounding the point of one spear on the black marble. Of course, I said I. It was with some trepidation that Egwene entered Rand's chambers, and Elaine's face spoke volumes of the effort those few steps took. No evidence of last night's horror remained, unless it was the absence of mirrors. Lighter patches marked the wall panels where those hanging there had been taken away. Not that the room came anywhere near neatness. Books lay everywhere, on everything, some lying open as if abandoned in the middle of a page, and the bed was still unmade. The crimson draperies were pulled open on all the windows, facing westward toward the river that was Tears Heart Vein, and Colindor sparkled like polished crystal on a huge gilded stand of surpassing gaudiness. 
Egwene thought the stand the ugliest thing she had ever seen decorating a room, until she glimpsed the silver wolves savaging a golden stag on a mantle above the fireplace. Scant breezes off the river kept the room surprisingly cool compared to the rest of the stone. Rand sat in his shirt sleeves, sprawled in a chair with one leg over the arm and a leather-bound book propped against his knee. At the sound of their footsteps he snapped the book shut and dropped it among the others on the scroll-worked carpet, bounding to his feet ready to fight. The scowl on his face faded as he took in who they were. For the first time in the stone, Egwene looked for changes in him, and found them. How many months before then since she had seen him last? Enough for his face to have grown harder, for the openness that had once been there to fade. He moved differently, too, a little like Lan, a little like the Aeel. With his height and his reddish hair, and eyes that seemed now blue, now gray, as the light took them, he looked all too much like an Aeelman, too much for comfort. But had he changed inside? I thought you were someone else, he mumbled, sharing out embarrassed glances between them. That was the Rand she knew, even to the flush that rose in his cheeks every time he looked at her or Elaine, either one. Some people want things I can't give, things I will not give. Suspicion grew on his face with shocking suddenness, and his tone hardened. What do you want? Did Moiraine send you? Are you supposed to convince me to do what she wants? Don't be a goose, Egwene said sharply before she thought. I do not want you to start a war. Elaine added in pleading tones, We came to, to help you if we can. That was one of their reasons, and the easiest to bring up. They had decided over breakfast. You know about her plans for— He began roughly, then made a sudden shift. Help me? How? That is what Moiraine says. Egwene sternly folded her arms beneath her breasts, holding the scarf tight, in the way Nynaeve used to address the village council when she meant to have her way no matter how stubborn they were. It was too late to start over. The only thing was to go on as she had begun. I told you not to be a fool, Randall Thor. You may have Teyrins bowing to your boots, but I remember when Nynaeve switched your bottom for letting Matt talk you into stealing a jar of apple brandy. Elaine kept her face carefully composed. Too carefully, it was plain to Egwene that she wanted to laugh out loud. Rand did not notice, of course. Men never did. He grinned at Egwene, close to laughing himself. We had just turned thirteen. She found us asleep behind your father's stable, and our heads hurt so much we didn't even feel her switch. That was not at all the way Egwene recalled it. Not like when you threw that bowl at her head. Remember? She'd dosed you with dogweed tea because you had been moping about for a week, and as soon as you tasted it, you hit her with her best bowl. Light, did you squeal? When was that? Two years ago, come this— we are not here to talk over old times, Egwene said, shifting the scarf irritably. It was thin wool, but still far too hot. Really, he did have the habit of remembering the most unfortunate things. He grinned as if he knew what she was thinking, and went on in better humor. You are here to help me, you say. With what? I don't suppose you know how to make a high lord keep his word when I'm not staring over his shoulder? or how to stop unwanted dreams. I could surely use help with— Eyes darting to Elaine and back to her, he made another abrupt shift. What about the old tongue? Did you learn any of that in the White Tower? Without waiting for an answer, he began rooting through the volumes scattered across the carpet. There were more on the chairs, among the tumbled bedclothes. I have a copy here, somewhere, of— Rand. Egwene raised her voice. Rand, I cannot read the old tongue. 
She shot a look at Elaine, warning her not to admit to any such knowledge. They had not come to translate the prophecies of the dragon for him. The sapphires in the daughter heir's hair swayed as she nodded agreement. We had other things to learn. He straightened from the books with a sigh. It was too much to hope. For a moment he seemed on the point of saying more, but stared at his boots. Egwene wondered how he managed to deal with the high lords and all their arrogance if she and Elaine put him so out of countenance. We came to help you with channeling, she told him, with the power. What Moiraine claimed was supposed to be true. A woman could not teach a man to channel any more than she could teach him how to bear a child. Egwene was not so sure. She had felt something woven from Sa'idin once, or rather she had felt nothing, something blocking her own flows as surely as stone dammed water. But she had learned as much outside the tower as within. Surely in her knowledge there was something she could teach him, some guidance she could offer. If we can, Elaine added. Suspicion flashed across his face again. It was unnerving how his mood changed so quickly. I have more chance of reading the old tongue than you do of— Are you sure this isn't Moiraine's doing? Did she send you here? Thinks she can convince me by some roundabout way, does she? Some twisty eyes Sedai plot I'll not see the point of until I'm mired in it? He grunted sourly and pulled a dark green coat from the floor behind one of the chairs, shrugging into it hastily. I agreed to meet some more of the High Lords this morning. If I don't keep an eye on them, they just find ways to get around what I want. They'll learn sooner or later. I rule Tyr now. Me, the Dragon Reborn. I will teach them. You will have to excuse me. Egwene wanted to shake him. He ruled Tyr? Well, perhaps he did, if it came to that, but she remembered a boy with a lamb nestled inside his coat, proud as a rooster because he had driven off the wolf that tried to take it. He was a shepherd, not a king, and even if he had called to give himself airs, it was no good to him that he did. She was about to tell him as much, but before she could, Elaine spoke up fiercely. No one sent us, no one. We came because, because we care for you. Perhaps it will not work, but you can try. If I, if we care enough to try, you can try too. Is it so unimportant to you that you cannot spare us an hour? For your life? He stopped buttoning up his coat, staring at the daughter heir so intently that for a moment Egwene thought he had forgotten she was there. With a shiver he pulled his eyes away. Glancing at Egwene, he shifted his feet and frowned at the floor. "'I will try,' he muttered. "'It'll do no good, but I will—' "'What do you want me to do?' Egwene drew a deep breath. She had not thought convincing him would be this easy. He had always been like a boulder buried in mud when he decided to dig his heels in, which he did far too often. Look at me, she said, embracing Sa'idar. She let the power fill her as completely as it ever had, more completely, accepting every drop she could hold. It was as if light suffused every particle of her, as if the light itself filled every cranny. Life seemed to burst inside her like fireworks. She had never before let this much in. It was a shock to realize she was not quivering. Surely she could not bear this glorious sweetness. She wanted to revel in it, to dance and sing, to simply lie back and let it roll through her, over her. She made herself speak. What do you see? What do you feel? Look at me, Rand. He lifted his head slowly, still frowning. I see you. What am I supposed to see? Are you touching the source? Egwene, Moiraine has channeled around me a hundred times, and I never saw anything, except what she did. 
It doesn't work that way. Even I know that much. I am stronger than Warren, she told him firmly. She would be whimpering on the floor or insensible if she tried to hold as much as I hold now. It was true, though she had never before rated the eyes Sadai's ability so closely. It cried out to be used, this power pulsing through her stronger than heart blood. With this much, she could do things Moiraine could not dream of doing. The wound in Rand's side that Moiraine could never heal completely. She did not know healing. It was considerably more complex than anything she had ever done. But she had watched Nynaeve heal, and perhaps with this great pool of the power filling her, she could see something of how that could be healed. Not to do it, of course. Only to see. Carefully she spun out hair-fine flows of air and water and spirit, the powers used for healing, and felt for his old injury. One touch, and she recoiled, shivering, snatching back her weaving. Her stomach churned as if every meal she had ever eaten wanted to come up. It seemed that all the darkness in the world rested there in Rand's side, all the world's evil in a festering sore only lightly covered by tender scar tissue. A thing like that would soak up healing flows like drops of water on dry sand. How could he bear the pain? Why was he not weeping? From first thought to action had taken only a moment. Shaken and desperately hiding it, she went on without a pause. You are as strong as I, I know it. You must be. Feel, Rand, what do you feel? Light, what can heal that? Can anything? I don't feel anything, he muttered, shifting his feet. Goosebumps? And no wonder. It's not that I don't trust you, Egwene, but I cannot help being nervous when a woman is channeling around me. I am sorry. She did not bother explaining to him the difference between channeling and merely embracing the true source. There was so much he did not know, even compared to her own scant knowledge. He was a blind man trying to work a loom by touch, with no idea of colors or what the threads or even the loom looked like. With an effort she released Saidar, and it was an effort. Part of her wanted to cry at the loss. I am not touching the source now, Rand. She stepped closer and peered up at him. Do you still feel goosebumps? No, but that's just because you told me. He gave an abrupt shrug of his shoulders. You see, I started thinking about it and I have them again. Egwene smiled triumphantly. She did not need to look around at Elaine to confirm what she had already sensed, what they had agreed upon earlier for this point. You can sense a woman embracing the source, Rand. Elaine is doing just that right now. He squinted at the daughter air. It doesn't matter what you see or don't see. You felt it. We have that much. Let's see what else we can find. Rand. Embrace the source. Embrace Saidine. The words came out hoarsely. They had agreed on this too, she and Elaine. He was Rand, not a monster from the stories, and they had agreed on it. But still, asking a man to— The wonder was that she had gotten the words out at all. Do you see anything? she asked Elaine. Or feel anything? Rand still doled out glances between them, in between staring at the floor and sometimes blushing. Why was he so out of countenance? Studying him fixedly, the daughter heir shook her head. He could just be standing there for all I can tell. Are you sure he is doing anything? He can be stubborn, but he isn't foolish. At least he isn't foolish most of the time. Well... Stubborn or foolish or something else, I feel nothing at all. Egwene frowned at him. You said you would do as we asked, Rand. Are you? 
If you felt something, so should I, and I do not. She broke off with a stifled yelp. Something had pinched her bottom. Rand's lips twitched, clearly fighting a grin. That, she told him crisply, was not nice. He tried to keep his face innocent, but the grin slipped. You said you wanted to feel something, and I just thought— His sudden roar made Egwene jump. Clapping a hand to his left buttock, he hobbled in a pained circle. Blood and ashes, Egwene, there was no need to— He fell off into deeper, inaudible mutters Egwene was just as glad she did not understand. She took the opportunity to flap the scarf for a little air, and shared a small smile with Elaine. The glow faded around the daughter air. They both came close to giggling as they rubbed themselves surreptitiously. That should show him. About a hundred for one, Egwene estimated. Turning back to Rand, she put on her sternest face. I would have expected something like that from Matt. I thought you, at least, had grown up. We came here to help you, if we can. Try to cooperate. Do something with a power, something that isn't childish. Perhaps we will be able to sense that. Hunched, he glared at them. Do something, he muttered. You had no call to— I'll limp for— You want me to do something? Suddenly she lifted into the air, and Elaine, too. They stared at each other, wide-eyed, as they floated a pace above the carpet. There was nothing holding them. No flows Egwene could feel or see. Nothing. Her mouth tightened. He had no right to do this, no right at all, and it was time he learned it. The same sort of shield of spirit that cut Joia off from the source would stop him, too. Eyes Sedai used it on the rare men they found who could channel. She opened herself to Sa'idar, and her stomach sank. Sa'idar was there. She could feel its warmth and light. But between her and the true source stood something. Nothing. An absence that shut her away from the source like a stone wall. She felt hollow inside until panic welled up to fill her. A man was channeling, and she was caught in it. He was Rand, of course, but dangling there like a basket, helpless, all she could think of was a man channeling, and the taint on Saidin. She tried to shout at him, but all that came out was a croak. You want me to do something? Rand growled. A pair of small tables flexed their legs awkwardly, the wood creaking, and began to stumble about in a stiff parody of dance, guilt flaking off and falling. Do you like this? Fire flared up in the fireplace, filling the hearth from side to side, burning on stone, bare of ashes. Or this? The tall stag and wolves above the fireplace began to soften and slump. Thin streams of gold and silver flowed out from the mass, fining down to shining threads, snaking, weaving themselves into a narrow sheet of metallic cloth. The length of glittering fabric hung in the air as it grew, its far end still linked to the slowly melting statuette on the stone mantel. "'Do something,' Rand said. "'Do something. Do you have any idea what it is like to touch Saidin, to hold it, do you?' I can feel the madness waiting, seeping into me. Abruptly the capering tables burst into flame like torches, dancing still. Books spun into the air, pages fluttering. The mattress on the bed erupted, showering feathers across the room like snow. Feathers falling onto the burning tables filled the room with their sharp, sooty stink. For a moment Rand stared wildly at the blazing tables. Then whatever was holding Egwene and Elaine vanished, along with the shield. Their heels thumped onto the carpet. In the same instant the flames went out as if sucked into the wood they had been consuming. The blaze in the fireplace winked out as well, and the books fell to the floor in a worse jumble than before. The length of gold and silver cloth dropped, too, along with strands of rough melted metal, no longer liquid or even hot. Only three largish lumps, two silver and one gold, remained on the mantel, cold and unrecognizable. Egwene had staggered into Elaine as they landed. They clutched each other for support, but Egwene felt the other woman doing exactly what she was doing. 
embracing Sa'idar as quickly as she could. In moments she had a shield ready to throw around Rand if he even appeared to be channeling, but he stood stunned, staring at the charred tables with feathers still drifting down around him, flecking his coat. He did not seem to be a danger now, but the room was certainly a mess. She wove tiny flows of air to pull all the floating feathers together, and those already on the carpet as well. As an afterthought, she added those on his coat. The rest of it he could have the magier straighten, or see to himself. Rand flinched as the feathers floated past him to alight on the tattered ruins of the mattress. It did nothing for the smell, burned feathers and burned wood, but at least the room was neater, and the open windows and faint breezes were already lessening the stench. The magier may not want to give me another, he said with a strained laugh. A mattress a day is probably more than she is willing to— He avoided looking at her or Elaine. I'm sorry, I did not mean to— Sometimes it runs wild, sometimes there's nothing there when I reach for it, and sometimes it does things I don't— I'm sorry. Perhaps you had better go. I seem to say that a lot. He blushed again and cleared his throat. I am not touching the source, but maybe you had best go. We are not done yet, Egwene said gently. More gently than she felt, she wanted to box his ears. The idea of picking her up like that, shielding her, and Elaine. But he was on the ragged edge, of what she did not know, and she did not want to find out, not now, not here. With so many exclaiming over their strength, everyone said she and Elaine would be among the strongest eyes, said I, if not the strongest, in a thousand years or more. She had assumed they were as strong as he, near to it, at least. She had just been rudely disabused. Perhaps Nynaeve could come close if she was angry enough, but Egwene knew she herself could never have done what he just had, split her flows that many ways. Worked that many things at once? Working two flows at once was far more than twice as hard as working one of the same magnitude, and working three much more than twice again working two. He had to have been weaving a dozen. He did not even look tired, yet exertion with the power took energy. She very much feared he could handle her and Elaine both like kittens. Kittens he might decide to drown if he went mad. But she would not, could not just walk away. That would be the same as quitting, and she was not made that way. She meant to do what she had come there for, all of it, and he was not going to chase her off short of it, not him or anything else. Elaine's blue eyes were filled with determination, and the moment Egwene fell silent, she added in a much firmer voice, And we will not go until we are. You said you would try. You must try. I did say that, didn't I? He murmured after a time. At least we can sit down. Not looking at the blackened tables or the band of metallic cloth lying crumpled on the carpet, he led them, limping slightly, to high-backed chairs near the windows. They had to move books from the red silk cushions in order to sit. Egwene's chair held volume twelve of The Treasures of the Stone of Tear, a dusty wood-bound book entitled Travels in the Aeal Waste, with various observations on the savage inhabitants, and a thick tattered leather volume called Dealings with the Territory of Mayenne, 500 to 750 of the New Era. Elaine had a bigger stack to move, but Rand hurriedly took them from her along with those from his chair, and put them all on the floor, where the pile promptly fell over. Egwene laid hers neatly beside them. What do you want me to do now? He sat on the edge of his seat, hands on his knees. I promise I won't do anything but what you ask this time. Egwene bit her tongue to keep from telling him that promise came a bit late. Perhaps she had been a little vague in what she had asked for, but that was no excuse. 
Still, that was something to be dealt with another time. She realized she was thinking of him as just Rand again, but he looked as if he had just splashed mud on her best dress and was worried she would not believe it an accident. Yet she had not let go of Sa'idar, and neither had Elaine. There was no need to be foolish. This time, she said, we just want you to talk. How do you embrace the source? Just tell us. Take it step by step, slowly. More like wrestling than embracing, he grunted. Step by step. Well, first I imagine a flame, and then I push everything into it. Hate, fear, nervousness, everything. When they're all consumed, there's an emptiness, a void inside my head. I am in the middle of it, but I'm a part of whatever I am concentrating on, too. That sounds familiar, Egwene said. I've heard your father talk about a trick of concentration he uses to win the archery competitions, what he calls the flame and the void. Rand nodded, sadly, it seemed. She thought he must be missing home, and his father. Tam taught it to me first, and Lan uses it too with a sword. Celine, someone I met once, called it the oneness. A good many people seem to know about it, whatever they call it. But I found out for myself that when I was inside the void, I could feel Sa'idin, like a light just beyond the corner of my eye in the emptiness. There's nothing but me and that light. Emotion, even thought, is outside. I used to have to take it bit by bit, but it all comes at once now. Most of it does, anyway. Most of the time. Emptiness, Elaine said with a shiver. No emotion. That doesn't sound very much like what we do. Yes, it does, Egwene insisted eagerly. Rand, we just do it a little differently, that's all. I imagine myself to be a flower, a rosebud. Imagine it until I am the rosebud. That is like your void, in a way. The rosebud's petals open out to the light of Sa'idar, and I let it fill me all light and warmth and life and wonder. I surrender to it, and by surrendering I control it. That was the hardest part to learn, really, how to master Sa'idar by submitting but it seems so natural now that I do not even think about it. That is the key to it, Rand. I am sure you must learn to surrender. He was shaking his head vigorously. That's nothing like what I do, he protested. Let it fill me? I have to reach out and take hold of Sa'idin. Sometimes there's still nothing there when I do, nothing I can touch. But if I didn't reach for it, I could stand there forever, and nothing would happen. It fills me all right once I take hold. But surrender to it? He raked his fingers through his hair. Egwene, if I surrendered, even for a minute, Sa'idin would consume me. It's like a river of molten metal, an ocean of fire, all the light of the sun gathered in one spot. I must fight it to make it do what I want. Fight it to keep from being eaten up. He sighed. I know what you mean about life filling you, though, even with the taint turning my stomach. Colors are sharper, smells clearer. Everything is more real somehow. I don't want to let go once I have it, even while it's trying to swallow me. But the rest? Face the facts, Egwene. The tower is right about this. Accept it for the truth, because it is. She shook her head. I will accept it when it is proved to me. She did not sound as sure as she wanted to, not as sure as she had been. What he told sounded like some twisted half-reflection of what she did, similarities only emphasizing differences. Yet there were similarities. She would not give up. Can you tell the flows apart? Air, water, spirit, earth, fire? Sometimes, he said slowly, not usually. I just take what I need to do what I want. 
fumble for it, mostly. It's very strange. Sometimes I need to do a thing, and I do it, but only afterward do I know what it was I did, or how. It's almost like remembering something I've forgotten. But I can remember how to do it again, most of the time. Yet you do remember how, she insisted. How did you set fire to those tables? She wanted to ask him how he had made them dance. She thought she saw a way, with air and water, but she wanted to start with something simple, lighting a candle and putting it out with things a novice could do. Rand's face took on a pained expression. I don't know. He sounded embarrassed. When I want fire for a lamp or a fireplace, I just make it, but I do not know how. I don't really need to think to do things with fire. That almost stood to reason. Of the five powers, fire and earth had been strongest in men in the age of legends, and air and water in women. Spirit had been shared equally. Egwene hardly had to think to use air or water once she had learned to do a thing in the first place. But the thought did not further their purpose. This time it was Elaine who pressed him. Do you know how you extinguished them? You seemed to think before they went out. That I do remember, because I don't believe I have ever done it before. I took in the heat from the tables and spread it into the stone of the fireplace. A fireplace wouldn't even notice that much heat. Elaine gasped, unconsciously cradling her left arm for a moment, and Egwene winced in sympathy. She remembered when that arm had been a mass of blisters because the daughter heir had done what Rand had just described, and with just the lamp in her room. Sheriam had threatened to let the blisters heal by themselves. She had not done it, but she had threatened. It was one of the warnings novices were given. Never draw heat in. A flame could be extinguished using air or water, but using fire to pull the heat away meant disaster with a flame of any size. It was not a matter of strength, so Sheriam had said. Heat once taken in could not be gotten rid of, not by the strongest woman ever to come out of the White Tower. Women had actually burst into flame themselves that way. Women had burst into flame. Egwene drew a ragged breath. What's the matter? Rand asked. I think you just proved the difference to me. She sighed. Oh. Does that mean you're ready to give up? No. She tried to make her voice softer. She was not angry with him. Exactly. She was not sure who she was angry with. Maybe my teachers were right, but there has to be a way. Some way. Only I cannot think of one right now. You tried, he said simply. I thank you for that. It is not your fault it did not work. There must be a way, Egwene muttered, and Elaine murmured, We will find it. We will. Of course you will he said with a forced cheerfulness. But not today. He hesitated. I suppose you'll be going then? He sounded half regretful, half glad. I do need to tell the High Lords a few things about taxes this morning. They seem to think they can take as much from a farmer in a poor year as a good without beggaring him. Then I suppose you have to get back to questioning those dark friends. He frowned. He had not said anything, but Egwene was sure he would like to keep them as far from the Black Aja as possible. She was a little surprised he had not already tried to make them return to the tower. Perhaps he knew that she and Nynaeve would put a flea in his ear the size of a horse if he tried. We do, she said firmly, but not right away. Rand, the time had come to bring up her second reason for being there, but it was even more difficult than she had expected. This was going to hurt him. Those sad, wary eyes convinced her it would. 
but it had to be done. She snugged the scarf around her. It enveloped her from shoulders to waist. Rand, I cannot marry you. I know, he said. She blinked. He was not taking it as hard as she expected. She told herself that was good. I do not mean to hurt you. Really, I don't. But I do not want to marry you. I understand, Egwene. I know what I am. No woman could— You wool-brained idiot! she snapped. This had nothing to do with you channeling. I do not love you. At least not in the way to want to marry you. Rand's jaw dropped. You don't love me? He sounded as surprised as he looked, and hurt, too. Please try to understand, she said in a gentler voice. People change, Rand. Feelings change. When people are apart, sometimes they grow apart. I love you as I would a brother, perhaps more than a brother, but not to marry. Can you understand that? He managed a rueful grin. I really am a fool. I didn't really believe you might change, too. Egwene, I do not want to marry you either. I did not want to change. I didn't try to. But it happened. If you knew how much this means to me, not having to pretend, not being afraid I'll hurt you, I never wanted to do that, Egwene. Never to hurt you. She very nearly smiled. He was putting on such a brave face. He was actually quite close to convincing. I am glad you are taking it so well, she told him in a soft voice. I did not want to hurt you, either. And now I really must go. Rising from her chair, she bent to brush a kiss across his cheek. You will find someone else. Of course, he said, getting to his feet, the lie loud in his voice. You will. She slipped out with a sense of satisfaction and hurried across the anteroom, letting Sa'idar go as she took the scarf from her shoulders. The thing was abominably hot. He was ready for Elaine to pick up like a lost puppy if she handled him the way they had discussed. She thought Elaine would manage him nicely, now and later. For as much later as they had. Something had to be done about his control. She was willing to admit that what she had been told was right. No woman could teach him. Fish and birds. But that was not the same as giving up. Something had to be done, so a way had to be found. That horrible wound and the madness were problems for later, but they would be dealt with eventually. Somehow. Everyone said Two Rivers men were stubborn. But they could not match Two Rivers women. Chapter 8 Hard Heads Elaine was not certain Rand realized she was still in the room, the way he stared after Egwene with a half-bewildered expression. Now and again he shook his head as if arguing with himself or trying to straighten his mind. She was content to wait him out, anything that put off the moment a while longer. She concentrated on maintaining an outward composure, back straight and head high, hands folded in her lap, a calmness on her face that could have rivaled Moiraine's best. Butterflies the size of hedgehogs frolicked in her stomach. It was not fear of him channeling. She had let go of Saidine as soon as Egwene stood to leave. She wanted to trust him, and she had to. It was what she wanted to happen that had her trembling inside. She had to concentrate not to finger her necklace or fiddle with a strand of sapphires in her hair. Was her perfume too heavy? No. Egwene said he liked the smell of roses. The dress. She wanted to tug it up, but— He turned. The slight limp in his step tightened her lips thoughtfully, saw her sitting in her chair, and gave a start, 
eyes widening with what seemed very close to panic. She was glad to see it. The effort of keeping her own face serene had leaped tenfold as soon as his eyes touched her. Those eyes were blue now, like a misty morning sky. He recovered on the instant and made a quite unnecessary bow, wiping his hands once nervously on his coat. I did not realize you were still— Flushing, he cut off, forgetting her presence might be taken as an insult. I mean, I didn't— that is, I— He took a deep breath and began again. I am not as much of a fool as I sound, my lady. It isn't every day someone tells you they don't love you, my lady. She put on a tone of mock severity. If you call me that again, I shall call you my Lord Dragon, and curtsy. Even the Queen of Andor might curtsy to you, and I am only daughter heir. Light, don't do that. He seemed uneasy out of all proportion to the threat. I will not, Rand, she said in a more serious voice, if you call me by my name. Elaine, say it. Elaine. He spoke awkwardly, yet delightfully, as if he were savoring the name, too. Good. It was absurd to be so pleased. All he had done was say her name, after all. There was something she had to know before she could go on. Did it hurt you very much? That could be taken two ways, she realized. What Egwene told you, I mean. No. Yes. Some, I don't know. Fair is fair, after all. His small grin took some of the edge off of his wariness. I sound a fool again, don't I? No, not to me. I told her the pure truth, but I don't think she believed me. I suppose I did not want to believe it of her, either. Not really. If that isn't foolish, I don't know what is. If you tell me one more time that you are a fool, I may begin to believe it. He won't try to hold on to her. I won't have to deal with that. Her voice was calm, with a light enough tone to let him know she did not really mean what she said. I saw a Kyrian lord's fool once, a man in a funny striped coat, too big for him, and sewn with bells. You would look silly wearing bells. I suppose I would, he said ruefully. I will remember that. His slow grin was wider this time, warming his whole face. The butterfly's wings flogged her for haste, but she occupied herself with straightening her skirts. She had to go slowly, carefully. If I don't, he'll think I am just a foolish girl, and he will be right. The butterflies in her belly were beating kettle drums now. Would you like a flower? he asked suddenly, and she blinked in confusion. A flower? Yes. Striding to the bed, he scooped up a double handful of feathers from the tattered mattress and held them out to her. I made one for the Magyar last night. You'd have thought I had given her the stone, but yours will be much prettier, he added hastily. Much prettier, I promise. Rand, I— I will be careful. It takes only a trickle of the power, just a thread, and I will be very careful. Trust. She had to trust him. It was a small surprise to realize that she did. I would like that, Rand. For long moments he stared at the fluffy mound in his hands, a slow frown on his face. Abruptly he let the feathers fall, dusting his hands. Flowers, he said, that's no fit gift for you. Her heart went out to him. Clearly he had tried to embrace Sa'idin and failed. Masking disappointment in action, he limped hurriedly to the metallic cloth and began gathering it over his arm. Now this is a proper gift for the daughter heir of Andor. You could have a seamstress make— He floundered over what a seamstress might make from a four-pace length of gold and silver cloth, less than two feet wide. I am sure a seamstress will have many ideas, she told him diplomatically. 
Pulling a handkerchief from her sleeve, she knelt for a moment to collect the feathers he had dropped into the square of pale blue silk. The maids will take care of that, he said, as she tucked the small bundle securely into her belt pouch. Well, this bit is done. How could he understand that she would keep the feathers because he had wanted them to be a flower? He shifted his feet, holding the glittering folds as if he did not know what to do with them. The magia must have seamstresses, she told him. I will give that to one of them. He brightened, smiling. She saw no reason to tell him she meant it as a gift. Those thundering butterflies would not let her hold back any longer. Rand, do you like me? Like you? He frowned. Of course I like you. I like you very much. Did he have to look as if he did not understand at all? I am fond of you, Rand. She was startled that she said it so calmly. Her stomach seemed to be trying to writhe up into her throat, and her hands and feet felt like ice. More than fond. That was enough. She was not going to make a fool of herself. He has to say more than like first. She almost giggled hysterically. I will keep control of myself. I will not let him see me behave like a moon-eyed girl. I will not. I am fond of you, he said slowly. I am not usually so forward. No, that might make him think of Berylane. There was red in his cheeks. He was thinking of Berylane. Burn him! Her voice came as smooth as silk. Soon I will have to go, Rand, to leave Tyr. I may not see you again for months. Or ever, a tiny voice cried in her head. She refused to listen. I could not go without letting you know how I feel. And I am very fond of you. Helene, I am fond of you. I feel... I want... The scarlet spots on his cheeks grew. Helene, I don't know what to say, how to... Suddenly it was her face that was flaming. He must think she was trying to force him into saying more. Aren't you? The small voice mocked, which only made her cheeks hotter. Rand, I am not asking for... Light, how to say it. I only wanted you to know how I feel, that is all. Berylane would not have let it go at that. Berylane would have been wrapped around him by now. Telling herself she would not let that half-dressed snip better her, she moved closer to him, took the glittering cloth from his arm, and dropped it on the carpet. For some reason he seemed taller than he ever had before. Rand, Rand, I want you to kiss me. There. It was out. Kiss you? he said, as if he had never heard of kissing before. Helene, I don't want to promise more than— I mean, it isn't as if we were betrothed. Not that I am suggesting we should be. It's just that— I am fond of you, Helene. More than fond. I just do not want you to think I— She had to laugh at him with all his confused earnestness. I do not know how things are done in the two rivers. But in Camelin you don't wait until you are betrothed before kissing a girl. And it does not mean you must become betrothed either. But perhaps you do not know how. His arms went around her almost roughly, and his lips came down on hers. Her head spun. Her toes tried to curl up in her slippers. Some time later, she was not certain how long, she realized she was leaning against his chest knees trembling, trying to gulp air. "'Forgive me for interrupting you,' he said. She was glad to hear a touch of breathlessness in his voice. "'I am just a backward shepherd from the two rivers.' "'You are uncouth,' she murmured against his shirt. "'And you did not shave this morning, but I would not say you are backward.' "'Elena,' she put a hand over his mouth. I do not want to hear anything from you that you do not mean with your whole heart, she said firmly, not now or ever. He nodded, 
not as if he understood why, but at least as if he understood that she meant what she said. Straightening her hair, the strand of sapphires was tangled beyond mending without a mirror, she stepped out of his encircling arms, not without reluctance. It would be all too easy to remain there, and she had already been more forward than she had ever dreamed of before. Speaking up like that? Asking for a kiss? Asking! She was not Barillane. Barillane. Perhaps Min had had a viewing. What Min saw happened, but she would not share him with Barillane. Perhaps she needed to do a bit more plain speaking. Obliquely plain, at least. I expect you will not lack for company after I go. Just remember that some women see a man with their hearts, while others see no more than a bauble to wear, no different than a necklace or a bracelet. Remember that I will come back, and I am one who sees with her heart. He looked confused at first, then a little alarmed. She had said too much too fast. She had to divert him. Do you know what you have not said to me? You have not tried to frighten me away by telling me how dangerous you are. Don't try now. It is too late. I did not think of it. Another thought came to him, though, and his eyes crinkled with suspicion. Did you and Egwene scheme this up between you? She managed to combine wide-eyed innocence with mild outrage. How could you even consider such a thing? Do you imagine we would hand you around between us like a package? You think a good deal of yourself. There is such a thing as being over-proud. He did look confused now. Quite satisfactory. Are you sorry for what you did to us, Rand? I did not mean to frighten you, he said hesitantly. Egwene made me angry. She's always been able to, without half trying. That's no excuse, I know. I said I was sorry, and I am. Look what it got me. Burned tables and another mattress ruined. And for the pinch? His face reddened again, but he faced her firmly, even so. No. No, I am not sorry for that. The two of you talking over my head, as if I were a lump of wood with no ears. You deserved as much, both of you, and I won't say different. For a moment she considered him. He rubbed his arms through his coat sleeves as she momentarily embraced Sa'idar. She did not know healing to any degree, but she had learned bits and pieces on the edge of it. Channeling, she soothed away the hurt she had given him for the pinch. His eyes widened in surprise, and he shifted on his feet as if testing the absence of pain. For being honest, she told him simply. There was a rap at the door, and Gaul looked in. At first the Aeelman had his head down, but after a quick glance at them he raised it. Color flooded Elaine's face as she realized he had suspected that he might be interrupting something he should not see. She very nearly embraced Sa'idar again and taught him a lesson. "'The Tairins are here,' Gaul said. "'The High Lords you were expecting?' "'I will go, then,' she told Rand. "'You must tell them about taxes, was it not?' Think on what I have said. She did not say, think of me, but she was sure the effect would be the same. He reached out as if to stop her, but she slipped away from him. She had no intention of putting on a display in front of Gaul. The man was Aeel, but what must he think of her wearing perfume and sapphires at that hour of the morning? It required real effort not to pull the neckline of her dress up higher. The High Lords entered as she reached the door, a cluster of graying men in pointed beards and colorful, ornate coats with puffy sleeves. They crowded out of her way with reluctant bows, their bland faces and polite murmurs not hiding their relief that she was leaving. She glanced back once from the doorway. A tall, broad-shouldered young man in a plain green coat among the High Lords in their silks and satin stripes, Rand looked like a stork among peacocks. Yet there was something about him, a presence, that said he commanded there by right. The Tairins recognized it, bending their stiff necks reluctantly. He thought probably they bowed just because he was the dragon reborn. 
and perhaps they thought so too. But she had seen men like Gareth Bryn, the captain commander of her mother's guards, who could have dominated a room in rags, with no title and no one knowing their name. Rand might not know it, but he was such a man. He had not been when she first saw him, but he was now. She pulled the door shut behind her. The Aeel around the entrance glanced at her, and the captain commanding the ring of defenders in the middle of the anteroom stared uneasily, but she barely noticed them. It was done. Or at least it was begun. Four days she had, before Joia and Amiko were put on that ship, four days at most to twine herself so firmly into Rand's thoughts that he had no room for Beryline. Or, if not that, firmly enough that she stayed inside his head until she had the chance to do more. She had never thought she might do a thing like this, stalk a man like a huntress stalking a wild boar. The butterflies were still gambling in her stomach. At least she had not let him see how nervous she was. And it occurred to her that she had not once thought of what her mother would say. With that, the flutterings vanished. She did not care what her mother said. Morgaze had to accept her daughter as a woman. That was all there was to it. The Aeel bowed as she moved away, and she acknowledged them with a gracious nod that would have done Morgaze proud. Even the Tayran captain looked at her as if he could see her new serenity. She did not think she would be troubled by butterflies again for the Black Aja, perhaps, but not for Rand. Ignoring the High Lords in their anxious semicircle, Rand watched the door close behind Elaine with wonder in his eyes. Dreams coming true, even only this much, made him uneasy. A swim in the waterwood was one thing, but he would never have believed a dream where she came to him like this. She had been so cool and collected while he was tripping over his own tongue, and Egwene giving his own thoughts back to him and only concerned she might hurt him. Why was it women could go to pieces or fly into a rage at the smallest thing, yet never flicker an eyelash at what left you gaping? My lord dragon, Sunaman murmured even more diffidently than usual. Word of this morning must have spread through the stone already. That first lot had nearly run on their way out, and it was doubtful Torian would show his face or his filthy suggestions anywhere Rand was. Sunaman essayed an ingratiating smile, then smothered it, dry-washing his plump hands, when Rand only looked at him. The rest pretended they did not see the burned tables or the shattered mattress and scattered books, or the half-melted lumps over the fireplace that had been the stag and wolves. High lords were good at seeing only what they wanted to see. Carleon and Tedosian, false self-effacement in every line of their thick bodies, surely never realized there was anything suspicious in never looking at one another. But then Rand might never have noticed, if not for Tom's note, found in the pocket of a coat just back from being brushed. The Lord Dragon wished to see us, Sunaman managed. Could Egwene and Elaine have worked it up between them? Of course not. Women did not do things like that any more than men. Did they? It had to be coincidence. Elaine heard that he was free and decided to speak. That was it. Taxes, he barked. The Tehrans did not move, but they gave the impression of stepping back. How he hated dealing with these men! He wanted to dive back into the books. It is a bad precedent, my lord dragon, lowering taxes, a lean grey-haired man said in an oily voice. Mylin was tall for a Tehran, only a hand shorter than Rand, and hard as any defender. He held himself in a stoop in Rand's presence. His dark eyes showed how he hated it. But he had hated it when Rand told them to stop crouching around him, too. None of them straightened, but Mylan especially had not liked being reminded of what he did. 
the peasants have always paid easily. But if we lower their taxes, when the day comes that we raise them back to where they now are, the fools will complain as bitterly as if we had doubled the present levy. There might well be riots when that day comes, my lord dragon. Rand strode across the room to stand before Colindor. The crystal sword glittered, outshining the gilt and gemstones surrounding it. A reminder of who he was, of the power he could wield. Egwene, it was foolish to feel hurt because she said she no longer loved him. Why should he expect her to have feelings for him that he did not have for her? Yet it did hurt. A relief, but not a pleasant one. You will have riots if you drive men off their farms. Three books stood in a stack almost by Mylan's feet. The Treasures of the Stone of Tear, Travels in the Waste, and Dealings with the Territory of Mayenne. The keys lay in those, and in the various translations of the Koreathan cycle, if he could only find them and fit them to the proper locks. He pushed his mind back to the High Lords. Do you think they will watch their families starve and do nothing? The defenders of the stone have put down riots before, my lord dragon, Sunaman said soothingly. Our own guards can keep peace in the countryside. The peasants will not disturb you, I give you my assurance. There are too many farmers as it is. Carleon flinched at Rand's glare. It is the civil war in Kyrian, my lord dragon, he explained hurriedly. The Kyrianin can buy no grain, and the granaries are bursting. This year's harvest will go to waste as it is, and next year burn my soul, my lord dragon, but what we need is for some of those peasants to stop their eternal digging and planting. He seemed to realize he had said too much, though he clearly did not understand why. Rand wondered whether he had any idea how food got to his table. Did he see anything but gold and power? What will you do when Kyrian is buying grain again? Brand said coolly. For that matter, is Kyrian the only land that needs grain? Why had Elaine spoken up like that? What did she expect of him? Fond, she said. Women could play games with words like eyes, said I. Did she mean she loved him? No, that was plain foolishness. Overproud to a degree. My lord dragon... Mylan said, half subservient, half as if explaining something to a child. If the civil wars stopped today, Kyrian still could not buy more than a few barge loads for two even three years. We have always sold our grain to Kyrian. Always. For the twenty years since the Aeol War. They were so bound up in what they had always done that they could not see what was so simple, or would not see it. When the cabbages sprouted like weeds around Eamon's field, it was a near certainty that a bad rain or white worm had struck Devon Ride or Watchill. When Watchill had too many turnips, Eamon's field would have a shortage, or Devon Ride. Offer it an Ilion, he told them. What did Elaine expect? Or Altara. He did like her, but he liked men as much, or thought he did. It was impossible to sort out his feelings for either of them. You have ships for the sea as well as river boats and barges, and if you don't have enough, hire them from Mayen. He liked both women, but beyond that... He had spent very nearly his whole life mooning after Egwene. He was not about to dive into that again until he was sure. Sure of something. Sure. If dealings with the territory of Mayen was to be believed... Stop this, he told himself. Keep your mind on these weasels, or they'll find cracks to slip through and bite you on the way. Pay with grain. I'm sure the first will be amenable, for a good price, and maybe a signed agreement, a treaty. That was a good word, the sort they used. Pledging to leave Mayan alone in return for ships. He owed her that. We trade little with Ilion, my lord dragon. They are vultures and scum. Tadosian sounded scandalized, and so did Mylan when he said, We have always dealt with Mayen from strength, my lord dragon, never with bent knee. Rand took a deep breath. The high lords tensed. It always came to this. 
He always tried to reason with them, and it always failed. Tom said the High Lords had heads as hard as the stone, and he was right. What do I feel for her? Dreaming about her? She's certainly pretty. He was not sure if he meant Elaine or Min. Stop this! A kiss means no more than a kiss. Stop it! Putting women firmly out of his head, he set himself to telling these stone-brained fools what they were going to do. First you will cut taxes on farmers by three-quarters, and on everyone else by half. Don't argue, just do it. Second, you go to Barrelane and ask, ask, her price for hiring. The High Lords listened with false smiles and grinding teeth, but they listened. Egwene was considering Joia and Amico when Matt fell in beside her, just walking down the hallway as if he merely happened to be going the same way. He was frowning to himself, and his hair needed brushing, as if he had been scrubbing his fingers through it. Once or twice he glanced at her, but did not speak. The servants they passed bowed or curtsied, and so did the occasional high lords and ladies, if with markedly less enthusiasm. Matt's lip-curling stares at the nobles would have brought trouble if she had not been there, friend of the Lord Dragon or not. This silence was not like him, not like the Matt she knew. Except for his fine red coat, wrinkled as if he had slept in it, he seemed no different than the old Matt, yet they were surely all different now. His quiet was unsettling. Is last night troubling you? she asked at last. He missed a step. You know about that? Well, you would, wouldn't you? Doesn't bother me. Wasn't much to it. Over and done with now, anyway. She pretended to believe him. Nynaeve and I do not see much of you. That was a rank understatement. I have been busy, he muttered with an uncomfortable shrug, looking everywhere but at her again. Dicing? she asked dismissively. Cards. A plump maid, curtsying with her arms full of folded towels, glanced at Egwene, and, apparently thinking she was not looking, winked at Matt. He grinned at her. I have been busy playing cards. Egwene's eyebrows rose sharply. That woman had to be ten years older than nine, Eve. I see. It must use up a great deal of time, playing cards. Too much to spare a few moments for old friends? The last time I spared you a moment, you and Nynaeve tied me up with a power like a pig from market, so you could rummage through my room. Friends don't steal from friends. He grimaced. Besides, you're always with that Elaine, with her nose in the air. Or Moiraine. I do not like— Clearing his throat, he shot her a sideways glance. I don't like taking up your time. You are busy, from what I hear, questioning dark friends. Doing all sorts of important things, I should imagine. You know these Teherans think you are Aes Sedai, don't you? She shook her head ruefully. It was Aes Sedai he did not like. However much of the world Matt saw, nothing would ever change him. It is not stealing to take back what was supposed to be a loan, she told him. I don't remember you saying anything about a loan. Ah, what use do I have for a letter from the Armalin? Just get me in trouble. You could have asked, though. She refrained from pointing out that they had asked. She wanted neither an argument nor a sulky departure. He would not call it that, of course. This time she would let him get away with his version. Well, I am glad you are still willing to talk to me. Was there a special reason for it today? He shoved his fingers through his hair and muttered to himself. What he needed was his mother to haul him off by his ear for a long talking to. Egwene counseled herself to patience. She could be patient when she wanted to. She would not say a word before he did, if she burst for it. The corridor opened into a railed colonnade of white marble looking down on one of the stone's few gardens. Large white blossoms covered a few small waxy-leafed trees, and gave a scent even sweeter than the banks of red and yellow roses. A sullen breeze failed to stir the hangings on the inner wall, 
but it did cut the morning's growing damp warmth. Matt took a seat on the wide balustrade with his back against a column and one foot up in front of him. Peering down into the garden, he finally said, I need some advice. He wanted advice from her? She goggled at him. Whatever I can do to help, she said faintly. He turned his head to her, and she did her best to assume something like eyes said I calm. What do you want advice about? I don't know. It was a ten-pace drop to the garden. Besides, there were men down there weeding among the roses. If she pushed him over, he might land on one. A gardener, not a rosebush. How am I supposed to advise you, then? she asked in a thin voice. I am trying to decide what to do. He looked embarrassed. He had a right to, in her opinion. I hope you are not thinking of trying to leave. You know how important you are. You cannot run away from it, Matt. You think I don't know that? I don't think I could leave if Moiraine told me I could. Believe me, Egwene, I am not going anywhere. I just want to know what's going to happen. He gave a rough shake of his head, and his voice grew tighter. What comes next? What's in these holes in my memory? There are chunks of my life that aren't even there. They don't exist, as if they never happened. Why do I find myself spouting gibberish? People say it's the old tongue, but it's goose gabble to me. I want to know, Egwene. I have to know before I go as crazy as Rand. Rand is not crazy, she said automatically. So Matt was not trying to run away. That was a pleasant surprise. He had not seemed to believe in responsibility. But there was pain and worry in his voice. Matt never worried, or never let anyone see it if he did. I do not know the answers, Matt, she said gently. Perhaps Moiraine— No. He was on his feet in a bound. No, I said I. I mean, you're different. I know you, and you aren't— didn't they teach you anything in the tower, some trick or other, something that would serve? Oh, Matt, I am sorry. I am so sorry. His laugh reminded her of their childhood. Just so he had always laughed when his grandest expectations went astray. Ah, well, I guess it does not matter. It'd still be the tower if it's second hand. No offense to you. Just so he had moaned over a splinter in his finger— and treated a broken leg as if it were nothing at all. There might be a way, she said slowly. If Moiraine says it is all right, she might. Moiraine, haven't you heard a word I said? The last thing I want is Moiraine meddling. What way? Matt had always been rash, but he wanted no more than she did, to know. If only he showed a little sense and caution for once. A passing Taerin noblewoman, with dark braids coiled about her head, shoulders bare above yellow linen, bent her knee slightly, looking at them with no expression. She walked on quickly with a stiff back. Egwene watched her until she was well beyond earshot and they were alone. Unless the gardeners, thirty feet below, counted. Matt was staring at her expectantly. In the end, she told him of the Tear on Griel, the twisted doorway that held answers on its other side. It was the dangers, she emphasized, the consequences of foolish questions, or those touching the shadow, the dangers even Eyes Sedai might not know. She was more than flattered that he had come to her, but he had to show a little sense. You must remember this, Matt. Frivolous questions can get you killed. So if you do use it, you will have to be serious for a change. And you mustn't ask any questions that touch the shadow. He had listened with greater and greater incredulity. When she was done, he exclaimed, Three questions? You go in like Billy, I suppose. Spend a night and come out ten years later with a purse that's always full of gold and a— For once in your life, Maxim Cawthon, she snapped. Do not talk like a fool. You know very well, Tyr on Griel are not stories. It's the dangers you have to be aware of. Maybe the answers you seek are inside this one, but you must not try it before Moiraine says you can. You must promise me that, or I promise you, I will take you to her like a trout on a string. 
You know I can. He gave a loud snort. I'd be a fool if I did try it, no matter what Moiraine says. Walk into a bloody tear on Greel? It's less I want to do with the bloody power, not more. You can blot it right out of your mind. It's the only chance I know, Matt. Not for me, it isn't, he said firmly. No chance at all is better than that. Despite his tone, she wanted to put an arm around him. Only he would likely make some joke at her expense and try to goose her. He had been incorrigible from the day he was born, but he had come to her for help. I'm sorry, Matt. What will you do? Well, play cards, I suppose, if anyone will play with me. Play stones with Tom, dice in the taverns. I can still go as far as the city, at least. His gaze strayed toward a passing maidservant, a slender, dark-eyed girl near his own age. I'll find something to take up time. Her hand itched to slap him, but instead she said cautiously, Matt, you really aren't thinking of leaving, are you? Would you tell Moiraine if I was? He put up his hands to forestall her. Well, there's no need. I told you I wouldn't. I'll not pretend I'd not like to, but I won't. Is that good enough for you? A pensive frown crept onto his face. Egwene, do you ever wish you were back home, that none of this had ever happened? It was a startling question, coming from him, but she knew her answer. No. Even with everything, no. Do you? I would be a fool, then, wouldn't I? He laughed. It's cities I like, and this one will do for now. This one will do. Egwene, you won't tell Moiraine about this, will you? About me asking for advice and all? Why shouldn't I? She asked suspiciously. He was mad, after all. He gave an embarrassed hitch of his shoulders. I've been keeping wider of her than I have of... Anyway, I've been staying clear, especially when she wants to root around in my head. She might think I'm weakening. You won't tell her, will you? I won't, she said. If you promise me, you will not go near that tear on Greel without asking her permission. I shouldn't even have told you about it. I promise, he grinned. I won't go near that thing unless my life depends on it. I swear, he finished with mock solemnity. Egwene shook her head. However much everything else changed, Matt just never would. Chapter 9 Decisions Three days passed with heat and damp that seemed to sap even the tear in strength. The city slowed to a lethargic walk, the stone to a crawl. Servants worked nearly in their sleep. The Magyar tore her coiled braids in frustration, but even she could not find the energy to wrap knuckles or flick ears with a hard finger. Defenders of the stone slumped at their posts like half-melted candles, and the officers showed more interest in chilled wine than in making their rounds. The high lords kept largely to their apartments, sleeping through the hottest part of the day, and a few left the stone entirely for the relative cool of estates far to the east, on the slopes of the spine of the world. Oddly, only the outlanders, who felt the heat worst of all, pushed on with their lives as hard as ever, if not harder. For them the heavy heat did not weigh nearly as much as did the hours rushing by. Matt quickly discovered that he had been right about the young lords who saw the playing cards try to kill him. Not only did they avoid him, they spread the word among their friends, often garbled. No one in the stone who had two pieces of silver in hand would say more than hasty excuses while backing away. The rumors spread beyond the lordlings. More than one serving woman who had enjoyed a cuddle now declined two, and two said uneasily that they had heard it was dangerous to be alone with him. Perrin appeared all wrapped up in his own worries, and Tom seemed to vanish by sleight of hand. Matt had no idea what occupied the gleeman, but he was seldom to be found day or night. Moiraine, the one person Matt wished would ignore him, instead seemed to be there whenever he turned around. She was just passing by, or crossing the corridor in the distance, 
but her eyes met his every last time, looking as if she knew what he was thinking and what he wanted, knew how she was going to make him do exactly what she wanted instead. None of it made any difference in one respect. He still managed to find excuses to put off leaving for another day. As he saw it, he had not promised Egwene he would stay. But he did. Once he carried a lamp down into the belly of the stone, to the so-called Great Holding, as far as the dry, rotted door at the far end of the narrow hallway. A few minutes of peering into the shadowy interior, at dim shapes covered with dusty canvas, roughly stacked crates and barrels, their flat ends used as shelves for jumbles of figurines and carvings and peculiar things of crystal and glass and metal. A few minutes of that, and he hurried away, muttering, I'd have to be the biggest bloody fool in the whole bloody world. Nothing kept him from going into the city, though, and there was no chance at all of meeting Moiraine in the dockside taverns of the mall, the port district, or the inns in the Chalm, where the warehouses were, dimly lit, cramped, often dirty places of cheap wine, bad ale, occasional fights, and unending dice games. The stakes in the dice games were small, compared to what he had grown used to, but that was not why he always found himself back in the stone after a few hours. He tried not to think about what always drew him back, near to Rand. Perrin sometimes saw Matt in the waterfront taverns, drinking too much cheap wine, dicing as if he did not care whether he won or lost, once flashing a knife when a burly shipman pressed him on how often he did win. It was not like Matt to be so irritable, but Perrin avoided him instead of trying to find out what was troubling him. Perrin was not there for wine or dice, and the men who thought of fighting changed their minds after a good look at his shoulders and his eyes. He bought bad ale, though, for sailors in wide leather trousers and for undermerchants with thin silver chains across their coat fronts. For any man who looked to be from a distant land, it was rumor he hunted, word of something that might draw Fa'il away from Tyr, away from him. He was sure if he found an adventure for her, something that smacked of a chance at putting her name in the stories, she would go. She pretended to understand why he had to stay, but occasionally she still hinted that she wanted to leave and hoped he would go with her. He was certain the right bait would pull her, without him. Most rumors she would know for outdated twistings of the truth, just as he did. The war that burned along the Arith Ocean was said to be the work of a people no one had ever heard of before called the Sawchin, or something like it. He heard many variations from many tellers, a strange folk who might be Arthur Hawkwing's armies come back after a thousand years. One fellow, a Torah bunner in a round red hat and a mustache as thick as a bull's horns, solemnly informed him that Hawkwing himself led these people, his legendary sword, Justice, in hand. There were rumors that the fabled Horn of Valir, meant to call dead heroes from the grave to fight in the last battle, had been found. In Gaeldan, riots had broken out all over the country. Ilian was suffering from outbreaks of mass madness. In Kyrian, famine was slowing the killing. Some place in the borderlands, Trolloc raids were on the increase. Perrin could not send Fa'il into any of that, not even to get her away from Tyr. Reports of trouble in Saldeia seemed promising. Her own home must be attractive to her, and he had heard that Mazrim Taim, the false dragon, was safely in Aes Sedai hands. But no one knew what sort of trouble. Making something up would do no good. Whatever he found, she would surely ask her own questions before chasing after it. Besides, any turmoil in Saldeia might easily be as bad as the other things he heard. He could not tell her where he was spending his time, either, because she would inevitably ask why. She knew he was not mad to enjoy lolling about taverns. He had never been good at lying, so he put her off as best he could, and she began to give him long, silent, slanted looks. All he could do was redouble his efforts to find a tale to lure her away. He had to send her away from him before he got her killed. He had to. Egwene and Nynaeve spent more hours with Joea and Amico, to no avail. Their stories never wavered. 
Over Nynaeve's protests, Egwene even tried telling each of them what the other had said, to see if anything joggled loose. Amiko stared at them, whining that she had never heard any such plan. But it might be true, she added. It might. She sweated with eagerness to please. Joia coolly told them to go to Tanchico if they wished. But tis an uncomfortable city now, I hear, she said smoothly, raven eyes glittering. The king holds little more than the city itself, and I understand the Panarch has ceased keeping civil order. Strong arms and quick knives rule Tanchico. But go, if it pleases you. No word came from Tarvalin. Nothing to say if the Armalin was dealing with a possible threat to free Mazrim Taim. There had been plenty of time for a message to come, by quick riverboat or a man changing horses, since Moiraine had sent the pigeons, provided she had sent them. Egwene and Nynaeve argued about that. Nynaeve admitted the eyes Sedai could not lie, but she tried to find some twist in Moiraine's words. Moiraine did not seem to fret over the lack of response from the Armalin, though it was hard to tell through her crystal calm. Egwene did fret over it, and over whether Tanchico was a false trail or a real one, or a trap. The stone's library held books about Tarabin and Tanchico, but though she read until her eyes ached, she found no clue to anything dangerous to Rand. Heat and worry did nothing for her temper. She was sometimes as snappish as Nynaeve. Some things were going well, of course. Matt was still in the stone. Obviously, he really was growing up and learning about responsibility. She regretted failing him, but she was not certain any woman in the tower could have done more. She understood his thirst to know, because she thirsted too, although for other knowledge, for the things she could only learn in the tower, the things she might discover that no one else had known how to do before, the lost things she might relearn. Avienda began to visit with Egwene, apparently of her own choice. If the woman was wary at first, well, she was Aiel, after all, and she did think Egwene was full eyes Sedai. Still, her company was enjoyable, although Egwene sometimes thought she saw unasked questions in her eyes. If Avienda kept her reserve, it soon became apparent that she had a quick wit, and a sense of humor akin to Egwene's. They sometimes ended up giggling together like girls. Aiel ways were nothing Egwene was used to, though, such as Avienda's discomfort at sitting in a chair, and her shock at finding Egwene in her bath, a silver-plated tub the Magir had had brought up. Not shock at walking in on her naked. In fact, when she saw that Egwene was uncomfortable, she peeled off her own clothes and sat down on the floor to talk, but at seeing Egwene sitting chest deep in water. It was dirtying so much water that made her eyes pop. For another thing, Avienda refused to understand why she and Elaine had not done something drastic to Berylaine, since they wanted her out of the way. It was all but forbidden for a warrior to kill a woman not wed to the spear. But since neither Elaine nor Berylaine were maidens of the spear, it was apparently quite all right in Avienda's view for Elaine to challenge the first of Mayenne to fight with knives or, failing that, with fists and feet. Knives were best, as she saw it. Berylaine looked the sort of woman who could be beaten several times without giving up, best simply to challenge and kill her. Or Egwene could do it for her, as friend and near sister. Even with that, it was a pleasure to have someone to talk and laugh with. Elaine was occupied most of the time, of course, and Nynaeve, seeming to feel the rush of time as keenly as Egwene, gave her free moments over to moonlit walks on the battlements with Lan and to preparing foods the water liked with her own hands, not to mention curses that sometimes drove the cooks from the kitchen. Nynaeve did not know very much about cooking. If not for Avienda, Egwene was not sure what she would have done in the muggy hours between questionings of the dark friends. Sweated, undoubtedly, and worried that she might have to do something that gave her nightmares thinking of it. By agreement, Elaine was never present at those questionings. One more set of ears listening would make no difference. Instead, whenever Rand had a moment to spare, the daughter heir just happened to be close by, to talk or simply walk holding his arm, even if it was only from a meeting with some high lords to a room where others waited. 
or to a lightning inspection of the defender's quarters. She became quite good at finding secluded corners where the two of them could pause alone. Of course, he always had Aiel trailing after him, but she soon cared as little for what they thought as for what her mother would. She even entered a sort of conspiracy with the maidens of the spear. They seemed to know every hidden nook in the stone, and they let her know whenever Rand was alone. They seemed to think the game great sport. The surprise was that he asked her about the governing of nations, and listened to what she said. That she wished her mother could see. More than once Morgaze had laughed half-despairingly, and told her she had to learn to concentrate. Which crafts to protect, and how, and which not, and why, might be dry decisions, but as important as how to care for the sick. It might be fun to guide a stubborn lord or merchant into doing what he did not want to, while thinking it was his own idea. It might be warming to feed the hungry. But if the hungry were to be fed, it was necessary to decide how many clerks and drivers and wagons were needed. Others might arrange it, but then you would never know until it was too late whether they had made a mistake. He listened to her, and often took her advice. She thought she could have loved him for those two things alone. Berylaine was not setting foot outside her chambers. Rand had begun smiling as soon as he saw her. Nothing could be finer about the world unless the days could stop passing. Three short days, slipping away like water through her fingers. Chawiya and Amiko would be sent north, and the reason for staying in Tyr would vanish. It would be time for her and Egwene and Nynaeve to leave, too. She would go, when that time came. She had never considered not. Knowing that made her proud of behaving like a woman, not a girl knowing it made her want to cry. And Rand? He met with high lords in his chambers and issued orders. He startled them by appearing at secret gatherings of three or four that Tom had ferreted out, just to reiterate some point from his last commands. They smiled and bowed and sweated and wondered how much he knew. A use had to be found for their energy before one of them decided that if Rand could not be manipulated, he must be killed. Whatever it took to divert them, he would not start a war. If he had to confront Samael, so be it. But he would not start a war. Forming his plan of action occupied most of his time not given over to hounding the high lords. Bits and pieces came from the books he had the librarians bring to his rooms by armloads, and from his talks with Elaine. Her advice was certainly useful with the high lords. He could see them hastily reassessing him when he displayed knowledge of things they themselves only half knew. She stopped him when he wanted to give her the credit. A wise ruler takes advice, she told him, smiling, but should never be seen to take it. Let them think you know more than you do. It will not harm them, and it will help you. She seemed pleased he had suggested it, though. He was not entirely sure that he was not still putting off some decision, at least, because of her. Three days of planning, of trying to puzzle out what was still missing. Something was. He could not react to the Forsaken. He had to make them react to him. Three days, and on the fourth she would go. Back to Tarvalin, he hoped. But once he moved, he suspected even their brief moments together would end. Three days of stolen kisses, when he could forget he was anything but a man with his arms around a woman. He knew it for a foolish reason, if true. He was relieved she did not seem to want more than his company, but in those moments alone he could forget decisions. Forget the fate awaiting the dragon reborn? More than once he considered asking her to stay, but it would not be fair to raise her expectations when he had no idea what he wanted from her beyond her presence if she had any expectations, of course. Much better just to think of them as a man and a young woman walking out together of a feast-day evening. That became easier. Sometimes he forgot she was the daughter heir, and he a shepherd. But he wished she were not going. Three days. He had to decide. He had to move. In a direction no one expected. The sun slid slowly toward the horizon on the evening of the third day. 
The half-drawn draperies of Rand's bedchamber lessened the reddish-yellow glare. Colindor glittered on its ornate stand like the purest crystal. Rand stared at Mylan and Sunaman, then tossed the thick bundle of large vellum sheets at them. A treaty, all neatly scribed, lacking only signatures and seals. It hit Mylan in the chest, and he caught it by reflex. He bowed as if honored, but his tight smile revealed clenched teeth. Sunaman shifted from foot to foot, dry-washing his hands. "'All is as you said, my lord dragon,' he said anxiously. "'Grain for ships, and two thousand Tearin levies,' Rand cut him off, "'to see to proper distribution of the grain and protect Tearin interests.' His voice was like ice, but his stomach seemed to be boiling. He nearly shook with a desire to pound at these fools with his fists. Two thousand men, under the command of Torian. The High Lord Torian has an interest in affairs with Mayen, my Lord Dragon, Mylan said smoothly. He has an interest in forcing his attentions on a woman who won't look at him, Rand shouted. Grain for ships, I said. No soldiers, and certainly no bloody Torian. Have you even spoken to Barrelane? They blinked at him as if they did not understand the words. It was too much. He snatched at Sa'idin. The vellum in Mylan's arms erupted into flame. With a yell, Mylan hurled the fiery bundle into the bare fireplace and hurriedly brushed at sparks and scorch marks on his red silk coat. Sunaman stared at the burning sheets, which were crackling and turning black with his mouth hanging open. You will go to Barrelane he told them, surprised at how calm his voice was. By tomorrow midday you will have offered her the treaty I want, or by sunset tomorrow I'll hang both of you. If I have to hang high lords every day, two by two, I will. I will send every last one of you to the gallows if you won't obey me. Now get out of my sight. The quiet tone seemed to affect them more than a shouting head. Even Mylan looked uneasy as they backed away, bowing at every other step, murmuring protestations of undying loyalty and everlasting obedience. They sickened him. "'Get out!' he roared, and they abandoned dignity, almost fighting with one another to pull the doors open. They ran. One of the Aiel guards put his head in for a moment to see that Rand was all right before drawing the door shut. Rand trembled openly. They disgusted him almost as much as he disgusted himself. Threatening to hang men because they did not do as he told them? Worse meaning it. He could remember when he did not have a temper, or at least when he rarely had, and had managed to keep it on a short reign. He crossed the room to where Colindor sparkled with a light streaming in between the draperies. The blade looked like the finest glass, absolutely clear. It felt like steel to his fingers, sharp as a razor. He had come close to reaching for it, to deal with Mylan and Sunaman. Whether to use it as a sword, or for its real purpose, he did not know. Either possibility horrified him. I am not mad yet, only angry. Light so angry. Tomorrow. The dark friends would be put on a ship tomorrow. Elaine would be leaving, and Egwene and Nynaeve, of course. Back to Tarvalin, he prayed. Black Aja or no Black Aja, the White Tower had to be as safe a place as there was now. Tomorrow, no more excuses to put off what he had to do. Not after tomorrow. He turned his hands over, looking at the heron branded into each palm. He had examined them so often that he could have sketched every line perfectly from memory. The prophecies foretold them. Twice and twice shall he be mocked, twice to live and twice to die, once the heron to set his path, twice the heron to name him true, once the dragon for remembrance lost, twice the dragon for the price he must pay. But if the herons named him true, what need for dragons? For that matter, what was a dragon? The only dragon he had ever heard of was Luz Theron Telamon. Luz Theron Kinslayer had been the dragon. The dragon was the Kinslayer, except now there was himself. But he could not be marked with himself, 
Perhaps the figure on the banner was a dragon. Not even I, said I, seemed to know what that creature was. You are changed from when I last saw you. Stronger. Harder. He spun, gaping at the young woman standing by the door, fair of skin and dark of hair and eye. Tall, dressed all in white and silver, she arched an eyebrow at the half-melted lumps of gold and silver over the fireplace. He had left them there to remind him what could happen when he acted without thinking, when he lost control. Much good it had done. Celine, he gasped, hurrying to her. Where did you come from? How did you get here? I thought you must still be in Cairienne, or— Looking down at her, he did not want to say he feared she might be dead or a starving refugee. A woven silver belt glittered around her narrow waist. Silver combs worked with stars and crescent moons, shone in hair that fell to her shoulders like waterfalls of night. She was still the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. Elaine and Egwene were only pretty beside her. For some reason, though, she did not affect him the way she had. Perhaps it was the long months since he had last seen her, in a Cairienne not yet racked by civil war. I go where I wish to be. She frowned at his face. You have been mocked, but no matter. You were mine, and you are mine. Any other is no more than a caretaker whose time has passed. I will lay claim to what is mine openly. Now. He stared at her. Marked? Did she mean his hands? And what did she mean he was hers? Celine, he said gently. We had pleasant days together, and hard days. I'll never forget your courage or your help. But there was never more between us than companionship. We traveled together, but that was the end of it. You will stay here in the stone in the best apartments, and when peace returns to Cairienne, I will see that your estates there are returned to you, if I can. You have been marked. She smiled wryly. Estates in Cairienne? I may have had estates in those lands once. The land has changed so much that nothing is as it was. Celine is only a name I sometimes use, Luz Theron. The name I made my own is Lanfear. Rand barked a shallow laugh. A poor jerk, Celine. I'd as soon make jests about the Dark One as one of the Forsaken. And my name is Rand. We call ourselves the Chosen, she said calmly. Chosen to rule the world forever. We will live forever. You can also. He frowned at her worriedly. She actually thought she was. Her travails in reaching Tyr must have unhinged her. But she did not look mad. She was calm, cool, certain. Without thinking, he found himself reaching for Sa'idin. He reached for it, and struck a wall he could not see or feel except that it kept him from the source. You can't be. She smiled. Light, he breathed. You are one of them. Slowly he backed away. If he reached Colindor, at least he would have a weapon. Perhaps it could not work as an angrial, but it would do for a sword. Could he use a sword against a woman, against Selene? No. Against Lanfear, against one of the Forsaken. His back came up hard against something, and he looked around to see what it was. There was nothing there. A wall of nothing, with his back pressed against it. Colindor glittered not three paces away on the other side. He thumped a fist against the barrier in frustration. It was as unyielding as rock. I cannot trust you fully, Luz Theron. Not yet. She came closer, and he considered simply seizing her. He was bigger and stronger by far. And, blocked as he was, she could wrap him up with a power like a kitten tangled in a ball of string. Not with that, certainly, she added, grimacing at Colindor. There are only two more powerful that a man can use. One, at least, I know, still exists. No, Luz Theron, I will not trust you yet with that. Stop calling me that! he growled. My name is Rand, Rand Althor. You are Luz Theron Telamon. 
Oh, physically nothing is the same except your height, but I would know who is behind those eyes even if I'd found you in your cradle. She laughed suddenly. How much easier everything would be if I had found you then? If I had been free to— Laughter faded into an angry stare. Do you wish to see my true appearance? You can't remember that either, can you? He tried to say no, but his tongue would not work. Once he had seen two of the Forsaken together, Agenor and Balthamel, the first two loosed after three thousand years trapped just beneath the sea on the Dark One's prison. The one had been more withered than anything could be and still live. The other hid his face behind a mask, hid every bit of his flesh as though he could not bear to see it or have it seen. The air rippled around Lanthier, and she changed. She was... Older than he, certainly, but older was not the right word. More mature. Riper. Even more beautiful, if that was possible. A lush blossom in full flower compared to a bud. Even knowing what she was, she made his mouth go dry, his throat tighten. Her dark eyes examined his face, full of confidence, yet with a hint of questioning, as if wondering what he saw. Whatever she perceived seemed to satisfy her. She smiled again. I was buried deeply, in a dreamless sleep where time did not flow. The turnings of the wheel passed me by. Now you see me as I am, and I have you in my hands. She drew a fingernail along his jaw hard enough to make him flinch. The time for games and subterfuges passed, lose therein, long past. His stomach lurched. Do you mean to kill me, then? The light burn you, I— Kill you? She spat incredulously. Kill you? I mean to have you. Forever. You were mine long before that pale-haired milksop stole you, before she ever saw you. You loved me. And you loved power. For a moment he felt dazed. The words sounded true. He knew they were true. But where had they come from? Selene, Lanthier, seemed as startled as he, but she recovered quickly. You've learned much. You have done much I'd not have believed you could, unaided. But you are still fumbling your way through a maze in the dark, and your ignorance may kill you. Some of the others fear you too much to wait. Samael? Ravin, Mogedian, others perhaps, but those of a certainty. They will come after you. They will not try to turn your heart. They will come at you by stealth, destroy you while you sleep, because of their fear. But there are those who could teach you, show you what you once knew. None would dare oppose you then. Teach me. You want me to let one of the Forsaken teach me? One of the Forsaken. A male Forsaken. A man who had been eyes Sedai in the Age of Legends, who knew the ways of channeling, knew how to avoid the pitfalls, knew— As much had been offered him before. No. Even if it was offered, I'd refuse, and why should it be? I oppose them. And you. I hate everything you've done, everything you stand for. Fool, he thought. Trapped here, and I spout defiance like some idiot in a story who never suspects he might make his captor angry enough to do something about it? But he could not force himself to take the words back. Stubbornly he plowed ahead and made it worse. I'll destroy you if I can. You and the Dark One, and every last forsaken. A dangerous gleam flashed in her eyes, and was gone. Do you know why some of us fear you? Do you have any idea? because they are afraid the great Lord of the Dark will give you a place above them. Rand surprised himself by managing a laugh. Great Lord of the Dark! Can't you say his true name, either? Surely you don't fear to attract his attention, as decent people do, or do you? It would be blasphemy, she said simply. They are right to be afraid, Samael and the rest. The great Lord does want you. He wants to exalt you above all other men. He told me. That's ridiculous. The Dark One is still bound in Sheol Ghul, or I would be fighting Tarmon Gaydon right now. 
And if he knows I exist, he'd want me dead. I mean to fight him. Oh, he knows. The great lord knows more than you would suspect. It is possible to talk with him. Go to Sheol Ghul, into the pit of doom, and you can hear him. You can bathe in his presence. A different light shone on her face now. Ecstasy. She breathed through parted lips, and for a moment seemed to stare at something distant and wondrous. Words cannot even begin to describe it. You must experience it to know. You must. She was seeing his face again, with eyes large and dark and insistent. Kneel to the great Lord, and he will set you above all others. He will leave you free to reign as you will, so long as you bend knee to him only once, to acknowledge him. No more than that. He told me this. Asmodian will teach you to wield the power without it killing you. Teach what you can do with it. Let me help you. We can destroy the others. The great lord will not care. We can destroy all of them, even Asmodian, once he has taught you all you need to know. You and I can rule the world together under the great lord forever. Her voice dropped to a whisper, equal parts, eagerness, and fear. Two great Sa'angriel were made just before the end, one that you can use, one that I can, far greater than that sort. Their power is beyond imagining. With those we could challenge even the great Lord himself, even the Creator. You are mad, he said raggedly. The father of lies says he will leave me free. I was born to fight him. That is why I am here, to fulfill the prophecies. I'll fight him and all of you until the last battle, until my last breath. You do not have to. Prophecy is no more than a sign of what people hope for. Fulfilling the prophecies will only bind you to a path leading to Tarmon Gadon and your death. Mogedion or Samael can destroy your body. The great Lord of the Dark can destroy your soul an end utter and complete. You will never be born again, no matter how long the wheel of time turns. No. For what seemed a long time, she studied him. He could almost see the scales weighing alternatives. I could take you with me, she said finally. I could have you turned to the great Lord, whatever you want or believe. There are ways. She paused, perhaps to see if her words had had any effect. Sweat rolled down his back, but he kept his face straight. He would have to do something, whether he had a chance or not. A second attempt to reach Sa'idin battered vainly against that invisible barrier. He let his eyes wander as if he were thinking. Colindor was behind him, as far out of reach as the other side of the Arath Ocean. His belt knife lay on a table by the bed, together with a half-made fox he had been carving. The shapeless lumps of metal mocking him from above the fireplace, a drably clad man slipping in at the doors with a knife in his hand, the books lying everywhere. He turned back to Lanfear, tensing. You were always stubborn, she muttered. I won't take you, this time. I want you to come to me of your own will, and I will have it. What is the matter? You're frowning. A man slipping in at the doors with a knife. His eyes had slid past the fellow almost without seeing. Instinctively he pushed Lanfear out of the way and reached for the true source. The shield blocking him vanished as he touched it, and his sword was in his hands like a red-gold flame. The man rushed at him, knife held low and point up for a killing stroke. Even then it was difficult to keep his eyes on the fellow, but Rand pivoted smoothly, and the wind blows over the wall, took off the hand holding the knife, and finished by driving through his assailant's heart. For an instant he stared into dull eyes, lifeless while that heart still pumped, then pulled his blade free. A gray man. Rand took what felt like his first breath in hours. The corpse at his feet was messy, bleeding on to the scroll-worked carpet, but there was no difficulty in fixing an eye on him now. It was always that way with the shadow's assassins. When they were noticed, it was usually too late. This makes no sense, 
You could have killed me easily. Why distract me for a gray man to sneak up on me? Lanfear was watching him warily. I make no use of the soulless. I told you there are differences among the chosen. It seems I was a day late in my judgment, but there is still time for you to come with me, to learn, to live. That sword, she all but sneered. You do not do the tenth part of what you can. Come with me and learn. Or do you mean to try to kill me now? I loosed you to defend yourself. Her voice, her stance, said she expected an attack, or at the very least was ready to counter it. But that was not what stopped him, any more than her loosing the bonds in the first place. She was one of the forsaken. She had served evil so long she made a black sister look like a newborn babe. Yet he saw a woman. He called himself nine kinds of fool, but he could not do it. Maybe if she tried to kill him, maybe. But all she did was stand there, watching, waiting. No doubt ready to do things with a power he did not even know were possible if he attempted to hold her. He had managed to block Elaine and Egwene, but that had been one of those things he did without thinking, the way of it buried somewhere in his head. He could only remember that he had done it, not how. At least he had a firm grip on Saidine. She would not surprise him that way again. The stomach-wrenching taint was nothing. Saidine was life, perhaps in more ways than one. A sudden thought boiled up in his head like a hot spring. The Aiel. Even a grey man should have found it impossible to sneak through doors watched by half a dozen Aiel. What did you do to them? His voice grated as he backed toward the doors, keeping his eyes on her. If she used the power, maybe he would have some warning. What did you do to the Aiel outside? Nothing, she replied coolly. Do not go out there. This may be only a testing to see how vulnerable you are, but even a testing may kill you if you are a fool. He flung open the left-hand door onto a scene of madness. Chapter 10 The Stone Stands Dead Aeolmen lay at Rand's feet tangled with the bodies of three very ordinary men in very ordinary coats and breeches. Ordinary-looking men, except that six Aeol, the entire guard, had been slain, some obviously before they knew what was happening, and each of those ordinary men had at least two Aeol spears through him. That was not the half of it, though. As soon as he pulled the door open, a roar of battle had washed over him, shouting, howling, steel clashing on steel among the redstone columns. The defenders in the anteroom were fighting for their lives beneath the gilded lamps against bulky, black-mailed shapes, head and shoulders taller than they, shapes like huge men but with heads and faces distorted by horns or feathers, by muzzle or beak where mouth and nose should be. Trollocs. They strode on paws or hooves as often as on booted feet, cutting men down with oddly spiked axes and hooked spears and scythe-like swords that curved the wrong way. And with them... A murdral, like a sleek, moving man with maggot-white skin and black armor, like death made bloodless flesh. Somewhere in the stone an alarm gong sounded, then stopped with lethal suddenness. Another took it up, and another in brazen tolls. The defenders fought, and they still outnumbered the Trollocs, but there were more men down than Trollocs. Even as Rand's eyes found them, the Murdral tore off half the tear in Captain's face with one bare hand, while the other drove a dead black blade through a defender's throat, slipping defender's spear thrusts like a snake. The defenders faced what they had thought were only travelers' tales to frighten children. Their nerve was frayed to snapping. One man who had lost his rimmed helmet threw down his spear and tried to flee, only to have his head split like a melon by a Trolloc's massive axe. Yet another man looked at the Murdral and fled screaming. The Murdral darted sinuously to intercept. In a moment, the humans would all be running. Fade! Rand shouted. Try me, Fade! The Murdral stopped as if it had never moved, its pale, eyeless face turning to him. Fear rippled through Rand at that stare, sliding over the bubble of cold calm that encased him when he held Saidin. In the borderlands, they said, the look of the eyeless is fear. 
Once he had believed fades rode shadows like horses and disappeared when they turned sideways. Those old beliefs were not so very far wrong. The murdral flowed toward him, and Rand leaped the dead men in front of the doorway to meet it, his boots skidding on bloody black marble as he landed. Rally to the stone, he shouted as he leaped. The stone stands. Those were the battle cries he had heard on the night the stone had not stood. He thought he heard a vexed shout of, Fool! from the room he had left, but he had no time for land fear or what she might do. That skid very nearly cost him his life. His red-gold blade barely turned the Murdral's black one as he fought for balance. Rally to the stone! The stone stands! He had to keep the defenders together, or face the Murdral and twenty Trollocs alone. The stone stands! The stone stands! He heard someone echo him, then another. The stone stands! The fade moved as fluidly as a serpent, the snake-like illusion heightened by the overlapping plates of black armor down its chest. Yet not even a black lance ever struck so quickly. For a time it was all Rand could do to keep its blade from his own unarmored flesh. That black metal could make wounds that festered almost as hard to heal as the one that ached in his side now. Each time dark steel forged in Thakandar, below the slopes of Sheol Ghul, met red-gold power-wrought blade, light flashed like sheet lightning in the room, a sharp bluish-white that hurt the eyes. You will die this time, the Murdral rasped at him in a voice like the crumbling of dead leaves. I will give your flesh to the Trollocs and take your women for my own. Rand fought as coldly as he ever had, and as desperately. The Fade knew the use of a sword. Then an instant came when he could strike a blow squarely at the sword itself, not merely divert it. With a hiss as of ice falling on molten metal, the red-gold blade sheared through the black. His next blow took that eyeless head from its shoulders. The shock of hacking through bone shivered up his arms. Inky blood fountained from the stump of its neck. The thing did not fall, though. Thrashing blindly with its broken sword, the headless figure stumbled about, striking randomly at the air. As the Fade's head fell to roll across the floor, the remaining Trollocs fell too, shrieking, kicking, tearing at their heads with coarse-haired hands. It was a weakness of Murdral and Trollocs. Even Murdral did not trust Trollocs, so they often linked with them in some way Rand did not understand. It apparently ensured the Trollocs' loyalty, but those linked to a Murdral did not survive its death long. The defenders still standing, fewer than two dozen, did not wait. In twos and threes they stabbed each Trolloc repeatedly with their spears until it stopped moving. Some of them had the Murdral down, but it flailed wildly no matter how much they stabbed. As the Trollocs fell silent, a few surviving human wounded could be heard moaning, weeping. There were still more men littering the floor than shadow spawn. The black marble was slick with blood, almost invisible against the dark stone. Leave it, Rand told the defenders, trying to finish the Murdral. It's dead already. Fades just don't want to admit they're dead. Lan had told him that, what seemed a long time ago. He had had proof of it before this. See to the injured. Peering at the headless thrashing shape, its torso a tatter of gaping wounds, they shivered and moved back, muttering about lurks. That was what they called Fades in Tear in tales meant for children. Some began to hunt among the downed humans for any still alive, pulling aside those who could not stand, helping those who could to their feet. All too many were left where they lay. Hasty bandages ripped from a man's own bloody shirt were the only comfort that could be offered now. They did not look so pretty as they had, these Teherans. Their no longer gleaming breast and back plates bore dents and scuffs, Blood-soaked slashes marred once fine black-and-gold coats and breeches. Some had no helmets, and more than one leaned on his spear as if it were the only thing holding him on his feet. Perhaps it was. They breathed heavily, wild expressions on their faces, that blend of stark terror and blind numbness that afflicts men in battle. They stared at Rand uncertainly, fleeting, fearful stares, as if he might have called these creatures out of the blight himself. Wipe those spear points, he told them. A fade's blood will etch steel like acid if it's left on long enough. Most moved slowly to obey, hesitantly using what was available, the coat sleeves of their own dead. 
The sounds of more fighting drifted through the corridors, distant shouts, the muted clash of metal. They had obeyed him twice. It was time to see if they would do more. Turning his back on them, he started across the anteroom, toward the sounds of battle. Follow me, he ordered. He raised his fire-wrought blade to remind them of who he was, hoping the reminder did not bring a spear in his back. It had to be risked. The stone stands! For the stone! For a moment his own hollow footsteps were the only sound in the columned chamber. Then boots began to follow. For the stone! a man shouted. And another. For the stone and the Lord Dragon! Others took it up. For the stone and the Lord Dragon! Quickening to a trot, Rand led his bloodied army of twenty-three deeper into the stone. Where was Lanfear? And what part had she played in this? He had little time for wondering. Dead men spotted the halls of the stone in pools of their own blood, one here and farther on two or three more, defenders, servants, Aiel. Women, too, linen-gowned, noble, and wool-clad servant alike, struck down as they fled. Trollocs did not care whom they killed. They took pleasure in it. Murdral were worse. Half-men gloried in pain and death. A little deeper in, the stone of tear boiled. Knots of Trollocs rampaged through the halls, sometimes with a murdraw leading, sometimes alone, battling Aiel or defenders, cutting down the unarmed, hunting for more to kill. Rand led his small force at any shadow spawn they found, his sword slicing coarse flesh and black mail with equal ease. Only the Aiel faced a fade without flinching. The Aiel and Rand. He passed up Trollocs to reach fades. Sometimes the Murdral took a dozen or two Trollocs with it in dying, sometimes none. Some of his defenders fell and did not rise, but Aiel joined them, nearly doubling their number. Groups of men broke off in furious battles that drifted away in shouts and clatter like a forge gone mad. Other men fell in behind Rand, broke away, were replaced, till none of those who had started with him remained. Sometimes he fought alone or ran down a hallway, empty save for himself and the dead, following the sounds of distant combat. Once, with two defenders and a colonnade looking down into a long chamber with many doorways, he saw Moiraine and Lan, surrounded by Trollocs. The eyes that die stood head high like some storied queen of battles, and bestial shapes burst into flame around her, but only to be replaced by more, dashing in through this door or that, six or eight at a time. Lan's sword accounted for those who escaped Moiraine's fire. The warder had blood on both sides of his face, yet he flowed through the forms as coolly as if practicing before a mirror. Then a wolf snouted Trolloc, thrust a tear in spear toward Moiraine's back. Lan whirled as though he had eyes in the back of his head, taking off the Trolloc's leg at the knee. The Trolloc fell, howling, yet still managed to thrust spear point at Lan, just as another clubbed the warder awkwardly with the flat of its axe, buckling his knees. Rand could do nothing, for at that moment five Trollocs fell upon him and his two companions, all snouts and boars, tusks and ram's horns, pushing the humans out of the colonnade by the sheer weight of their rush. Five Trollocs should have been able to kill three men without much difficulty, except that one of the men was Rand, with a sword that treated their mail like cloth. One of the defenders died, and the other vanished, chasing after a wounded Trolloc, the lone survivor of the five. When Rand hurried back to the colonnade, there was a smell of burned meat from the chamber below, and great burned bodies on its floor, but no sign of Moiraine or Lan. That was the way of the contest for the stone, or the contest for Rand's life. Battles sprang up and drifted away from where they began, or died when one side fell. Not only did men fight Trollocs and Murdral, men fought men. There were dark friends siding the shadow spawn, roughly dressed fellows who looked like former soldiers and tavern brawlers. They seemed as fearful of the Trollocs as the Teirvins did, but they killed as indiscriminately where they could. Twice Rand actually saw Trollocs battling Trollocs. He could only assume the Murdral had lost control of them and their bloodlust had taken over. If they wanted to slay each other, he left them to it. Then, alone once more and seeking, he trotted round a corner and right into three Trollocs, each twice as wide as he and nearly half again as tall. One of them, with an eagle's hooked beak thrusting out of an otherwise human face, was hacking an arm from the corpse of a tear and noblewoman, while the other two watched eagerly licking their snouts. The Trollocs ate anything, so long as it was meat. It was an even chance whether he was more surprised or they were, but he was the first to recover. The one with the eagle's beak went down, male and belly alike opened across. 
The sword form called Lizard in the thorn bush should have done for the other two, but that first fallen trollop, thrashing still, half kicked his foot out from under him, and he staggered, his blade only scoring a slice along his target's mail, right into the path of the second trollop as it fell, Wolf's muzzle snapping at nothing. It crushed him to the stone tiles beneath its bulk, trapping sword arm and sword alike. The one still standing raised its spiked axe, coming as close to a smile as a boar's snout and tusks would allow. Rand struggled to move, to breathe. A scythe-curved sword split the boar's snout to the neck. Wrenching its blade free, a fourth trollop bared goat teeth at him in a snarl, ears twitching beside its horns. Then it darted away, sharp hooves clicking on the floor tiles. Rand heaved himself out from under the dead weight of the trollop, half-stunned. A trollop saved me. A trollop? Trollop blood was all over him, thick and dark. Far down the hallway, in the opposite direction from where the goat-horned trollop had fled, blue-white flashed as two murdraw moved into view, fighting each other in an almost boneless blur of continuous motion. One forced the other into a crossing corridor, and the flashing light faded from sight. I'm mad. That's what it is. I am mad. And this is all some crazed dream. You risk everything, rushing about wildly with that... that sword. Rand turned to face Lanfear. She had put on the appearance of a girl again, no older than he, perhaps younger. She lifted her white skirts to step over the tear in Lady's torn body. For all the emotion on her face, it might as well have been a log. You build a hut of twigs, she went on, when you could have marble palaces for the snap of your fingers. You could have had their lives and such souls as Trollocs possess with little effort, and instead they nearly killed you. You must learn. Join with me. "'Was this your doing?' he demanded. "'That Trolloc saving me? Those Murdral, was it?' She considered him a moment before giving a slight, regretful shake of her head. "'If I take credit, you will expect it again, and that could be deadly. None of the others is really certain where I stand, and I like it that way. You can expect no open aid from me.' "'Expect your aid?' he growled. You want me to turn to the shadow. You can't make me forget what you are with soft words. He channeled, and she slammed against the wall hanging, hard enough to make her grunt. He held her there, spread-eagled over a woven hunting scene, feet off the floor and snowy gown spread out and flattened. How had he blocked Egwene and Elaine? He had to remember. Suddenly he flew across the hallway to crash into the wall opposite Lanfear, pressed there like an insect by something that barely allowed him to breathe. Lanfear appeared to have no trouble breathing. Whatever you can do, Luz Theron, I can do. And better. Pinned against the wall as she was, she seemed unperturbed. The din of fighting surged up somewhere nearby, then faded as the battle moved away. You half use the smallest fraction of what you are capable of, and walk away from what would allow you to crush all who come against you. Where is Colindor, Luz Theron? Still up in your bedchamber like some useless ornament? Do you think yours is the only hand that can wield it, now that you have drawn it free? If Samael is here, he will take it and use it against you. Even Mogedian would take it to deny you its use. She could gain much by trading it to any male chosen. He struggled against whatever held him. Nothing moved but his head, flung from side to side. Colindor in the hands of a male, forsaken? The thought drove him half mad with fear and frustration. He channeled, tried to pry at what held him, but there might as well have been nothing to pry. And then, abruptly, it was gone. He lurched away from the wall, still fighting, before he realized he was free. And from nothing he had done. He looked at Lanfear. She still hung there, as complacently as if taking the air on a streamside. She was trying to lull him, to gull him into softening toward her. He hesitated over the flows holding her. If he tied them off and left her, she might tear half the stone down, trying to get free. If a passing trollop did not kill her, thinking she was one of the stone's folk. That should not have troubled him. Not the death of a forsaken. But the thought of leaving a woman, or anyone, helpless for trollops, repelled him. A glance at her unruffled composure rid him of that thought. No one, nothing in the stone would harm her, as long as she could channel. If he could find Moiraine to block her. Once more, Lanfear took the decision from him. 
The impact of severed flows jolted him, and she dropped lightly to the floor. He stared as she stepped away from the wall, calmly brushing her skirts. "'You can't do that!' he gasped foolishly, and she smiled. "'I do not have to see a flow to unravel it, if I know what it is and where. You see, you have much to learn. I like you like this. You were always too stiff-necked and sure of yourself for comfort. It was always better when you were a bit uncertain of your footing.' Are you forgetting Colindor, then? Still he hesitated. One of the Forsaken stood there, and there was absolutely nothing he could do. Turning, he ran for Colindor. Her laughter seemed to follow him. This time he did not turn aside to fight Trollocs or Murdral, did not slow his wild climb through the stone unless they got in his way. Then his sword, carved of fire, sliced a way through for him. He saw Perrin and Fa'il, he with axe in hand, she guarding his back with her knives. The Trollocs seemed as reluctant to face Perrin's yellow-eyed stare as his axe blade. Rand left them behind without a second look. If one of the Forsaken took Colindor, none of them would live to see the sunrise. Breathless, he scrambled through the columned anteroom, leaping the dead still lying there. Defenders and Trollocs alike in his haste to reach Colindor. He flung open both doors. The sword that is not a sword sat on its gilded and gem-set stand, shining with the light of the setting sun, waiting for him. Now that he had it in sight, safe, he was almost loath to touch it. Once he had used Colindor as it was truly meant to be used, only once. He knew what awaited him when he took it up again, used it to draw on the true source far beyond what any human could hold unaided. Letting go the red gold blade seemed more than he could do. When it vanished, he almost called it back. Feet dragging, he skirted the corpse of the gray man and put his hand slowly on Colindor's hilt. It was cold, like crystal long in the dark, but it did not feel so smooth that it would slip in the hand. Something made him look up. A fade stood in the doorway, hesitating, its pale-faced, eyeless gaze on Colindor. Rand pulled at Saedine through Colindor. The sword that is not a sword blazed in his hands as if he held noonday. The power filled him, hammering down like solid thunder. The taint rushed through him in a flood of blackness. Molten rock pulsed along his veins. The cold inside him could have frozen the sun. He had to use it or burst like a rotted melon. The Murdral turned to flee, and suddenly black clothes and armor crumpled to the floor, leaving oily motes floating in the air. Rand was not even aware he had channeled until it was done. He could not have said what he had done if his life had depended upon it. But nothing could threaten his life while he held Colindor. The power throbbed in him like the heartbeat of the world. With Colindor in his hands, he could do anything. The power hammered at him, a hammer to crack mountains. A channeled thread whisked the Murdral's drifting remains out into the anteroom, and its clothes and armor, too. A trickled flow incinerated both. He strode out to hunt those who had come hunting him. Some of them had come as far as the anteroom. Another fade, and a huddle of cowering trollocs stood before the columns at the far side, staring at ash that sifted out of the air the last fragments of the Murdral and all its garb. At the sight of Rand, with Colindor flaring in his hands, the trollocs howled like beasts. The fade stood paralyzed with shock. Rand gave them no chance to run. Maintaining his deliberate pace toward them, he channeled, and flames roared from the bare black marble beneath the shadow spawn, so hot that he flung up a hand against it. By the time he reached them, the flames were gone. Nothing remained but dull circles on the marble. Back down into the stone he went, and every trollic, every murdral he saw, died wreathed in fire. He burned them fighting Aeel or Teherans, and killed servants trying to defend themselves with spears or swords snatched from the dead. He burned them as they ran, whether stalking more victims or fleeing him. He began to move faster, trotting, then running past the wounded, often lying untended, past the dead. It was not enough. He could not move fast enough. While he killed Trollocs in handfuls, others still slew, if only to escape. Suddenly he stopped, surrounded by the dead, in a wide hallway. He had to do something, something more. The power slid along his bones, pure essence of fire. Something more! The power froze his marrow. Something to kill them all, all of them at once. 
The taint on Saeedine rolled over him, a mountain of rotting filth threatening to bury his soul. Raising Colador, he drew on the source, drew on it till it seemed he must scream screams of frozen flame. He had to kill them all. Just beneath the ceiling, right above his head, air slowly began to revolve, spinning faster, milling in streaks of red and black and silver. It roiled and collapsed inward, boiling harder, whining as it whirled, and grew smaller still. Sweat rolled down Rand's face as he stared up at it. He had no idea what it was, only that racing flows he could not begin to count connected him to the mass. It had mass, a weight growing greater while the thing fell inward on itself. Colindor flared brighter and brighter, too brilliant to look at. He closed his eyes, and the light seemed to burn through his eyelids. The power raced through him, a raging torrent that threatened to carry all that was him into the spinning. He had to let go, he had to. He forced his eyes open, and it was like looking at all the thunderstorms in the world compressed to the size of a trollock's head. He had to, had to, had to. Now, the thought floated like cackling laughter on the rim of his awareness. He severed the flows rushing out of him, leaving the thing still whirling, whining like a drill on bone. Now! And the lightnings came, flashing out along the ceiling, left and right like silver streams. A murdral stepped out of a side corridor, and before he could take a second step, half a dozen flaring streaks stabbed down, blasting it apart. The other streams flowed on, fanning down every branching of the corridor, replaced by more and more, erupting every second. Rand had not a clue to what he had made, or how it worked. He could only stand there, quivering with a power that filled him with the need to use it, even if it destroyed him. He could feel Trollocs and Murdral dying, feel the lightning strike and kill. He could kill them everywhere, everywhere in the world. He knew it. With Colindor, he could do anything. And he knew trying would kill him just as surely. The lightnings faded and died with the last shadow spawn. The spinning mass imploded with a loud clap of inrushing air, but Colindor still shone like the sun. He shook with the power. Moiraine was there, a dozen paces away, staring at him. Her dress was neat, every fold of blue silk in place, but wisps of her hair were disarrayed. She looked tired and shocked. How... What you have done I would not have believed possible. Lan appeared, half trotting up the hall, sword in hand, face bloodied, coat torn. Without taking her eyes from Rand, Moiraine flung out a hand, halting the water short of her, well short of Rand, as if he were too dangerous for even Lan to approach. Are you... well, Rand? Rand pulled his gaze away from her, and it fell on the body of a dark-haired girl, little more than a child. She lay sprawled on her back, eyes wide and fixed on the ceiling, blood blackening the bosom of her dress. Sadly, he bent to brush strands of hair from her face. Light, she is only a child. I was too late. Why didn't I do it sooner? A child. I will see that someone takes care of her, Rand, Moiraine said gently. You cannot help her now. His hand shook so hard on Colindor that he could barely hold on. For this I can do anything. His voice was harsh in his own ears. Anything! Rand, Moiraine said urgently. He would not listen. The power was in him. Colindor blazed, and he was the power. He channeled, directing flows into the child's body, searching, trying, fumbling. She lurched to her feet, arms and legs unnaturally rigid and jerky. Rand, you cannot do this, not this. Breathe. She has to breathe. The girl's chest rose and fell. Heart has to beat. Blood already thick and dark oozed from the wound in her chest. Live! Live! Burn you! I didn't mean to be too late. Her eyes stared at him, filmed, lifeless. Tears trickled unheeded down his cheeks. She has to live! Heal her, Moiraine! I don't know how! Heal her! Death cannot be healed, Rand. You are not the creator. Staring into those dead eyes, Rand slowly withdrew the flows. The body fell stiffly the body. He threw back his head and howled as wild as any trollic. Braided fire sizzled into walls and ceiling as he lashed out in frustration and pain. Sagging, he released Saeedine, pushed it away. It was like pushing away a boulder, like pushing away life. Strength drained out of him with the power. The taint remained, though, a stain weighing him down with darkness. 
He had to ground Colander on the floor tiles and lean on it to stay on his feet. The others. It was hard to speak. His throat hurt. Elaine. Perrin. The rest. Was I too late for them, too? You were not too late, Moiraine said calmly. But she had come no closer, and Lan looked ready to dart between her and Rand. You must not— Are they still alive? Rand shouted. They are, she assured him. He nodded in weary relief. He tried not to look at the girl's body. Three days waiting so he could enjoy a few stolen kisses. If he had moved three days ago— but he had learned things in those three days, things he might be able to use if he could put them together. If. Not too late for his friends, at least. Not too late for them. How do the Trollocs get in? I don't think they climb the walls like Aeel, not with the sun still up. Is it still up? He shook his head to dispel some of the fog. No matter. The Trollocs, how? Lan was the one who answered. Eight large grain barges tied up at the stone's docks late this afternoon. Apparently no one thought to question why laden grain barges would be coming downriver. His voice was heavy with contempt. Or why they'd dock at the stone, or why the crews left the hatches shut until nearly sunfall. Also a train of wagons arrived about two hours ago now. Thirty of them supposedly bringing some lord or other's things from the country for his return to the stone. When the canvas was thrown back, they were packed with half-men and trollocs too. If they came in any other way, I don't know of it yet. Rand nodded again, and the effort buckled his knees. Suddenly Lan was there, pulling Rand's arm over his shoulder to hold him up. Moiraine took his face in her hands. A chill rippled through him, not the blasting cold of full healing, but a chill that pushed weariness out as it passed. Most of the weariness. A seed remained, as if he had worked a day hoeing to back. He moved away from the support he no longer needed. Lan watched him warily to see if he could really stand alone, or perhaps because the warder was not certain how dangerous he was. How sane. I left some a purpose, Moiraine told him. You need to sleep tonight. Sleep. There was too much to do to sleep. But he gave another nod. He did not want her shadowing him. Yet what he said was, Lanfear was here. This was not her doing. She said so, and I believe her. You don't seem surprised, Moiraine. Would Lanfear's offer surprise her? Would anything? Lanfear was here, and I talked with her. She didn't try to kill me, and I didn't try to kill her. And you are not surprised. I doubt you could kill her. Yet. Her glance at Colindor was the merest flicker of dark eyes, not unaided. And I doubt she will try to kill you. Yet. We know little of any of the Forsaken, and least of all Lanfear, but we do know she loved Luz Theron Telamon. To say you are safe from her is certainly too strong. There is a good deal she can do to harm you short of murder. But I do not think she will try to kill as long as she thinks she might win Luz Theron back again. Lanfear wanted him. The daughter of the night, used by mothers who only half believed in her to frighten children. She certainly frightened him. It was nearly enough to make him laugh. He had always felt guilty for looking at any woman besides Egwene, and Egwene did not want him. But the daughter heir of Ondor wanted to kiss him at least, and one of the Forsaken claimed to love him. Nearly enough for laughter, but not quite. Lanfear seemed jealous of Elaine, that pale-haired milksop, she had called him. Madness, all madness. Tomorrow. He started away from them. Tomorrow, Moiraine said. Tomorrow I will tell you what I'm going to do. Some of it he would. The thought of Moiraine's face, if he told her everything, made him want to laugh. If he knew everything himself yet. Lanfear had given him almost the last piece, without knowing it. One more step tonight. The hand holding Colindor by his side trembled. With that, he could do anything. I am not mad yet. Not mad enough for that. Tomorrow. A good night to us all, the light willing. Tomorrow he would begin to unleash another kind of lightning. Another lightning that might save him.
or kill him. He was not mad yet. Chapter 11 What Lies Hidden Clad in her shift, Egwene drew a deep breath and left the stone ring lying beside an open book on her bedside table. All flecked and striped in brown and red and blue, it was slightly too large for a finger ring, and shaped wrong, flattened and twisted so that a fingertip run along the edge would circle both inside and out before coming back to where it had started. There was only one edge, impossible though that seemed. She was not leaving the ring there because she might fail without it, because she wanted to fail. She had to try without the ring sooner or later, or she could never do more than dabble her toes where she dreamed of swimming. It might as well be now. That was the reason. It was. The thick, leather-bound book was A Journey to Tarabin, written by Urien Romovny from Candor. Fifty-three years ago, according to the date the author gave in the first line, but little of any consequence would have changed in Tanchico in that short a time. Besides, it was the only volume she had found with useful drawings. Most of the books only had portraits of kings, or fanciful renderings of battles by men who had not seen them. Darkness filled both windows, but the lamps gave more than adequate light. One tall beeswax candle burned in a gilded candlestick on the bedside table. She had gone to fetch that herself. This was no night to be sending a maid for a candle. Most of the servants were tending the wounded or weeping over loved ones or being tended themselves. There had been too many for healing, any but those who would have died without it. Elaine and Nynaeve waited with high-backed chairs pulled to either side of the wide bed with its tall, swallow-carved posts. They tried to hide their anxiety with differing degrees of success. Elaine managed a passably stately calm and only spoiled it by frowning and chewing her underlip when she thought Egwene was not looking. Nynaeve was all brisk confidence, the sort that made you feel comforted when she tucked you into a sickbed. But Egwene recognized the set of her eyes. They said Nynaeve was afraid. Avienda sat cross-legged beside the door, her browns and greys standing out sharply against the deep blue of the carpet. This time the eye eel woman had her long-bladed knife at one side of her belt, a bristling quiver at the other, and four short spears across her knees. A round hide buckler lay close at hand, atop a horn bow, and a worked leather case with straps that could hold it on her back. After tonight, Egwene could not fault her for going armed. She still wanted to hold a lightning bolt ready to fling herself. Light! What was that Rand did? Burn him, he frightened me almost as badly as the Fades did. Maybe worse. It isn't fair he can do something like that, and I can't even see the flows. She climbed onto the bed and took the leather-bound book on her knees, frowning at an engraved map of Tanchico. Little of any use was marked, really. A dozen fortresses surrounding the harbor, guarding the city on its three hilly peninsulas, the Verana to the east, the Meseta in the center, and the Calpine nearest the sea. Useless. Several large squares, some open areas that seemed to be parks, and a number of monuments to rulers long since dust, all useless a few palaces and things that seemed strange. The great circle, for instance, on the Calpine. On the map it was just a ring, but Master Romovny described it as a huge gathering place that could hold thousands to watch horse races or displays of fireworks by the illuminators. There was also a king's circle on the Meseta, and larger than the great circle, and a panarch's circle on the Varana, just a little smaller. The chapter house of the Guild of Illuminators was marked as well. They were all useless. The text certainly had nothing of use. "'Are you certain you want to try this without the ring?' Nynaeve asked quietly. "'Certain,' Egwene replied as calmly as she could. Her stomach was leaping as badly as it had when she saw that first trollic tonight, holding that poor woman by the hair and slitting her throat like a rabbit's. The woman had screamed like a rabbit, too. Killing the trollic had done her no good.' The woman was as dead as the trollic. Only her shrill scream would not go away. If it doesn't work, I can always try again with the ring. She leaned over to mark the candle with a thumbnail. Wake me when it burns down to there. Light, but I wish we had a clock. Elaine laughed at her, a light-hearted trill, and it 
very nearly sounded unforced. A clock in a bedchamber? My mother has a dozen clocks, but I never heard of a clock in a bedchamber. Well, my father has one clock, Egwene grumbled, the only one in the whole village, and I wish I had it here. Do you think it will burn that far in an hour? I don't want to sleep longer than that. You must wake me as soon as the flame reaches that mark, as soon as. We will, Elaine said soothingly. I promise it. The stone ring, Avienda said suddenly. Since you are not using it, Egwene, could not someone, one of us, use it to go with you? No, Egwene muttered. Light, I wish they would all come with me. Thank you for the thought, though. Can only you use it, Egwene? the Aiel woman asked. Any of us might, Nynaeve replied. Even you, Avienda. A woman needn't be able to channel, only sleep with it touching her skin. A man might be able to, for all we know. But we do not know till Aren Riyad as well as Egwene, or the rules of it. Avienda nodded. I see. A woman can make mistakes where she does not know the ways, and her mistakes can kill others as well as herself. Exactly, Nynaeve said. The world of dreams is a dangerous place. That much we do know. But Egwene will be careful, Elaine added, speaking to Avienda, but obviously meaning it for Egwene's ears. She promised. She will look around, carefully, and no more. Egwene concentrated on the map. Careful. If she had not guarded her twisted stone ring so jealously, she thought of it as hers. The hall of the tower might not agree, but they did not know she had it. If she had been willing to let Elaine or Nynaeve use it more than once or twice, they might know enough to come with her now. Yet it was not regret that made her avoid looking at the other women. She did not want them to see the fear in her eyes. Teleran Riyadh, the unseen world, the world of dreams. Not the dreams of ordinary people, though sometimes they touched Teleran Riyadh briefly, in dreams that seemed as true as life, because they were. In the unseen world, what happened was real, in a strange way. Nothing that happened there affected what was. A door opened in the world of dreams would still be shut in the real world. A tree cut down there still stood here. Yet a woman could be killed there, or stilled. Strange barely began to describe it. In the unseen world, the whole world lay open, and maybe other worlds too. Any place was attainable. Or at least its reflection in the world of dreams was. The weave of the pattern could be read there, past, present, and future, by one who knew how. By a dreamer? There had not been a dreamer in the White Tower since Corianan Nedial, nearly five hundred years earlier. Four hundred and seventy-three years, to be exact, Egwene thought. Or is it four hundred seventy-four now? When did Corianan die? If Egwene had had a chance to finish novice training in the Tower, to study there as an accepted, perhaps she would know. There was so much she might have known then. A list lay in Egwene's pouch of the Tehran Greel, most small enough to slip into a pocket that had been stolen by the Black Aja when they fled the tower. They all three had a copy. Thirteen of those stolen Tehran Greel had no known use written alongside, and last studied by Corianna Nedeal. But if Corianna and Sedai had truly not discovered their uses, Egwene was sure of one of them. They gave entrance to Teleran Riyadh, not as easily as the stone ring, perhaps, and perhaps not without channeling, but they did it. Two they had recovered from Joia and Amiko, an iron disc three inches across, scribed on both sides with a tight spiral, and a plaque no longer than her hand, apparently clear amber, yet hard enough to scratch steel, with a sleeping woman somehow carved into the middle of it. Amiko had spoken freely of them, and so had Joia, after a session alone in her cell with Moiraine that had left the dark friend pale-faced and almost civil. Channel a flow of spirit into either Tirangriol, and it would take you into sleep and then into Teleran Riyad. Helene had tried both of them briefly, and they worked, though all she saw was the inside of the stone and Morgaze's royal palace in Camelin. Egwene had not wanted her to try however fleeting the visit, but not from jealousy. 
She had not been able to argue very effectively, though, for she had been afraid Elaine and Nynaeve would hear what was in her voice. Two recovered meant eleven still with the black Aja. That was the point Egwene had tried to make. Eleven Tyran Griel that could take a woman to tell Aaron Riyadh, all in the hands of black sisters. When Elaine made her short journeys into the unseen world, she could have found the black Aja waiting for her, or walked into them before she knew they were there. The thought made Egwene's stomach writhe. They could be waiting for her now. Not likely, not on purpose. How would they know she was coming? But they could be there when she stepped through. One she could face, unless she was caught by surprise, and she did not mean to allow that. But if they did surprise her, two or three of them together, Leandrin and Rihanna, Chesmal, Emre, and Jean Kaid, and all the rest at once. Frowning at the map, she made her hands loosen their white-knuckled grip. Tonight had given everything urgency. If Shadowspawn could attack the stone, if one of the Forsaken could suddenly appear in their midst, she could not give in to fear. They had to know what to do. They had to have something besides Amiko's vague tale. Something? If only she could learn where Mazrim Taim was in his caged journey to Tarvalin, or if she could somehow slip into the Armalin's dreams and speak to her. Perhaps those things were possible for a dreamer. If they were, she did not know how. Tanchika was what she had to work with. I must go alone, Avienda. I must. She thought her voice was calm and steady, but Elaine patted her shoulder. Egwene did not know why she was scrutinizing the map. She already had it fixed in her head, everything in relation to everything else. Whatever existed in this world existed in the world of dreams, and sometimes more besides, of course. She had her destination chosen. She thumbed through the book to the only engraving showing the inside of a building named on the map the Panarch's Palace. It would do no good to find herself in a chamber if she had no idea where it was in the city. None of it might do any good in any case. She put that out of her mind. She had to believe there was some chance. The engraving showed a large room with a high ceiling. A rope strung along waist-high posts would keep anyone from going too close to the things displayed on stands and in open-fronted cabinets along the walls. Most of those displays were indistinct, but not what stood at the far end of the room. The artist had taken pains to show the massive skeleton standing there as if the rest of the creature had that moment disappeared. It had four thick-boned legs, but otherwise resembled no animal Egwene had ever seen. For one thing, it had to stand at least two spans high, well over twice her height. The rounded skull, set low on the shoulders like a bull's, looked big enough for a child to climb inside, and in the picture it seemed to have four eye sockets. The skeleton marked the room off from any other. There was no mistaking it for anything but itself, whatever it was. If Urien Romavni had known, he had not named it in these pages. What is a panarch, anyway? she asked, laying the book aside. She had studied the picture a dozen times. All of these writers seem to think you know already. The panarch of Tanchico is the equal of the king in authority, Elaine recited. She is responsible for collecting taxes, customs, and duties, he for spending them properly. She controls the civil watch and the courts, except for the high court, which is the king's. The army is his, of course, except for the panarch's legion. She— I didn't really want to know, Egwene sighed. It had only been something to say, another few moments, to delay what she was going to do. The candle was burning down, she was wasting precious minutes. She knew how to step out of the dream when she wanted, how to wake herself, but time passed differently in the world of dreams, and it was easy to lose track. As soon as it reaches the mark, she said, and Elaine and Nynaeve murmured reassurances. Settling back on her feather pillows, at first she only stared at the ceiling, painted with blue sky and clouds and swooping swallows. She did not see them. Her dreams had been bad enough lately, most of them. Rand was in them, of course. Rand, as tall as a mountain, walking through cities, crushing buildings beneath his feet, with screaming people like ants fleeing from him. Rand in chains, and it was he who was screaming. Rand building a wall with him on one side and her on the other, her and Elaine and others she could not make out. It has to be done, he was saying as he piled up stones. I'll not let you stop me now. His were not the only nightmares. 
She had dreamed of Aiel fighting each other, killing each other, even throwing away their weapons and running as if they had gone mad. Matt wrestling with a Sean Chan woman who tied an invisible leash to him. A wolf. She was sure it was Perrin, though, fighting a man whose face kept changing. Galad wrapping himself in white as though putting on his own shroud, and Gawain with his eyes full of pain and hatred. Her mother weeping. They were the sharp dreams, the ones she knew meant something. They were hideous, and she did not know what any of them meant. How could she presume to think she could find any meaning or clues until Aran Riyadh? But there was no other choice. No other choice but ignorance, and she could not choose that. Despite her anxiety, going to sleep was no problem. She was exhausted. It was just a matter of closing her eyes and taking deep regular breaths. She fixed in her thoughts the room and the Panarch's palace and the huge skeleton. Deep, regular breaths. She could remember how using the stone ring felt to step into Teleran Riyadh. Deep, regular breaths. Egwene stepped back with a gasp, one hand to her throat. This close, the skeleton seemed even larger than she had thought, the bones bleached dull and dry. She stood right in front of it, inside the rope, a white rope as thick as her wrist and apparently silk. She had no doubt this was to lay around Riyadh. The detail was as fine as reality, even for things half seen from the corner of her eye. That she could even be aware of the differences between this and an ordinary dream told her where she was. Besides, it felt right. She opened herself to Sa'idar. A nick on the finger in the world of dreams would still be there on waking. There would be no waking from a killing stroke with a power, or even from a sword or a club. She did not intend to be vulnerable for an instant. Instead of her shift, she wore something very much like Avienda's Aiel garb, but in red brocaded silk. Even her soft boots laced to the knee were supple red leather, suitable for gloves, with gold stitching and laces. She laughed softly to herself. Clothes and Teleran Muyad were what you wanted them to be. Apparently part of her mind wanted to be ready to move quickly, while another part wanted to be ready for a ball. It would not do. The red faded to greys and browns. The coat and breeches and boots became exact copies of the maidens. No better, really, not in a city. Abruptly she was in a copy of the dresses Fa'il always wore, dark with narrow divided skirts, long sleeves, and a high snug bodice. Foolish to worry about it. No one is going to see me except in their dreams, and few ordinary dreams reach here. It would make no difference if I were naked. For a moment she was naked, her face colored with embarrassment. There was no one there to see her bare as in her bath, before she hastily brought the dark dress back, but she should have remembered how stray thoughts could affect things here, especially when you had embraced the power. Elaine and Nynaeve thought she was so knowledgeable. She knew a few of the rules of the unseen world, and knew there were a hundred, a thousand more of which she was ignorant. Somehow she had to learn them, if she was to be the tower's first dreamer since Corianin. She took a closer look at the huge skull. She had grown up in a country village, and she knew what animal bones looked like. Not four eye sockets, after all. Two seemed to be for tusks of some kind instead, on either side of where its nose had been. Some sort of monstrous boar, perhaps, though it looked like no pig skull she had ever seen. It had a feel of age, though. Great age. With the power in her, she could sense things like that here. The usual enhancement of senses was with her, of course. She could feel tiny cracks in the gilded plaster bosses covering the ceiling fifty feet up, and the smooth polish of the white stone floor. Infinitesimal cracks, invisible to the eye, spread across the floor stones as well. The chamber was huge, perhaps two hundred paces long and nearly half as wide with rows of thin white columns and that white rope running all the way around except where there were doorways with double-pointed arches. More ropes encircled polished wooden stands and cabinets holding other exhibits out on the floor. Up under the ceiling an elaborate pattern of tiny carvings pierced the walls, letting in plenty of light. Apparently she had dreamed herself into a tanchico, where it was day. 
a grand display of artifacts of ages long past, of the age of legends and ages before, open to all, even the common folk, three days in the month and on feast days. Yerian Romovny had written. He had spoken in glowing terms of the priceless display of Queen the R figures, six of them, in a glass-sided case in the center of the hall, always watched by four of the Panarch's personal guards when people were allowed in, and had gone on for two pages about the bones of fabulous beasts never seen alive by the eyes of men. Egwene could see some of those. On one side of the room was the skeleton of something that looked a little like a bear, if a bear had two front teeth as long as her forearm, and opposite it, on the other side, were the bones of some slender, four-footed beast with a neck so long the skull was half as high as the ceiling. There were more, spaced down the chamber's walls, just as fantastic. All of them felt old enough to make the stone of tear seem new-built. Ducking under the rope barrier, she walked down the chamber slowly, staring. A weathered stone figurine of a woman— Seemingly unclothed, but wrapped in hair that fell to her ankles, was outwardly no different from the others sharing its case, each not much bigger than her hand. But it gave an impression of soft warmth that she recognized. It was an angry all, she was sure. She wondered why the tower had not managed to get it away from the panarch. A finely jointed collar and two bracelets of dull black metal on a stand by themselves made her shiver. She felt darkness and pain associated with them— old, old pain, and sharp. A silvery thing in another cabinet, like a three-pointed star inside a circle, was made of no substance she knew. It was softer than metal, scratched and gouged, yet even older than any of the ancient bones. From ten paces she could sense pride and vanity. One thing actually seemed familiar, though she could not say why. Tucked into a corner of one of the cabinets, as if whoever put it there had been uncertain that it was worthy of display, lay the upper half of a broken figure carved from some shiny white stone, a woman holding a crystal sphere in one upraised hand, her face calm and dignified and full of wise authority. Whole she would have been perhaps a foot tall. But why did she appear so familiar? She almost seemed to call to Egwene to pick her up, not until Egwene's fingers closed on the broken statuette did she realize she had climbed over the rope. Foolish when I don't know what it is, she thought, but it was already too late. As her hand grasped it, the power surged within her, into the half-figure, then back into her, into the figure and back, in and back. The crystal sphere flickered in fitful, lurid flashes, and needles stabbed her brain with each flash. With a sob of agony she loosed her hold and clasped both hands to her head. The crystal sphere shattered as the figure hit the floor and broke into pieces, and the needles vanished, leaving only dull memories of the pain and the queasiness that wobbled her knees. She squeezed her eyes shut so she could not see the room heaving. The figure had to be a Turangriel, but why had it hurt her like that when she only touched it? Perhaps because it was broken. Perhaps broken, it could not do what it was meant for. She did not even want to think of what it might have been made for. Testing Terangriel was dangerous. At least it must be broken beyond danger now. Here, at least. Why did it seem to call me? Nausea faded, and she opened her eyes. The figure was back on the shelf, as whole as it had been when she first saw it. Strange things happened in Teleran Riyadh, but that was stranger than she wanted to see. And this was not what she had come for. First she had to find her way out of the Panarch's palace. Climbing back over the rope, she hurried out of the chamber, trying not to run. The palace was empty of life, of course. Human life, at least. Colorful fish swam in large fountains that splashed merrily in the courtyards, surrounded by delicately columned walks and balconies, screened by stonework, like intricately carved lace. Lily pads floated on the waters, and white flowers as big as dinner plates. In the world of dreams, a place was as it was in the so-called real world, except for people. Elaborate golden lamps stood in the hallways, wicks uncharred, but she could smell the perfumed oil in them. Her feet raised no hint of dust from the bright carpets that surely could never have been beaten, not here. Once she did see another person walking ahead of her, a man in gilded, ornately worked plate-and-mail armor, 
a pointed golden helmet crested with white egret plumes under his arm. Eldra, he called, smiling. Eldra, come look at me. I am named the Lord Captain of the Panarch's Legion. Eldra. He walked on another pace, still calling, and suddenly was not there. Not a dreamer. Not even someone using a tirangrio like her stone ring, or Amico's iron disc. Only a man whose dream had touched a place he was not aware of, with dangers he did not know. People who died unexpectedly in their sleep had often dreamed their way into Teleran Riyadh, and in truth had died there. He was well out of it, back into an ordinary dream. The candle was burning down beside that bed back in Tyr. Her time in Teleran Riyadh was burning away. Hastening her steps, she came to tall, carved doors leading outside, to wide, white stairs and a huge, empty square. Tanchico spread out in every direction across steep hills, white buildings upon white buildings, shining in the sun, hundreds of thin towers and almost as many pointed domes, some gilded. The Panarch's Circle, a tall, round wall of white stone, stood in plain sight not half a mile away and a little lower than the palace. The Panarch's Palace rose atop one of the loftiest hills. At the top of the deep stairs she was high enough to see water glinting to the west, inlets separating her from more hilly fingers where the rest of the city lay. Tanchico was larger than Tyr, perhaps larger than Canelin. So much to search, and she did not even know for what, for something that signified the presence of the Black Aja, or something that indicated some sort of danger to Rand, if either existed here. Had she been a real dreamer, trained in the use of her talent, she would surely have known what to look for, how to interpret what she saw. But no one remained who could teach her. Aeel, wise ones, supposedly knew how to decipher dreams. Avienda had been so reluctant to talk about the wise ones that Egwene had not asked any of the other Aeel. Perhaps a wise one could teach her, if she could find one. She took a step toward the square, and suddenly she was somewhere else. Great stone spires rose around her in a heat that sucked the moisture out of her breath. The sun seemed to bake right through her dress, and the breeze blowing in her face seemed to come from a stove. Stunted trees dotted a landscape almost bare of other growth, except for a few patches of tough grass and some prickly plants she did not recognize. She recognized the lion, however, even if she had never seen one in the flesh. It lay in a crevice in the rocks, not twenty paces away, black tufted tail switching idly looking not at her, but at something another hundred strides on. The large boar, covered in coarse hair, was rooting and snuffling at the base of a thorny bush, never noticing the Aeel woman creeping up on it, with a spear ready to thrust. Garbed like the Aeel in the stone, she had her shufa around her head, but her face uncovered. The waste, Egwene thought incredulously. I've jumped into the Aeel waste. When will I learn to watch what I think here? The Aeel woman froze. Her eyes were on Egwene now, not the boar. If it was a boar, it did not seem to be shaped exactly right. Egwene was sure the woman was not a wise one, not dressed like a maiden, from what Egwene had been told. A maiden of the spear, who wanted to become a wise one, had to give up the spear. This had to be just an Aeel woman who had dreamed herself into Teleran Riyadh, like that fellow in the palace. He would have seen her, too, if he had ever turned around. Egwene closed her eyes and concentrated on her one clear image of Tanchico, that huge skeleton in the great hall. When she opened them again, she was staring at the massive bones. They had been wired together, she noticed this time, quite cleverly, so that the wires hardly showed at all. The half-figurine with its crystal sphere was still on its shelf. She did not go near it any more than the black collar and bracelets that felt of so much pain and suffering. The Angrial, the stone woman, was a temptation. What are you going to do with it? Light, you're here to look, to search, nothing more than that. Get on with it, woman. This time she quickly found her way back to the square. Time passed differently here. Elaine and Nynaeve could be waking her up any moment, and she still had not even begun. There might be no more minutes to waste. She had to be careful of what she thought from here on. No more thinking about the wise ones. Even the admonition made everything lurch around her. Keep your mind on what you are doing, she told herself firmly. She set out through the empty city, walking fast, sometimes trotting. 
winding stone-paved streets slanted up and down, curving every which way, all empty except for green-backed pigeons and pale gray gulls that rose in thunderclaps of wings when she came close. Why birds and not people? Flies buzzed by, and she could see roaches and beetles scurrying along in the shadows. A pack of lean dogs, all different colors, loped across the street far ahead of her. Why dogs? She pulled herself back to why she was there. What would be a sign of the black archer? Or of this danger to Rand, if it existed? Most of the white buildings were plastered, the plaster chipped and cracked, often showing weathered wood or pale brown brick beneath. Only the towers and the larger structures, palaces, she supposed, were stone, if still white. Even the stone had tiny fissures, though, most of it, cracks too minute for the eye to catch, but she could feel them with a power in her, spider-webbing domes and towers. Perhaps that meant something. Perhaps it meant Tanchico was a city not looked after by its inhabitants as likely that as anything else. She jumped as a shrieking man suddenly plummeted out of the sky in front of her. She only had time to register baggy white trousers and thick moustaches covered by a transparent veil before he vanished, only a pace above the pavement. Had he struck here in Teleron Riyadh, he would have been found dead in his bed. He probably has as much to do with anything as the roaches, she told herself. Perhaps something inside the buildings. It was a small chance, a wild hope, but she was desperate enough to try anything, almost anything. Time. How much time did she have left? She began running from doorway to doorway, putting her head into shops and inns and houses. Tables and benches stood in common rooms awaiting customers, as neatly arranged as the dully gleaming pewter mugs and plates on their shelves. The shops were as tidy as if the shopkeeper had just opened for the morning, yet while a tailor's tables held bolts of cloth and a cutler's knives and scissors, the ceiling hooks hung empty in a butcher shop, and the shelves stood bare. A finger run along anywhere picked up no dust at all. Everything was clean enough to suit her mother. In the narrower streets there were homes, small, simple, white plastered buildings with flat roofs and no windows onto the street, ready for families to walk in and sit on benches before cold fireplaces or around narrow tables with carved legs, where a good wife's best bowl or platter was given pride of place. Clothes hung on pegs, pots hung from ceilings, Hand tools lay on benches, waiting. On a hunch, she retraced her steps once, just to see, back a dozen doors, and peered a second time into what was some woman's home in the real world. It was almost the way it had been. Almost. The red-striped bowl that had been on the table was now a narrow blue vase. One of the benches, on it a broken harness and the tools for mending it, that had been near the fireplace, now sat by the door holding a darning basket and a child's embroidered dress. Why did it change? she wondered. But for that matter, why should it stay the same? Light, I don't know anything. There was a stable across the street, the white plaster showing large patches of brick. She trotted to it and pulled open one of the big doors. Straw covered the dirt floor, just as in every stable she had ever seen, but the stalls stood empty. No horses. Why? Something rustled in the straw, and she realized the stalls were not empty after all. Rats, dozens of them, staring at her boldly, noses testing the air for her scent. None of the rats ran or even shied away. They behaved as if they had more right there than she. In spite of herself, she stepped back. Pigeons and gulls and dogs, flies and rats. Maybe a wise one would know why. As suddenly as that, she was back in the waist. With a scream, she fell flat on her back as the hairy, boar-like creature darted straight for her, looking as large as a small pony. Not a pig, she saw, as it leaped nimbly over her. The snout was too sharp and full of keen teeth, and it had four toes on each foot. The thought was calm, but she shuddered as the beast scampered away through the rocks. It was big enough to have trampled her, breaking bones and worse. Those teeth could have ripped and torn as well as any wolf's. She would have awakened with the wounds, if she had waked at all. The gritty rock under her back was a blistering stove-top. She scrambled to her feet, angry with herself. If she could not keep her mind on what she was doing, she would accomplish nothing. Tanchico was where she was supposed to be. She had to concentrate on that, nothing else. She stopped brushing at her skirts when she saw the Aiel woman watching her with sharp blue eyes from ten paces off. The woman was Avienda's age, no older than herself, but the wisps of hair that stuck out from under her shufa were so pale as to be almost white. The spear in her hands was ready to be cast, 
and at that distance she was not likely to miss. The Aiel was said to be more than rough with those who entered the waste without permission. Egwene knew she could wrap woman and spear in air, hold them safely, but would the flows keep long enough when she began to fade? Or would they just anger the woman enough to make her cast her spear the moment she was able, perhaps before Egwene was truly gone? Much good it would do to take herself back to Tenchiko with an Aiel spear through her. If she tied the flows, that would leave the woman trapped in Teleran Riyad until they were unraveled, helpless if that lion or the boar-like creature returned. No, she simply needed the woman to lower her spear, just long enough to feel safe closing her eyes, to take herself back to Tanchiko, back to what she was supposed to be doing. She had no more time for these flights of fancy. She was not entirely sure someone who had only dreamed themselves into Teleran Riyadh could harm her the way other things there could, but she was not going to risk finding out with an Aiel spear point. The Aiel woman should vanish in a few moments, something to put her off balance until then. Changing her clothes was easy. As soon as the thought came, Egwene was wearing the same browns and greys as the woman. I mean you no harm, she said, outwardly calm. The woman did not lower her weapon. Instead, she frowned and said, You have no right to wear cotton saw, girl. And Egwene found herself standing there in her skin, the sun burning her from overhead, the ground searing her bare feet. For a moment she gaped in disbelief, dancing from foot to foot. She had not thought it possible to change things about someone else. So many possibilities, so many rules that she did not know. Hurriedly she thought herself back into stout shoes and the dark dress with its divided skirts, and at the same time made the Aiel woman's garments vanish. She had to draw on Sa'idar to do it. The woman must have been concentrating on keeping Egwene naked. She had a flow ready to seize the spear if the other woman made to throw it. It was the Aiel woman's turn to look shocked. She let the spear fall to her side, too, and Egwene seized the moment to shut her eyes and take herself back to Tanchico, back to the skeleton of that huge boar, or whatever it was. She barely gave it a second glance this time, she was growing tired of things that looked like boars and were not. How did she do that? No, it's wondering about how and why that keeps pulling me off the path. This time I'll stick to it. She did hesitate, though. Just as she had closed her eyes, it had seemed she saw another woman, beyond the Aiel woman, watching them both. A golden-haired woman, holding a silver bow. You are letting wild fancies take you now. You've been listening to too many of Tom Marilyn's stories. Birgitta was long dead. She could not come again until the horn of Valier called her back from the grave. Dead women, even heroes of legend, surely could not dream themselves into Teleran Riyad. It was only a moment's pause, though. Shutting off feudal speculation, she ran back to the square. How much time did she have left? the whole city to search, and time slipping away, and she as ignorant as when she started. If only she had some idea of what to look for, or where. Running did not seem to tire her here in the world of dreams, but run as hard as she might, she would never cover the entire city before Elaine and Nynaeve woke her. She did not want to have to come back. A woman appeared suddenly among the flock of pigeons that had gathered in the square, her gown was pale green, thin, and draped closely enough to have satisfied Berylaine. Her dark hair was in dozens of narrow braids, and her face was covered to the eyes by a transparent veil like the one the falling man had worn. The pigeons soared up, and so did the woman, gliding over the nearest rooftops with them, before abruptly winking out of existence. Egwene smiled. She dreamed of flying like a bird all the time, and this was a dream, after all. She leaped into the air and kept going up toward the roofs. She wobbled as she thought how ridiculous this was. Flying? People did not fly. Then steadied again as she forced herself to be confident. She was doing it, and that was all there was to it. This was a dream, and she was flying. The wind rushed in her face, and she wanted to laugh giddily. She skimmed across the Panarch's circle, where rows of stone benches slanted down from the high wall to a broad field of packed dirt in the center. Imagine so many people gathered, and to watch a fireworks display by the Guild of Illuminators themselves. Back home, fireworks were a rare treat. 
She could remember the handful of times in her life Eamon's Field had had them, with the grown-ups as excited as the children. She sailed over rooftops like a falcon, over palaces and mansions, humble dwellings and shops, warehouses and stables. She slid by domes topped with golden spires and bronze weather vanes, by towers ringed with lacy stone balconies. Carts and wagons dotted wagon yards, waiting. Ships crowded the great harbor and the fingers of water between the city's peninsulas. They lined the docks. Everything seemed in a poor state of repair, from the carts to the ships. But nothing she saw pointed to the black Aja, as far as she knew. She considered trying to envision Leandrin. She knew that doll's face all too well, with its multitude of blonde braids, its self-satisfied brown eyes, and its smirking rosebud mouth. Picture her in the hopes she might be drawn to where the black sister was. But if it worked, she might find Leandrin and Teleron Riyadh too, and maybe others of them. She was not ready for that. It suddenly occurred to her that if any of the black Aja were in Tanchico, in the Tanchico of Teleran Riyadh, she was flaunting herself for them. Any eye looking at the sky would notice a woman flying, one who did not vanish after a few moments. Her smooth flight staggered, and she swooped down below roof level, floating along the streets more slowly than before, but still faster than a horse could run. She might be rushing toward them, but she could not make herself stop and wait for them. Fool, she called herself furiously. Fool, they could know I'm here now. They could be laying a trap already. She considered stepping out of the dream, back to her bed in tear, but she had found nothing, if there was anything to find. A tall woman was suddenly standing in the street ahead of her, slim in a bulky brown skirt and loose white blouse, with a brown shawl around her shoulders and a folded scarf around her forehead to hold white hair that spilled to her waist. Despite her plain clothes, she wore a great many necklaces and bracelets of gold or ivory or both. Fists planted on her hips, she stared straight at Egwene, frowning. Another fool woman who's dreamed herself where she has no right to be and doesn't believe what she's seeing, Egwene thought. She had the description of every woman who had gone with Leandrin, and this woman certainly matched none of them. But the woman did not vanish again. She stood there as Egwene approached swiftly. Why doesn't she go? Why— Oh, light! She's really— she snatched for the flows to weave lightning to tangle the woman in air, fumbling in startled haste. Put your feet on the ground, girl, the woman barked. I had enough trouble finding you again without you flying off like some bird when I do. Abruptly, Egwene stopped flying. Her feet thumped hard on the pavement, and she staggered. It was the Aeel woman's voice, but this was an older woman. Not as old as Egwene had thought at first. In fact, she looked much younger than her white hair suggested— but with a voice and those sharp blue eyes, she was sure it was the same woman. You're different, she said. You can be what you wish to be here. The woman sounded embarrassed, but only a little. At times I like to remember. That is not important. You are from the White Tower. It has been long since they had a dream walker. Very long. I am Amis, of the Nine Valleys Sept of the Ta'ardad Aiel. You are a wise one. You are. And you know dreams. You know Teleran Riyadh. You can... My name is Egwene. Egwene Alvir. I... She took a deep breath. Amis did not look a woman to lie to. I am Eyes Sedai, of the Green Aja. Amis's expression did not change, really. A slight crinkling of her eyes, perhaps in skepticism. Egwene hardly looked old enough to be full eyes, said I. What she said, though, was, I meant to leave you standing in your skin until you asked for some proper clothes. Putting on cotton sir all that way, as though you were... You surprised me, pulling free as you did, turning my own spear on me. But you are still untaught, are you not, however strong? else you would not have popped into the middle of my hunt that way, where you obviously did not wish to be. And this flying about. Did you come to Teleran Riyadh? Teleran Riyadh? 
to stare at this city, wherever it is? It's Tanjiko, Egwene said faintly. She didn't know. But then how had Amis followed her, or found her? It was obvious she knew more of the world of dreams than Egwene did, by far. You can help me. I am trying to find women of the Black Aja, dark friends. I think they are here, and I have to find them if they are. It truly exists, then. Amis almost whispered it. An Aja of the Shadow Runners in the White Tower. She shook her head. You are like a girl just wedded to the spear who thinks now she can rustle men and leap mountains. For her it means a few bruises and a valuable lesson in humility. For you, here, it could mean death. Amis eyed the white buildings around them and grimaced. Tanchico, in Tarabin? The city is dying, eating itself. There is a darkness here, an evil, worse than men can make. Or women. She looked at Egwene pointedly. You cannot see it or feel it, can you? And you want to hunt shadow runners in Teleran Riyadh? Evil, Egwene said quickly. That could be them. Are you sure? If I told you what they looked like, could you be certain it was them? I can describe them. I can describe one to her last braid. A child, Amis muttered, demanding a silver bracelet from her father this minute, when she knows nothing of trading or the making of bracelets. You have much to learn, far more than I can begin to teach you now. Come to the threefold land. I will have the word spread through the clans that an eyes Sedai called Egwene Alvir is to be brought to me at Cold Rock's Hold. Give your name and show your great serpent ring, and you will have safe running. I am not there now, but I will return from Ruirian before you can arrive. Please, you must help me. I need to know if they are here. I have to know. But I cannot tell you. I do not know them, or this place, this Tanchico. You must come to me. What you do is dangerous, far more dangerous than you know. You must... Where are you going? Stay! Something seemed to snatch at Egwene, pulling her into darkness. Amisa's voice followed her, hollow and dwindling. You must come to me and learn. You must. Chapter 12 Tanchico or the tower. Elaine drew a ragged, relieved breath as Egwene finally stirred and opened her eyes. At the foot of the bed, Avienda's features lost their tinge of frustration and anxiety, and she flashed a quick smile that Egwene returned. The candle had burned past the mark minutes ago. It seemed an hour. You would not wake up, Elaine said unsteadily. I shook you and shook you, but you would not wake. She gave a small laugh. Oh, Egwene, you even frightened Avienda. Egwene put a hand on her arm and squeezed reassuringly. I am back now. She sounded tired, and she had sweated her shift through. I suppose I had reason to stay a little longer than we planned. I will be more careful next time, I promise. Nynaeve returned the pitcher of water to the washstand vigorously, sloshing some out. She had been on the point of throwing it in Egwene's sleeping face. Her features were composed, but the pitcher rattled the washbowl, and she let the spilled water drip to the carpet. Was it something you found? Or was it— Egwene, if the world of dreams can hold on to you in some way, maybe it is too dangerous until you learn more. Maybe the more often you go, the harder it is to come back. Maybe— I don't know. But I do know we cannot risk letting you become lost. She crossed her arms under her breasts, ready for an argument. I know, Egwene said, very close to meekly. Elaine's eyebrows shot up. Egwene was never meek with Nynaeve, anything but. Egwene struggled off the bed, refusing Elaine's help, and made her way to the washstand to bathe her face and arms in the relatively cool water. Elaine found a dry shift in the wardrobe while Egwene pulled off her sodden one. I met a wise one, a woman named Amis. Egwene's voice was muffled until her head popped out of the top of the new shift. She said I should come to her to learn about Teleran Riyad, at some place in the waste called Cold Rock's Hold. Elaine had caught a flicker of Avienda's eye at the mention of the wise one's name. Do you know her, Amis? The Aiel woman's nod could only be described as reluctant. A wise one, a dreamwalker. Amis was Fardarai's Mai, 
until she gave up the spear to go to Rudion. A maiden, Egwene exclaimed. So that's why she— No matter. She said she is at Rudion now. Do you know where this cold rock's hold is, Avienda? Of course. Cold rock's is Rurik's hold. Rurik is Amis's husband. I visit there sometimes. I used to. My sister-mother, Leon, is sister-wife to Amis. Elaine exchanged confused glances with Egwene and Nynaeve. Once Elaine had thought she knew a good bit about Aiel, all learned from her teachers in Camelin, but she had discovered since meeting Avienda how little she did know. Customs and relationships all were a maze. First sisters meant having the same mother, except that it was possible for friends to become first sisters by making a pledge before wise ones. Second sisters meant your mothers were sisters. If your fathers were brothers, you were father sisters, and not considered as closely related as second sisters. After that it truly grew bewildering. What does sister wife mean? she asked hesitantly. That you have the same husband? Avienda frowned at the way Egwene gasped, and Nynaeve's eyes opened as wide as they would go. Elaine had been half expecting the answer, but she still found herself fussing with skirts that were perfectly straight. This is not your custom? the Aiel woman asked. No, Egwene said faintly. No, it is not. But you and Elaine care for one another as first sisters. What would you have done had one of you been unwilling to step aside for Randolph Thor? Fight over him? Let a man damage the ties between you? Would it not have been better if you both had married him then? Elaine looked at Egwene. The thought of... Could she have done such a thing? Even with Egwene? She knew her cheeks were red. Egwene merely looked startled. But I wanted to step aside, Egwene said. Elaine knew the remark was as much for her as for Avienda, but the thought would not go away. Had Min had a viewing? What would she do if Min had? If it's Berylaine, I will strangle her, and him too. If it has to be someone, why couldn't it be Egwene? Light, what am I thinking? She knew she was becoming flustered, and to cover it she made her voice light. You sound as if the man has no choice in the matter. He can say no, Avienda said, as if it were obvious. But if he wishes to marry one, he must marry both when they ask. Please take no offense, but I was shocked when I learned that in your lands a man can ask a woman to marry him. A man should make his interest known, then wait for the woman to speak. Of course, some women lead a man to see where his interest lies, but the right of the question is hers. I do not really know very much of these things. I have wanted to be far Darai's my since I was a child. All I want in life is the spear and my spear sisters. She finished quite fiercely. No one is going to try to make you marry, Egwene said soothingly. Avienda gave her a startled look. Nynaeve cleared her throat loudly. Elaine wondered if she had been thinking about Lan. There were certainly hard spots of color in her cheeks. I suppose, Egwene, Nynaeve said in a slightly too energetic voice, that you did not find what you were looking for, or you would have said something by now? I found nothing, Egwene replied regretfully. But Amis said, Avienda, what sort of woman is Amis? The Aiel woman had taken up a study of the carpet. Amis is hard as the mountains and pitiless as the sun, she said without looking up. She is a dream walker. She can teach you. Once she lays her hands on you, she will drag you by the hair toward what she wants. Rourke is the only one who can stand up to her. Even the other wise ones step carefully when Amis speaks. But she can teach you. Egwene shook her head. I meant... Would being in a strange place unsettle her, make her nervous, being in a city? Would she see things that weren't there? Avienda's laugh was a short, sharp sound. Nervous? Waking to find a lion in her bed would not make Amis nervous. She was a maiden, Egwene, and she has grown no softer, you can be sure of it. What did this woman see? Nynaeve asked. It wasn't something she saw exactly, Egwene said slowly. I think not seeing. She said Tanchico had an evil in it. Worse than men could make, she said. That could be the Black Archer. Don't argue with me, Nynaeve. 
she added in a firmer voice. Dreams have to be interpreted. It very well could be. Nynaeve had begun frowning as soon as Egwene mentioned evil in Tanchico, and her frown turned to a heated glare when Egwene told her not to argue. Sometimes Elaine wanted to shake both women. She stepped in quickly before the older woman could erupt. It very well could be, Egwene. You did find something. More than Nynaeve or I thought you could, didn't she, Nynaeve? Don't you think so? It could be, Nynaeve said grudgingly. It could be. Egwene did not sound happy about it. She took a deep breath. Nynaeve is right. I have to learn what I'm doing. If I knew what I should, I would not have had to be told about the evil. If I knew what I should, I could have found the very room Leandrin is staying in, wherever she is. Amis can teach me. That is why... That is why I have to go to her. Go to her? Nynaeve sounded appalled. Into the waste? Avienda can take me right to this cold rock's hold. Egwene's look, half defiant, half anxious, darted between Elaine and Nynaeve. If I was certain they were in Tanchico, I wouldn't let you go alone, if you decide to. But with Amis to help me, maybe I can find out where they are. Maybe I can... That is just it. I do not even know what I'll be able to do, only that I am certain it will be far more than I can now. It isn't as if I will be abandoning you. You can take the ring with you. You know the stone well enough to come back here in Teleran, Riyad. I can come to you in Tanchico. Whatever I learn from Amis, I can teach you. Please say you understand. I can learn so much from Amis, and then I can use it to help you. It will be as if all three of us had been trained by her. A dreamwalker, a woman, who knows? Leandrin and the rest of them will be like children. They won't know a quarter of what we do. She chewed her lip, one pensive bite. You don't believe I am running out on you, do you? If you do, I won't go. Of course you must go, Elaine told her. I will miss you, but no one promised us we could stay together until this was done. But the two of you, going alone... I should go with you. If they really are in Tanchico, I should be with you. Nonsense, Nynaeve said briskly. Training is what you need. That will do us far more good in the long run than your company to Tanchico. It isn't even as if we know any of them are in Tanchico. If they are, Elaine and I will do very well together, but we could arrive and find that this evil is no more than the war, after all. The light knows war should be evil enough for anyone. We may be back in the tower before you are. You must be careful in the waste, she added in a practical tone. It is a dangerous place. Ovienda, you will look after her? Before the Aiel woman could open her mouth, there was a knock at the door, followed immediately by Moiraine. The eyes said I took them in with one sweeping look that weighed, measured, and considered them, and what they had been doing, all without the twitch of an eyelid to suggest her conclusions. Joia and Amiko are dead, she announced. Was that the reason for the attack, then? Nynaeve said. All that to kill them? Or perhaps to kill them if they could not be freed? I've been sure Joia was so confident because she expected rescue. She must have been lying after all. I never trusted her repentance. Not the main purpose, perhaps, Moiraine replied. The captain very wisely kept his men to their posts in the dungeons during the attack. They never saw a single trollic or murdral. But they found the pair dead after, each with her throat rather messily cut, after her tongue had been nailed to her cell door. She might as well have been speaking of having a dress mended. Elaine's stomach heaved leadenly at the detached description. I would not have wanted that for them, not like that. The light illumined their souls. They sold their souls to the shadow long ago, Egwene said roughly. She had both hands pressed to her stomach, though. How, how was it done? Grey men? I doubt even grey men could have managed that, Moiraine said dryly. The shadow has resources beyond what we know, it seems. Yes, Egwene smoothed her dress and her voice. If there was no attempt at rescue, it must mean they were both telling the truth. They were killed because they talked. Or to stop them from it, Nynaeve added grimly. We can hope they do not know that those two told us anything. Perhaps Joia did repent, but I'll not believe it. 
Elaine swallowed, thinking of being in a cell, having your face pressed to the door so your tongue could be pulled out, and— She shivered, but made herself say, They might have been killed simply to punish them for being captured. She left out her thought that the killing might have been to make them believe whatever Joia and Amiko had said. They had enough doubts about what to do as it was. Three possibilities, and only one, says the black Arja, knows they revealed a word. Since all three are equal— the chances are that they do not know. Egwene and Nynaeve looked shocked. To punish them? Nynaeve said incredulously. They were both tougher than she in many ways. She admired them for it. But they had not grown up watching the maneuverings at court in Camelin, hearing tales of the cruel way Carienin and Teorins played the game of houses. I think the Black Aja might be less than gentle with failure of any kind, she told them. I can imagine Leandrin ordering it. Joia surely could have done it easily. Moiraine eyed her briefly, a reassessing look. Leandrin, Egwene said, her tone absolutely flat. Yes, I can imagine Leandrin or Joia giving that command. You did not have much longer to question them in any case, Moiraine said. They would have been shipbound by midday tomorrow. A hint of anger touched her voice. Elaine realized Moiraine must see the Black Sisters' deaths as an escape from justice. I hope you reach some decision soon, Tanchico or the Tower. Elaine met Nynaeve's eyes and gave a slight nod. Nynaeve nodded back, more assertively, before turning to the eyes, said I. Elaine and I will be going to Tanchico as soon as we can find a ship. A fast ship, I hope. Egwene and Avienda will be going to Cold Rock's Hold, in the Aeel Waste. She gave no reasons, and Moiraine's eyebrows rose. Julian can take her, Avienda said into the momentary silence. She avoided looking at Egwene. Or Sephila, or Bane and Chiad. I—I I have a thought to go with Elaine and Nynaeve. If there is war in this Tanchico, they have need of a sister to watch their backs. If that is what you want, Avienda. Egwene said slowly. She looked surprised and hurt, but no more surprised than Elaine. She had thought the two of them were becoming friends. I am glad you want to help us, Avienda, but you should be the one to take Egwene to Cold Rock's Hold. She is going neither to Tanchico nor Cold Rock's Hold, Moiraine said, taking a letter from her pouch and unfolding the pages. This was placed in my hand an hour gone. The young Aeelman who brought it told me it was given to him a month ago, before any of us reached Tyr, yet it is addressed to me by name at the Stone of Tyr. She glanced at the last sheet. Avienda, do you know Amis of the Nine Valleys Sept of the Ta'ardad Aeel? Bayer of the Haido Sept of the Sha'arad Aeel? Melane of the Girard Sept of the Goshian Aeel? And Siana of the Black Cliff Sept of the Nakai Aeel? They signed it. They are all wise ones, I said I, all dreamwalkers. Avienda's stance had shifted to wariness, though she did not seem aware of it. She looked ready to fight or flee. Dreamwalkers, Moiraine mused. Perhaps that explains it. I have heard of dreamwalkers. She turned to the second page of the letter. Here is what they say about you. What they said, perhaps before you had even decided to come to Tyr. There is among the maidens of the spear in the stone of Tyr a willful girl called Avienda, of the nine valleys sept of the Ta'ardad Aeel. She must now come to us. There can be no more waiting or excuses. We will await her on the slopes of Cheyendere, above Rudian. There is more about you, but mainly telling me that I must see you come to them without delay. They issue commands like the Armelin. These wise ones of yours? She made a vexed sound, which brought Elaine to wonder if the wise ones had tried issuing commands to the eyes Sedai, too. Not very likely, and unlikely to be successful if tried. Still, something about that letter irritated the eyes Sedai. I am far Darai's my, Avienda said angrily. I do not go running like a child when someone calls my name. I will go to Tanchico if I wish. Elaine pursed her lips thoughtfully. This was something new from the Aeel woman, not the anger. 
She had seen Avienda angry before, if not quite to this degree, but the undertone. She could call it nothing but sulkiness. That seemed as unlikely as land being sulky, but there it was. Egwene heard it too. She patted Avienda's arm. It's all right, if you want to go to Tanchico. I'll be pleased that you are protecting Elaine and Nynaeve. Avienda gave her a truly miserable look. Moiraine shook her head, only slightly, but still deliberate. I showed this to Rourke. Avienda opened her mouth, her face irate, but the eyes that I raised her voice and went on smoothly. As the letter asks me to, only the part concerning you, of course, he seems quite determined that you will do as the letter asks, as it orders. I think it wisest to do as Rourke and the wise ones wish, Avienda. Do you not agree? Avienda stared around the room wildly, as at a trap. "'I am far dar eyes my,' she muttered, and strode for the door without another word. Egwene took a step, half raising a hand to stop her, then let it fall as the door banged shut. "'What do they want with her?' she demanded of Moiraine. "'You always know more than you let on. What are you holding back this time?' "'Whatever the wise one's reason,' Moiraine said coolly, "'it is surely a matter between Avienda and them.' If she wished you to know, she would have told you. You cannot stop trying to maneuver people, Nynaeve said bitterly. You are maneuvering Avienda into something now, aren't you? Not I. The wise ones. And Rourke. Moiraine folded the letter, returning it to her belt pouch with a touch of acerbity in her manner. She can always say no to him. A clan chief is not the same as a king, as I understand, i.e. your ways. Can she? Elaine asked. Rourke reminded her of Gareth Bryn. The captain general of her mother's royal guards had seldom put his foot down, but when he did, not even more gaze could bring him around, short of a royal command. There would be no command from the throne this time, not that more gaze had ever issued one to Gareth Bryn when he had decided he was right, now that Elaine thought of it, and without one she expected that Avienda was going to the slopes of Cheyendere, above Ruidion. At least she can journey with you, Egwene. Amis can hardly meet you at Cold Rock's Hold if she plans to wait for Avienda at Rudion. You can go to Amis together. But I do not want her to, Egwene said sadly. Not if she doesn't want to. Whatever anyone wants, Nynaeve said. We have work to do. You will need many things for a trip into the waste, Egwene. Lan will tell me what. And Elaine and I must make preparations to sail for Tanchico. I suppose we can find a ship tomorrow, but that means deciding what to pack tonight. There is a ship of the Atha'an Mier at the docks in the mall, Moiraine told them. A raker. There are no ships faster. You did want a fast ship. Nynaeve gave a grudging nod. Moiraine, Elaine said, what is Rand going to do now? After this attack... Will he start the war you want? I do not want a war, the eyes said I replied. I want what will see him alive to fight Tarman Gadon. He says he will tell us all what he means to do tomorrow. The smallest frown creased her smooth forehead. Tomorrow we will all know more than we do tonight. Her departure was abrupt. Tomorrow, Elaine thought. What will he do when I tell him? What will he say? He has to understand. Determinedly, she joined the other two to discuss their preparations. Chapter 13 Rumors The tavern's business rocked along like any in the mall, a wagon load of geese and crockery careering downhill through the night. The babble of voices fought with the musicians' offerings on three assorted drums, two hammered dulcimers, and a bulbous samseer that produced whining trills. The serving maids in dark ankle-length dresses with necks up to the chin and short white aprons hustled between crowded tables, holding clusters of pottery mugs overhead so they could squeeze through. Barefoot, leather-vested dockmen mixed with fellows in coats tight to the waist and bare-chested men with broad, colorful sashes to hold up their baggy breeches. So close to the docks, vestments of outlanders were everywhere among the crowd, high collars from the north and long collars from the west, silver chains on coats and bells on vests, knee-high boots and thigh-high boots, 
necklaces or earrings on men, lace on coats or shirts. One man with wide shoulders and a big belly had a forked yellow beard, and another had smeared something on his mustaches to make them glisten in the lamplight and curl up on either side of his narrow face. Dice rolled and tumbled in three corners of the room and on a number of tabletops, silver changing hands briskly to shouts and laughter. Matt sat alone with his back to the wall where he could see all the doors, though mostly he peered into a still untouched mug of dark wine. He did not go near the dice games, and he never glanced at the serving girl's ankles. With the tavern so crowded, men occasionally thought to share his table, but a good look at his face made them sheer away and crowd onto a bench elsewhere. Dipping a finger in his wine, he sketched aimlessly on the tabletop. These fools had no idea what had happened in the stone tonight. He had heard a few tear-ins mention some kind of trouble, quick words that trailed off into nervous laughter. They did not know and did not want to. He almost wished he did not know himself. No, he wished he had a better idea of what had happened. The images kept flashing in his head, flashing through the holes in his memory, making no real sense. The din of fighting somewhere in the distance echoed down the corridor, dulled by the wall hangings. He retrieved his knife from the gray man's corpse with a shaking hand, a gray man, and hunting him. It had to have been after him. Gray men did not wander about killing at random. They had targets as surely as an arrow. He turned to run, and there was a murdral striding toward him like a black snake on legs, its pasty-faced eyeless stare sending shivers into his bones. At thirty paces he hurled the knife straight at where an eye should have been. At that distance he could hit a knot-hole no larger than an eye four times in five. The fade's black sword blurred as it knocked the dagger away, almost casually. It did not even break stride. Time to die, horn sounder. Its voice was a red adder's dry hiss, warning of death. Matt backed away. He had a knife in either hand now, though he did not remember drawing them. Not that knives would be much good against a sword, but running meant that black blade in his back, as sure as five sixes beat four threes. He wished he had a good quarterstaff. Or a bow. He would like to see this thing try to deflect a shaft from a Two Rivers longbow. He wished he were somewhere else. He was going to die here. Suddenly a dozen trollocs roared out of a side hallway, piling onto the fade in a frenzy of chopping axes and stabbing swords. Matt stared in amazed disbelief. The halfmen fought like a black-armored whirlwind. More than half the Trollocs were dead or dying before the fade lay in a twitching heap, one arm flexed and thrashed like a dying snake three paces away from the body, still with that black sword in its fist. A ram-horned Trolloc peered toward Matt, snout lifted to sniff the air. It snarled at him, then whined and began licking a long gash that had laid open male and hairy forearm. The others finished cutting the throats of their wounded, and one barked a few harsh guttural words. Without another glance at Matt, they turned and trotted away, hooves and boots making hollow sounds on the stone floor. Away from him, Matt shivered. Trollocs to the rescue. What had Rand gotten him into now? He saw what he had drawn with the wine, an open door, and scrubbed it out angrily. He had to get away from here, he had to. And he could also feel that urge in the back of his head that it was time to go back to the stone. He pushed it away angrily, but it kept buzzing at him. He caught a snatch of talk from the table to his right, where the lean-faced fellow with the curling moustaches was holding forth in a heavy Lugarder accent. Now, this dragon of yours is a great man, no doubt. I'll not be denying it, but he's not a patch on Loghain. Why, Loghain had all of Gaeldan at war, and half of Amadicia and Altara as well. He made the earth swallow whole towns that resisted him, he did. Buildings, people, and all entire. And the one up in Saldeia. Masim? Why, they say he made the sun stand still till he defeated the lord of Bashir's army. Tis a fact, they do say. Matt shook his head. The stone fallen, and Colindor in Rand's hand, and this idiot still thought he was another false dragon. He had sketched that doorway again. Rubbing a hand through it, he grabbed up the mug of wine, then stopped with it halfway to his mouth. Through the commotion, his ear had picked out a familiar name spoken at a nearby table. Scraping back his bench, he made his way to that table, mug in hand. The people around it were the sort of odd mixture made in taverns in the mall. Two barefoot sailors wearing oiled coats over bare chests, one with a thick gold chain close around his neck. 
A once fat man with sagging jowls and a dark Kyrianan coat with slashes of red and gold and green across his chest, which might have indicated that he was a noble, though one sleeve was torn at the shoulder. A good many Kyrianan refugees had come down far in the world. A grey-haired woman, all in subdued dark blue, with a hard face and a sharp eye and heavy gold rings on her fingers. And the speaker, the fork-bearded fellow, with a ruby the size of a pigeon's egg in his ear. The three silver chains looped across the straining chest of his dark reddish coat named him a Candori Master Merchant. They had a guild for merchants in Candor. The talk ceased, and all eyes swung to Matt when he stopped at their table. I heard you mention the two rivers. Forkbeard ran a quick eye over him, the unbrushed hair, the tight expression on his face, and the wine in his fist, the gleaming black boots, the green coat with its gold scrollwork, open to the waist to reveal a snowy linen shirt, but both coat and shirt heavily wrinkled. In short, the very image of a young noble sporting himself among the commoners. I did, my lord, he said heartily. I was saying there'll be no tobacco out of there this year, I'll wager. I have twenty casks of the finest Two Rivers leaf, though, than which there is none finer. Fetch an excellent price later in the year. If my lord wishes a cask for his own stock, he tugged one point of his yellow beard and laid a finger alongside his nose. I am certain I could manage to— You'll wager that, will you? Matt said softly, cutting him short. Why would there be no tobacco out of the Two Rivers? Why, the white cloaks, my lord, the children of the light. What about white cloaks? The master merchant peered around the table for help. There was a dangerous note in that quiet tone. The sailors looked as if they would leave if they dared. The Kyrianin was glaring at Matt, sitting up too straight and smoothing his worn coat as he swayed. The empty mug in front of him was obviously not his first. The gray-haired woman had her mug to her mouth, her sharp eyes watching Matt over the rim in a calculating way. Managing a seated bow, the merchant put on an ingratiating tone. The rumor is, my lord, that the white cloaks have gone into the two rivers, hunting the dragon reborn, it said. Though, of course, that cannot be, since the Lord Dragon is here in tear. He eyed Matt to see how that had been taken. Matt's face did not change. These rumors can run very wild, my lord. Perhaps it's only wind in a bucket. The same rumor claims the white cloaks are after some dark friend with yellow eyes, too. Did you ever hear of a man with yellow eyes, my lord? No more have I. Wind in a bucket. Matt set his mug on the table and leaned closer to the man. Who else are they hunting, according to this rumor? The dragon reborn? A man with yellow eyes? Who else? Beats of sweat formed on the merchant's face. No one, my lord. No one that I heard. Only rumor, my lord. Straws in the wind, no more. A puff of smoke soon vanished. If I might have the honor of presenting my lord a cask of two rivers to back, a gesture of appreciation, the honor of— To express my— Matt tossed an Andoran gold crown onto the table. Buy your drink on me till that runs out. As he turned away, he heard mutters from the table. I thought he'd cut my throat. You know these lordlings when they're full of wine. That from the fork-bearded merchant. An odd young man, the woman said. Dangerous. Do not try your ploys on that kind, Petrum. I do not think he is a lord at all, another man said petulantly. The Kyrianin, Matt supposed, his lip curled. A lord? He would not be a lord if it was offered to him. White cloaks in the two rivers. Light, light help us. Plowing his way to the door, he pulled a pair of wooden clogs from the pile against the wall. He had no idea whether they were the ones he had worn in. They all looked alike and did not care. They fit his boots. It had started raining outside, a light fall that made the darkness that much deeper. Turning up his collar, he splashed along the muddy streets of the mall in an awkward trot, past blaring taverns and well-lit inns and dark-windowed houses. When mud gave way to paving stones at the wall marking the inner city, he kicked the clogs off and left them lying as he ran on. The defenders guarding the nearest gate into the stone let him pass without a word. They knew who he was. He ran all the way to Perrin's room and flung open the door, barely noticing the splintered split in the wood. Perrin's saddlebags lay on the bed, and Perrin was stuffing shirts and stockings into them. There was only one candle lit, but he did not seem to notice the gloom. "'You've heard, then,' Matt said. Perrin went on with what he was doing. "'About home? Yes, I went down to sniff out a rumor for Fayil. After tonight, more than ever, I have to get her.' The growl deep in his throat made Matt's hackles rise. It sounded like an angry wolf. 
No matter, I heard. Maybe this will do as well. As well as what? Matt wondered. You believe it? For a moment, Perrin looked up. His eyes gathered the light of the candle, shining a burnished golden yellow. There doesn't seem to be much doubt to me. It's all too close to the truth. Matt shifted uncomfortably. Does Rand know? Perrin only nodded and went back to his packing. Well, what does he say? Perrin paused, staring at the folded cloak in his hands. He started muttering to himself. He said he'd do it. He said he would. I should have believed him. Like that. It made no sense. Then he grabbed me by the collar and said he had to do what they don't expect. He wanted me to understand, but I'm not certain he does himself. He didn't seem to care whether I leave or stay. No, I take that back. I think he was relieved I'm leaving. Boil it down, and he's not going to do anything, Matt said. Light with Colindor, he could blast a thousand white cloaks. You saw what he did to those bloody Trollocs. You're going, are you? Back to the two rivers? Alone? Unless you are coming, too. Perrin stuffed the cloak into the saddlebags. Are you? Instead of answering, Matt paced back and forth, his face in half-light and shadow by turns. His mother and father were in Eamon's field, and his sisters. White cloaks had no reason to hurt them. If he went home, he had the feeling he would never leave again, that his mother would marry him off before he could sit down. But if he did not go, if the white cloaks harmed them, all it took was rumor for white cloaks, so he had heard. But why should there be any rumor about them? Even the Coplands, liars and troublemakers to a man, liked his father. Everyone liked Abel Coffin. You don't have to, Perrin said quietly. Nothing I heard mentioned you, only Rand and me. Burn me, I will go. He could not say it. Thinking of going was easy enough, but saying he would? His throat tightened up to strangle the words. Is it easy for you, Perrin? Going, I mean. Don't you feel anything? Trying to hold you back? Telling you reasons you shouldn't go? A hundred of them, Matt. But I know it comes down to Rand and Tavirin. You won't admit that, will you? A hundred reasons to stay, but the one reason to go outweighs them. The White Cloaks are in the two rivers, and they'll hurt people trying to find me. I can stop it if I go. Why should the White Cloaks want you enough to hurt anybody? Light, if they go asking for somebody with yellow eyes, nobody in Eamon's Field will know who they're talking about. And how can you stop anything? One more pair of hands won't do much good. Ha! <sighs> The White Cloaks have bitten a mouthful of leather if they think they can push Two Rivers folk around. They know my name, Perrin said softly. His gaze swung to where his axe hung on the wall, the belt tied around the haft and the wall hook. Or maybe it was his hammer he was staring at, standing propped against the wall beneath the axe. Matt could not be sure. They can find my family. As for why, they have their reasons, Matt, just as I have mine. Who can say who has the better? Burn me, Perrin, burn me! I want to g g See, I can't even say it now. Like my head knows I'll do it if I say it. I can't even get it out in my mind. Different paths. We've been sent down different paths before. Different paths be bloodied, Matt grunted. I've had all I want of Rand, and I said I, shoving me down their bloody paths. I want to go where I want for a change. Do what I want. He turned for the door, but Perrin's voice halted him. I hope your path is a happy one, Matt. The light send you pretty girls and fools who want to gamble. Oh, burn me, Perrin! The light send you what you want to. I expect it will. He did not sound happy at the prospect. What do you tell my dame, all right? And my mother? She always did worry. And look after my sisters. They used to spy on me and tell mother everything, but I wouldn't want anything to happen to them. I promise, Matt. Closing the door behind him, Matt wandered down the hallways aimlessly. His sisters, Eldrin and Bodwin, had always been ready to run, shouting, Mama, Matt's in trouble again. Matt's doing what he shouldn't, Mama. Especially Bode. They would be sixteen and seventeen now, probably thinking of marriage before too much longer, already with some dull farmer picked out, whether the fellow knew it or not. Had he really been gone so long? It did not seem so, sometimes. Sometimes he felt as if he had left Eamon's Field just a week or two past. Other times it seemed years gone, only dimly remembered at all. He could remember Eldrin and Bode smirking when he had been switched, but their faces were no longer sharp. 
his own sister's faces. These bloody holes in his memory, like holes in his life. He saw Berylaine coming toward him and grinned in spite of himself. For all her airs, she was a fine figure of a woman. That clinging white silk was thin enough for a handkerchief, not to mention being scooped low enough at the top to expose a considerable amount of excellent pale bosom. He swept her his best bow, elegant and formal. Ah, good evening to you, my lady. She started to sweep by without a glance, and he straightened angrily. Are you deaf as well as blind, woman? I'm not a carpet to walk over, and I distinctly heard myself speak. If I pinch your bottom, you can slap my face, but until I do, I expect a civil word for a civil word. The first stopped dead, eyeing him in that way women had. She could have sewn him a shirt and told his weight, not to mention when he had his last bath from that look. Then she turned away, murmuring something to herself. All he caught was, too much like me. He stared after her in amazement. Not a word to him. That face, that walk, and her nose so far in the air, it was a wonder her feet touched the ground. That was what he got, speaking to the likes of Berylaine and Elaine. Nobles who thought you were dirt unless you had a palace and bloodlines back to Arthur Hawkwing. Well, he knew a plump cook's helper, just plump enough, who did not think he was dirt. Dara had a way of nibbling his ears that... His thoughts stopped dead in their tracks. He had been considering seeing whether Dara was awake and up for a cuddle. He had even considered flirting with Berylaine. Berylaine. And the last words he had said to Perrin, Look after my sisters. As if he had already decided, already knew what to do. Only he had not. He would not, not so easily, just sliding into it. There was a way, perhaps. Digging a gold coin from his pocket, he flipped it into the air and snatched it onto the back of his other hand. A Tarvalin mark he saw for the first time, and he was staring at the flame of Tarvalin, stylized like a teardrop. Burn all eyes, said I, he announced loudly, and burn Randolph for for getting me into this. A black and gold liveried servant stopped in mid-stride, staring at him worriedly. The man's silver tray was piled high with rolled bandages and jars of ointment. As soon as he realized Matt had seen him, he gave a jump. Matt tossed the gold mark onto the man's tray. From the biggest fool in the world. Mind you, spend it well. On women and wine. Th thank you, my lord, the man stammered as if stunned. Matt left him standing there. The biggest fool in the world. Aren't I just? Chapter 14 Customs of Mayenne Perrin shook his head as the door closed behind Matt. Matt would as soon hit himself on the head with a hammer as go back to the two rivers. Not unless he must. Perrin wished there was some way he could avoid going home, too. But there was no way. It was a fact as hard as iron and less forgiving. The difference between Matt and himself was that he was willing to accept that, even when he did not want to. Easing his shirt off made him grunt, careful as he could be. A large bruise, already faded to browns and yellows, stained his entire left shoulder. A trollic had slipped past his axe, and only Fa'il's quick work with a knife had kept it from being more than it was. The shoulder made washing painful, but at least there was no worry about cold water in tear. He was packed and ready, only a change of clothes for the morning remaining out of his saddlebags. As soon as the sun rose, he would go find Loyal. No point in bothering the ogre tonight. He was probably already abed, where Perrin meant to be shortly. Fa'il was the only problem he had not figured out how to deal with. Even staying in Tyr would be better for her than going with him. The door opened, surprising him. Perfume wafted in to him as soon as the door cracked. It made him think of climbing flowers on a hot summer night. A tantalizing scent, not heavy, not to anyone but him, but nothing Fa'il would wear. Still, he was even more surprised when Berylaine stepped into his room. Holding the edge of the door, she blinked, making him realize how dim the light must be for her. 
You are going somewhere? she said hesitantly. With the light of the hallway's lamps behind her, it was difficult not to stare. Yes, my lady. He bowed, not smoothly, but as well as he could. Fa'il could give all the sharp sniffs she wanted, but he saw no reason not to be polite. In the morning. So am I. She closed the door and crossed her arms beneath her breast. He looked away, watching her from the corner of his eyes, so she would not think he was goggling. She went on without noticing his reaction. The single candle flame was reflected in her dark eyes. After tonight, tomorrow I will leave by carriage for Godan, and from there take ship for Mayenne. I should have gone days ago, but I thought there must be some way to work matters out. Only there wasn't, of course. I should have seen that sooner. Tonight convinced me. The way he... All that lightning flowing down the halls. I will leave tomorrow. My lady, Perrin said in confusion, why are you telling me? The way she tossed her head reminded him of a mare he had sometimes shooed in Eamon's field. That mare would try to take a bite out of you. So you can tell the Lord Dragon, of course. That made no more sense to him. You can tell him yourself, he said with more than a little exasperation. I have no time for carrying messages before I go. I do not think he would wish to see me. Any man would want to see her, and she was beautiful to look at. She knew both things. He thought she had started to say something else. Could she have been that frightened by what had happened that night in Rand's bedchamber? Or the attack and the way Rand had ended it? Perhaps, but... This was not a woman to frighten easily, not from the cool way she was eyeing him. Give your message to a servant. I doubt I'll see Rand again, not before I leave. Any servant will take a note to him. It would come better from you. A friend of the Lord, give it to a servant. Or one of the Aiel. You will not do as I ask? She asked incredulously. Now, haven't you been listening to me? She tossed her head again, but there was a difference this time, though he could not have said what. Studying him thoughtfully, she murmured half to herself, Such striking eyes. What? Suddenly he realized he was standing there naked to the waist. Her intense scrutiny abruptly seemed like the study of a horse before purchase. Next thing, she would be feeling his ankles and inspecting his teeth. He snatched the shirt meant for mourning from the bed and pulled it over his head. Give your message to a servant. I want to go to bed now. I mean to be up early, before sunrise. Where are you going tomorrow? Home, the two rivers. It is late. If you are leaving tomorrow too, I suppose you want to get some sleep. I know I'm tired. He yawned as widely as he could. She still made no move toward the door. You are a blacksmith? I have need of a blacksmith in Mayenne. Making ornamental ironwork. A short stay before returning to the two rivers? You would find Mayenne entertaining. I am going home, he told her firmly, and you are going back to your own rooms. Her small shrug made him look away again hastily. Perhaps another day. I always get what I want in the end. And I think I want... She paused, eyeing him up and down. Ornamental ironwork. For the windows of my bedchamber. She smiled so innocently that he felt alarm gongs sounding his head. The door opened again and Fa'il came in. Perrin, I went into the city looking for you, and I heard a rumor. She stopped, stock still, her eyes hard on Berylane. The first ignored her. Stepping close to Perrin, she ran a hand up his arm across his shoulder. For an instant he thought she meant to try pulling his head down for a kiss. She certainly lifted her face as if for one, but she only trailed her hand along the side of his neck in a quick caress and stepped back. It was over and done before he could move to stop her. Remember, she said softly, as if they were alone. I always get what I want. And she swept past Fa'il and out of the room. He waited for an explosion from Fa'il, but she glanced at his stuffed saddlebags on the bed and said, I see you've heard the rumor already. 
It is only a rumor, Perrin. Yellow eyes make it more than that. She should have been erupting like a bundle of dry twigs tossed on a fire. Why was she so cool? Very well. Moiraine is the next problem, then. Will she try to stop you? Not if she doesn't know. If she tries, I will go anyway. I have family and friends, Fayil. I won't leave them to white cloaks. But I hope to keep it from her until I am well out of the city. Even her eyes were calm, like dark pools in the forest. It made his hackles rise. But it had to take weeks for that rumor to reach Tyr, and it will take weeks more to ride to the two rivers. The white cloaks could be gone by then. Well, I have been wanting you to leave here. I should not complain. I just want you to know what to expect. It won't take weeks by the ways, he told her. Two days, maybe three. Two days. He supposed there was no means to make it faster. You are as mad as Randall Thor, she said disbelievingly. Dropping on the foot of his bed, she folded her legs crosswise and addressed him in a voice suitable for lecturing children. Go into the ways, and you come out hopelessly mad, if you come out at all, which it is most likely you will not. The ways are tainted, Perrin. They have been dark for, what, three hundred years? Four hundred? Ask Loyal. He could tell you. It was Ogares built the ways, or grew them, or whatever it was. Not even they use the ways. Why, even if you managed to make it through them unscathed, the light alone knows where you would come out. I have traveled them, Fayil. And a frightening trip it had been, too. Loyal can guide me. He can read the guideposts. That's how we went before. He will do it for me again when he knows how important it is. Loyal was eager to be away from Tyr, too. He seemed to be afraid that his mother knew where he was. Perrin was sure he would help. Well, she said, rubbing her hands together briskly. Well, I wanted adventure, and this is certainly it. Leaving the Stone of Tyr and the Dragon Reborn, traveling the ways to fight white cloaks. I wonder whether we can persuade Tom Marilyn to come along. If we cannot have a bard, a gleeman will do. He could compose the story, and you and I the heart of it. No dragon reborn, or eyes that I about to swallow up the tale. When do we leave? In the morning? He took a deep breath to steady his voice. I will be going alone, Fayil. Just loyal and me. We will need a pack horse, she said, as if he had not spoken. Two, I think. The ways are dark. We will need lanterns and plenty of oil. Your two rivers people... Farmers? Will they fight white cloaks? Fayil, I said... I heard what you said. She snapped. Shadows gave her a dangerous look, with her tilted eyes and high cheekbones. I heard, and it makes no sense. What if these farmers won't fight, or don't know how? Who is going to teach them? You? Alone? I will do what has to be done, he said patiently, without you. She bounced to her feet so fast he thought she was coming for his throat. Do you think Berylaine will go with you? Will she guard your back? Or perhaps you prefer her to sit on your lap and squeal? Tuck your shirt in, you hairy oaf. Does it have to be so dark in here? Berylaine likes dim light, does she? Much good she will do you against the children of the light. Perrin opened his mouth to protest and changed what he had been going to say. She looks a pleasant armful, Berylaine. What man wouldn't want her on his lap? The hurt on her face banded his chest with iron, but he made himself go on. When I am done at home, I may go to Mayenne. She asked me to come, and I might. Fayil said not a word. She stared at him with a face like stone, then whirled and ran out, slamming the door behind her with a crash. In spite of himself, he started to follow, then stopped with his hands gripping the door frame till his fingers hurt. Staring at the splintered gash his axe had made in the door, he found himself telling it what he could not tell her. I killed white cloaks. They would have killed me if I hadn't. But they still call it murder. I'm going home to die for you. That's the only way I can stop them hurting my people. Let them hang me. I cannot let you see that. I can't. You might even try to stop it, and then they... His head dropped against the door. She would not be sorry to see the last of him now. That was what was important. She would go find her adventure somewhere else, safe from white cloaks and Tarvirin and bubbles of evil. That was all that was important. 
He wished he did not want to howl with grief. Fayil strode through the halls at a near run, oblivious of who she passed or who had to scramble out of her way. Perrin, Perilane, Perrin, Perilane. He wants a milk-faced vixen who runs about half-naked, does he? He doesn't know what he wants. Hairy lummox, wooden-headed buffoon, blacksmith. And that sneaking sow, Berylaine, that prancing she-goat. She did not realize where she was going until she saw Berylaine ahead of her, gliding along in that dress that left nothing to the imagination, swaying along as if that walk of hers was not deliberately calculated to make male eyes pop. Before Fa'il knew what she was doing, she had darted ahead of Berylaine and turned to face her where two corridors met. Perrin Ibarra belongs to me, she snapped. You keep your hands and your smiles away from him. She flushed to her hairline when she heard what she had said. She had promised herself she would never do this, never fight over a man like a farm girl rolling in the dirt at harvest. Berylaine arched a cool eyebrow. Belongs to you. Strange, I saw no collar on him. You serving girls, or are you a farmer's daughter? You have the most peculiar ideas. Serving girl! Serving girl! I am— Fa'il bit her tongue to stop the furious words. The first of Mayenne, indeed. There were estates in Saldeia larger than Mayenne. She would not last a week in the courts of Saldeia. Could she recite poetry while hawking? Could she ride in the hunt all day, then play the bittern at night while discussing how to counter trollic raids? She thought she knew men, did she? Did she know the language of fans? Could she tell a man to come or go or stay and a hundred things more, all with a twist of a wrist and the placement of a lace fan? Light shine on me, what am I thinking? I swore I would never even hold a fan again. But there were other Saldean customs. She was surprised to see the knife in her hand. She had been taught not to draw a knife unless she meant to use it. Farm girls in Saldea have a way of dealing with women who poach others' men. If you do not swear to forget Perrin Ebara, I will shave your head as bald as an egg. Perhaps the boys who tend the chickens will pant after you then. She was not sure exactly how Barrelaine gripped her wrist, but suddenly she was flying through the air. The floor crashing into her back drove all the air from her lungs. Barrelaine stood smiling, tapping the blade of Fa'il's knife on her palm. A custom of Mayenne. The Teherans do like to use assassins, and the guards cannot always be close at hand. I despise being attacked, farm girl. So this is what I will do. I will take the blacksmith away from you and keep him as a pet for as long as he amuses me. Ogare's oath on it, farm girl. He is quite ravishing, really. Those shoulders, those arms, not to mention those eyes of his. And if he is a bit uncultured, I can have that remedied. My courtiers can teach him how to dress and rid him of that awful beard. Wherever he goes, I will find him and make him mine. You can have him when I am finished. If he still wants you, of course. Finally managing to draw a breath, Fa'il struggled to her feet, pulling a second knife. I will drag you to him after I cut off those clothes you are almost wearing and make you tell him you are nothing but a sow. Might help me. I am behaving like a farm girl and talking like one. The worst part was that she meant it. Barrelaine set herself warily. She meant to use her hands, obviously, not the knife. She held it like a fan. Fa'il advanced on the balls of her feet. Suddenly Rourke was there between them, towering over them, snatching the knives away before either woman was really aware of him. "'Have you not seen enough blood already tonight?' he said coldly. "'Of all those I thought I might find breaking the peace, the two of you would be the last named.' Fa'il gaped at him. With no warning, she pivoted, driving her fist toward Rourke's short ribs. The toughest man would feel it there. He seemed to move without looking at her, caught her hand, forced her arm straight to her side, twisted. Abruptly she was standing very straight and hoping he did not push her arm right up out of her shoulder. As if nothing had happened, he addressed Perilane. You will go to your room, and you will not come out until the sun is above the horizon. I will see that no breakfast is brought to you. A little hunger will remind you that there is a time and place for fighting. Berylaine drew herself up indignantly. I am the first of Mayenne. I will not be ordered about like you will go to your rooms. Now. 
Rourke told her flatly. Fael wondered if she could kick him. She must have tensed because as soon as she thought of it, he increased the pressure on her wrist and she was up on her tiptoes. If you do not, he went on to Berylane, we will repeat our first talk together, you and I. Right here. Berylane's face went white and red by turns. Very well, she said stiffly. If you insist, I will perhaps. I did not propose a discussion. If I can still see you when I have counted three. One. With a gasp, Berylane hiked her skirts and ran. She even managed to sway doing that. Fa'il stared after her in amazement. It was almost worth having her arm nearly disjointed. Rourke was watching Berylane go, too, a small appreciative smile on his lips. Do you mean to hold me all night? she demanded. He released her, and tucked her knives into his belt. Those are mine. Forfeit, he said. Berylane's punishment for fighting was to have you see her sent to bed like a willful child. Yours is to lose these knives, you prize. I know you have others. If you argue, I might take those too. I will not have the peace broken. She glared at him, but she suspected he meant just what he said. Those knives had been made for her by a man who knew what he was doing. The balance was just right. What first talk did you have with her? Why did she run like that? That is between her and me. You will not go near her again, Fayo. I do not believe she started this. That one's weapons are not knives. If either of you makes trouble again, I will put both of you to carrying awful. Some of the Terrans thought they could keep on fighting their duels after I had declared peace on this place, but the smell of the refuse carts soon taught them their mistake. Be sure you do not have to learn it the same way. She waited until he had gone before nursing her shoulder. He reminded her of her father. Not that her father had ever twisted her arm, but he had small patience with those who made trouble, whatever their position, and no one ever caught him by surprise. She wondered if she could bait Berylane into something, just to see the first of Mayan sweating among the refuse carts. But Rourke had said both of them. Her father meant what he said, too. Berylane. Something Berylane had said was tickling the back of her mind. Ogre's oath. That was it. An ogre never broke an oath. To say ogre oathbreaker was like saying brave coward or wise fool. She could not help laughing aloud. You will take him from me, you silly peahen. By the time you see him again, if you ever do, he'll be mine once more. Chuckling to herself and occasionally rubbing her shoulder, she walked on with a light heart. Chapter 15 Into the Doorway Holding the glass-mantled lamp high, Matt peered down the narrow corridor, deep in the belly of the stone. Not unless my life depended on it. That's what I promised. Well, burn me if it doesn't. Before doubt could seize him again, he hurried on, past doors dry-rotted and hanging aslant, past others only shreds of wood clinging to rusted hinges. The floor had been swept recently, but the air still smelled of old dust and mold. Something skidded in the darkness, and he had a knife out before he realized it was just a rat, running from him, no doubt running toward some escape hole it knew. Show me the way out, he whispered after it, and I'll come with you. Why am I whispering? There's nobody down here to hear me. It seemed a place for quiet, though. He could feel the whole weight of the stone over his head pressing down. The last door, she had said. That one hung askew, too. He kicked it open, and it fell apart. The room was littered with dim shapes, with crates and barrels and things stacked high against the walls and out into the floor. Dust, too. The great hold. It looks like the basement of an abandoned farmhouse, only worse. He was surprised that Egwene and Nynaeve had not dusted and tidied while they were down here. Women were always dusting and straightening, even things that did not need it. Footprints crisscrossed the floor, some of them from boots, but no doubt they had had men to shift the heavier items about for them. Nynaeve liked finding ways to make a man work. Likely she had deliberately hunted out some fellows enjoying themselves. What he sought stood out among the jumble. 
a tall, redstone doorframe, looming oddly in the shadows cast by his lamp. When he came closer, it still looked odd. Twisted, somehow. As I did not want to follow it around, the corners did not join right. The tall, hollow rectangle seemed likely to fall over at a breath, but when he gave it an experimental push, it stood steady. He pushed a bit harder, not sure he did not want to heave the thing over, and that side of it scraped through the dust. Goosebumps ran down his arms. There might as well have been a wire fastened to the top, suspending it from the ceiling. He held the lamp up to see. There was no wire. At least it won't topple while I'm inside. Light, I am going inside, aren't I? A clutter of figurines and small things wrapped in rotting cloth occupied the top of a tall, upended barrel near him. He pushed the jumble to one side so he could set the lamp there and studied the doorway. The tear on Griel. If Egwene knew what she was talking about, she probably did. No doubt she had learned all sorts of strange things in the tower, however much she denied. She would deny things, wouldn't she now? Learning to be eyes sedai? She didn't deny this, though, now, did she? If he squinted, it just looked like a stone doorframe, dully polished and the duller for dust. Just a plain doorframe. Well, not entirely plain. Three sinuous lines carved deep in the stone ran down each upright from top to bottom. He had seen fancier on farmhouses. He would probably step through and find himself still in this dusty room. Well, now till I try, will I? Luck, taking a deep breath and coughing from the dust, he put his foot through. He seemed to be stepping through a sheet of brilliant white light, infinitely bright, infinitely thick. For a moment that lasted forever. He was blind. A roaring filled his ears. All the sounds of the world gathered together at once for just the length of one measureless step. Stumbling another pace, he stared around in amazement. The tear on Griel was still there, but this was certainly not where he had started. The twisted stone door frame stood in the center of a round hall, with a ceiling so high it was lost in shadows, surrounded by strange spiraled yellow columns snaking up into the gloom, like huge vines twining round poles that had been taken away. A soft light came from glowing spheres atop coiled stands of some white metal. Not silver. The shine was too dull for that, and no hint of what made the glow. It did not look like flame. The spheres simply shone. The floor tiles spiraled out in white and yellow stripes from the tear on grill. There was a heavy scent in the air, sharp and dry and not particularly pleasant. He almost turned around and went back on the spot. A long time. He jumped, a knife coming into his hand, and peered among the columns for the source of the breathy voice that pronounced those words so harshly. A long time. Yet the seekers come again for answers. The questioners come once more. A shape moved back among the columns. A man, Matt thought. Good. You have brought no lamps, no torches, as the agreement was, and is, and ever will be. You have no iron, no instruments of music. The figure stepped out, tall, barefoot, arms and legs and body wound about in layers of yellow cloth, and Matt was suddenly not so sure if it was a man or human. It looked human at first glance, though perhaps too graceful, but it seemed far too thin for its height, with a narrow, elongated face. Its skin and even its straight black hair caught the pale light in a way that reminded him of a snake's scales, and those eyes, the pupils, just black vertical slits. No, not human. Iron, instruments of music, you have none. Matt wondered what it thought the knife was. It certainly did not seem concerned over it. Well, the blade was good steel, not iron. No, no iron. And no instruments of... Why? He cut off sharply. Three questions, Egwene had said. He was not about to waste one on iron or instruments of music. Why should he care if I have a dozen musicians in my pocket and a smithy on my back? I have come here for true answers. If you are not the one to give them, take me to who can. The man 
It was male, at least, Matt decided, smiled slightly. He did not show any teeth. According to the agreement, come. He beckoned with one long-fingered hand. Follow. Matt made the knife disappear up his sleeve. Lead and I will follow. Just you keep ahead of me and in plain sight. This place makes my skin crawl. There was not a straight line to be seen anywhere, except for the floor itself, as he trailed the strange man. Even the ceiling was always arched and the walls bowed out. The halls were continuously curved, the doorways rounded, the windows perfect circles. Tile work made spirals and sinuous lines, and what seemed to be bronze metalwork set in the ceiling at intervals was all complicated scrolls. There were no pictures of anything, no wall hangings or paintings, only patterns and always curves. He saw no one except his silent guide. He could have believed the place empty except for the two of them. From somewhere he had a dim memory of walking halls that had not known a human foot in hundreds of years. And this felt the same. Yet sometimes he caught a flicker of motion out of the corner of his eye. Only, however quickly he turned, there was never anyone there. He pretended to rub his forearms, checking the knives up his coat sleeves for reassurance. What he saw through those round windows was even worse. Tall, wispy trees with only a drooping umbrella of branches at the top, and others like huge fans of lacy leaves, a tangle of growth equal to the heart of any briar-choked thicket, all under a dim, overcast light, though there did not seem to be a cloud in the sky. There were always windows, always along just one side of the curving corridor, but sometimes the side changed, and what surely should have been looking into courtyard or rooms instead gave out into that forest. He never caught as much as a glimpse of any other part of this palace, or whatever it was, through those windows, or any other building except through one circular window he saw three tall silvery spires curving in toward each other, so their points all aimed to the same spot. They were not visible from the next window three paces away, but a few minutes later, after he and his guide had rounded enough curves that he had to be looking in another direction, he saw them again. He tried telling himself these were three different spires, but between them and him was one of those fan-shaped trees with a dangling broken branch, a tree that had been in the same spot the first time. After his third sight of the spires and the strange tree with a broken branch, this time ten paces farther on, but on the other side of the hallway, he tried to stop looking at what lay outside at all. The walk seemed interminable. When are— Matt ground his teeth. Three questions. It was hard to learn anything without asking questions. I hope you are taking me to those who can answer my questions. Burn my bones, I do. For my sake and yours, the light know it true. Here, yeah, the peculiar yellow-wrapped fellow said, gesturing with one of those thin hands to a rounded doorway twice as large as any Matt had seen before. His strange eyes studied Matt intently. His mouth gaped open, and he inhaled, long and slow. Matt frowned at him, and the stranger gave a writhing hitch of his shoulders. Here your answers may be found. Enter. Enter and ask. Matt drew a deep breath of his own, then grimaced and scrubbed at his nose. That sharp, heavy smell was a rank nuisance. He took a hesitant step toward the tall doorway and looked around for his guide again. The fellow was gone. Light, I don't know why anything in this place surprises me now. Well, I will be burned if I'll turn back now. Trying not to think of whether he could find the Tiran Griel again on his own, he went in. It was another round room, with spiraling floor tiles in red and white under a domed ceiling. It had no columns or furnishings of any kind, except for three thick, coiled pedestals around the heart of the floor's spirals. Matt could see no way to reach the top of them except by climbing the twists, Yet a man like his guide sat cross-legged atop each, only wrapped in layers of red. Not all men, he decided at a second look. Two of those long faces with the odd eyes had a definite feminine cast. They stared at him, intense, penetrating stares, and breathed deeply, almost panting. He wondered if he made them nervous in some way. Not much bloody chance of that. 
but they're certainly getting under my coat. It has been long, the woman on the right said. Very long, the woman on the left added. The man nodded. Yet they come again. All three had the breathy voice of the guide, almost indistinguishable from it, in fact, and the harsh way of pronouncing words. They spoke in unison, and the words might as well have come from one mouth. Enter and ask according to the agreement of old. If Matt had thought his skin crawled before, now he was sure it was writhing. He made himself go closer, carefully, careful to say nothing that even sounded like a question. He laid the situation before them. The White Cloaks, certainly in his home village, surely hunting friends of his, maybe hunting him. One of his friends going to face the White Cloaks, another not. His family, not likely in danger, but with the bloody children of the bloody light around. A Taviran pulling at him so he could hardly move. He saw no reason to give names or mention that Rand was the dragon reborn. His first question, and the other two for that matter, he had worked out before going down to the great hold. Should I go home to help my people? he asked finally. Three sets of slitted eyes lifted from him, reluctantly it seemed, and studied the air above his head. Finally, the woman on the left said, You must go to Ruidion. As soon as she spoke, their eyes all dropped to him again, and they leaned forward, breathing deeply again. But at that moment, a bell tolled, a sonorous, brazen sound that rolled through the room. They swayed upright, staring at one another, then at the air over Matt's head again. He is another, the woman on the left whispered. The strain, the strain, the savor, the man said. It has been long. There is yet time, the other woman told them. She sounded calm. They all did. But there was a sharpness to her voice when she turned back to Matt. Ask. Ask. Matt glared up at them furiously. Ruidion? Light! That was somewhere out in the waste, the light in the Aiel knew where. That was about as much as he knew. In the waste. Anger drove questions about how to get away from Aes Sedai and how to recover the lost parts of his memory right out his head. Ruidion, he barked. The light burned my bones to ash if I want to go to Ruidion, and my blood on the ground if I will. Why should I? You are not answering my questions. You are supposed to answer, not hand me riddles. If you do not go to Ruidion, the woman on the right said, you will die. The bell tolled again, louder this time. Matt felt its tremor through his boots. The looks the three shared were plainly anxious. He opened his mouth, but they were only concerned with each other. The strain, one of the women said hurriedly, it is too great. The savor of him, the other woman said on her heels, it has been so very long. Before she was done, the man spoke. The strain is too great, too great, ask, ask. Burn your soul for a craven heart. Matt growled. I will that. Why will I die if I do not go to Ridion? I very likely will die if I try. It makes no— The man cut him off and spoke hurriedly. You will have sidestepped the thread of fate, left your fate to drift on the winds of time, and you will be killed by those who do not want that fate fulfilled. Now, go. You must go. Quickly. The yellow-clad guide was suddenly there at Matt's side, tugging at his sleeve with those two long hands. Matt shook him off. No, I will not go. You have led me from the questions I wanted to ask and given me senseless answers. You will not leave it there. What fate are you talking about? I will have one clear answer out of you at least. A third time the bell sounded mournfully and the entire room trembled. Go, the man shouted. You have had your answers. You must go before it is too late. Abruptly a dozen of the yellow-clad men were around Matt, seeming to appear out of the air, trying to pull him toward the door. He fought with fists, elbows, knees. What fate! Burn your hearts! What fate! It was the room itself that peeled, the walls and floor quivering, nearly taking Matt and his attackers off their feet. What fate! The three were on their feet atop the pedestals, and he could not tell which shrieked which answer. To marry the daughter of the nine moons! To die and live again and live once more a part of what was! To give up half the light of the world to save the world! 
Together they howled like steam escaping under pressure. Go to Ruidion, son of battles! Go to Ruidion, trickster! Go, gambler! Go! Matt's assailant snatched him into the air by his arms and legs and ran, holding him over their heads. Unhand me, you white-livered sons of goats! he shouted, struggling. Burn your eyes! The shadow take your souls! Loose me! I will have your guts for a saddle girth! But writhe and curse as he would, those long fingers gripped like iron. Twice more the bell tolled, or the palace did. Everything shook, as in an earthquake. The walls rang with deafening reverberations, each louder than the last. Matt's captors stumbled on, nearly falling, but never stopping their pell-mell race. He did not even see where they were taking him until they suddenly stopped short, heaving him into the air. Then he saw the twisted doorway, the tear on Griot, as he flew toward it. White light blinded him. The roar filled his head till it drove thought away. He fell heavily onto a dusty floor in dim light and rolled up against the barrel holding his lamp in the great hold. The barrel rocked, packets and figurines toppling to the floor in a crash of breaking stone and ivory and porcelain. Bounding to his feet, he threw himself back at the stone door frame. Burn you! You can't throw me! He hurtled through and stumbled against the crates and barrels on the other side. Without a pause, he turned and leaped at it again with the same result. This time he caught himself on the barrel holding his lamp, which nearly fell onto the already shattered things littering the floor under his boots. He grabbed it in time, burning his hand, and fumbled it back to a steadier perch. Burn me if I want to be down here in the dark, he thought, sucking his fingers. Light the way my luck is running, it probably would have started a fire and I'd have burned to death. He glared at the tear on Griel. Why was it not working? Maybe the folk on the other side had shut it off somehow. He understood practically nothing of what had happened. That bell and their panic? You would have thought they were afraid the roof would come down on their heads. Come to think of it, it very nearly had. And Ruidion, and all the rest of it. The waste was bad enough, but they said he was fated to marry somebody called the Daughter of the Nine Moons. Marry, and to a noblewoman by the sound of it. He would sooner marry a pig than a noblewoman. And that business about dying and living again? Nice of them to add the last bit. If some black-veiled Aielman killed him on the way to Ruvidion, he would find out how true it was. It was all nonsense, and he did not believe a word of it. Only the bloody doorway had taken him somewhere, and they had only wanted to answer three questions, just the way Egwene had said. I won't marry any bloody noblewoman, he told the Tiran Griel. I'll marry when I'm too old to have any fun, that's what. Ruidion, my bloody— A boot appeared, backing out of the twisted stone doorway, followed by the rest of Rand, with that fiery sword in his hands. The blade vanished as he stepped clear, and he heaved a sigh of relief. Even in the dim light, Matt could see he was troubled, though. He gave a start when he saw Matt. Just poking around, Matt? Or did you go through, too? Matt eyed him warily for a moment. At least that sword was gone. He did not seem to be channeling, though how was anybody to tell? And he did not look particularly like a madman. In fact, he looked very much as Matt remembered. He had to remind himself they were not back home any longer, and Rand was not what he remembered. Oh, I went through all right. A bunch of bloody liars, if you ask me. What are they? Made me think of snakes. Not liars, I think. Rand sounded as if he wished they were. No, not that. They were afraid of me, right from the first. And when that tolling started, the sword kept them back. They wouldn't even look at it, shied away, hid their eyes. Did you get your answers? Nothing that makes sense, Matt muttered. What about you? Suddenly, Moiraine appeared from the Tiran Griot, seeming to step gracefully out of thin air, flowing out. She would be a fine one to dance with if she were not eyes to die. Her mouth tightened at the sight of them. You. You were both in there. That is why— She made a vexed hiss. One of you would have been bad enough, but two Taviran at once. You might have torn the connection entirely and been trapped there. Wretched boys playing with things you do not know the danger of. Perrin. Is Perrin in there, too? Did he share your— Exploit. 
The last I saw of Perrin, Matt said, he was getting ready to go to bed. Maybe Perrin would give him the lie by being the next to step out of the thing, but he might as well deflect the eyes to die's anger if he could. No need for Perrin to face it, too. Maybe he'll make it clear of her, at least, if he gets away before she knows what he's doing. Bloody woman, I'll wager she was noble-born. That Moiraine was angry, there was no doubt. The blood had drained out of her cheeks, and her eyes were dark augers boring into Rand. At least you escaped with your lives. Who told you of this? Which one of them? I will make her wish I had peeled off her hide like a glove. A book told me, Rand said calmly. He sat down back on the edge of a crate that creaked alarmingly under his weight and crossed his arms. All very cool. Matt wished he could emulate it. A pair of books, in fact. Treasures of the Stone and Dealings with the Territory of Mayen. Surprising what you can dig out of books if you read long enough, isn't it? And you? She shifted that drilling gaze to Matt. Did you read it in a book, too? You? I do read sometimes, he said dryly. He would not have been averse to a little hide-peeling for Egwene and Nynaeve after what they had done to make him tell where he had hidden the Armorlin's letter. Tying him up with a power was bad enough, but the rest— Yet it was more fun to tweak Moiraine's nose. Treasures. Dealings. Lots of things in books. Luckily, she did not insist that he repeat the titles. He had not paid attention once Rand brought up books. Instead, she swung back to Rand. And your answers? Are mine, Rand replied, then frowned. It wasn't easy, though. They brought a woman to interpret, but she talked like an old book. I can hardly understand some of the words. I never considered they might speak another language. The old tongue, Moiraine told him. They use the old tongue, a rather harsh dialect of it, for their dealings with men. And you, Matt, was your interpreter easily understood? He had to work moisture back into his mouth. The old tongue? Is that what it was? They didn't give me one. In fact, I never got to ask any questions. That bell started shaking the walls down, and they hustled me out like I was tracking cow manure on the rugs. She was still staring, her eyes still digging into his head. She knew about the old tongue slipping out of him sometimes. I almost understood a word here and there, but not to know it. You and Rand got answers. What did they get out of it? The snakes with the legs? We aren't going upstairs to find ten years gone, are we, like Billy in the story? Sensations. Moiraine replied with a grimace. Sensations, emotions, experiences. They rummage through them. You can feel them doing it, making your skin crawl. Perhaps they feed on them in some manner. The eyes that I, who studied this Tiran Griot when it was in Mayenne, wrote of a strong desire to bathe afterward. I certainly intend to. But their answers are true, Rand said as she started to turn away. You are sure of it? The books implied as much, but can they really give true answers about the future? The answers are true, Warren said slowly, so long as they are in regard to your own future. That much is certain. She watched Rand and himself weighing the effect of her words. As to how, though, there is only speculation. That world is folded in strange ways. I cannot be clearer. It may be that that allows them to read the thread of a human life, read the various ways it may yet be woven into the pattern. Or perhaps it is a talent of the people. The answers are often obscure, however. If you need help working out what yours mean, I offer my services. Her eyes flickered from one of them to the other, and Matt nearly swore. She did not believe him about no answers, unless it was simply general eyes said I suspicion. Rand gave her a slow smile. And will you tell me what you asked, and what they answered? For answer, she returned a level searching look, then started for the door. A small ball of light, as bright as a lantern, was suddenly floating ahead of her, illuminating her way. Matt knew he should leave it alone now. Just let her go and hope she forgot he had ever been down here. But a knot of anger still burned inside him. 
all those ridiculous things they had said? Well, maybe they were true, if Moiraine said so, but he wanted to grab those fellows by the collar, or whatever passed for a collar in those wrappings, and make them explain a few things. Why can't you go there twice, Moiraine? he called after her. Why not? He very nearly asked why they worried about iron and musical instruments, too, and bit his tongue. He could not know about those if he had not understood what they were saying. She paused at the door to the hall, and it was impossible to see if she was looking at the Tiran Griel or at Rand. If I knew everything, Matrim, I would not need to ask questions. She peered into the room a moment longer. She was staring at Rand, then glided away without another word. For a time, Matt and Rand looked at each other in silence. Did you find out what you wanted? Rand asked finally. Did you? A bright flame leaped into existence, balanced above Rand's palm. Not the smooth, glowing sphere of the eyes Sedai, but a rough blaze like a torch. As Rand moved to leave, Matt added another question. Are you really going to just let the white cloaks do whatever they want back home? You know they're heading for Eamon's Field, if they are not there already. Yellow Eyes, the bloody dragon reborn. It's too much otherwise. Perrin will do what he has to do to save Eamon's Field, Rand replied in a pained voice. And I must do what I have to, or more than Eamon's Field will fall, and to worse than White Cloaks. Matt stood watching the light of that flame fade away down the hall until he remembered where he was. Then he snatched up his lamp and hurried out. Ruidion! Light, what am I going to do? Chapter 16 Leave Takings Lying on sweat-soaked sheets, staring at the ceiling, Perrin realized that the darkness was turning to gray. Soon the sun would be edging above the horizon. Morning. A time for new hopes, a time to be up and doing. New hopes, he almost laughed. How long had he been awake? An hour or more, surely, this time. Scratching his curly beard, he winced. His bruised shoulder had stiffened, and he sat up slowly. Sweat popped out on his face as he worked the arm. He kept at it methodically, though, suppressing groans and now and again biting back a curse until he could move the arm freely, if not comfortably. Such sleep as he had managed had been broken and fitful. When he was awake, he had seen Fa'il's face, her dark eyes accusing him, the hurt he had put there making him cringe inside. When he slept, he dreamed of mounting a gallows, and Fa'il watching, or worse, trying to stop it, trying to fight white cloaks with their lances and swords, and he was screaming while they fitted the noose around his neck, screaming because the white cloaks were killing Fa'il. Sometimes she watched them hang him with a smile of angry satisfaction. Small wonder such dreams wakened him with a jerk. Once he had dreamed of wolves running out of the forest to save both Fa'il and him, only to be spitted on white cloak lances, shot down by their arrows. Yet had not been a restful night. Washing and dressing as hurriedly as he could, he left the room as if hoping to leave memories of his dreams behind. Little outward evidence remained of the night's attack. Here a sword slashed tapestry, there a chest with a corner splintered by an axe, or lighter patch on the stone-tiled floor where a blood-stained rug had been removed. The Magir had her liveried army of servants out in force, though many wore bandages, sweeping, mopping, clearing away, and replacing. She limped about, leaning on a stick, a broad woman with her gray hair pushed up like a round cap by the dressing wound around her head, calling her orders in a firm voice, with a clear intention of removing every sign of the stone's second violation. She saw Perrin and gave him an infinitesimal curtsy. Even the high lords did not get much more from her, even when she was well. Despite all the cleaning and scrubbing, under the smell of waxes and polishes and cleaning fluids, Perrin could still catch the faint scent of blood, sharply metallic human blood, fetid trollic blood, acrid murdral blood with its stink that burned his nostrils. He would be glad to be away from here. The door to Loyal's room was a span across and more than two spans high, with an over-large door handle in the shape of entwined vines, level with Perrin's head. 
The stone had a number of rarely used Ogair guest rooms. The stone of Tyr predated even the age of great Ogair stoneworks, but it was a point of prestige to use Ogair stonemasons, at least from time to time. Perrin knocked, and at the call of, Come in, in a voice like a slow avalanche, lifted the handle and complied. The room was on a scale with a door in every dimension, yet Loyal, standing in the middle of the leaf-patterned carpet in his shirt sleeves, a long pipe in his teeth, reduced it all to seemingly normal size. The ogre stood taller than a trollic in his wide-toed, thigh-high boots, if not so broad as one. His dark green coat, buttoned to the waist, then flaring to his boot tops like a kilt over baggy trousers, no longer looked odd to Perrin, but one look was enough to tell this was not an ordinary man in an ordinary room. The ogre's nose was so broad as to seem a snout, and eyebrows like long moustaches dangled beside eyes the size of teacups. Tufted ears poked up through shaggy black hair that hung nearly to his shoulders. When he grinned around his pipe stem at the sight of Perrin, it split his face in half. Good morning, Perrin, he rumbled, removing the pipe. You slept well. Not easy after such a night as that. I sir, if I have been up half the night writing down what happened. He had a pen in his other hand and ink stains on his sausage thick fingers. Books lay everywhere on ogre-sized chairs and the huge bed and the table that stood as high as Perrin's chest. That was no surprise, but what was a little startling was the flowers. Flowers of every sort and every color, vases of flowers, baskets of them, posies tied with ribbon or even string, great woven banks of flowers standing about like lengths of garden wall. Perrin had certainly never seen the like inside a room. Their scent filled the air. Yet what really caught his eye was the swollen knot on Loyal's head, the size of a man's fist, and the heavy limp in Loyal's walk. If Loyal had been hurt too badly to travel, he felt ashamed at thinking of it that way. The ogre was a friend, but he had to. You were injured, Loyal? Moiraine could heal you, I'm sure she will. Oh, I can get around with no trouble, and there were so many who truly needed her help. I would not want to bother her. It certainly is not enough to hamper me in my work. Loyal glanced at the table where a large cloth-bound book, large for Perrin, but it would fit in one of the ogre's coat pockets, lay open beside an uncorked ink bottle. I hope I wrote it all down correctly. I did not see very much last night until it was done. Loyal? Fael said, standing up from behind one of the banks of flowers with a book in her hands, is a hero. Perrin jumped. The flowers had masked her scent completely. Loyal made shushing noises, his ears twitching with embarrassment, and waved his big hands at her, but she went on, her voice cool but her eyes hot on Perrin's face. He gathered as many children as he could, and some of their mothers, into a large room and held the door alone against Trollocs and Merdral through the entire fight. These flowers are from the women of the stone, tokens to honor his steadfast courage, his faithfulness. She made steadfast and faithfulness crack like whips. Perrin managed not to flinch, but only just. What he had done was right, but he could not expect her to see it. Even if she knew why, she would not see it. It was the right thing. It was. He only wished he felt better about the entire matter. It was hardly fair that he could be right and still feel in the wrong. It was nothing. Loyal's ears twitched wildly. It is just that the children could not defend themselves. That's all. Not a hero, no. Nonsense. Fayo marked her place in the book with a finger and moved closer to the ogre. She did not come up to his chest. There is not a woman in the stone who would not marry you if you were human, and some would anyway. Loyal, well named, for your nature is loyalty. Any woman could love that. The ogre's ears went stiff with shock, and Perrin grinned. She had obviously been feeding loyal honey and butter all morning, and hoped the ogre would agree to take her along no matter what Perrin wanted. But in trying to prick him, she had just fed loyal a stone without knowing it. Have you heard from your mother, Loyal? he asked. No. 
Loyal managed to sound relieved and worried at the same time. But I saw Lafer in the city yesterday. He was as surprised to see me as I to see him. We are not a common sight in Tyr. He came from studying Shangtai to negotiate repairs on some ogre stonework in one of the palaces. I have no doubt the first words out of his mouth when he returns to the steading will be, Loyal is in tear. That is worrying, Perrin said, and Loyal nodded dejectedly. Lafer says the elders have named me a runaway, and my mother has promised to have me married and settled. She even has someone chosen. Lafer did not know who. At least he said he did not. He thinks such things are funny. She could be here in a month's time. Fa'il's face was a picture of confusion that almost made Perrin grin again. She thought she knew so much more than he did about the world. Well, she did, in truth. But she did not know Loyal. Steading Shangtai was Loyal's home in the spine of the world, and since he was barely past ninety, he was not old enough to have left on his own. Ogar lived a very long time. By their standards, Loyal was no older than Perrin, maybe younger. But Loyal had gone anyway, to see the world, and his greatest fear was that his mother would find him and drag back to the steading to marry, never to leave again. While Fa'il was trying to figure out what was going on, Perrin stepped into the silence. I need to go back to the two rivers, Loyal. Your mother won't find you there. Yes, that is true. The ogre gave an uncomfortable shrug. But my book... Rand's story, and yours, and Matt's. I have so many notes already, but... He moved around behind the table, peering down at the open book, the pages filled with his neat script. I will be the one to write the true story of the dragon reborn, Perrin. The only book by someone who traveled with him, who actually saw it unfold. The dragon reborn by Loyal, son of Arend, son of Halan, of Steading Shangtai. Frowning, he bent over the book, dipping his pen in the ink bottle. That is not quite right. It was more... Perrin put a hand on the page where Loyal was going to write. You'll write no book if your mother finds you. Not about Rand, at least. And I need you, Loyal. Need, Perrin? I do not understand. There are white cloaks in the two rivers, hunting me. Hunting you? But why? Loyal looked almost as confused as Fa'il had. Fa'il, on the other hand, had donned a complacent smugness that was worrisome. Perrin went on anyway. The reasons don't matter. The fact is that they are. They may hurt people, my family looking for me. Knowing white cloaks, they will. I can stop it if I can get there quickly, but it must be quickly. The light only knows what they've done already. I need you to take me there, Loyal, by the ways. You told me once there was a way gate here. And I know there was one at Manatherin. It must still be there in the mountains above Eamon's Field. Nothing can destroy a waygate, you said. I need you, Loyal. Well, of course I will help, Loyal said. The ways. He exhaled noisily, and his ears wilted a bit. I want to write of adventures, not have them. But I suppose one more time will not hurt. The light send it so he finished fervently. Fa'il cleared her throat delicately. Are you not forgetting something, Loyal? You promised to take me into the ways whenever I asked and before you took anyone else. I did promise you a look at a waygate, Loyal said, and what it is like inside. You can have that when Perrin and I go. You could come with us, I suppose, but the ways are not traveled lightly, Fa'il. I would not enter them myself if Perrin did not have need. Fa'il will not be coming, Perrin said firmly. Just you and me, Loyal. Ignoring him, Fa'il smiled up at Loyal as if he were teasing her. You promised more than a look, Loyal, to take me wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and before anyone else. You swore to it. I did, Loyal protested, but only because you refused to believe I would show you. You said you would not believe unless I swore. I will do as I promised, but surely you do not want to step ahead of Perrin's need. You swore, Fayil said calmly, by your mother and your mother's mother and your mother's mother's mother. Yes, I did, Fayil, but Perrin— You swore, Loyal. 
Do you mean to break your oath? The ogre looked like misery stacked on misery. His shoulders slumped and his ears drooped. The corners of his wide mouth turned down and the ends of his long eyebrows draggled onto his cheeks. She tricked you, Loyal. Perrin wondered if they could hear his teeth grinding. She deliberately tricked you. Red stained Fael's cheeks, but she still had the nerve to say, Only because I had to, Loyal. Only because a fool man thinks he can order my life to suit himself. I'd not have done it otherwise. You must believe that. Doesn't it make any difference that she tricked you? Perrin demanded, and Loyal shook his massive head sadly. Ogre, keep their word, Fael said. And Loyal is going to take me to the two rivers, or to the waygate at Manetherin, at least. I have a wish to see the two rivers. Loyal stood up straight. But that means I can help Perrin, after all. Fael, why did you drag this out? Even Phalar would not think this funny. There was a touch of anger in his voice. It took a good bit to make an ogre angry. If he asks, she said determinedly, that was part of it, Loyal. No one but you and me, unless they ask me. He has to ask me. No, Perrin told her, while Loyal was still opening his mouth. No, I won't ask. I will ride to Eamon's field first. I'll walk. So you might as well give up this foolishness, tricking Loyal, trying to force yourself in where, where you aren't wanted. Her calm dropped away in anger. And by the time you reach there, Loyal and I will have done for the White Cloaks. It will be all over. Ask, you anvil-headed blacksmith. Just ask, and you can come with us. Perrin took hold of himself. There was no way to argue her around to his way of thinking, but he would not ask. She was right. He would need weeks to reach the two rivers on his horse. They could be there in two days, perhaps, through the ways. But he would not ask. Not after she tricked Loyal and tried to bully me. Then I'll travel the ways to Manetherin alone. I'll follow you two. If I stay far enough back not to be part of your party, I won't be breaking Loyal's oath. You can't stop me following. That is dangerous, Perrin, Loyal said worriedly. The ways are dark. If you miss a turning or take the wrong bridge by accident, you could be lost forever. Or until Machin Shin catches you. Ask her, Perrin. She said you can come if you do. Ask her. The ogre's deep voice trembled, speaking the name of Machin Shin and a shiver ran down Perrin's back, too. Machin Shin, the Black Wind. Not even I Sedai knew whether it was shadow spawn or something that had grown out of the Way's corruption. Machin Shin was why traveling the Way's meant risking death. That was what I Sedai said. The Black Wind ate souls. That Perrin knew for truth. But he kept his voice steady and his face straight. I'll be burned if I let her think I am weakening. I can't, Loyal. Or anyway, I won't. Loyal grimaced. Fra'il, it would be dangerous for him, trying to follow us. Please relent and let him... She cut him off sharply. No. If he is too stiff-necked to ask, why should I? Why should I even care if he does get lost? She turned to Perrin. You can travel close to us, as close as you need to, so long as it's plain you are following. You will trail after me like a puppy until you ask. Why won't you just ask? Stubborn humans, the ogre muttered. Hasty and stubborn, even when haste lands you in a hornet nest. I would like to leave today, Loyal, Perrin said, not looking at Fahil. Best to go quickly, Loyal agreed with a regretful look at the book on the table. I can tidy my notes on the journey, I suppose. The light knows what I will miss, being away from Rand. Did you hear me, Perrin? Fahil demanded. I will get my horse and a few supplies, Loyal. We can be on our way by mid-morning. Burn you, Perrin, a barra. Answer me. Loyal eyed her worriedly. Perrin, are you certain you could not— No, Perrin interrupted gently. She is mule-headed, and she likes playing tricks. I won't dance, so she can laugh. He ignored the sound coming from deep in Fahil's throat like a cat staring at a strange dog and ready to attack. I will let you know as soon as I am ready. He started for the door, and she called after him furiously. When is my decision, Perinibara? Mine and Loyal's, do you hear me? You had better be ready in two hours, or we'll leave you behind. You can meet us at the Dragon Wall Gate Stable if you're coming. Do you hear me? 
He sensed her moving and shut the door behind him just as something thumped into it heavily. A book, he thought. Loyal would give her fits about that. Better to hit Loyal on the head than harm one of his books. For a moment he leaned against the door, despairing. All he had done, all he had gone through, making her hate him, and she was going to be there to see him die anyway. The best thing he could say was that she might enjoy it now. Stubborn, mule-headed woman! When he turned to go, one of the Aiel was approaching, a tall man with reddish hair and green eyes who could have been Rand's older cousin, or a young uncle. He knew the man and liked him, if only because Gaul had never given even a flicker of notice to his yellow eyes. May you find shade this morning, Perrin. The Margier told me you had come this way, though I think she itched to put a broom in my hands. As hard as a wise one, that woman. May you find shade this morning, Gaul. Women are all hard-headed, if you ask me. Perhaps so, if you do not know how to get around them. I hear you are journeying to the two rivers. Light, Perrin growled before the Aiel could say more. Does the whole stone know? If Moiraine knew, Gaul shook his head. Randall Thor took me aside and spoke to me, asking me to tell no one. I think he spoke to others, too, but I do not know how many will want to go with you. We have been on this side of the Dragon Wall for a long time, and many ache for the threefold land. Come with me, Perrin felt stunned. If he had Aiel with him, there were possibilities he had not dared consider before. Rand asked you to come with me? To the two rivers? Gaul shook his head again. He said only that you were going, and that there were men who might try to kill you. I mean to accompany you, though, if you will have me. Will I? Perrin almost laughed. I will that. We will be into the ways in a few hours. The ways? Gaul's expression did not change, but he blinked. Does that make a difference? Death comes for all men, Perrin. It was hardly a comforting answer. I cannot believe Rand is that cruel, Egwene said, and Nynaeve added, At least he did not try to stop you. Seated on Nynaeve's bed, they were finishing the division of the gold Moiraine had provided. Four fat purses apiece, to be carried in pockets sewn under Elaine's and Nynaeve's skirts, and another each, not so large as to attract unwanted attention, to carry at the belt. Egwene had taken a lesser amount, there being less use for gold in the waist. Elaine frowned at the two neatly tied bundles and the leather script lying beside the door. They held all of her clothes and other things. Cased knife and fork, hairbrush and comb, needles, pins, thread, thimble, scissors. A tinder box and a second knife, smaller than the one in her belt. Soap and bath powder and... It was ridiculous to go over the list again. Egwene's stone ring was snug in her pouch. She was ready to go. There was nothing to hold her back. No, he did not. Elaine was proud of how calm and collected she sounded. He seemed almost relieved. Relieved. And I had to give him that letter laying my heart open like a stone-blind fool. At least he won't open it until I am gone. She jumped at the touch of Nynaeve's hand on her shoulder. Did you want him to ask you to stay? You know what your answer would have been. You do, don't you? Elaine compressed her lips. Of course I do. But he did not have to look happy about it. She had not meant to say that. Nynaeve gave her an understanding look. Men are difficult at the best. I still cannot believe he would be so... so... Egwene began in an angry mutter. Elaine never learned what she meant to say, for at that moment the door crashed open so hard that it bounced off the wall. Elaine embraced Saidar before she had stopped flinching then felt a moment of embarrassment when the rebounding door slapped hard against Land's outstretched hand. A moment more, and she decided to hold on to the source a while longer. The warder filled the doorway with his broad shoulders, his face a thunderhead. If his blue eyes could really have given off the thunderbolts they threatened, they would have blasted Nynaeve. The glow of Saidar surrounded Egwene, too, and did not fade. Land did not appear to see anyone but Nynaeve. You let me believe you are returning to Tarvalin, he rasped at her. You may have believed it, she said calmly, but I never said it. Never said it? 
Never said it. You spoke of leaving today, and always linked your leaving with those dark friends being sent to Tarvalin. Always. What did you mean me to think? But I never said. Light, woman, he roared. Do not bandy words with me. Elaine exchanged worried looks with Egwene. This man had an iron self-control, but he was at a breaking point now. Nynaeve was one who often let her emotions rage, yet she faced him coolly, head high and eyes serene, hands still on her green silk skirts. Lan took hold of himself with an obvious effort. He appeared as stone-faced as ever, as much in control of himself, and Elaine was sure it was all on the surface. I'd not have known where you were off to if I had not heard that you had ordered a carriage to take you to a ship bound for Tanchico. I do not know why the Amarlin allowed you to leave the tower in the first place, or why Moiraine involved you in questioning Black Sisters, but you three are accepted. Accepted, not Aes Sedai. Tanchico now is no place for anyone except a full Aes Sedai with a warder to watch her back. I'll not let you go into that. So, Nynaeve said lightly, you question Moiraine's decisions and those of the Amarlin seat as well. Perhaps I've misunderstood warders all along. I thought you swore to accept and obey, among other things. Lan, I do understand your concern, and I am grateful, more than grateful. But we all have tasks to perform. We are going. You must resign yourself to the fact. Why? For the love of the light, at least tell me why. Tanchico! If Moiraine has not told you, Nynaeve said gently, Perhaps she has her reasons. We must do our tasks as you must do yours. Lan trembled, actually trembled, and clamped his jaw shut angrily. When he spoke, he was strangely hesitant. You will need someone to help you in Tanchico. Someone to keep a Tarabana street thief from slipping a knife into your back for your purse. Tanchico was that sort of city before the war began, and everything I've heard says it is worse now. I could... I could protect you, Nynaeve. Elaine's eyebrows shot up. He could not be suggesting. He just could not be. Nynaeve gave no sign that he had said anything out of the ordinary. Your place is with Moiraine. Moiraine! Sweat beaded on the water's hard face, and he struggled with the words. I can... I must... Nynaeve, I... I... You will remain with Moiraine, Nynaeve said sharply, until she releases you from your bond. You will do as I say. Pulling a carefully folded paper from her pouch, she thrust it into his hands. He frowned, read, then blinked and read again. Elaine knew what it said. What the bearer does is done at my order and by my authority. Obey and keep silent at my command. Swan Sanche, Watcher of the Seals, Flame of Tarvalin, the Amarlin Seat. The other, like it, rested in Egwene's pouch, though none of them were sure what good it would do where she was going. But this allows you to do anything you please, Lan protested. You can speak in the Amarlin's name. Why would she give this to an accepted? Ask no questions I cannot answer, Nynaeve said, then added with a hint of a grin, Just count yourself lucky I do not tell you to dance for me. Elaine suppressed a smile of her own. Egwene made a choking sound of swaddled laughter. It was what Nynaeve had said when the Amarlin first handed them the letters. With this I could make a warder dance. Neither of them had had any doubt which warder she had meant. Do you not? You dispose of me very neatly. My bond and my oaths. This letter. Lan had a dangerous gleam in his eye, which Nynaeve seemed not to notice as she took back the letter and replaced it in the pouch on her belt. You are very full of yourself, Alan Mandragoran. We do as we must, as you will. Full of myself, Nynaeve Almira. I am full of myself. Lan moved so quickly toward Nynaeve that Elaine very nearly wrapped him in flows of air before she could think. One moment, Nynaeve was standing there, with just time to gape at the tall man sweeping toward her. The next, her shoes were dangling a foot off the floor, and she was being quite thoroughly kissed. At first, she kicked his shins and hammered him with her fists and made sounds of frantic, furious protest. 
but her kicks slowed and stopped, and then she was holding on to his shoulders and not protesting at all. Egwene dropped her eyes with embarrassment, but Elaine watched interestedly. Was that how she had looked when Rand— No, I will not think about him. She wondered if there was time to write him another letter, taking back everything she had said in the first, letting him know she was not to be trifled with. But did she want to? After a while, Lan set Nynaeve back on her feet. She swayed a bit as she straightened her dress and patted her hair furiously. You have no right, she began in a breathless voice, then stopped to swallow. I will not be manhandled in that fashion for the whole world to see. I will not. Not the whole world, he replied. But if they can see, they can hear as well. You have made a place in my heart where I thought there was no room for anything else. You have made flowers grow where I cultivated dust and stones. Remember this on this journey you insist on making. If you die, I will not survive you long. He gave Nynaeve one of his rare smiles. If it did not exactly soften his face, at least it made it less hard. And remember also, I am not always so easily commanded, even with letters from the Armorlin. He made an elegant bow. For a moment Elaine thought he actually meant to kneel and kiss Nynaeve's great serpent ring. As you command, he murmured, so do I obey. It was difficult to tell whether he meant to be mocking or not. As soon as the door closed behind him, Nynaeve sank onto the edge of her bed as if letting her knees give way at last. She stared at the door with a pensive frown. Poke the meekest dog too often, Elaine quoted, and he will bite. Not that Lan is very meek. She got a sharp look and a sniff from Nynaeve. He is insufferable, Egwene said. Sometimes he is. Nynaeve, why did you do that? He was ready to go with you. I know you want nothing more than to break him free of Moiraine. Do not try to deny it. Nynaeve did not try. Instead, she fussed with her dress and smoothed the coverlet on the bed. Not like that, she said finally. I mean him to be mine, all of him. I will not have him remembering a broken oath to Moiraine. I will not have that between us. For him as well as myself. But will it be any different if you bring him to ask Moiraine to release him from his bond? Egwene asked. Lan is the kind of man who would see it as much the same thing. All that leaves is to somehow make her let him go of her own accord. How can you manage that? I do not know. Nynaeve firmed her voice. Yet what must be done can be done. There is always a way. That is for another time. Work to be done, and we sit here fretting over men. Are you sure you have everything you need for the waste, Egwene? Avienda is readying everything, Egwene said. She still seems unhappy, but she says we can reach Ruidian in little more than a month, if we are lucky. You will be in Tanchico by then. Perhaps sooner, Elaine told her, if what they say about sea folk rakers is true. You will be careful, Egwene. Even with Avienda for a guide, the waste cannot be safe. I will. You be careful, both of you. Tanchico is not much safer than the waste now. Abruptly they were all hugging one another, repeating cautions to take care, making sure they all remembered the schedule for meeting in till Aaron Riyad's stone. Elaine wiped tears from her cheeks. As well, Lan left, she laughed tremulously. He would think we were all being foolish. No, he would not, Nynaeve said, pulling up her skirts to settle a purse of gold into its pocket. He may be a man, but he is not a complete dolt. There had to be time between here and the carriage to locate paper and pen, Elaine decided. She would find time. Nynaeve had the right of it. Men needed a firm hand. Rand would find he could not get away from her so easily, and he would not find it easy to worm his way back into her good graces.